Now then, let's break down the um, lesson on definiteness of purpose and see exactly what it means, why it's the starting point of all achievement. Because it is the starting point of all individual achievements. And um, a definite purpose must be accompanied by a definite plan for its attainment, followed by appropriate action. Now, you have to have a purpose, you have to have a plan, and you have to start putting that plan into action. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not too important that your plan be sound. It is, in fact, it's not too important. Because if you find that you've adopted a plan that's not sound, that's not working, you can always change. You can modify your plan. But it is very important that you be definite about what it is you're going after, what your purpose is. That must be very definite. There can be no ifs or ands about it. And you'll see before you get through this lesson why it's got to be definite. Now... Just to understand this philosophy, to read it or to hear me talk about it, it wouldn't be of very much value to you. The value will come when you begin to uh, form your own patterns out of this philosophy and put it into work in your daily lives, in your business, in your professions, or in your jobs, or in your human relations. That's where the benefits will really come. The second premise, all individual achievements are the results of a motive or a combination of motives. I just want to impress upon you that you have no right to ask anybody to do anything at any time without what? Without giving that person an adequate motive. And incidentally, that's the warp and the woof of all salesmanship. The ability to plant in the mind of the prospective buyer an adequate motive for his buying. Learning to deal with people by planting in their minds adequate motives for their doing the things that you want them to do. Now, uh, there are a lot of people who call themselves salesmen who have never heard of the nine basic motives, who do not know that they have no right to ask for a sale until they have planted a motive in the mind of the buyer for his buying. The third premise, any dominating idea, plan, or purpose held in the mind through repetition of thought, any dominating idea, plan, or purpose held in the mind through repetition of thought and emotionalized with a burning desire for its realization is taken over by the subconscious section of the mind and acted upon through whatever natural and logical means that may be available. Now, in that paragraph, you've got a tremendous lesson in psychology. If you want the mind to pick up an idea and to form a habit so that the mind will automatically act upon that idea, you've got to tell the mind what you want over and over and over again. No end to it. When Mr. Kui came over here some years ago with his famous uh, formula, day by day in every way I'm getting better and better, uh, he cured thousands of people, but a very great number more than that he didn't cure. And I wonder if you would know why. <coughs> there was no desire, there was no feeling put into that statement. You might just as well blow in the wind as to make a statement unless you put some feeling back of it. Unless you believe it. And incidentally, if you tell yourself anything often enough, you'll get to where you will believe it. <laughs> Even a lie. <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? But it happens to be true. <laughs> you know, there are people who tell uh, little white lies and sometimes they're not so white at, at that until they get to where they believe them themselves. Now, the subconscious mind doesn't, uh, doesn't know the difference between the right or wrong. It doesn't know the difference between positive or negative. It doesn't know the difference between a penny or a million dollars. It doesn't know the difference between success and failure. It'll accept any statement that you keep repeating to it by thoughts or by words or by any other means. And incidentally, it's up to you in the beginning to <clears throat> lay out your definite purpose Write it out so that it can be understood, memorize it, and start repeating it day in and day out until your subconscious mind picks it up and automatically acts upon it. Now, this is going to take a little time, 
You can't expect to undo uh, in, overnight what, you're, uh, what you've been doing to your subconscious mind there back down through the years by allowing negative thoughts to get into it. You can't expect that to happen overnight. But you will find that if you uh, emotionalize any plan that you send over to your subconscious mind and repeat it in a state of enthusiasm and back it up with a spirit of faith, if you do that, the subconscious mind not only acts more quickly, but it acts more definitely and more positively. And the fourth premise, any dominating desire, plan, or purpose which is backed by that state of mind known as faith is taken over by the subconscious section of the mind and acted upon immediately. That state of mind, ladies and gentlemen, is the only state of mind that will produce immediate action through the subconscious mind. And uh, when I say uh, faith, I don't have reference to wishing or hoping or mildly believing. I don't have reference to any of those things. I have reference to a state of mind wherein whatever it is that you're going to do, you can see it already in a finished act before you even begin it. Now, that's pretty positive, isn't it? I can truthfully tell you that not ever in my whole life have I undertaken to do anything that I didn't do it unless I got careless in my desire to do it and backed away from it or changed my mind or my mental attitude. I have never failed to do anything that I made up my mind to do, and I'll tell you that you can put yourself in a frame of mind where you can do whatever you make up your mind to do unless you weaken as you go along. But so many people do. Now let's get back to this fourth premise again. Any dominating desire, plan, or purpose which is backed by that state of mind known as faith is taken over by the subconscious section of the mind and acted upon immediately. I don't know for sure, ladies and gentlemen, but I suspect that there's a relatively small number of people in the world at any one time who understand the principle of faith who really understand it and know how to apply it. And even if you do understand it, if you don't back it up with action and make it a part of your uh, habit life, you might just as well not understand it. Because faith without deeds is dead. Faith without action is dead. Faith without uh, absolute positive belief is dead. I don't know how you're going to get any results through believing unless you put some action back of that belief. And incidentally, if you tell your mind often enough that you have faith in anything, the time will come when your subconscious mind will accept that, even if you tell your mind often enough that you have faith in yourself. Had you ever thought what a nice thing it would be if you had such complete faith in yourself that you wouldn't hesitate to undertake anything you wanted to do in life? Uh, had you ever thought what, that, what a benefit that would be to you? Do you know how many people there are that sell themselves short all the way through life because they don't have the right amount of confidence, let alone faith? Give a guess as to the percentage. Well, it's somewhere between 98 and 100. <laughs> the margin who do is so small that I wouldn't begin to guess just exactly what it is. But judging by the good many thousands of people that I've come into contact with, and I'll, you know it without my telling you that my audiences and my classes are always above average, judging by those people, I would say that uh, it's uh, well over 98% of the people who never in our whole lives develop a sufficient amount of confidence in themselves to go out and to undertake and to do the things they want to do in life. They accept from life whatever life hands them. Isn't it a strange thing how nature works? She gives you a set of tools. Everything that you need to attain all that you can use or aspire to have in this world. She gives you a set of tools adequate for your every need. And she rewards you bountifully for accepting and using those tools. That's all you have to do, just accept them and use them. She penalizes you beyond compare if you don't accept them and use them. Nature hates vacuums and idleness. She wants everything to be in action. And especially does she want the human mind to be in action. The mind is not different from any other part of the body. If you don't use it, if you don't rely upon it, it atrophies and withers away and finally gets to where anybody can push you around. 
anybody. And oftentimes you don't have the uh, willpower to even resist or protest when people push you around. The fifth premise. The power of thought is the only thing over which any human being has complete unquestionable means of control, a fact so astounding that it connotes a close relationship between the mind of man and infinite intelligence. Now, there are only five known things in the whole universe, ladies and gentlemen, just five, and out of those five is shaped everything that's in existence, from the smallest electrons and protons of matter on up to the largest suns that float out there in the heavens, including you and me. Just five things. There's time and there's space. There's energy and there's matter. And those four things would be no good without the fifth thing. They'd be nothing. Everything would be chaos. You and I wouldn't have, never could have existed without that fifth thing. What do you think it is? A universal intelligence. And it uh, reflects itself in every blade of grass, everything that grows out of the ground, in all of the electrons and protons of matter. It reflects itself in space and in time, in everything it is. There is intelligence. Intelligence operating all the time. And the person who is the most successful is the one who finds ways and means of appropriating most of this intelligence through his brain and putting it into action. This intelligence permeates the whole universe. Space, time, matter, energy, everything else. And every individual has the privilege of appropriating to his own use as much of this intelligence as he chooses. He can only appropriate it by using it. Just understanding it or believing in it is not enough. You've got to put it into specialized use in some form. And the responsibility of this course mainly is to give you a pattern, a blueprint, by which you can take possession of your own mind and put it into operation. All you have to do is to follow the blueprint. Don't just pick out that part of it which you like best and uh, discard the other. Take it all as is. The sixth premise, the subconscious section of the mind appears to be the only doorway of individual approach to infinite intelligence. Now, I want you to study that language very carefully. I said it appears to be. I don't know if it is, and I doubt if you do, and I doubt if anyone knows definitely. We have, a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about it, but from the best intelligence that I have been able to use, best observations that I have been able to make through thousands of experiments, it is true that the subconscious section of the mind is the only doorway of individual approach to infinite intelligence, and it is capable of influence by the individual through the means described in this and subsequent lessons. The basis of approach is faith based upon definiteness of purpose. Now, there is one sentence that gives you the whole key to that paragraph. Faith based upon definiteness of purpose. Uh, do you have any idea why it is that you don't have as much confidence in yourself as you should have? Had you ever stopped to think about that? Did you ever stop to think about why it is that when uh, you see an opportunity coming along or what you believe to be an opportunity, you begin to question your ability to embrace it and use it? Haven't you had that happen to you many times? Doesn't it happen every day? And if you've had a chance to be closely associated with people who are very successful, you'll know that that is one thing that they are not bothered by. If they want to do something, it never occurs to them they can't do it. I hope that in your association with Napoleon Hill Associates, you'll come to know my distinguished uh, business associate, Mr. W. Clement Stone, better. Because if I ever saw a man that knows the power of his mind and is willing to rely upon that mind, Mr. Stone is that man. I don't think Mr. Stone has any worries. I don't believe he would tolerate a worry. I think he, it would be an insult to his intelligence if he recognized that anything was worrying him. Why? Because he has confidence in his ability to use his mind and to make that mind to create the circumstances that he wants created. And that's the condition and the operation of the, any successful mind.
And that's going to be the condition of your mind when you get through with this philosophy. You're going to be able to project your mind into whatever objective you choose, and there'll be never any question in your mind as to whether you can do what you want to do or not. Never a question in the world. In the seventh premise, every brain is both of a receiving set and a broadcasting station for the vibrations of thought, a fact which explains the importance of moving with definiteness of purpose instead of drifting, since the brain may be so thoroughly charged with the nature of one's purpose that it will begin to attract the physical or material equivalents of that purpose. Get it into your consciousness that the first radio broadcasting and receiving set was uh, the one uh, that uh, exists in the brain of man. And not only does it exist in the brain of man, but it exists in a great many animals. I have a couple of Pomeranian dogs, and they know exactly what I'm thinking sometimes before I know. <laughs> they're so smart. They can tune in on me. They know when we start off for an automobile ride, whether they're going or whether they're not. Don't have to say a word. Not a word, because they're in constant attunement with us. Your uh, mind is sending out vibrations constantly. And if you're a salesman and you're going to call on a prospective buyer, the sale ought to be made before you ever come into presence of the buyer. Had you ever thought of that? If you're going to do anything requiring the cooperation of other people, condition your mind so that you know the other fellow is going to cooperate. Why? First, because the plan that you're going to offer him is so fair and honest and so beneficial to him that he can't refuse it. In other words, you have a right to his cooperation. You would be surprised to know how, what a change there will be in people when you come then sending out over this broadcasting station of yours positive thoughts instead of thoughts of fear. Now, if you want a good illustration of how this uh, broadcasting station works, you uh, need a thousand dollars real bad, Lynn. You go down to the bank somewhere and you've got to have that thousand by a day after tomorrow. They're going to take the car back. <laughs> or the furniture, or something else. You just have to have that thousand dollars. Why, the banker can tell the moment you walk inside the door that you just have to have it, and he doesn't want you to have it. Isn't that funny? No, it's not funny. It's tragic. You uh, carry the matches around in your pocket, oftentimes to set your own house afire. You broadcast your thoughts, and uh, they precede you, and uh, when you get there, there uh, you find that uh, instead of getting the cooperation you went after, the other person reflects back to you what? That state of doubt, that state of mind that you sent out ahead of it. I used to teach salesmanship. I made my living that way for a long time while I was doing the research on this philosophy. And I have taught over 30,000 salesmen, many of them now life members of the coveted Million Dollar Roundtable in the life insurance field. And if there is one thing in this world that has to be sold, it's life insurance. Nobody ever buys life insurance. It has to be sold. And the first thing that I taught those uh, people under my direction was that they must make the sale to themselves before they try to make it to the other fellow. And if they don't do that, they're not going to make a sale. Somebody might buy something from them, but they'll never make a sale unless they first make it to themselves. Every brain, a broadcasting station, and a receiving set. And you can attune that brain so that it'll attract only the positive vibrations released by other people. Now, that's the point I'm coming to and that I wanted you to get. By habit, you can train your own mind to pick up out of that myriad of vibrations that are floating out there constantly. Train your mind to pick up only the things that are related to what you want most in life. And how do you do that? Why, you do that by keeping your mind on what you want most in life, your definite major purpose. So this, by repetition, by thought, by action, until finally the brain will not pick up anything not related to that definiteness of purpose. Now, is that a marvelous thought? You can educate your brain so that it will absolutely refuse to pick up any vibrations except those related to what you want. And ladies and gentlemen, when you get your brain under control like that, you will be on the path, really and truly on the beam. Now let's uh, see what are some of the benefits of definiteness of purpose. And first of all, definiteness of purpose automatically develops self-reliance. 
personal initiative, imagination, enthusiasm, self-discipline, and concentration of effort. All of these being prerequisites for success of vital importance. Now that's quite an array of things that you really developed. You developed through definiteness of purpose. That is to say, knowing what you want, having a plan for getting it, having your mind occupied mostly with the carrying out of that plan. And if you happen to adopt a plan, and unless you're uh, an unusual person, you're almost sure to adopt some plans that are not going to work so well. When you find out that your plan is not right, immediately uh, discard it and get another one. And keep on until you find one that will work. And in the process of doing this, just remember one thing, that maybe somewhere along the line that infinite intelligence, being gifted with a great deal of wisdom, might have a plan for you better than the one you had yourself. <clears throat> have an open mind. If you adopt a plan to carry out your major purpose or a minor purpose and it doesn't work well, dismiss that plan and ask for guidance from infinite intelligence. And you may get that guidance, and what, what can you do to be sure that you will get it? Uh, why, you can believe that you'll get it. You can believe that you'll get it, and it's not going to hurt if you say out loud orally that you believe it. I suspect that uh, the Creator can uh, knows your thoughts, but I found that if you uh, express yourself with a lot of enthusiasm, it doesn't hurt any. <laughs> And I'm sure that it doesn't uh, hurt to, in arousing your subconscious mind. When I wrote Think and Grow Rich, the original title of it was The 13 Steps to Riches. And both the publisher and I knew that that was not a box office title. We had to have a million dollar title. Well, they went ahead and set the, tie, set the book up in type. And the publisher kept prodding me every day to give him the title that I wanted. And I, I wrote five or six hundred titles. There weren't any of them any good. Not any of them. And then one day he scared the dickens out of me. He called me up and said, well, he said, uh, tomorrow morning I've got to have that title. And he said, if you don't have one, I have one that's a humdinger. I said, what is it? He said, uh, we're going to call it Use Your Noodle and Get the Boodle. I said, my goodness, you'll ruin me. <laughs> Why, he said, that, uh, uh, this is a dignified book. And that's a flippant title. Why, that will ruin the book and me too. Well, he said, whether it will or not, that's the title, unless you give me a better one by tomorrow morning. <laughs> now, I want you to follow this incident because it's, it's, uh, la it's, uh, it's potent with uh, food for thought, what I'm now telling you. I went in that night and sat down on my bed as I was going to, on the side of the bed, and I had a talk with my subconscious mind. And I said, now, look here, old sub. You and I have gone a long way together, and you've done a lot of things for me and some things to me, thanks to my ignorance. But I've got to have a million-dollar title, and I've got to have it tonight. Do you understand that? I got to talking so loudly that the man in the apartment above me thumped on the floor. <laughs> and I don't blame him, because he guess he thought I was quarreling with my wife or something. Well, I really gave the subconscious mind no doubt as to what I wanted. Now, I didn't tell him, I didn't tell the subconscious mind exactly what kind of a title. I said, it's got to be a million dollar title. I went to bed. When I, when I had charged my subconscious mind until I reached that psychological moment where I knew it was going to produce what I wanted. And if I hadn't have, if I hadn't have gotten to that point, I'd have been up there still sitting on the side of that bed talking to my subconscious. There is a psychological moment, and you can feel it when uh, you, the power of faith uh, takes over whatever you're trying to do and says, all right, now you can relax. This is it. I went to bed, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up as if somebody had uh, shaken me real hard, and as I came out of my sleep, think and grow rich was in my mind. Oh, boy, I let out an Indian hoop. I jumped to my typewriter and wrote it down, and I grabbed the telephone, and I called the publisher. He said, what's the matter? Is town on fire now? And I was about 2.30 in the morning by this time. I said, yes, you bet it is. With a million dollar title, he said, let's have her. I said, think and go rich. He said, boy, you've got it. <laughs> yes, I'll say we've got it. That book has grossed outside of the United States over $23 million already and probably will gross over $100 million before I pass on. And there's no end to it. A million dollar... 
a multi-million dollar title. Well, after the thrashing that I gave my subconscious, I'm not surprised that it really came over and did a good job. Now, uh, why didn't I uh, use that method in the first place? Isn't that a funny thing? Why, I know the law. Why did I fool around about it and temporize? Why didn't I go to the source and get my subconscious mind all heated up instead of sitting down there to my typewriter writing out five or six hundred times? Why didn't I? Well, I'll tell you why. For the same reason that you oftentimes know what to do but won't do it. There's no explaining the indifference of mankind toward himself. Even after you know what the law is, you know what the score is, and you fool around until the last limit before you do anything about it. Just like in prayer. Fool around about prayer until the time of need comes, and then you're scared to death, and of course you don't get any results from prayer. If you want to have results from prayer, you condition your mind so that your life is a prayer, day in and day out, every minute of your life, a constant prayer, because it's based upon belief, belief in your dignity and your right to tune in on infinite intelligence and to have the things that you need in this world. And so it is with this human mind. You've got to condition the mind as you go along from day to day so that when any emergency arises, you'll be right there ready to deal with it. Also, the uh, definiteness of purpose induces one to budget one's time and to plan day-to-day -day endeavors which lead to the attainment of one's major purpose. If you would sit down and put on an hour-by-hour hour account of the actual work that you put in each day for one week, and then an hour-by-hour hour account of the time that you waste that you could devote to anything you want to if you wanted to, badly enough, you're going to get one of the shocks of your life. We're not efficient. You know, you have three hour, uh, about eight hours to sleep and about eight hours to earn a living, and have eight hours of free time that you can do anything that you want to with here in this country where we live. And then, definiteness of purpose makes one more alert in recognizing opportunities related to the object of one's major purpose, and it inspires the courage to embrace and act upon those opportunities. And now, we all see opportunities almost every day of our lives, which if we embraced them and acted upon them, could, could benefit us. But there's, a, there's something in us that we call procrastination. We just don't uh, have the will, the alertness, the determination to embrace opportunities when they come along. <coughs> but if you condition your mind with this philosophy, you'll not only embrace opportunities, but you'll do something better. What could you do better than embrace an opportunity? Make the opportunity. That's, a, that's the idea. One of uh, Napoleon's generals, the other Napoleon, <laughs> came to him one day and they were fixing to attack the next morning. And this general says, Sir, the conditions, the circumstances are not just right for the attack tomorrow. And Napoleon says, Circumstances not right, hell, I make circumstances. Attack. And I have never seen a successful man yet in any business that didn't say when somebody says it can't be done, he said attack. Attack. Start where you are. And when you get around to that curve in the road, although you can't see by it until you get there, you'll always find that the road goes on around. Attack. Don't procrastinate. Don't stand still. Attack. And uh, definiteness of purpose inspires confidence in one's integrity and character, and it attracts the favorable attention of other people. Have you ever thought about that? I think the whole world loves to see a person walking with his chest sticking out, walking with uh, an atmosphere that tells the whole doggone world that he knows what he's doing and he's right on the way doing it. Why, well, you know, people get out of the way on the sidewalk and let you go by if you are determined to get by. And you don't have to whistle at them either or holler at them or anything of that kind. You just have to send your thoughts ahead with determination that you're going through that crowd. And believe me, they stand aside and let you go through. And the world's like that. The man who knows where he is going and is determined to get there will always find willing helpers to cooperate with him. Now, there's another very important thing. The greatest of all its benefits, that is, to go definiteness of purpose, it opens the way for the full exercise of that state of mind known as faith. 
by making the mind positive and freeing the mind from the limitations of fear and doubt and discouragement and indecision and procrastination. The very minute that you decide upon something, you know that's what you want, you know you're going to do it, all of these negatives that have been bothering you, they pick up their baggage and get out. They just move out. They can't live in a positive mind. Can you imagine a negative frame of mind and a positive frame of mind occupying the same space at the same time? Could you imagine that? No, you can't, because it can't be done. And did you know that the slightest bit of a, a negative a mental attitude is sufficient to destroy the power of prayer? Did you know that the slightest bit of a, of a negative mental attitude is sufficient to destroy your plan, whatever it is you're doing, carrying out your definiteness of purpose? You have to move with courage, with faith, with determination in connection with carrying out your definiteness of purpose. And next, definiteness of purpose makes one success conscious. You know what I mean by success conscious? If I said uh, it makes one also health conscious, would you know what I meant by that? What do I mean? Thinking. Why your thoughts are predominantly about health. And uh, with reference to success consciousness, your thoughts are predominantly about success. The can-do part of life and not the no-can-do. Did you know that that 98% of the people who never get anywhere in life that we were talking about a while ago are no can-do people? Any circumstance that you place before them or that is placed before them or that overtakes them, immediately they fasten their attention upon the no can-do part, the negative part. Now, I'll never forget as long as I live what happened to me when Mr. Carnegie surprised me and gave me a, a chance to organize this philosophy. I tried every way in the world to give him all the reasons I could think of and had about six, about six reasons why I couldn't do it. I didn't have sufficient education. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the influence. I didn't know what the word philosophy meant. Well, and there was about two others that immediately popped into my mind. And I was trying to get my mouth open to tell Mr. Carnegie that I thanked him for the compliment he'd paid me. But what was going on in my mind was that uh, I was doubting that Mr. Carnegie was such a good judge of human nature as he had been reported to be when he was picking me to do a job like that. <laughs> now, that's what went on in my mind. But there were silent persons standing looking over my shoulder, and he said, go ahead and tell him you can do it. Spit it out! And I said, yes, Mr. Carnegie, I'll accept the commission, and you can depend upon it, sir, that I will complete it. He reached over and grabbed me by the hand. He said, I not only like what you said, but I like the way you said it. That's what I was waiting for. He saw that I, my mind was on fire with belief that I could do it, even though I hadn't the slightest asset to give me a beginning other than my determination that I would get the assets necessary to create this philosophy. And if I had wavered, in the slightest, if I had said to Mr. Carnegie, well, yes, uh, Mr. Carnegie, I'll uh, do my best. I'm sure, I never asked him about this, but I am sure that he would have taken the opportunity away from me instantly. Because it would have indicated that I wasn't too determined to do it. Yes, Mr. Carnegie, you can depend upon me, sir, to complete it. And your living witnesses here, although Mr. Carnegie has long since been gone, your living witnesses that Mr. Carnegie didn't pick wrongly. <laughs> he knew what he was about. He had found something in the human mind, in my mind, that he'd been searching for for years. He found it. I didn't know its value, but I found out the value of it later. And I want you to recognize the value of it, because you have that same thing in your mind, that same capacity to know what you want and to be determined that you'll get it even though you don't know where to make the first start. And what does make a great man? Give me a good definition. What makes a great man or a great woman? Do you have any idea what greatness is? 
Greatness is the ability to recognize the power of your own mind, to embrace it and use it. That's what makes greatness. And in my book of rules, every man and every woman can become truly great by the simple process of recognizing his or her own mind, embracing it and using it. Now here are instructions for applying the principle of a definite major purpose. And uh, these instructions are to be carried out to the letter. Don't overlook any part of them. First, write out a clear statement of your major purpose, sign it, commit it to memory, and repeat it orally at least once a day in the form of a prayer or an affirmation if you choose. You can see the advantage of this because it places uh, your faith in your creator squarely back of you. Now, I've found from experience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here is the uh, weakest spot in the students' uh, activities. They read this, they say, well, it's simple enough, I understand it, and what's the use of going to the trouble of writing it out? You might just as well not have this lesson if you're going to take that attitude to it. You must write it out. You must go through the physical act of translating a thought into, into, onto paper, and then you must memorize it, and then you must start talking to your subconscious mind about it. Give that subconscious mind a pretty good idea of what it is you want. And it won't hurt any if you remember the story I told you in the first half of the lesson tonight about what I did to get my million-dollar book title. It won't do a bit of harm if you uh, give your subconscious mind to understand from here on out that you're the boss and that you're going to do something about it. But you can't expect the subconscious mind or anything else to help you if you don't know what it is you want, if you're not definite about it. Ninety-eight out of every hundred people taking cross-section of humanity in general do not know what they want in life and consequently never get it. They take whatever life hands them. Now, in, a in addition to your definite major purpose, you can have minor purposes, as many as you want, provided they lead you in the direction of your major purpose, uh, provided they are related to or lead you in the direction of your major purpose. Your whole life should be devoted to carrying out your major purpose in life. Find out what it is you want. And incidentally, uh, it's all right to be um, modest like I am <laughs> when you go to asking for what you want. But don't be too modest. Uh, reach out and uh, ask for a bounty. Ask for the things that you are sure you're entitled to, but in asking, be sure that you don't overlook the subsequent instructions I'm going to give you about what it is you're going to give in return for what you expect. Second, write out a clear, definite outline of the plan or plans by which you intend to achieve the object of your purpose and state the maximum of time within which you intend to attain it. And describe it in detail precisely what you intend to give in return for the realization of the object of your purpose. Make your plan flexible enough to permit changes any time you are inspired to do so, remembering that infinite intelligence may present you with a better plan than yours and oftentimes will if you are definite about what you want. Have any of you ever had a hunch that you couldn't describe, <laughs> you couldn't explain away? You know what a hunch is? It's your subconscious mind trying to get an idea over to you, and oftentimes you are too indifferent to even let the subconscious mind talk to you for a few moments. I've heard people say, well, I had the darndest fool idea today, <laughs> but that darn fool idea, you know, might have been a million-dollar idea if you'd have listened to it and have done something about it. Uh, have great respect for these hunches that come to you because there's something outside of yourself trying to communicate with you, undoubtedly. I have a great respect for these hunches that come to me, and they come to me uh, constantly. And uh, I find them always related to something that my mind's been dwelling upon, something that I want to do, something that I'm uh, engaged in. Write out a clear, definite outline of the plan or plans and state the maximum of time with which it within which you intend to attain it. Now, that timing is important, very important. 
Don't uh, write out as your definite major aim that I intend to become the best salesman in the world or that I intend to become the uh, best employee in my organization or that I intend to make a lot of money. Uh, that, that's not definite. Whatever it is that you consider to be your major objective in life, write it out clearly and time it. I intend to in attain within blank number of years so and so and then go ahead and describe so and so what it is. And then in the next paragraph down below, I intend to give in return for the thing that I request so and so and then go ahead and describe it. Now this business of timing, you know, um, nature... <clears throat> has a system of timing everything. If you go out, if you're a farmer, you want to plant some wheat in the field, you go out and you prepare that ground, you sow the wheat at the right season of the year, and uh, then after you sow it, you go back the next day with the harvester and start harvesting. The very next day. Well, isn't anybody going to catch me up on that one? <laughs> What do you wait for? For nature to do her part. Infinite intelligence or God or whatever you want, it's all, no matter what you call it, we're talking about the same thing, but there is an intelligence that does its part if you do your part first. Intelligence is not going to direct you to nor attract to you the object of your major purpose unless you know what it is and unless you properly time it. It'd be quite ridiculous if you started out with only a mediocre talent and said that you're going to make a million dollars within the next 30 days. It'd be quite ridiculous. In other words, make your major purpose uh, within reason of what you know you're able to, uh, to, to deserve. And next, uh, keep your major purpose strictly to yourself, except insofar as you will receive further instructions on this subject in the lesson on the mastermind. Now, why do I, why do I suggest that you keep your major purpose to yourself? Well, the reason, of course, that you don't disclose your major purpose to other people is that there are a lot of uh, idle, curious people in this world who like to stand on the sidelines and stick their toes out when you go by, especially if you've got a high head and look like you're going to accomplish more in life than they are. And for no good reason at all, as you go along, they stick their toes out and just to see you fall. They'll throw monkey wrenches in your machinery. If they don't have monkey wrenches, they'll put sand in your gearbox. But they will uh, slow you down. Why? Because of the envy of mankind. Now, the only way to speak about your definite major purpose is in action after the fact and not before the fact, after you've achieved it. Let it speak for itself. Let it speak for itself. The only way anybody can afford to boast or brag about himself is not by words but by deeds. And then if, you do, if the deeds are engaged in, you don't need any words. They speak for themselves. Now, in about making your plan flexible, don't, uh, <clears throat> don't become determined that the plan you've worked out is perfect just because you worked it out. You'll make a mistake if you do that. Leave your plan flexible. Give it a good trial, and if it's not working properly, change it. Next, uh, call your major purpose into your consciousness as often as may be practical. Eat with it. Sleep with it. And take it with you wherever you go, keeping in mind the fact that your subconscious mind can thus be influenced to work for its attainment while you sleep. Your conscious mind is a very jealous mind. It stands guard and doesn't want anything to get by except the things that you are afraid of and the things that you're very enthusiastic about. And especially the things that you are afraid of. It does let those get by sometimes too. But generally speaking, if you want to plant an idea in your subconscious mind, you have to do it with a tremendous amount of faith, tremendous amount of enthusiasm. You've got to rush the conscious mind so that it steps aside and lets you go through to the subconscious because of your enthusiasm and your faith. And then repetition is a marvelous thing, too. The conscious mind finally gets tired of hearing you say a thing over and over and over. It says, all right, if you're bound to repeat that, I can't stand here and watch you forever. Go on in there and take it into the sub and see what he'll do with it. That's the way it works. This, uh, this conscious mind is a very contrary thing. And you know it, le it learns all of the things that won't work. <laughs> Did you know that? It has a tremendous stock of things that won't work and things that are not right. And it has a tremendous stock <clears throat> of old pieces of string, horseshoes, nails, like some misers gather up 
a whole stock of those things lying around, useless trash that it's gathered, impedimentia that you don't need. And that's the kind of stuff it's feeding to your subconscious mind. Every night, just before you go to bed, you should give your subconscious mind some sort of an order for the night, what it is you want done. I should say the healing of your body, certainly the body needs repairing every day. When you lay the carcass down for sleep, by turn it over to the infinite intelligence and request your subconscious mind to go to work and heal every, every cell in your body, every organ, and to give you tomorrow morning a perfectly conditioned body in which the mind may function. Uh, don't go to bed uh, without giving orders to your subconscious mind. Tell it what you want. Get in the habit of telling it what you want. You keep on long enough, it'll believe you and deliver what you, what you ask for. And therefore, you better be careful about what you ask for, because if you keep on asking for it, you're going to get it. I wonder if you wouldn't be surprised if you knew uh, right now what you've been asking for back down through the years. Have you ever thought of that? You've been asking for it. Sure you have. Everything that you have that you don't want, you've been asking for it. Maybe by neglect. Maybe by neglect, maybe you didn't tell the subconscious mind what you really wanted and it stocked up on a lot of stuff you didn't want. It works that way. Now here are some important factors in connection with your definite major purpose. <clears throat> First of all, it should represent your greatest purpose in life, the one single purpose which above all others you desire to achieve and the fruits of which you are willing to leave behind you as a monument to yourself. Now that's what your definite major purpose should be. I'm not talking about your minor purposes, now. I'm talking about your major overall purpose, your lifelong purpose. And believe me, friends, if you don't have an overall lifelong purpose, you're, wasting, you're just wasting the better portion of your life. <clears throat> the wear and tear of living is not worth the price you pay for it unless you really are aiming for something, unless you're going somewhere in life. Unless you're doing something with this opportunity here on this plane. I imagine you were sent over here to do something. I imagine you were sent over here with a mind capable of hewing out and attaining your own destiny. And if you don't attain that, if you don't use that mind, I imagine that uh, your life, to a large extent, will have been wasted from the viewpoint of the one who sent you over. Take possession of your mind. Aim high. Don't believe because... Uh, uh, in the past, you may not have achieved much you can't achieve in the future. Don't measure your future by your past. If you do, you're sunk. A new day is coming. You're going to be born again. You're setting up a new pattern. You're in a new world. You're a new person. Well, if not, why not? I intend that every one of you shall be born again. Mentally, physically, and maybe spiritually. A new aim, a new purpose, a new realization of your own individual power, and a new realization of your own dignity as a unit of mankind. If you ask me what I believe to be the greatest sin of mankind, I bet you'd be surprised at what my answer would be. What would yours be? What do you think the greatest sin of mankind is? The greatest sin of mankind is neglect to use his greatest asset. That's the greatest sin of mankind. It's bound to be that, because if you use that greatest asset, you'll have everything you want and you'll have it in abundance. You notice I didn't say you'll have everything within reason. I said you'd have everything you want and have it in abundance. I didn't put any qualifying words in there. You're the only one that can put qualifying words in there as to what you want. You're the only one that can set up limitations for yourself. Nobody else can do it for you. Unless you let them. Your major purpose, or some portion of it, should remain a few jumps ahead of you at all times as something to which you may look forward with hope and anticipation. Now, if you ever catch up with your major purpose and attain it, then what? What are you going to do there? Get another one. Get another one. Of course you... And you will have learned, by having attained your first one, that uh, you can attain a major purpose, and the chances are when you select your per next one, you'll make it a bigger objective than you did your first one. If your objective is to acquire material riches, why well, don't aim for too high for the first year. Get a, work out a 12 months plan within reason, and watch how easily you can attain it, and then next year, double it. Then next year, double that. 
One's major purpose should keep a few jumps ahead of him. What's the purpose of that? Why not uh, lay out a definite purpose that you can catch up with, uh, well, just tomorrow, say? Well, now, obviously, if you do that, your definite major purpose is not going to be very extensive, is it? And you're not going to have the fun of pursuit. <laughs> uh, do you, you know, the fun of pursuit is a great thing. If you found success, or if you found your objective, uh, then there's no fun in it, but you have to turn around and start after something else. Life is less interesting when one has no definite purpose to be attained other than that of merely living. The hope of future achievement in connection with a major purpose is among the greatest of man's pleasures. Sorry is the man indeed who's caught up with himself and no longer has anything to do. I've found a lot of them. They're all miserable. No, you've got to keep active. Keep doing something. Keep working. Keep an objective ahead of you. One's major purpose may, and it generally does, consist of that which can be attained only by a series of day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month and year-to-year -year steps. Because it is something which should uh, be so designed as to consume an entire lifetime of endeavor. It should harmonize with one's occupation, business, or profession, for each day's work should enable one to come one day nearer to the attainment of his major purpose in life. I, I feel sorry, indeed I feel sorry, for the individual who is just working day in and day out in order to have something to eat and some clothes to wear and a place to sleep. I, I feel sorry for that kind of a person that has no, no aim beyond, just enough to exist on. I can't imagine anybody in this class satisfying himself sitting down with an existence. I think you want to live. I think you want abundance. I think you want everything that's necessary for you to do the thing you want to do in life including money. One's major purpose and may and it generally does consist of that which can be attained only by a series of day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month steps. Now, remember that when you start in pursuit of your definite major purpose. One's major purpose may consist of many different combinations of lesser aims, such as the nature of one's occupation, which should be something of his own choice. When you come to write out your definite major purpose, you write it out like the planks in the platform. Number one, so-and-so. Number two, so-and-so. And somewhere along there, right near the head, be sure that you include in your definite major purpose perfect harmony between yourself and your mate. You think that's important? Do you know of anything more important than that? Do you know of anything, any human relationship more important than that of a man and his wife? No, of course you don't. I'll answer that one for you. <laughs> Nobody does. And have you ever heard of a, a relationship of man and wife where there was not harmony? Have you ever seen a thing like that? <laughs> you have, huh? Yes, yeah, so I'll answer that for you too. I know you have. It's not pleasant, is it? Not pleasant even to be around people who are not in step with one another. Well, you can be har harmonious. And there is where you ought to start applying your mastermind relationship first. Your wife or your husband should be your first mastermind ally. Maybe you'll have to go back and court him or her over again, but all right, that's nice too. I don't know of anything I ever did in my life, but I enjoyed as much as courting. It's a wonderful experience. <laughs> go back and court the gal over again, or the man. It's a wonderful experience. Or if you're not on the right kind of terms with your business associate or your fellow uh, worker or your, the people you uh, work with every day, go back and rededicate yourself to the business of striking out on a new basis. You know, you'll be surprised at what a little confession on your part will do. Wonderful thing. The confession is really a marvelous thing. Most people claim they have too much pride to confess their weaknesses. I tell you, it's a good thing to get, that out, get some of your weaknesses out of your system by confession. Acknowledge that maybe you're not perfect, you're, or well, nigh perfect, but not entirely perfect. <laughs> maybe the other fellows say, well, come to think about it, neither am I. And then you're off to the races. Rededicate yourself to a better relationship with the people that you come into contact every day, whoever they may be. What a wonderful thing it is. You can do that. You can handle it. You can handle it. I know you can. You know most of these inharmonies in human relations are due to the neglect of people. You just neglect to build up your human relations. You could do it if you wanted to do it.
and the budgeting of uh, income and expenses so as to provide for the accumulation of a definite amount for old age and security, the security of loved ones and so forth, and the budgeting of time so as to provide whatever income that is necessary to support one's plan for the attainment of a definite major purpose. That should be a part of your definite major purpose. Write out your, your platform of life and include that down under these minor purposes the things that are related to your major purpose, the things that you're going to have to get in the step-by-step -step movement up toward your major purpose. And a definite plan for developing harmony in all of your relations, and especially these, in the home where one works, where one plays or relaxes. The human relationship plank is the most important one in connection with one's major aim, since the aim is attainable very largely through the cooperation of others. Had you ever thought of that, that the things that you do in life, if they're worthwhile, have to be done through harmonious cooperation with other people? And how are you going to get that harmonious cooperation if you don't cultivate people? If you don't understand them, if you don't make allowances for their weaknesses? Did you ever have a friend that appreciated you were trying to reform him or change his mind about something? Uh, do you like to have a friend come around and try to reform you? No, no, you don't. Nobody does. But there are certain things you can do for a friend by example. Uh, that's a mighty effective way of doing it. <laughs> but start in to tell a man where he's wrong. And chances are that he'll have business around the corner. The next time he sees you coming, he'll get on the other side of the street. In your human relations, you can develop a marvelous relationship, but you can't do it by criticizing people, harping upon their faults, because we all have faults. A better thing to do is to talk about a person's virtues and his good qualities. And I have never seen a person yet so lowly that he didn't have some good qualities. And if you'll concentrate upon those good qualities, that person on whom you're concentrating will go out of his way and lean over backwards to make sure that you're not disappointed. One should not hesitate to choose a major aim which may be, for the time being, out of his reach. For one may always prepare himself to attain pretty much any desired purpose in life. <clears throat> Certainly when I chose as my definite major purpose the organizing and taking to the world of the first practical philosophy of individual achievement, it was a way beyond my reach. And what do you think it was that kept me down through 20 years of unproductive effort of research? What do you think it was that kept me striving and struggling in face of the fact that the majority of people I knew were criticizing me? What do you think it was? I had to have an abundance of faith and I had to keep that faith alive by moving, moving always as if I knew in advance that I was going to complete the task that Mr. Carnegie assigned to me. There were times when... Uh, it looked as if what my friends were and relatives were saying about me was absolutely true. And in a sense it was that I was wasting my time. From their viewpoint and their measuring stick and their standards, I was wasting 20 years of my time. But from the viewpoint of the millions of people who have benefited and will benefit by my work during those 20 years, I was not wasting my time. You can't fail unless you think you can. If you think you can fail, then you can't. If you stay around me long enough, I'll get you so you're not going to think you can fail. You'll know you're not going to fail. Our greatest demonstration of the universal application of the principle of definiteness of purpose may be seen by observing how nature applies it as follows. And there is a great string of applications the way nature moves with definiteness of purpose. And ladies and gentlemen, if there is anything in this universe that's definite, it's the laws of nature. They don't deviate. They don't temporize. They don't subside. You can't go around them. You can't avoid them. And uh, however you can, learn their nature and adjust yourself to them and benefit by them. Nobody ever heard of the law of gravitation being suspended, not even for one fraction of a second. It never has been done and never will be. Because nature's whole setup throughout the whole universe, system of universes perhaps, is so definite that everything moves with precision, like clockwork. And if you want an example of the necessity of an individual's moving with definiteness, you only have to have a smattering of understanding of the sciences to see the way that nature does things. And then you'll have that example. 
and the orderliness of the universe and the interrelation of all of the natural laws, the fixation of all of the stars and planets in the immovable relationship to one another. Isn't it a marvelous thing to know that the astronomers can sit down and with a pencil and a few pieces of paper predetermine hundreds of years in advance the exact relationship of given planets and stars? right where they'll be with relationship to one another in advance. And you know they couldn't do that if there was not a purpose, a plan under which we're working. We want to find out what that purpose is as it relates to us as individuals. That's why you're in this course. That's why I'm teaching you. I'm giving you that little bit that I have picked up from life and from the experiences of men and from my own experience so that you will learn how to adjust yourself to the laws of nature in order that you may use those laws instead of allowing yourself to be abused by your neglect in using them. To me, one of the most horrible things to contemplate is the possible cessation of natural laws. Imagine all of the chaos, all of the stars and planets running together, why they'd make the H-bomb look like a firecracker if nature allowed her laws to be suspended, but she doesn't do that. She has very definite laws to go by. And you'll find that if you check these 17 principles, they check perfectly with all of the laws of nature. If you get over to that uh, <clears throat> principle of going the extra mile, you'll find that nature is, is profound in her application of the principle of going the extra mile. When she uh, produces blooms on the trees, she doesn't produce just enough to fill the trees. She produces enough to take care of all of the damages of the... <clears throat> winds and the storms. When she produces fish in the sea, she doesn't just produce enough to perpetuate the fish, she produces enough to feed the bullfrogs and the snakes and the alligators and all the other things that still have enough left to carry out her purpose. She has an abundance of things, overabundance. And also, she forces man to go the extra mile or else he'll perish. He would perish in one season if he didn't go the extra mile. If nature didn't compensate a man when he goes out and puts a grain of wheat in the ground by giving him back 500 grains to compensate him for his intelligence, why, we'd starve to death in one season. If you do your part, nature does her part, and she does it in abundance, in abundance, in superabundance. And one of the strange things about nature is that if you keep your mind focused on the positive side of life, it becomes greater than the negative side. Always does that. If you keep your mind on the positive side, it becomes greater than all of the negatives that may try to penetrate your mind and influence your life. Look around and you'll find examples, living examples all around you of people that you want to emulate and people you do not want to emulate. People that are failing and you'll be able to tell why they're failing. I dare say that from this time on, you'll be able to use this philosophy as a measuring stick and wherever you find a success or a failure, you'll be able to lay your finger right on the cause of it. Right on it. And that includes you too. First of all, the first premise is that the mastermind principle is the medium through which one may procure the full benefits of the experience, the training, the education, and the specialized knowledge and influence of others as completely as if their minds were in reality one's own. Isn't that a marvelous thing to contemplate? That whatever it is that you lack in education or in knowledge or in influence, you can always uh, obtain it through somebody who has it. The exchange of favors, the exchange of knowledge, is one of the greatest exchanges in the world. It's a very nice thing to engage in business where the exchange of money makes you a profit, but I would a whole lot rather exchange ideas with somebody, give a man an idea that he didn't have before and receive in return one that I didn't have, than I would do it, make an exchange of money. You, uh, of course, know that Thomas A. Edison was perhaps the greatest inventor the world has ever known. He was uh, dealing all the time with many uh, of the sciences, and yet he knew nothing at all about any of the sciences. You'd say it would be impossible for a man to succeed in any undertaking unless he were educated in that field. I was astounded when I first talked to Andrew Carnegie to hear him say that he personally didn't know anything about the making or the marketing of steel. And uh, I was so astounded at that statement, I said, well, Mr. Carnegie, just what is your uh, part in this job here? What, what part do you play? Well, he said, I'll tell you the part that I play. My job is to keep the members of my mastermind alliance working in a state of perfect harmony. 
And I said, is that all you have to do? He said, well, have you ever tried to get any two people to agree on anything for three minutes in, in, in succession in your life? I said, well, I don't know that I have. Well, you said, you try it someday to see just what kind of a job it is. To get people to work together in the spirit of harmony is one of the greatest of uh, human achievements. And then Mr. Carnegie went on to uh, break down his mastermind uh, group to describe each one individually to tell what part he played. One was his uh, metallurgist, one was his chief chemist, one was his uh, plant works manager, and one was his legal advisor, one was the chief of his financial staff, and so on down the line. There were over 20 of those men working together whose combined education, experience, and knowledge constituted all there was known about the making and the marketing of steel at that time. And Mr. Carnegie said it wasn't necessary for him to know about it. He had men all around him who did understand the making and the marketing of steel. And that was his job, to keep them working in perfect harmony. And the second premise, an active alliance of two or more minds in a spirit of perfect harmony for the attainment of a common objective stimulates each individual mind to a higher degree of courage than that which is ordinarily experienced and prepares the way for that state of mind known as faith. You know, in the, uh, driving an automobile, every so often the battery runs down, and you have to do something about it. You come out some morning, you step on the starter, and nothing happens. I know of people who get out of bed in the morning do the same thing. <laughs> nothing happens, except they feel badly, they don't want to put on their shoes, they don't want to get dressed, they don't even eat breakfast. Now, they, uh, they need a... Uh, what, what do they need? <laughs> need the batteries charged, of course, and they have to have a source for doing it. It's a mighty fine thing if a man gets up in the morning feeling like that and if he can have a little talk with his wife, for instance, and she's a good coordinator and she helps to charge his batteries. The chances are when he comes home that night, he will come home with all of the rabbit skins that he went out to get. And the third premise, a mastermind alliance properly conducted stimulates each mind in the alliance to move with enthusiasm, personal initiative, imagination, and courage to a degree far above that which the individual experiences when moving without such an alliance. In my own uh, early beginning, I had a mastermind alliance of three people. I had an alliance with, my, with Mr. Carnegie and with my stepmother. And we, through three people, nursed this philosophy through the stages when everybody else was laughing at me and making fun of me for undertaking to serve the richest man in the world for 20 years without any compensation. And uh, there was a whole lot of logic to what they were saying, because at that time I wasn't getting very much compensation out of it, in the way of money at least. There came a time, however, when the laughing was on the other side of the face. But that took a long time, and there was plenty of blood and tears shed, I'll assure you, before I got to the point at which I could laugh back when the people laughed at me. But the uh, relationship between we three people, my stepmother and Mr. Carnegie and myself, enabled me to offset all of this uh, fun making that was thrown at me by my relatives and my friends and everybody who knew who, what I was engaged in. Now, there are times, you know, when if you undertake anything above mediocrity, you're going to meet with opposition, you're going to meet with people who will charge you and uh, poke fun at you, and uh, most of them will be right close to you, some, some of them perhaps your own relatives. You need some source to which you can turn when you're going to aim above mediocrity to get your batteries charged and to keep them charged so that you won't quit and the going is hard and so you won't pay any attention when somebody criticizes you. You know, criticism falls off my back just like a water off a duck's back, or more than that, like a, a bullet off a rhinoceros' hide. <laughs> but I'm absolutely immune, absolutely immune to all forms of criticism. Whether it's friendly or unfriendly, it makes no difference to me whatsoever. I'm just immune, immune to it, that's all. And I became immune because of my relationship with certain people through whom I uh, built up an immunity under my mastermind alliance. If it had not been for the uh, relationship with my stepmother and Mr. Carnegie, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you folks tonight. You wouldn't be here as students of this philosophy, and this philosophy would not be spread all over the world, helping millions of people because I had a million opportunities to quit, at least a million opportunities. And every one of them looked very alluring. And almost sometimes it seems as if I were stupid if I didn't quit. But this marvelous relationship, I could always go back to Mr. Carnegie, I could always go run into my stepmother and we'd sit down and have a little chat and she'd say, stand by your guns, you'll come out on top, I know you will. 
<clears throat> she once said, at a time when I didn't have two nickels to rub together, as my enemies were saying, she once said that you are going to be the richest member of the Hill family far and away. I know it. I, I can see it in the future. Well, uh, if you would uh, take all of my riches and put them together, I suspect that I have more riches than all of my uh, relatives put together for three generations back on both sides of the house. Uh, that's true. And my stepmother could see that. She could see that what I was doing it was bound to make me rich. And I'm not, I don't have reference alone to uh, monetary riches. I have a reference to the, those higher and broader riches that you find when uh, you get to where you can render service to so many people. And the fourth premise, to be effective, a mastermind alliance must be active. It must be active. You can't just form an alliance with somebody and say, now that's it, we've got it. I'm lined up with this person, that person, the other person. We've got a mastermind alliance. It amounts to absolutely nothing until you become active. Every member of the alliance has got to step right in there and uh, start pitching. Mentally, spiritually, physically, financially, every way that is necessary. Uh, they must engage in the pursuit of a definite purpose and they must move with perfect harmony. Do you know the difference between perfect harmony and ordinary harmony? Do you know what it is? How many of you know the difference between perfect harmony and ordinary harmony? How many of you have ever had a relationship of perfect harmony with anybody? I'll tell you the truth. I suspect that I have had uh, harmonious relationships with about as many people, maybe more people, than any person living today, beyond any question of it out. But I want to tell you that perfect harmony in relationship is about the rarest thing in the world. And I think I could count on the fingers of my two hands all of the people that I now know with whom I have a relationship of perfect harmony. I have a speaking acquaintance, a very nice, polite speaking acquaintance with a lot of people, but that's not perfect harmony. I have a working alliance with a lot of people. That's not harmony, perfect harmony. Perfect harmony consists only when your relationship to the other fellow is such that uh, if he wanted everything you have, you would willingly turn it over to him. Now, it takes a lot of unselfishness to put yourself in that frame of mind. Mr. Carnegie stressed time and time again the importance of this relationship of perfect harmony because he said if you don't have perfect harmony in your mastermind alliance, it's not a mastermind alliance after all, it's just, a, it's just cooperation or coordination of effort. Without this factor of harmony, the alliance may be nothing more than ordinary cooperation or friendly coordination of effort. The mastermind gives one full access to the spiritual powers of the other members of the alliance. I want you to underscore that part in your notes. The mastermind gives one full access to the spiritual powers of the other members of his alliance. I'm not talking now about just the mental powers or the financial powers, but the spiritual powers. The feeling that you have when you begin to establish permanency in your mastermind relationship is going to be one of the most outstanding and pleasant experiences of your entire life. When, that, when, when you're engaged in a mastermind activity, I want to tell you that you have so much faith, you know that you can do anything that you start out to do. You have no doubts, you have no fears, you have no limitations. And that's a marvelous frame of mind to be in. And the sixth premise... Yeah, yes, I just want to know if you're following me. <laughs> it is the fifth. It is a matter of established record that all individual successes based upon any kind of achievement above mediocrity are attained through the mastermind principle and not by individual effort alone. Just imagine how little you could accomplish if you didn't have the cooperation of other people. Suppose that you're in a profession. Suppose you're a dentist or a lawyer or a doctor or a osteopath or anybody in the profession. And suppose that you didn't understand how to convert each one of your clients or patients into uh, a salesman for yourself. Imagine how long would it take to build, to build up a clientele or a following. The outstanding professional men understand how to make a salesman out of every person that they serve. And they do it all by indirection. They don't uh, go about it directly. They do it by going the extra mile, by going out of their way to be of unusual service. But they do make salesmen out of all of their clients. Most successes are the result of personal power, and personal power of sufficient proportions to enable one to rise above mediocrity is not possible without the application of the mastermind principle. Now, during the first term of Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House, I had the privilege of 
working with him as a confidential advisor, and it was I who laid out the skeleton of the propaganda plan that took the words business depression off of the, out of the headlines of the papers and substituted in their stead business recovery. Those of you who remember what happened on that Black Sunday when we had a meeting down at the White House when the banks were closed the following Monday morning, remember how, what a stampede there was in this country. People were lined up in front of the banks all over the country to draw out their deposits. They were scared to death. They had lost confidence in their country, in their banks, in themselves, in everybody else. I suppose they still had some confidence in God, but they didn't show much signs of it. It was a scary time, I'll tell you. And uh, we sat down there and worked out a skeleton of a plan of procedure that created one of the most outstanding uh, applications of the mastermind that this nation has ever seen, and I doubt that any nation on earth has ever had the equal of it. Because it was only a matter of weeks until we had taken all that fear out of people. It was only a matter of days until salesmen on the road who uh, had uh, run out of funds, who couldn't get money, were laughing about it, not in any way scared about it. My own funds were closed up. I had no money, none at all. I had a... I, oh, yes, I did. Have. <laughs> I must tell you, this is funny. I got very smart when I found out what was coming, and I ran down to the bank and got a $1,000 bill. Well, I might just as well have had only 10 cents. Nobody would, could change it. It wasn't worth a nickel. Not a nickel. But I wasn't scared because everybody else was the same boat that I was in. But something had to be done about it, and uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was a great leader. He had great imagination. He had great courage. And here's what we did. First of all, we got both houses of Congress working in harmony with the president. The first time in the history of this nation that both houses of Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, got behind the president and forgot about what their political faiths happened to be. In other words, there were no Democrats, there were no Republicans, they were just Americans down there backing the president everything that he needed in order to stop that stampede of fear. I have never seen anything to equal it in my life. I never hope to see it again. I would wish I could, but I don't hope to. Because there was a great emergency on then and something had to be done about it. And second, the majority of the newspaper publishers of America, everything that we set out, the newspapers published it. They gave it marvelous space. And then the uh, radio station operators, uh, they uh, gave us marvelous help, uh, despite their political bleeps. And the churches, all denominations, all that was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in this country. Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, and all of the rest, pulling together as Americans. I want to tell you, it was a wonderful sight. A wonderful sight. What a wonderful thing it was. They all got behind the president. Every one of them made some sort of a contribution toward reestablishing faith in the people of this country. But during these uh, hectic days, I want to tell you that there wasn't any doubt in the minds of the majority of the people. I, I don't know, I didn't come in contact with anybody who didn't think that Mr. Roosevelt was the only man, the finest man that could possibly have handled that chaotic condition. And uh, don't uh, get me wrong politically. I'm just talking about a great man who did a great job at a time when it needed to be done. And he did it because he had a mastermind alliance work out there that was uh, unbeatable. Now let's take up, uh, take up the different kinds of mastermind alliances that you may have. First of all, there are alliances for purely social or personal reasons, consisting of one's relatives, friends, and religious advisors, where no material gain is sought. The most important of this type is the mastermind alliance which may exist between a man and his wife. I couldn't emphasize, uh, if, I had the, if I were brilliant and if I had the great magnetic powers, I couldn't overemphasize the importance to you who are married of going to work immediately and rededicating that marriage to a mastermind alliance based upon this lesson tonight. It'll bring joys into your life that you never dreamed of. It'll bring success into your life that you never dreamed of. It'll bring health into your life that you never dreamed of. It's a perfectly marvelous thing when the real mastermind alliance exists between a man and his wife. I don't know of anything that equals it. And then there are alliances for business or professional advancement consisting of individuals who have a personal motive of a material or a financial nature connected with the object of their alliances. Now, I imagine that the majority of you who are in this class now will be forming your first mastermind alliances for purely economic or financial 
advancement purposes. And that's perfectly legitimate. That's one of the reasons why you're taking this course. You want to improve your, your economic and financial condition. And uh, you should start in immediately now to, to form a mastermind alliance for that purpose. And if you only have, can find to begin with one person, that's all right. Start out with one. And then look around until the two of you select another one. Now, you can't select another one, but the two of you. When you go to select the third party, be sure that the, one, the second one that you've already selected is in accord. You understand that? That's important. And then when you go to select the fourth, the three of you then will pass on the fourth. And you'll uh, go over the matter very carefully before you make him a member of the alliance. And then when you go to select the fifth, the four of you will select the fifth. You see, in the mastermind alliance, there's no such thing as one person dominating, except in this respect that, generally speaking, one person is the leader. He's the coordinator and the leader, but he in no way undertakes to dominate his uh, associates. Because the very moment you start to dominate anybody, you find resistance and rebellion. Even though it's not open rebellion, it's, re it's rebellion nevertheless. And in the Mastermind Alliance, it must be one continuous spirit of perfect harmony where you move and act as if you were only one mind. The American system of free enterprise is another example of efficiency through the Mastermind Principle. This system is the envy of the world because it has raised the standard of living of the American people to an all-time high level. And that despite the fact that there's not perfect harmony. But there is motive, there is motive to the American system of free enterprise to inspire every individual to do his best. There is a motive there. And incidentally, more and more industry and business is coming to understand that uh, uh, they can go a step further and instead of just having cooperation or coordination of effort between management and the workers, that they can have the mastermind principle by sharing uh, the management problems, by sharing uh, profits, by sharing everything. And wherever I have... Uh, been successful in influencing any business to adopt that policy, the business has made more money than it ever made before, and the employees have, been, have received more wages, and everybody's happy. General instructions for the farming and the maintenance of a mastermind alliance. First, adopt a definite purpose as an objective to be attained by the alliance, choosing individual members whose education, experience, and influence are such as to make them of the greatest value in achieving the purpose. A lot of times I'm asked by students, how, what is the most favorable number for a mastermind alliance? And how do you go about selecting the, uh, uh, the right uh, sort of people for your mastermind alliance? And the nearest answer that I can give you that is that the procedure is exactly the same as if you were starting into a business and you were choosing employees. What kind of an employee would you choose? Marvelous. I see the sparks flying. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Dependability at the top of the list. If a person is not dependable, I don't want any part of him in a business transaction. No part of him, no matter how brilliant he may be, no matter how well educated he may be, the more educated he is, the more dangerous he may be if he's not dependable. And if he's not loyal, I would say the same thing. If an individual is not loyalty to those to whom he owes loyalty, then to me he has no character whatsoever and I want no part of him. Dependability and loyalty, and then after that comes what? Ability to do the job. Ability. Look, notice where I place ability, down at third place. I, I'm not interested in the man's ability until I find out whether he's dependable and whether he is loyal. And then what would you say came after that in my uh, category, my book of rules? Number four, positive mental attitude, of course. What good is a negative uh, wet blanket around you? Why, uh, you could pay him to stay away and then be ahead of the game. And number five, what would that be? Going the extra mile, that is right. And number six, What would you say that is? Faith. <laughs> Applied faith. <laughs> now let me tell you, when you find people that come up to all of those six traits, I want to tell you, you've really found somebody. You're in the presence of royalty. Some businesses, if you're only running a peanut stand or two, you maybe need only one person. But if you're running a chain of peanut stands, you might need a hundred persons. 
And then uh, as to the qualifications of a mastermind ally, first of all, take those six points that I gave you, and there are the qualifications. There are the qualifications for your mastermind. There must be dependability. There must be uh, loyalty. Must be ability. Must be a positive mental attitude. Must be able to, willing to go the extra mile. Applied faith. Applied faith. Now there you are. If you want to know what the quality, qualifications of your mastermind allies are, there it is. And don't settle for anything less. If you find a man that has five of those qualities and does have, doesn't have all six of them, you better beware of him before you start. Because they're all essential in a mastermind relationship. You can ch check very carefully and see that that's true. You couldn't have perfect harmony unless you were working with somebody who checked 100% on all of those six points. You just couldn't have a mastermind alliance. You might have a working arrangement like so many people do, but it wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't embrace all of the potential values of the mastermind. Next, uh, determine what appropriate benefit each member may receive in return for his cooperation in this alliance. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, nobody ever does anything for nothing. No, they never do. Uh, you say when you uh, give love to somebody, you don't to get anything out of that? You don't do that for nothing? Well, let me tell you something. You get plenty out of that. Because to have had the privilege of loving is a great privilege. And even though the love is not returned, you still have had the benefits of that state of mind of known as love. And you've enjoyed the development and growth as a result of it. No, there's no such thing as something for nothing. Nobody works without a some sort of a compensation. There are very many uh, different forms of compensation. So don't expect that your master mind allies are going to jump in and help you make a fortune or help you do anything unless they are equally participating in the benefits that come out of that master mind alliance. Now there's the criterion by which you go. They must approximately, each individual must approximately benefit equally with yourself, whether it's a monetary benefit or a a happiness or peace of mind benefit, a social benefit, or whatever it happens to be. Never ask anybody to do anything, if you want to be sure of his doing it, unless you give him us an adequate motive for doing it. If I went down to the bank and wanted to borrow $10,000, what would be an adequate motive for the bank lending me that money? Two, two motives. All of them under the heading of uh, desire for financial gain. Now, they'd want to, the bank would be delighted to loan me as much money as I could take away if I give them free-for-one security. Collateral. <laughs> uh, collateral. They want collateral, and they want the profit on that loan. That's what they're in business for. Now, there are other uh, transactions not based upon the monetary motive. For instance, when the man asks the girl of his choice to marry him, what's the motive there? Love. Oh, uh, sometimes. <laughs> 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 Theoretically, a love, yes. Animal magnetism. Money. <laughs> well, isn't this interesting? <laughs> I bet out of the, all the people sitting here, everyone would have a different, uh, a different idea or definition as to what the motive is when uh, a man asks the girl of his choice to marry him and she accepts. Why does she accept him? <laughs> I want to tell you that when, when my father brought my stepmother home, he was just a farmer. And he never had had on a white shirt or a tie. He, wouldn't, uh, he was afraid of white shirts and ties. He wore blue cotton shirts. And my stepmother was a college woman. She was well educated. And uh, they were as different as the North Pole and, and the South Pole. And I wondered all of my life until one day uh, just how he happened to be able to sell himself to her. Of course, she cleaned him up and put a white shirt on him and made him look like somebody, but nevertheless, it took her a lot, quite a little while to do it. And uh, she finally got him into the money, and he became an outstanding man. And I, at that point, I said to her one day, oh, how in the world did my father, I, I remember what he looked like and what he talked like. He, he uh, abused the Queen's English. <laughs> says, I've seen him coming and I've done my duty <laughs> and all that sort of thing. I said, how in the world did, you, did he ever sell himself to you? What was the motive? She said, well, I'll tell you. First of all, I recognized that he had good blood in his veins and that he had possibilities and I believed that I could bring them out. And she did bring them out. Mrs. Henry Ford and Mrs. Thomas A. Edison are two of the outstanding examples that I use time and time again to show what a woman can do to make her husband successful. 
Had it not been for Mrs. Ford's understanding of the mastermind principle, although she didn't call it by that name, Mr. Ford would never have been known. The Ford automobile never would have been here. And I doubt if the automobile industry would have been ushered in as it has been. It was Mrs. Ford, more than it was Mr. Ford, that kept him going, kept him alert, kept him uh, filled with confidence in himself when the going was hard and when other people were criticizing him in connection with his uh, contraption, as they called it, that was only designed to scare horses. Just as I was uh, criticized for fooling away my time with the richest man in the world working for nothing. Mrs. Ford sustained him through those trying hours when the going was hard. And uh, all of you will uh, experience that period in your life. The going is hard at some place with everybody. Now, a lot of times a woman will marry a man because she sees that he has possibilities. He can do something with him, make something out of him. Sometimes it's monetary consideration. Sometimes it's love. Sometimes it's one thing and sometimes another. But every time anybody engages in any transaction, there is a motive back of it. You may be sure of that. And whatever it is that you want anybody to do, pick out the right kind of a motive and find it in the mind in, under the proper circumstances and you'll become a master salesman. Next, establish a definite plan through which each member of the alliance will make his contribution in working toward the achievement of the object of the alliance and arrange a definite time and place for the mutual discussion of the plan. Indefinite this year will bring defeat. Keep a regular means of contact between all members of your alliance. Did you hear, ever hear of a, a great friendship existing? Well, let me rephrase that. Have you ever had a great friendship with somebody and then uh, suddenly saw it uh, grow cold and then finally die? Have you, how, how many have had that experience? Of course, most of us have, to be sure. And what do you think was the reason for it? Neglect. That's all. Neglect. If you have a very close and very dear friends, the only way you can keep them is to keep in contact. Constantly. It's nothing but an occasional postal card. I have one student who was a member of my class in 1928 in New York City. And she never has missed a single one of my birthdays to send me a card. One time she was off on her uh, vacation and uh, uh, she forgot it until mid-afternoon of my birthday and she sent me a telegram congratulating me on my birthday. In other words, she has been the most constant student that I've ever had out of the many thousands all over the country. Well, as a result of that uh, uh, close attention that she's given me, uh, there have been times when I've been able to help her in a business way too. The last time I got her promotion, it was about, about, to about $4,000 a year which is quite a little bit of payoff for the business of keeping in contact. Quite a nice bit of payoff. But you have to keep in contact with your mastermind allies. You have to have regular meeting places. You have to keep them active. If you don't, they uh, grow cold or grow indifferent, and finally they're of no value to you. If you had a definite major purpose, knew exactly what you wanted to do, had a mastermind alliance of people that could help you do it, and then had the sufficient faith to keep you going uh, while you did it, don't you see that would be about all you would need? Why then do we need the 14 additional principles, do you suppose? Well, I'll tell you why. We need 14 additional principles to, uh, in, to induce you to make use of these three. <laughs> you need personal initiative. You need uh, imagination. You need enthusiasm. In other words, uh, this philosophy is something like baking a cake. When you go to bake a cake, you don't uh, put in just one ingredient. You put in a pinch of this and a pinch of that and a dash of the other thing, and uh, then you put it in the stove and bake it. And if you took out any one of those ingredients, you wouldn't have uh, the same kind of a cake. And it's the same way with this philosophy. You can't leave out any one of these 17 principles. It'd be just like taking a link out of a chain. You wouldn't have a chain anymore. You'd have two parts of a chain, but not a whole chain. And these are the 14 principles, our supporting principles, are these three. Faith is a state of mind that has been called the mainspring of the soul through which one's aims, desires, plans, and purposes may be translated into their physical or financial equivalent. And here are the fundamentals of faith. Now, when you speak of applied faith, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about something vastly different from just mere belief. Applied, the word applied means what? Action. That's the action part of faith. And without action, uh, uh, faith is nothing but just daydreaming. And there are a lot of people, you know, who believe in things, but they don't do anything about them. 
They are engaging only in daydreaming. Applied faith is an active faith. Now, uh, the fundamentals of faith are, first of all, definiteness of purpose, supported by personal initiative and action. Action, action. The more action, the better. It means continuous action. Not only on your part, but on the part of those that uh, may be cooperating with you or may be mastermind allies of yours. And next, a positive mind, free from all negatives, such as fear, envy, hatred, jealousy, and greed, is essential. Mental attitude determines the effectiveness of faith. Mental attitude. Did you know that that is a fact? The frame of mind that you're in when you go to pray determines the, uh, what happens as a result of that prayer. There's no two ways about that. You can test it for your own selves and find out. I have no doubt you have. I have no doubt that you've had the experiences I've had of uh, sending out prayers that didn't produce anything but a negative result. You've had that experience, haven't you? How many of you have had that experience? Oh, come on now, be modest. <laughs> Do you suppose there ever was anybody that didn't have that experience at one time or another? I want to tell you that uh, when you go to prayer, unless you have such absolute faith that whatever you are going after, that you're going to acquire, that you can see it in advance in your possession before you start asking for it, the chances are that the effect of your prayer is going to be negative. And next, a mastermind alliance with one or more people who radiate courage based on faith and are suited mentally and spiritually to one's needs in carrying out a given purpose. I'm talking to you now about the elements or the constituent parts or the premises that go into the business of applied faith. And next, recognition of the fact that every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent benefit and temporary defeat is not failure until it has been accepted as such. Do you know where the majority of people fall down in connection with their application of their faith? It's when they're defeated, and they accept that defeat as being something they can't do anything about. Instead of uh, beginning immediately to uh, search for that seed of an equivalent benefit that's in every defeat, they, be they become moody and broody, they become discouraged, they uh, build up uh, inferiority complexes instead of uh, reversing that order and using that uh, defeat as some, nothing more than temporary and uh, making another effort. And next, the habit of affirming one's definite major purpose in the form of a prayer at least once daily. Now, the subconscious mind only knows what you tell it or what you allow other people to tell it or what you allow the circumstances of life to tell it. And it doesn't know the difference between a lie and the truth. It doesn't know the difference between a penny and a million dollars. It accepts the things that you send over. And if you send over a predominating thoughts on poverty and ill health and failure, that's exactly what you'll get. No, um, no matter how much faith that you may have later on, you find out that uh, the subconscious responds to the mental attitude that you're maintaining during the day. And it's necessary for you to affirm over and over again the objects that you are going to attain in life until you educate your Subconscious mind to attract automatically to you the things that are related to what you're aiming to attain in life. You'll find that your mind is like an electromagnet. And once you charge it with a clear picture of what you want, it'll attract to you from the highways and the byways, the things that you need to carry out that purpose. And next, recognition of the existence of infinite intelligence that gives ordinalness to the entire universe. That the individual, you that is, is a minute expression of this intelligence. And as such, you the individual. Your mind has no limitations except those accepted or set up in your own mind. Your mind has no limitations whatsoever. Except those that you allow to be established there or that you deliberately set up in your own mind or accept. Now that's a pretty broad statement, isn't it? But uh, the achievements of men... Uh, like Mr. Edison and Mr. Ford and Mr. Carnegie and Napoleon Hill, if you please, certainly definitely supports the idea that there is no limitation except that which you set up in your own mind. And if I had ever wavered for one second from the time that I started with Mr. Carnegie up until the time I gave this philosophy to the world, if I had wavered one second in my belief that I would do it, I would never have done it. How did I happen to do it? Do you have any idea what, was the, what played the strongest part in what I've achieved? It wasn't my brilliancy. It wasn't my outstanding intelligence. I have no more brilliancy than the average person, and no more intelligence than the average person. But there was something in there that uh, was responsible for it.
Five. <laughs> Grand. In other words, I believed I could do it and I never stopped believing it. The harder the going was, the more I believed I would do it. And I want to tell you that if you can take that attitude toward yourself, if you can throw yourself over on the, on the side of yourself, so to speak, when you're overtaken by adversity, when people are against you, if you can do that, if you can stand by and not also go over against yourself, then you're using applied faith. And you've got to do that. Do you know there are testing times for people? Had you ever thought of that? Nobody is permitted to attain high state in life and stay there without being tested. Any more than anybody is allowed to go into a well-managed business and go up to a high position and stay there without he's been tested with lower position step by step until he earns the right to be up to the top. I don't know how the creator runs his business entirely, but I can see, uh, I can catch a pretty good idea of how he does it from observing that part which I can understand. Of course, there's much more that I can't understand. But I can see definitely that he allows nobody to attain to a high estate in life without giving him severe testings. And one of the most astounding things that I found in my research was that the men of great achievement in all walks of life back down through the ages were great only in proportion as they had been defeated and as they had met with opposition. Now that's an astounding thing. It couldn't have been a coincidence that every one of these outstanding men was great in proportion exactly as he had been small and as he had been opposed and as he had had to struggle. I used to tell of my early struggles and tell of some of my defeats. My business management got after me about it and said it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> I still think it's a good idea. I think it's a fine idea because if you only knew the amount of major defeats that I've met with and still kept my head above water and still lived to deliver this philosophy, you'd say that if a hill can do it, I can do it too. And that was the only reason, of course, that I ever spoke of it. The habit of affirming one's definite major purpose in the form of a prayer at least daily and the recognition of infinite intelligence. Now, I don't mind what terms you use. You can call that God, or you can call it Jehovah, or you can call it Buddha, or you can call it Muhammad. Anything you want to. No matter what you call it, we're all talking about one, the first cause. There isn't two first causes. There's only one. There couldn't be two. There's one first cause that's responsible for this great universe we're living in, for you and for me and for everything that's in the universe. I call it infinite intelligence because uh, I have uh, students of all faiths and all religions all over the world as my students. And the infinite intelligence happens to be a sort of a neutral in-between term that nobody can object to. Nobody at all. But unless you, unless you not only believe in that, unless you can prove to yourself, unless you can absolutely put down on paper uh, evidence that there is a first cause that you can draw on, why then you are not going to be able to make the fullest use of applied faith. One of my students asked me one day if, uh, about my concept of God, about my concept of infinite intelligence, and if I meant the same thing as God. I said, why, yes, I do. Well, he said, uh, can you prove the, in the existence of your concept of God? I said, why, everything in the universe is the finest of the evidence of the existence of it because of the orderliness of the universe. Everything's orderly, from the electrons and protons of the smallest part of a mat matter on up to the largest suns that float through the heavens. Everything's in orderliness. No chaos, no running together of the planets. Why, there's more evidence of a first cause than there is of anything that I know of. And if you don't believe that, if you don't accept it, if you don't see it, if you don't feel it, if you don't know that, then you won't know that you are a minute part of that infinite intelligence expressing through your brain. And if you once recognize that, then you recognize the truth of what I said, that your only limitations are those which you set up in your own mind or permit somebody to set up there or circumstances to establish for you. Next, careful inventory of your past defeats and adversities from which it becomes obvious that all such experiences do carry the seed of an equivalent benefit. Now, uh, just to hear me say that every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent benefit, that every defeat... Every failure carries with it the seed of an equivalent benefit. Uh, wouldn't mean a thing in the world to you. Unless I made application of it and gave you illustration after illustration, and unless you examine enough illustrations in your own experience to see that it always works out that way. That's why I want you to examine these adversities that come to you. Do you know that oftentimes uh, your adversities are your greatest blessings? Do you have any idea? Do you have any idea the greatest blessing that ever came into my life? Those of you who know considerable about me, would you have any idea what it is? Of course, it was the loss of my mother. 
And ordinarily, you would say that would be the greatest catastrophe that could over, overtake a child, would be to lose his mother at the age of nine years. Why do I say that was the greatest, greatest blessing? Because it brought me a new mother to take her place that's been responsible for everything that I've achieved, everything that I shall achieve. Very largely responsible, at least. And without her influence, I'd still be up there fighting rattlesnakes, drinking mountain liquor, and fighting feuds. <laughs> where my relatives still are doing that same thing. No reason to expect that I wouldn't be. <clears throat> I've had a lot of other adversities. And I want to tell you that without some 20 major adversities I've gone through with, I would never have been able to approve the soundness of this philosophy and that there is a seed of an equivalent benefit in every adversity. Can you imagine any worse adversity coming to a man than to walk down to the hospital and to be informed that his son was born without any sign of ears and that he would be a deaf and dumb mood all of his life? Can you imagine any worse th adversity than that? I will always be thankful that that happened because by my contact with infinite intelligence, he was uh, improvised with a hearing system of some sort that gave him 65% of his normal hearing and with a hearing aid, 100%. He's learned to live a normal life, and I got the greatest demonstration of my entire experience of the power of faith. I couldn't have gotten it any other way. I couldn't have gotten it secondhand. I had to get it firsthand. I never accepted that affliction of that child, not even before I saw him, not even after I saw him. I never accepted it. His relatives accepted it. They wanted to put him in the school of underprivileged where he learned the sign language learned to lip reading. I didn't want him to know there were such things. And when he got up to where he was old enough to go to school, I had a fight with the school authorities every year, just as regular as the time came around. They wanted to send him over to a school for underprivileged children, where he'd mix with the other children and see that there were afflictions. I didn't want him to know there were such things. And I taught him from the very beginning that his not having any ears was a great blessing. And he believed it. And it turned out to be because people took compassion on him. They did things for him they wouldn't have done otherwise. He got a, a job as a, a salesman for the Saturday Evening Post, and he led every salesman throughout the United States. Oftentimes, he'd go out with $5 worth of merchandise and come back with $10 in cash. <laughs> he did that many times. People would look at him and say, well, that poor little fellow, no ears out selling papers. I guess his parents are poor. <laughs> 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 Give him a dollar bill, and uh, instead of giving him back, uh, uh, he giving him back 95 cents, they say, oh, just Sonny, you just keep that. And very often, he'd get a dollar apiece for Saturday evening folks. <laughs> Not at all conscious today of any affliction. He's uh, living a perfectly normal life because I taught him that an affliction, any kind of an affliction, can be transmuted into a benefit. Now, that's an astounding thing, isn't it, to consider that that is true. But it is true. Now, as I said, uh, you're just hearing me say that won't mean a thing in the world unless you begin to look around in your own experiences, take inventory, and watch what happens in the future. There will be th things happen to you in the future that are unpleasant, and maybe some to me too. But uh, I tell you what I'm going to do when anything unpleasant happens to me, I'm going to immediately transmute it into something pleasant. Immediately. And then I'm still talking about the <clears throat> fundamentals of faith. A self-respect expressed through harmony with one's own conscience is certainly an important factor in applied faith. Self-respect expressed through harmony with one's own conscience. Isn't it the marvelous thing that the uh, Creator set up in everybody, a judge, advocate, that uh, tells you the right thing and the wrong thing? You don't have to ask anybody. Isn't that a marvelous thing? You don't have to ask anybody what's right or wrong. Your own conscience tells you unless you convert it into a conspirator instead of a cooperator by uh, choking it off and not responding to it, as so many people do. Your, your, your conscience can be not only a guide, but it can all be, also be corrupted to where it's a conspirator. It'll help you cover up your meanness. And a lot of people use it for just that purpose, too. Believe me, they have it choked off. If that weren't true, the, uh, there, there couldn't be so many brutes loose in the world today concocting plans for starting bigger and better wars. They have no conscience. They've killed off the conscience. That conscience is a marvelous thing. And next, uh, to create a mental attitude favorable for the expression of faith. Now, here's what you do. First of all, 
Know what you want and determine what you have to give in return for it. Know what you want in life. And I mean not only in your major purpose, but in your minor purposes. What kind of a house you want to live in? What kind of a car you want to drive? What kind of a wardrobe you want? What kind of an education you want your, your children to have? What kind of a present you're going to buy your wife for her birthday? And you better be sure to buy her one every time if you're going to keep on good terms with her. What kind of a cake are you going to bake for your husband on his birthday? And you better make it a good one. <laughs> did you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, married ladies and gentlemen in particular, did you know it's not the big things in, in the relationship between a man and his wife that counts? It's the little, the little niceties, the little things that count. Well, it's the little niceties, the little things, the little things that the, my, my wife cooks up for me. Now, I don't mean uh, in food, but the little parties, the little uh, visits, the trips that she cooks up for me when I'm home. They don't amount to so much in one way, and yet another way, they're very sentimental and keeps that uh, relationship alive that we had before, uh, before we were married. We're still courting each other. I think I do a more of a courting job now than I did before because, after all, I not only got her, I have to keep her. <laughs> don't we have a lot of fun with these off, off, off the cuff remarks that, not you don't find any of that in the notes at all but just <laughs> but I just know that these are very uh, super intimate uh, uh, things that make joy in my life would just as, uh, be just as acceptable in your life too I know it's the little things in your life that make the difference between the happiness and unhappiness And next, <clears throat> when you affirm the object of your desires through prayer, let your imagination see yourself already in possession of the thing that you're going after. Now that, uh, you might say, that takes a lot of willpower, a lot of determination, but uh, if you keep at it, it you'll find it's not uh, so hard to do. In the first place, it's easy for me to do that because I never go after anything that I haven't first sold myself thoroughly on the idea that I not only have the right to get it, but that I am going to earn that right by giving something in return. And that's the best salesmanship in the world. When you go out to sell a person an idea or a merchandise or a service, if you know positively that you're going to give him his money's worth and more too before you start, it does something to you that enables you to do something to him. That enables him to, in return, do something for you. It's the very acme of master salesmanship. You know, uh, I've said this, ladies and gentlemen, several times, and at the risk of being boresome to you, I'm going to repeat that if you want your prayers to be effective, don't wait until the time of need to utter them. Build up the habit of prayer when you don't need anything. And what do you pray for then? For what you already have. You give gratitude for what you already have, don't you? Wouldn't it be an interesting thing if I gave you a lesson assignment right now to write down before the night, before you go to bed tonight, everything that you have in this world to be thankful for? And I'm giving you that assignment, every one of you, and I want you to carry it out. It's going to be one of the surprises of your life. You may have a lot of things you don't want, but you have a lot of things you do want. Write down a list of them and express gratitude that you have these things that you like. And you certainly can start with the fact that you're associated here in a country where you have freedom of speech, freedom of action, freedom of thought, and freedom of opportunity. Certainly that would head the list. Because in other countries we don't have that much. And then you could come right on down from that and put down all the things that you have to be grateful for. And then start in expressing gratitude every night and every day. Uh, keep your mind open for guidance from within. Now, what do I mean by that, do you suppose? Yes, hunches. You get hunches. Don't be, uh, what is the word I want to use? Disrespectful. <laughs> Don't be disrespectful of hunches. Treat them with civility. Examine them. And you may find that some of these very unusual hunches that you come are bringing you messages that you need to get you over the hump in whatever it is that you're doing. And when you are inspired by hunches to move on some plan created by your imagination which leads in the direction of that which you desire, accept the plan and act upon it at once. And remember always that there can be no such state of mind as faith without appropriate action. Faith without deeds is dead. And when overtaken by defeat, as you may be many times, remember that man's faith is tested many times and your defeat may be only one of your testing times. Isn't that an astounding and an encouraging thing to recognize that when you're meeting with defeat that probably in the eyes of your creator, you're only being tested to see whether you're a man or a worm. And believe you me, we all go through that testing time. And the ones that survive these tests, 
and come out on top with an abiding faith are the ones that become truly great in life. I don't think there's any doubt in the world but what it's a part of the Creator's plan to see that everybody that amounts to anything above mediocrity must pay the price of undergoing test after test as to his faith. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I see evidence everywhere that that's true. Any negative state of mind will destroy the power of faith and result in a negative climax. Your state of mind is everything. Why do you suppose that... Uh, in my notes here, you notice that I have underscored your state of mind is everything. I underscored for emphasis. Why do you suppose I wanted to emphasize that state? That's right. That's the only thing you have control over. The only thing in this world that you have control over is your state of mind. And certainly that connotes. The fact that the Creator intended that to be the most important asset you, that you have, and it is, because with the use of that mind, you can project it into any objective or to the attainment of any end you choose. Your education, your background, your nationality, your creed, has nothing whatsoever to do with your ability to achieve. It's the state of mind that you maintain. That's the thing that determines how and what and when you achieve. To me, that's the most profound thing in all of the knowledge of mankind. The most profound of all knowledge is the fact that the humblest person can take possession of his own mind. He can color it any way he chooses. He can project it into high places or into the gutter. He can make it a success or he can make it a failure. Just the change of his mental attitude changes from success to failure almost instantly. A burning desire is the sort of material of which faith is created. Do you know what a burning desire is? <clears throat> That's right, obsessional desire. Um, obsessional means a desire that takes possession of you, obsesses you. Now, there are a lot of uh, <clears throat> desires in the world, but they're not burning desires, and they're not obsessional desires, and most people in their whole life never uh, express or never experience an obsessional desire for anything. We start out with uh, hopes, not too uh, definite, but faint hopes for things, then wishes. We wish for, everybody wishes for a lot of money without any having to work for it. Well, maybe not everybody, but of course my students don't. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people do, most people I'll say, wish for things, wish for a Cadillac when they're driving a Ford. If you want a Cadillac car and you uh, make up your mind to have it, get out and see that the men under you or the, or the job that you're holding and see that you put into it unless, uh, that which will entitle you to Cadillac car. But if you don't want a Cadillac car, the chances are you drive a Ford or something else the rest of your life. You have to want things. You have to want them with a burning desire. And then you have to do something about that burning desire. What is it? Action. Action. You've got to start in right where you stand, showing that you do have faith in your ability. Start right where you stand with action. Now, here's a lot of examples of men of achievement. I'm not going to go over them. You know them. But uh, there is one down here that I particularly want to call your attention to, that of Miss Helen Keller, who believed that she would learn to talk despite the fact that she had lost the use of her speech, her sight, and her hearing. Can you imagine that? Lost the use early in life of her speech, her sight, and her hearing. She couldn't hear, she couldn't see, and she couldn't speak. And yet... Did you know, of course you do know, that Miss Helen Keller became one of the best educated women in the world. She's in contact with more of public affairs and civic affairs and conditions all over the world than the nine-tenths of the women who have all of their senses. Isn't it an astounding thing? And all she has to go by is the vibration. Uh, if you speak to her, she uh, puts your fingers up to her lips and she can tell what you're, uh, you're saying by her fingertips. Entirely by vibration. Think with a, a woman with a handicap of that kind all the way through life, getting joy out of life, rendering useful service, making speeches. She's learned after a fashion to talk. Doing a great work where the majority of people would have uh, settled for a tin cup and a bunch of lead pencils on a street corner with any one of those afflictions. While I was on the staff of Franklin D. Roosevelt, I passed at the corner of Pennsylvania Avenue and the street running by the White House, every day I passed a man sitting there with a tin cup and some pencils. I became acquainted with that man. He had lost the use of his legs. He had the same affliction as Franklin D. Roosevelt, exactly. And it happened at about the same time. 
And I found out that he have, had even a better education than Franklin D. Roosevelt had. But out there he was, out there with a tin cup and pencils, trying to eke out a living by begging. There was a, just a block away, there was the man with the most important and responsible position in the whole world, running a great nation, who uh, also had lost the use of his legs, but he hadn't lost the use of his brain. He hadn't lost confidence in himself. These afflictions that come along, sometimes they turn out to be a great blessing. They teach us that, uh, very often they teach us that we can get along without an eye or without both eyes or without legs or without hands. We can get along without a lot of things if we have the right mental attitude toward what's left of us. That's important. If you would have faith, keep your mind on that which you want and not on that which you do not want. Now, how do you go about that? How does one go about keeping his mind off of the things he doesn't want? Look up that word transmute and see what it means. Look it up in the dictionary. You know in a general way, but look it up just for the, uh, because it will be more impressive in your subconscious mind. The way you keep your mind off of things you don't want is to transfer your mind over to things you do want and start talking about them. Start giving thanks for already possessing them. It sounds perfectly silly to anybody who doesn't know what you're doing. It won't sound silly to you because you know what you're doing. You're talking to your subconscious mind. You're re-educating yourself. You're keeping your mind fixed on things you want and off of the things you don't want. And in order to do that, you have to keep, you have to keep talking. You have to keep thinking. You can't talk without thinking. Well, some people can, but most of them can't. <laughs> Keep on talking about things you want. And if you ever feel blue or discouraged or lacking in courage, I'll tell you a good remedy for it. May I? Yes. Sit down and take a tablet and start numbering, number one, the thing that you want most in life. Number two, the thing that you want next most. Number three, the thing you want next most. And when it gets down to the kind of a house you live Describe the lot that you want it on, whether you want it on a lot of acreage, on top of the hill, or down below the road, or above the road, how many rooms you want that house to have, how you want each room furnished. Why, you have a grand time furnishing those rooms. <laughs> well, that'll be the one of the most, well, it'll be better than window shopping. Because you can go the limit in your own mind, and window shopping, you only have two legs, you can only walk so far. Do a little mental window shopping. And believe you me, you get to, you'll get your mind off of that moodiness, you'll get it onto something that's constructive, and you'll be educating your subconscious mind to keep on the right side of the street and away from the other side of the railroad tracks. The assignment I'm giving you now is not foolish. It's not facetious. It's a real assignment, and you'll get real joy out of doing it. Start right in doing something physically, writing down the things that you want when anything bothers you. I don't know why it is that when a person makes up his mind what he wants and becomes determined to get it, that the whole powers of the universe seem to come to his aid to see that he gets it. I don't know why that is, but I'll tell you one thing, I know that it is, and that's enough for me. There are a lot of things in this world that I can see, and a lot of advantages I can use that I don't understand, but I don't need to understand them. I know which button to press to get the result I want, and I don't need to know how, what happens between the pressing of that button and the result that happens. I know that if you follow the instructions in this philosophy, I know that you'll be able to take possession of your own mind. You'll be able to get the things out of life that you want. You'll be able to make life pay off on your own terms. I know that. How would I know, do you suppose, that any person can actually make life pay off point by point on his own terms instead of accepting the circumstances? How, do, how would I know that? There is only one way in this world that I could possibly know that, and that's by my own experiences. I can tell you as sincerely as I'm standing here on this platform talking to you tonight, there isn't a blessed thing in this world that I want that I don't have or can't get easily. Not anything. What an astounding statement that is. If you go back just a few years ago, uh, what an astounding statement it is because it's so broadly in contrast to what I might have said a, a few years back before I'd learned the secret of getting everything that I want. Do you know there was a time when I was carrying around in my own pocket the matches with which I was setting my house of opportunity afire and didn't know it. And I finally got rid of those matches. I began to build that house of opportunity. And I commenced to find out that uh, the house uh, resembled the picture of it that I built in my mind, uh, right down to the finest detail. Well, there's no such thing as a blanket faith. You must have a definite objective, a purpose, a goal before you can have faith in anything. Faith is a mental attitude wherein the mind is cleared of all fears and doubts and directed toward the attainment of something definite 
through the inspiration of infinite intelligence. Faith is guidance. It is nothing more. Had you ever thought about that? Faith is guidance. It's nothing more than that. Faith's not going to go out and get you that Cadillac or that mink coat or that new house that you want or that better job or that better business or all those clients that you need if you're a professional. Faith's not going to do that. But faith will guide you as to how you can do it. And you'll find that there is always a part that you must play. The Creator has wisely arranged it so that we can produce our food from the soil of the earth. Everything that we eat, use, or wear comes from the earth. Everything. And uh, infinite intelligence has very wisely provided a system whereby you can uh, be sure of getting your food out of the soil of the earth. How? By complying with the laws of nature. You go out there and you plant the seed. You plant it in soil that you have examined to make sure it has the elements in there that you want into the plant. You plant it at the right season. You plant it at the right depth in the ground. All of those things you do by, in way of going the extra mile. You do them in advance. And then what do you do? You go back the next day and start harvesting, do you? No. No, you time it properly. You find out what nature requires in order to produce a to convert or transmute a seed of wheat into a stalk of wheat with 500 or 1,000 grains on it. And you comply with nature's laws. That's what you do. And it's the same thing identically in connection with this subject of faith in anything else. You, uh, you expect guidance. You do your part. You have to do your part. You always will find that there's a part that you must do in connection with any example of a demonstration of faith. Faith will do nothing for you if you expect everything to be done for you outside of yourself. <coughs> It's guidance that if you expect to get the answer, that you'll have it. And faith uh, probably, now look, notice that word probably down there. Why do you think I say faith probably works through the subconscious section of the mind? I'll tell you why I put it there, because nobody knows definitely whether it does or not. It's a theory, and uh, for want of a better theory, I'm using it. It appears to work through the subconscious section of the mind, the subconscious acting as the gateway between the conscious section of the mind and infinite intelligence. My picture, my mental picture of what happens when you uh, pray properly is that you first condition your mind, you know what it is you want, and then you, give, you transfer over to your subconscious mind a clear picture. That subconscious is the intermediary or the gatekeeper between you and infinite intelligence. It's the only one that can turn on the power of infinite intelligence for you. It's the only way you can reach into infinite intelligence in my book of rules. And if that isn't correct, as far as I'm concerned, it might as well be correct because that's the way I get it to work. Now, the definite essential steps in the development of self-reliance based on faith. If there's anything that people need more than everything else, it's self-reliance, belief in yourself. Here are the steps. I'm not going to go over all of them, but I'm going to call your attention to the most important ones. First of all, you adopt a major purpose and begin at once to attain it. That's the first step in building self-confidence. You know, when you know what you want, and you start in getting it, you have a measure of self-reliance, you're, you're demonstrating a measure of self-reliance, because if you didn't believe in yourself, you wouldn't even begin, would you? The very fact that you start, even though you're a long way from attaining the thing you're going after, shows that you have a measure or a degree of self-reliance. And the more you pursue that idea, the stronger that belief will be. And next, associate as many as possible of the nine basic motives with the object of the definite major purpose. In other words, have yourself inspired by as many as possible of those nine basic motives when you go after anything. You know, uh, you've had this experience. That you wanted something very badly. And in order to get the something that you wanted very badly, a material something, it meant extra money that you couldn't lay your hands on. You didn't have it in the bank. You weren't earning it. Now, uh, what do you do in a case of that kind? Borrow? <laughs> well, a lot of people do, but there's always something else, too, that you can do that's more important than borrowing. Why, well, you begin to connive and work out some sort of a scheme to earn some more money, don't you? That's what you do. My little son, Blair, when he's about six or seven years old, wanted a nice uh, an electrical train that cost $50. And it was more than we felt we could give him at that time because we'd had to give the other two children a $50 gift too. And I told Blair that. He said, oh, I didn't ask you to buy me anything. I said, well, well that's different. Fine. He said, I just wanted your approval to buy the train. And he made out the order. Lionel train, $50. 
And there came a snow, a big snow the next day, and he borrowed a shovel from the janitor, and he went down the street uh, cleaning off sidewalks. He didn't ask anybody if he could do it, he just started cleaning off the sidewalks, and uh, they'd all come out and get into a conversation with him and say, oh, I thought it'd be a nice thing to just clean off your sidewalks. I see you haven't started doing it yet. I thought it'd be nice if you'd, uh, you'd appreciate it. And invariably, they'd give him a quarter, a half dollar, sometimes a dollar. One man gave him five dollars. And before the end of the month, long before the end of the month, he had his $50 and $10 more that he'd earned himself. His mother uh, thought that he ought not to be permitted to do that. It kind of disgraced us to let him go out down the street cleaning off side of what I say, disgrace my eye. <laughs> they ought to find out who we are, that we can raise a child like this. <laughs> How we do it. <laughs> Motive. And write out a list of all the advantages of your definite major purpose and call these into your mind many times daily, thereby making your mind success conscious. Did you know that in order to be uh, healthy, you have to be health conscious? Did you know that? No matter what other precautions you take, if your mental attitude is not health conscious, if you're not thinking in terms of health, if you're not expecting that you're going to be healthy, you're not going to be, no matter what else you do. And it's the same thing with reference to success. If you accept any kind of a fear complex or an inferiority complex, if you don't expect success of yourself and develop a success expectation or consciousness, you're not going to be a success. You just have to do that. If your major purpose is to achieve some material thing or money, see yourself already in possession of it when you call it into your consciousness. This is of vital importance because there, again, is coming into play your power of faith. And if your faith isn't great enough that you can see the thing already in your possession even before you start to get it, then you are not making use of applied faith. And associate with people who are in sympathy with you and your major purpose and lead them to encourage you in every way possible. This has reference only to close friends or members of your mastermind alliance. Don't, take, uh, don't disclose your aims and purposes to people who are not absolutely dependable, loyal, and close to you. Especially loyal. Because it's surprising how sometimes uh, people to whom you disclose your ideas, they, if they're good ideas, they go around the corner and beat you to the draw and they're using your ideas before you use them. Or they're saying something to discourage you. And let not a single day pass without making at least one definite move toward the attainment of your major purpose. Faith is a positive mental attitude in action. And your mental attitude is reflected in every word you speak and it speaks louder than your words. Your mental attitude is the sum total of your thoughts at a given time. A positive mental attitude has its roots in the spiritual wells of one's soul. How true that is, and what a, what a wonderful statement that is. A positive mental attitude has its roots in the spiritual wells of one's soul. Mental attitude is the medium by which adversities may be transmuted into benefits. And so the list goes. Now, you'll find some of those that appeal to you more than others. Uh, print them out on, in a card or in some form where you can put them up, where you can see them each day. Make them your own. Surround yourself with suggestions. Everywhere you look, you'll see something that suggests a positive mental attitude. You'll notice when you go into the office of a successful person or into the home of a successful person, if you can find his den or the place where he uh, himself uh, uh, withdraws uh, unto himself, you'll find that oftentimes he has himself surrounded with pictures of those whom he, whom he considers great. Oftentimes he'll have mottos on the walls. I've seen hundreds of them. I walked into Ed Barnes' uh, office one time and I found out that he had over 500 mottos that were done up in beautiful cards, hand-lettered, every one of them. It must have cost him a small fortune. I walked into my friend Jennings Randolph's office when he was in Congress in Washington, and I found that he had all of the walls of his uh, congressional office covered with the pictures of uh, men whom he considered great. He did that to live in the, uh, in the environment of the great, in the environment of things that uh, kept, him, uh, kept his mind positive. Start in where you are, in your home, in your business, in your office, wherever you stay the most. Maybe it's in your bedroom. You certainly sleep every night. Start in there to put up something that will uh, give you a positive thought just before you go to bed. And it will remind you every time you go in there. You'll be surprised at how much good it will do you. Well, the first half of the evening is devoted to going the extra mile. And of course, as you know, that means the rendering of more service and better service and you're paid to render, uh, doing it all the time and doing it in a pleasant, pleasing mental attitude. Now, 
One of the reasons why there are so many failures in the world today is that the majority of people do not even go the first mile, let alone the second one. And oftentimes, if they do go the first mile, they gripe as they go along and make themselves a darn nuisance. No. People around. <laughs> I said, darn nuisance. <laughs> I suppose you know the type. Of course, that doesn't apply to any of you, because if you were like that before you got into this philosophy, you were going to get over it very fast. I don't know of any one quality or trait that can get a person an opportunity quicker than to go out of his way, his way or her way to do somebody a favor, do something useful. Uh, it's the one thing that you can do in life that you don't have to ask anybody's privilege for, of doing it. As a matter of fact, uh, if you're going to be free and independent and uh, self-determining and uh, financially independent in old age, you might just as well make up your mind that you can never be that unless by a stroke of good luck, a rich uncle or a rich aunt dying or something of that sort, unless you uh, form the habit of going the extra mile and make yourself as near indispensable as you possibly can. I don't know of any way, any way that anybody can make himself or herself ind uh, indispensable except by going the extra mile, by uh, rendering some sort of service that you're not expected to render and rendering, rendering it in the right sort of a mental attitude. Now that mental attitude is important. If you uh, gripe about uh, going the extra mile, uh, the chances are that it won't, uh, won't bring you very many returns. Now uh, where do I get my authority, do you suppose, for emphasizing this principle of going the extra mile? What causes me to emphasize that? Experience. I get it by uh, looking around and watching the way nature does things. And any time that you can follow the, way, the habits of nature, you're not going to go wrong. And uh, stated conversely, any time that you fail to recognize the way nature does things and do not go along, you are going to get into trouble sooner or later. Just a question of time. Because you do have, there is an overall plan that, through which this universe operates. And uh, no matter what you call the first cause of that plan, or the operator of it, or the creator of it, no matter what you call that, there is, only, there is just one plan, there's just one set of natural laws, and it's up to every individual to discover what those natural laws are and adjust himself favorably to them. And certainly, if there is one thing that stands out above all others in nature, it is that nature requests and demands that every living thing go the extra mile in order to eat, in order to live, in order to survive. Man wouldn't survive one season if it were not for this law of going the extra mile. Don't render service, a uh, million dollars worth of service a day and then expect to go and get a bank uh, check for it tomorrow. <laughs> in other words, if you start out to render a million dollars worth of service, you perhaps have to render it a little bit at a time and you'll have to get yourself recognized. And while you're going through that period of recognition, the chances are that uh, you'll not be compensated for going the extra mile. Chances are you'll have to go the extra mile quite a little while before anybody takes notice of you. But always be careful that you don't go the extra mile too long without somebody taking notice of you. And if the right fellow doesn't take notice, look around until you find the right fellow who will. That's about the equivalent of saying if your present employer doesn't recognize you, if you work for an employer, why fire the employer sooner or later and uh, let, his, let his competitor know what kind of service you're rendering. It won't hurt your chances a bit. I'll assure you it won't. Have a little competition as you go along. Now, uh, now, nobody ever accepts a rule or does anything without a motive. And I have outlined here in this lesson a great variety of reasons why you should go the extra mile. I'm going to make comments on them. Now, what do I mean by the law of increasing returns? Benefits, yes. Well, substantially, the law of increasing returns means that you get back more than you give out, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether it's positive or whether it's negative, and that's the way the law of nature works. Whatever you give out, whatever you do to or for another person, or whatever you give out from yourself comes back to you, multiple, greatly multiplied, in kind. No, no, no exception to that whatsoever. Again, there is the question of timing. The coming back process doesn't always come back very quickly. Sometimes it's uh, longer than you expect. But you may be sure that if you send out some negative influence, that it's going to come back on you sooner or later, and you may not recognize uh, what caused it, but uh, it'll come back. It won't overlook you. That law of increasing returns is eternal. It's uh, automatic. It's working all the time. And it's just as uh, inexorable as the law of gravitation. There's nobody in the world that can circumvent it or go around it or have it suspended for one moment. It's operating all the time. 
The law of increasing returns means that when you uh, go out of your way to render more service and better service than you paid to render, it's impossible for you not to get back more than you really did because eventually that law of increasing returns takes care of that. If you're working for a salary, for instance, it takes care of it in additional wages, in greater responsibilities, in promotions, in opportunities that'll come to you to go into business for yourself. In a thousand and one different ways, it'll come back. And oftentimes, this uh, coming back process doesn't uh, come back from the source to which you render the service. Don't be too afraid to render service to a greedy buyer or to a greedy, a greedy employer. It makes no difference to whom you render this service. You, if you render it in good faith and in good spirit and keep on doing it as a matter of habit, it's just as impossible for you not to be compensated as it is to be and not to be at the same time. Well, that law of increasing returns. Now, just remember that when you start applying this principle, that you don't have to be too careful about the person whom you render it. As a matter of fact, what you should really do is to apply this principle with everybody you come into contact, no matter who it is. Strangers and acquaintances and business associates and relatives alike. Make it your business to render useful service wherever you touch human relations in any shape, form, or fashion. Because uh, the only way that you can increase your, uh, the space that you occupy in the world, and by the space that you occupy, I don't mean necessarily the physical space, but the mental and spiritual, spiritual space as well, will be determined by the quality and the quantity of the service that you render. The quality and the quantity plus the mental attitude in which you render. Now, those are the determining factors as to how far you'll go in life, how much you'll get out of life, how much you'll enjoy life and how much peace of mind you'll have. And next, it uh, brings one to the favorable attention of those who can and often do provide opportunities for self-promotion. The favorable attention of people. You'll go into any organization and if you're alert-minded and take notice, you'll find out who the people are that are going the extra mile. You'll find out very quickly. And also, if you watch the uh, procedure, and the records of those people who are going the extra mile, you'll find that they're the, when there are promotions around, they're the ones that get the promotions. They don't have to ask for them. It's not necessary at all. Because the employers are just naturally looking around for people who will go the extra mile. And next, it tends to permit the one to become indispensable in many different human relationships and therefore enables one to command more than the average compensation. But I'll tell you one thing that's not in my notes that it does. <clears throat> And I want you to know this. It does something to your soul inside of you. It makes you feel better. And if it didn't do a single, if there's not another reason in the world why you should go the extra mile, I'd say that would be adequate. You know, there are a lot of things in, in life that to cause us to have uh, negative feelings, cause us uh, unpleasant uh, experiences and feelings, a lot of things in life. This is one thing that you can do for yourself that will always give you a pleasant feeling. And if you go back in your own experiences, I'm sure that you'll remember that you never did a kind thing for anybody, that you didn't get a great deal of joy of it. Maybe the other fellow didn't appreciate it. That, that's in, unimportant. It's just like love. Uh, you, to have loved has, alone is a great privilege. And it doesn't make any difference whatsoever whether your love is returned by the other person. You've had the benefit by the, the emotion of love itself. And so it is by the principle of going the extra mile. It'll do something to you, it'll give you greater courage, it'll enable you to overcome inhibitions and uh, inferiority complexes that you've been storing up back down through the years. Just this stepping out and making yourself useful to somebody. And don't be too surprised when um, you do something courteous or useful for somebody that, who's not expecting it, and they look at you with a, in a quizzical sort of way as much as to say, well, I just wa wonder why you're doing that. <laughs> Some people will be a little bit uh, surprised when you go out of your way to be useful to them. Also, it leads to mental growth and physical perfection in various forms of service, thereby developing greater ability and skill in one's chosen vocation. You know, delivering a lecture or making up your notebook or filling your job, whatever it is in, that you do in life that you're going to repeat, Make up your mind that every time you do it, you will excel all previous efforts on your part. In other words, you, you're, you're a constant challenge to yourself. And you'll find how quickly and how rapidly you will grow if you'll go at it in that way. I have never delivered a lecture in my life that I didn't intend to deliver it better than I did previously. I don't always do it, but that's my intention. 
And it makes no difference what kind of an audience I have, whether I have a big class or a small class. I don't often have small classes, but sometimes I have had small classes. But I put just as much into a small class as a big one. Not alone because I want to be useful to my students, but because I want to grow and I want to develop. And out of effort, out of struggle, out of use of your faculties comes growth. And then <clears throat> it enables one to profit by the law of contrast. Had you ever thought about that? And uh, I'll tell you right now, you won't have to advertise that one very much because it'll advertise itself. Because the majority of people around you are not going to be going the extra mile. And that's all to the good for you. Now, if everybody went the extra mile, this would be a grand world to live in, but you couldn't cash in on this principle as definitely as you can now, because you'd have a tremendous amount of competition. But don't worry, you're not going to have it. I can assure you you're not. Practically be in the class by yourself. Now, there will be some cases, perhaps, where people with whom you're working or with whom you're associated will be shown up for not going the first mile, let alone the second one, and they won't like it. Now, of course, you're going to cry about that one and quit and go back to your old habits just because the other fellow doesn't like what you're doing. Or are you? Yeah, no. Of course not. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it's your individual responsibility in this world to succeed. That's your sole responsibility. And you can't afford to let anybody's ideas or idiosyncrasies or notions get in the way of your success. You can't afford to do that. You should be fair, you should be just with other people, but beyond that, you're under no obligations to let anybody's opinion or idea stop you from going out and being successful. I'd like to see the person that could stop me from being successful. I'd just love to take a look at him, <laughs> see what he looked like. And I want you to feel that way about it, too. I want you to make up your mind that you're going to put into these laws into operation and that you're not going to let anybody stop you from doing it. Also, it leads to the development of a positive, pleasing mental attitude, which is among the more important traits of a pleasing personality. Not among, not among the more important, it is the most important one. As a matter of fact, it's the first trait of a pleasing personality, as you will see when you get to that lesson. A positive mental attitude. Isn't it a marvelous thing to know what you can do to change the chemistry of your brain so that you're positive instead of negative? Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that you can do that so easily? How? Why, by getting in that frame of mind where you want to do something useful to the other fellow without uh, rendering service with one hand and picking his pocket with the other while you're doing it. Doing it just because of the goodness that you get out of doing it, knowing that eventually, if you render more service and better service than you're paid to render, sooner or later you will be paid for more than you do and paid willingly. That's the way the law works. That's the law of compensation. And that, that's an eternal law. It never, it never forgets. It has a perfectly marvelous bookkeeping system. And uh, you may be sure that when you're giving out the right kind of service and the right kind of a mental attitude, that you're piling up credits for you somewhere that will come back to you multiplied sooner or later. Also, it uh, tends to develop a keen, alert imagination. <clears throat> because it is a habit which keeps one continuously seeking new and more efficient ways of rendering useful service. Now that's an important thing, isn't it? It develops your imagination, because you begin to look around to see how, how many places, how many ways and means there are of helping other people to find themselves. And in helping the other fellow to find himself, you find yourself. Incidentally, I, one of the most outstanding things that I discovered in the, my research was that when you have a problem, or an unpleasant situation and you don't know how to solve it, you've done everything you know, you've tried every source that you know anything about and you're still at a stalemate, there is always one thing that you can do. And if you'll do that one thing, the chances are that you not only will solve your problem, but you'll learn a great lesson. What is that one thing that you can do? When find, you find somebody who has a, an equal or a greater problem and start where you stand, then and there, to help that other person. And lo and behold, it unlocks in you something. Some uh, cells of the brain, it unlocks some cells that permits infinite intelligence to come into your brain and give you the answer to the solution of your problem. Now, I don't know why that works, but do you know, the, do you know how I know that it does work? 
Do you know why I can make that statement so positive and not qualified? Do you know how I arrived at that decision? By trying it out hundreds and hundreds of times myself. And by seeing it tried out by hundreds and hundreds of times by my students whom I have recommended to do that same thing. What a simple thing that is. I don't know what it does to you. I don't know why it works. A lot of things in life I don't know. A lot of things you don't know. And some that you do know that you don't do much about. Now, this is one of them that I don't know anything about, but I do something about. I follow the law because I know that if I, if I, if I need my own mind to be opened up to receive opportunity, the best way in the world to open it up is to start looking around to see how many other people I can help. And also, it uh, develops that important factor of personal initiative. You know, it gets you into the habit of looking around for something useful to do and going out and doing it without somebody telling you to do it. And that's a mighty important thing. You know, pro, that old man, procrastination, is a, he's a sour old, old bird, and he causes a lot of trouble in this world. People are putting off things until day after tomorrow, which they should have done the day before yesterday. And we're all guilty of it, every one of us. I'm not free of it, I know, and I know you're not. But I'm, not a, I'm freer of it than I was a few years back, I'll tell you that. I can find a lot of things to do now. Why do I find them? Because I get joy out of doing them. And any time you're going the extra mile, you're going to get joy out of what you're doing. Otherwise, you won't be going the extra mile. And it's going to develop this quality of uh, personal initiative and over help you overcome this uh, quality of procrastination. It also serves to build uh, the confidence of others in one's integrity and general ability. And it aids one in mastering the destructive habit of procrastination. It develops definiteness of purpose without which one cannot hope for success. That alone would be enough to justify it. It develops definiteness of purpose. It gives you an objective so that you don't go round and round in circles like a goldfish in a bowl, always coming back to where you started with nothing that you st didn't start out with. Definiteness of purpose comes out of this business of going the extra mile. And I'll tell you another thing that it does. That's not in my notes. It enables you to um, make your work a joy instead of a burden. In other words, you get to where you love it. And I think maybe that if you're not engaged in a labor of love in life, you're uh, wasting a lot of your time. I think one of the greatest joys in the world is one's being permitted to engage in the thing that he would rather do than all other things. And surely when you're going the extra mile, you're doing just exactly that because you don't have to do it. Nobody expects you to do it. Nobody asks you to do it. Certainly no employer would ask his employees to go the extra mile. Oh, he might ask uh, to help out once in a while, but as a regular thing, he wouldn't do that. So it's uh, something that you do on your own initiative, and it gives you, it gives uh, dignity to labor. It gives dignity, even if you're doing nothing but digging a ditch, and you're doing it because you're helping somebody, you have a certain dignity attached to that, that ticks the fatigue and the unpleasantness out of the labor. What is the most uh, important application you ever made in your life of this business of going the extra mile out of which you got the greatest amount of joy? Now think hard, please. Tell me. Being married. What? Being married. Being married? Well, that's getting pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> How about before getting married? <laughs> yeah. Party. Believe me, I've spent a lot of time <laughs> burning midnight oil and later than that. And I didn't consider it hard work at all. Also, it was my own idea. <laughs> I'd only use my initiative, but I got a lot of joy out of doing it. And I made it pay off. Marvelous thing, how long you can go when you're courting the girl of your choice or being courted by the man of your choice. Marvelous how much sleep you can lose and still not <laughs> be seriously hurt by it. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you could put the same attitude into your relations with people professionally or in the business that you put into, your, into courtship? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And wouldn't this be a wonderful world to live in? We're going to start back sparking again. <laughs> it's going to start at home with our own mates. Believe me, I, I couldn't begin to tell you the number of married couples that I've started in on a new sparking spree. And they've gotten a lot of joy out of it. Saves a lot of friction, a lot of argument. Cuts down expenses. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. 
There you go. Now, I, I don't mean to be facetious, facetious about this. I mean, I'm very serious about it when I say that there is one of the finest places in the world to start going the extra mile. When you start going the extra mile with somebody that you haven't been going with, sit down and have a little, uh, little sales talk with them. Just tell them that you've uh, changed your attitude and uh, you want a mutual agreement for both parties to change the attitude. Now, from here on out, all of us are going the extra mile. We're going to relate ourselves to, uh, together on a different basis where we'll all get joy out of it and get more peace of mind and more happiness in living. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you went home tonight and uh, had that kind of a speech with your mate? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? It wouldn't hurt. It might help. Now, the mate might not be uh, impressed by it, but you will be. <laughs> Nothing to hinder you from enjoying it. And that person in business that you haven't been getting along so well with, now, if you went in tomorrow morning with a smile and walked over to him or her and took his hand or, and shook hands and said, Now, listen, pal, from here on out, let you and I enjoy working together. What did you say? <laughs> Wouldn't work, huh? Oh, yes, it would. <laughs> oh, yes, it would. You try it and see. Try it and see. You know, there's a little thing that we have called pride, and if there's one thing that does more damage in this world than any other one, it's that little thing called pride. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to humiliate yourself if it's going to be a little better human relations with the people that you have to associate with all the time. Well, uh, all of those remarks in the last five minutes are not in my notes, but I'll tell you where they were. They were in my heart. Thank you. And one of the reasons why you and I get along so well is that very often I deviate from my notes and go down into my heart and dig up things for you that I want you to have, little morsels of food for your soul that I want you to have because I know they're good. I know they're good because I know where I got them and what they've done for me. Along, down through the years. Also, going the extra mile is the only thing which gives one the right to ask for promotions or more pay. Did you ever stop to think about that? You don't have a leg to stand on in going into the purchaser of your services and asking for more money or for a promotion to a better job unless for some time previously you have been going the extra mile, doing more than you're paid for. Because obviously, if you're doing no more than you're paid for, then you're being paid for all you're entitled to, aren't you? Certainly you are. So you have to first start going the extra mile and putting the other fellow under obligation to you before you can ask any favors of him. And I'll tell you another thing. If you have enough people whom you have put under obligations to you by going the extra mile, when you need some favor, you can always turn one direction or another and get it. It's a nice thing to know that you have that kind of credit uh, hanging around, isn't it? I want you to have that kind of credit with other people. And I want to teach you the technique by which you can do that. Now, uh, we get our cue as to the soundness of the principle of going the extra mile by observing nature. And here's quite a bit of illustration regarding that. You will see that nature goes the extra mile by producing enough of everything for her needs together with an overplus for emergencies and waste. The blooms on the trees. The fishes in the seas, in the waters. She doesn't just produce enough fish to perpetuate the species. She produces enough to feed the snakes and the alligators and everything else and those that die of natural causes and still enough to perpetuate the species. Nature is most bountiful in her business of going the extra mile. And in return, she is very demanding in seeing that every living creature goes the extra mile. Bees are provided with honey as compensation for their services in fertilizing the flowers in which the honey is attractively stored. But they have to perform the service to get the honey, and it must be performed in advance. Nature, you've heard it said that the birds of the air and the beasts of the jungle neither weave nor spin, but they always live and eat. But you know if you observe wildlife at all, they don't eat without performing some sort of service without working, without doing something before they can eat. Take a flock of uh, common old cornfield crows, for instance. They, uh, they have to organize. They have to have sentinels to put down for their protection. They travel in flocks. They have sentinels. They have codes by which to warn one another. They have to do a lot of educating before they can even eat safely. 
And uh, nature requires man to go the extra mile. He's got to go out, and uh, if he's going to have food, all food comes out of the ground. And if he's going to have food, he's got to plant seed. He can't live entirely on what the nature plants. Not in civilized life, he can't, at least. Over on the islands where some places were not civilized, I suppose they depend on eating raw coconuts and what have you. But in civilized life, we have to plant our food in the ground. We have to clear the ground first. We have to plow it. We have to harrow it. We have to fence it. We have to protect it against uh, predatory animals and so forth. And all of that costs labor and time and money. And all of that has to be done in advance or you're not going to eat. I wouldn't have any trouble at all selling this idea that nature makes everybody go the extra mile to a farmer. He knows that beyond any question of a doubt. He knows every minute of his life that if he doesn't go the extra mile, he doesn't eat. He doesn't have anything to sell. A new employee, for instance, going into a new job can't come right in immediately and start going the extra mile and uh, immediately demand uh, top wages or the best job in the place. You just don't, it doesn't work out that way. You have to establish a record, a reputation. You have to get yourself recognized and uh, received in this business of going the extra mile before you can begin to put pressure on to get compensation back. As a matter of fact, if you go the extra mile in the right sort of mental attitude, the chances are a thousand to one you'll never have to ask for compensation according to the service you're rendered because it'll be, it'll be attended you automatically in the way of promotions, in the way of increased salary. And uh, throughout the whole universe, everything has been so arranged uh, through the law of compensation, so advocately described by Emerson, that nature's budget is balanced, so to speak. Everything has its opposite equivalent in something else positive and negative in every unit of energy, day and night, hot and cold, success and failure, sweet and sour, happiness and misery, man and woman. Everywhere and everything one may see the law of action and reaction in operation. Everything you do, everything you think, every thought that you release causes a reaction. If not on somebody else, on the person releasing the thought. Because you never, as a matter of fact, when you release a thought, you're not through with it. Every thought that you... Uh, express, silently even, becomes a definite part of the pattern of your subconscious mind. And if you, re if you store in that subconscious mind enough, enough negative thoughts, you'll be predominantly negative. And if you uh, follow the habit of uh, releasing only the positive thoughts, your subconscious pattern will be predominantly positive. And you will attract to you the things, all of the things that you want, and if you're negative, you repel the things that you want and attract only the things you don't want. That's a law of nature, too. And this business of going the extra mile is one of the finest ways that I know of of educating your subconscious mind to attract to you the things you want and to repel the things you don't want. And you can put it down as an established fact that if you neglect to develop and apply this principle of going the extra mile, you will never become personally successful and you will never become financially independent. The reason I happen to know it sound is, you see, I've had a, a great privilege over you that you haven't had yet, but you will have in time. I had the privilege of observing a great many thousands of people, some of whom applied the principle of going the next mile and some of whom did not. And I have had the uh, privilege of finding out what happened to those who did and those who didn't. And I know beyond any question of a doubt that uh, nobody ever rises above ordinary or stations in life or mediocrity without the habit of going the extra mile. It just doesn't happen. If I had discovered one case, just one case, where somebody went on to the top without going the extra mile, I would say then there are exceptions. But I am in position to say there are no exceptions because I have never found that one case. And I can definitely tell you from my own experiences, and I have been there every minute of my life, that I have never had a major benefit of any kind in the world that I didn't get it as a result of going the extra mile. Now that's the thing that I want you to do. I want you to become self-determining so you can do these things without the help of anybody. That's the time when the payoff will come to you, when you can go out and do anything in this world that you want to do and whether anybody wants you to do it or whether they want to help you or whether they don't. You can do it on your own. I want to tell you that's one of the grandest, most glorious feelings that I know anything about, knowing that as I stand here talking to you that whatever I wanted to do I can do it. I don't have to ask anybody. Not even my wife. <laughs> but if I had to ask her, I would. 
because I'm on good terms with it. <laughs> then uh, here's a little item now that's not to be sniffed at. Peace of mind that I got out of all this work coming out of those 20 years of going the extra mile. Do you have any idea, ladies and gentlemen, how many people there are in the world at any one time who are willing to do anything for 20 years in succession without getting something back out of it? Do you have any idea how many people there are in this world who are willing to do something three days in succession without being sure they're going to get something out of it? No. You'd be surprised if you found out how few there are. You'd be surprised. And overlooking one of the grandest opportunities that a human being could possibly have. Especially here in this country of ours where we really can cr create our own destiny. Where we can express ourselves in any way that we want to. Speech is free. Activities are free. Education is free. A wonderful opportunity to get right in and go the extra mile. In any direction you want to travel. And yet most people are not doing it. I have seen the time when there were not so many people interested in their philosophy because they were prosperous, they were get, doing all right, they had no troubles to speak of. Today everybody almost has troubles, or he thinks he has. Now, do you know what I do instead of uh, finding out what's wrong with the rest of the world? Do you know how I put in my time? Yes, I try to find out what I can do to correct this guy here. That I, have to, I have to eat with him, I have to sleep with him, I have to shave his face every morning, I have to wash his face, I have to give him a bath now and then. <laughs> Why, you know, have no idea how many things I have to do for him. And I have to live with the guy, 24 hours a day. <laughs> so I put in my time trying to improve myself and through myself trying to improve my friends and my students by writing books and by delivering lectures and by teaching and by, in other ways. And you know it pays off very much better than it would if I sat down and took the old trib or any of the papers and read all of the murder stories, all of the divorce scandals and everything that blazoned across the pages every day. So I'm still talking about this fellow in Napoleon Hill who didn't have sense enough not to decline Andrew Carnegie's offer to work 20 years for nothing. In his declining years, there uh, will be years of happiness because of the seeds of kindness and help you sown in the hearts of others. I, that's a wonderful thing. You know, if I had my life to live over again, I'd live it just exactly the way I have. I'd make all the mistakes I had made. I'd make them at the time in life when I made them, back early, so I'd have time enough to correct some of them. And that period during which I would uh, come into peace of mind and understanding would be in the afternoon of life, not in the forenoon. Because I, I could stand it, I can take it. When you're young, you can take it. But when you pass the uh, noon hour and you go into the afternoon, why, uh, your energies are not as great oftentimes as they were before, your physical energies, sometimes your mental capacity is not as great, and you can't take as much trouble as you can in your days of youth. And you haven't got so many years left to correct the mistakes that you made. So, to have the tranquility and the peace of mind that I have today in the uh, afternoon of life is one of the great joys that has come out of this philosophy. And if you ask me what has been my greatest compensation, I would say that's it. Because there's so many people at my age, and even much younger than I, who haven't found peace of mind and never will. They never will. Because they're looking for it in the wrong place. They're not doing anything about it. They're expecting somebody else to do something about it for them. And that peace of mind is something that you've got to get for yourself. You've got to earn it, first of all. That's how anybody can get peace of mind. And you'd be surprised where you have to really start looking for it. Not where the average person is looking for it, out there in the joys of what money will buy, out there in the joys of uh, recognition and fame and fortune and what have you. Not there. But in the humility of the one individual's own heart. I get peace of mind mostly in that third inner wall that I described to you, where the wall is as high as eternity, where I go in for meditation many times each day. There's where I get my real peace of mind. Now, I can always withdraw into that inner wall, cut out every earthly influence, and commune with the higher forces of the universe. What a grand thing that is. And anybody can do that. You can do that. When you get through this philosophy, you'll be able to do anything you want to do, just as well or better than anything that I can do. And I'm hoping, incidentally, that I'll Every student that I turn out will eventually excel me in every way that I know possible. Maybe in writing books. Maybe you'll take up where I left off and write better books than I wrote. Why not? There's no, I haven't said the last word in my books or in my lectures or in anything else. Matter of fact, I'm just a student. Just a student. I think I'm a fairly intelligent student, but just a student on the path 
And the only state of perfection that I have is that I have actually found a piece of iron and how to get it. Engage in at least one act of going the extra mile every day. Now, you can choose your own circumstance if it is nothing more than telephoning an acquaintance and wishing him good fortune. Uh, you'll be surprised what will happen to you uh, when you begin to call up your friends uh, that you have been neglecting for some time and just uh, say, well, hello, I got to th I, you were on my mind. I was thinking about it. I just wanted to call up and say, how do you do? And I hope you're feeling as good as I am. You'd be surprised how, uh, what that'll do to you and what it'll do to the friend, too. And it doesn't have to be a close personal friend. It just has to be somebody you, you know. Or you may relieve some friend from duty for half an hour or so, or have some neighbor send over his children while he attends the movies, or you might do a little babysitting for one of your neighbors. You're going to be at home anyway. Maybe you've got some children of your own. Maybe you know some neighbor that uh, would like to get off and go down to the movies, but she can't get away from her children. Oh, I know, the children are noisy, and they probably fight with your children. But if you're a real diplomat, you'll uh, keep them apart. She'll be under obligations to you, and you'll feel that you've really been kind by helping out somebody who otherwise wouldn't have had a little freedom. So, uh, it'd be a nice thing for some of you people who don't have any children to say, well, I'll, could I come over and babysit for you while you go out? You and your, why don't you and your husband go on a little courtship? Go out to the movie, go to a show, and let me come over and babysit for you. Well, of course, uh, you have to know your neighbors pretty well in order to do that. But, oh. Certainly, most of you would have some neighbor that uh, you could approach on some such basis as that, and they wouldn't think you were crazy. <laughs> it's not so much what you do to the other fellow, that, uh, it's what you do to yourself by finding ways and means of going the extra mile. In little ways. Did you know that the, uh, both the successes in life and the failures are made up of little things? Very little things. So little, in fact, that oftentimes they're overlooked. The real reasons for success is overlooked because the things that make success are so such small in seemingly insignificant things. I know some people so popular, they couldn't have an enemy. They just couldn't have an enemy. And one of them is my distinguished business associate, Mr. Stone. All of his going the extra mile. And look how prosperous he is. Look how many people are going the extra mile from him. There are a lot of people who, if they didn't uh, make good money working for Mr. Stone, if they had to do it, they'd pay him a salary to work for him. And I know, I heard one say just that, and he's become immensely wealthy himself working for Mr. Stone. He said, if I, if I didn't make money out of working for him, I'd pay him if I had to, just for the association with him. Now, Mr. Stone's not different from you or me or anybody else, except in his mental attitude toward people, toward himself. He makes it his business to go the extra mile. Sometimes people take advantage of that. Don't act fairly with him. I've seen that happen, too. He doesn't worry about that too much. In fact, he doesn't worry about anything at all, period. <laughs> because he's learned to adjust himself to life in such a way that he gets great joy out of living, gets great joy out of people. <clears throat> or you may write a letter to some acquaintance offering him encouragement. In your job, you may do a little more than you're paid to do. Stay a little longer on the job, make some other person a little more happy. Thank you very much. I want to introduce you to the most wonderful person in the world. That's the person sitting in your seat right now. And when you commence to break down that person point by point, well, in accordance with these 25 factors that go to make a pleasing personality, you'll find out just exactly why you're wonderful and why. And I'm going to ask you as I go along, <clears throat> grade yourself. The rating that you think you're entitled to, and it can be anything from zero to 100 percent. Then when you get through, add up the total and divide it by the 25 traits, and that'll give you your average rating on the pleasing personality. And if you rate all the way through a, 50, uh, a general rating of 50 percent, you're doing very fine. Some of you rate much higher than that, I hope. Now, the first uh, trait of a pleasing personality always is a positive mental attitude because nobody wants to be around a person who's negative and uh, no matter what other traits you may have, if you don't have a positive mental attitude, at least when you're in the presence of people, you're not going to be considered uh, to have a pleasing personality. Now, rate yourself on that anywhere from zero to uh, 100. 
If you can rate 100 on that, you'll be up in the class with Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> That's pretty high. And the next one is on flexibility. Now, that mean, what do I mean by flexibility? I mean the, uh, the ability to unbend, to adjust yourself to the varying circumstances of life without going down under them. You know, there are a lot of people in this world who are so stayed in their habits and in their mental attitude that they cannot adjust to anything that's unpleasant or anything that, does, that they don't agree with. Do you know why uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was one of the most, if not the most popular president we've had in our generation? Because he could be all things to all people. I've been in his office when senators and congressmen would come in there ready to cut his throat and they'd go out uh, wanting to, uh, singing his praises. Just because of the mental attitude in which he received. In other words, he adjusted himself uh, to their mental attitude and he didn't get mad at the same time the other fellow did. That's a mighty good way of adjusting Sue incidental is to learn to be flexible enough not to get mad when the other fellow's mad. If you want to get mad, do it on your own account when the other fellow's in a good humor and you'll have a much better chance of, of not getting hurt. <laughs> Flexibility. I've seen presidents of the United States come and go. I've been associated with several of them. And I know what this uh, factor of flexibility can mean in the highest office in the world. Herbert Hoover probably was one of the best business executives, best all-round executives we've ever had in the White House. And yet he couldn't possibly sell himself to the people a second time because he was inflexible. He could not bend. He was too static, too fixed. Calvin Coolidge was the same way. And uh, Woodrow Wilson, to some extent, was the same way. He was too austere too static, too fixed, too correct. In other words, he wouldn't allow anybody to slap him on the shoulder, to call him Woody, or take any uh, personal liberties with him uh, at all. But there's so many things in this life that you have to adjust yourself to temporarily if you're going to have peace of mind and good health, that you might just as well start in now learning to do it. And if you're not flexible, you can become flexible. Number three. On the pleasing tone of voice, now there is an important thing that you can experiment with. A lot of people have harsh tones, they talk, they have nasal tones, and they put that something into the tone of voice that irritates other people. You take any monotonous speaker, for instance, does not have personal magnetism, does not know how to uh, uh, give pitch and tone to his voice, and uh, he'll never get his audience you know, in a million years if he tries. You've got to learn to, uh, if you're going to teach, if you're going to lecture, if you're going to do public speaking or even in good conversation, you've got to learn to uh, give a pleasant, pleasing tone to your tone of voice. And if you, uh, if you can't do that now, you can do it by a little bit of practice. Oftentimes uh, by simply lowering your voice, not talking too loudly. You can give it that something that uh, is pleasing to the ear. I don't think that anybody can teach another person how to make his uh, tone of voice pleasing. I think you have to do that yourself. You have to do it by experimenting. But first of all, before you do it, you have to feel pleasing. How could you use a pleasant tone of voice when you felt angry, for instance? <laughs> or when you didn't like a person that you were talking to? How could you do it? Well, you can, but it's not too effective unless you really feel inside of you the way you're expressing yourself. Now, all those are things, they're, they're carefully studied techniques that you have to acquire if you're going to make yourself pleasing. And consequently, uh, I don't know if anything will pay off better than to be pleasing in the eyes of other people. It's just one of those things that you can't get along without. Tolerance. Now, what does that mean? You know, a lot of people don't understand the full meaning of tolerance. That means an open mind on all subjects toward all people at all times. An open mind. In other words, your mind's not closed against anybody or anything. You're always willing to hear the last word or to hear an additional word about anything. Now, you'd be surprised at how few people there are in this world with open minds. Some of them are close to the fact you couldn't open them with a crowbar. You couldn't get a new idea in there if you tried. Well, uh, did you ever see one of those people who, were, who was pleasy? You never did and you never will. Have a pleasant, uh, pleasing, mental attitude, you've got to have an open mind because the very minute people find that you have prejudices that involve them and in their understanding of religion or politics or economics or anything else, the very minute they find out that you have, uh, have a closed mind toward any of these things that affect them, they're going to back away from you. 
do you have any idea why it is that I can have all of the religious, uh, followers of all religions in my classes and, and get along well with all of them, Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, all the races, all the creeds? Do you know why it is? That's right. That's right. To me, they're all of one brand. They're my fellow beings. They're my brothers and sisters. That's why I get along with them. I never thought, I think of anybody in terms of what he believes politically or religiously or economically. I think of him in terms of what, he, what he's trying to do to better himself and to better somebody else. That's the terms that I think of people in. And that's why I get along so well with them. I didn't used to do that. An open mind. What a marvelous thing it is to be able to be in possession of yourself so you can keep your mind open. And if you don't keep it open, you're not going to learn very much. If you have a closed mind, you'll, uh, you'll find that you'll, uh, you'll uh, miss out on a lot of information, a lot of facts that you need that you couldn't get without an open mind. And then uh, something that does to you inside, have your mind closed up against anybody or anything, say that you have the last word, you don't want any more information. That's the, that means you've ceased to grow. The very moment you close your mind on any subject, you can say, that's the last word, I want no more information on it, then you cease to grow. A keen sense of humor. Now, uh, what I mean by keen sense of humor is you have to have a disposition. If you don't have it, you have to cultivate it so that you can adjust yourself to all of these unpleasant things that come along in life without uh, taking them too seriously. I think I told you about the uh, motto that I saw in the office of Dr. Frank Crane once. They impressed me very much, and especially finding it in the office of a preacher. It says, don't take yourself too damn seriously. <laughs> and he explained to me what that word damn mean. He said it meant just exactly what it said. <laughs> if you take yourself too seriously, you are damning yourself. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. So it wasn't a profane word after all. And I liked it. I like it. I still like it. I think it's a good motto for anybody. Not to take himself too seriously. And incidentally... One of the finest tonics that you can take is to have a good laugh at least several times a day. A good hearty laugh. If you don't have anything to laugh at, cook up something. Look at yourself in the glass, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> you can always get a laugh out of that. <laughs> and you, you, you'd be surprised at how to change the chemistry of your mind right while you're doing it. If you've got troubles, why, they'll melt away and they won't seem near as big when you're laughing as when you're crying. Keen sense of humor. What a marvelous thing it is. I don't know that my sense of humor is what you'd call keen, but it's alert. <laughs> I, can, I can get some fun out of almost any circumstance in life. I used to get a lot of punishment out of some circumstances that I now get fun out of because I've oiled up and made my sense of humor a little bit more alert than I used to be. Then next, the frankness of manner and speech with discriminate control of the tongue at all times based upon the habit of thinking before you speak. Now, most people don't do that. They speak first and think or regret afterwards. <clears throat> what a wonderful thing it is in your conversation, for instance, if you just, uh, before you utter any kind of an expression to anybody, figure out whether it's going to benefit the person that's listening or damage him. Whether it's going to benefit you or damage you. And if you just follow those two simple rules, I, I would say that half of the things that you say that you wish you hadn't said, you will never say them. If you do a little weighing and a little thinking before you open your mouth and start speaking. You know, there are a lot of people who set their mouths going and go off and leave them. And they forget what they <laughs> said because they weren't there. <laughs> and they're almost always in difficulty with somebody. Frankness of manner and speech. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to tell everybody exactly what you think of him, because if you do that, you'll have no friends. But frankness, not being evasive, not engaging in double talk. Nobody likes a double talker. Nobody likes a person who's always evasive and never has a, never expressed an opinion about anything. And uh, then number seven... Pleasing facial expression. Now, you know, if you study your uh, facial expression in the mirror, it's a marvelous thing to see how much more pleasing you can make your facial expression when you try than when you don't try. By smiling a little bit. It's a marvelous thing to learn to smile when you're talking to people. You'll be surprised at how much more effective what you say is when you're smiling than when you're frowning or when you're looking serious. That makes a tremendous difference on the person that's listening. I hate to talk to a person who's uh, got a serious expression on as if the whole world is on his shoulders. It does, well, it makes me fidgety. I just wish that whatever he's saying, he'd get through with it and go on. 
But if he limbers up like Franklin D. Roosevelt used to and uh, gives you that old million dollar smile, why, uh, even the most trivial thing that he says sounds like music, sounds like wisdom, because uh, what he does to you um, uh, psychologically, that smile is a marvelous thing. Don't grin at people when you don't mean it, because monkeys can grin. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> but learn to, learn to smile because you feel it. Not, where does a smile take place first? On your lips or face or where? In your heart, where you feel it. That's where it takes place. You don't have to be pretty. You don't have to be handsome. You don't have to, but a smile, it'll decorate you and uh, embellish you no matter who you are. Make your facial expression much more beautiful. And then a keen sense of justice toward all people. Now, a keen sense of justice. In other words, uh, being just with another person, even when it's uh, to your disadvantage to do so. What a wonderful thing that is, and how that does endear you to other people, when they know very well that your being just with them is costing you something. Do it. There's no particular uh, virtue in being just with the other fellow when you're benefiting by it. <laughs> And do you, know how, do you have any idea how many people there are that are just fair and just and honest only when they, uh, when they know it's uh, going to come back to them in one way or another? How quickly they'd be dishonest if it, is un, if it was profitable to them to do it? Well, I wouldn't give you the percentage. I'd hate to tell you what I think it is. It's much too high. People who are like that. Keen sense of justice toward all people at all times. And then next one, sincerity of purpose. Uh, nobody likes a person who is obviously insincere in what he says and does who's trying to be something that he's not, who's saying something that doesn't represent his inner thoughts, and you know that's true. It's not as bad as out and out lying, but it's the, it's the first cousin to it, lacking of sincerity of purpose. Then versatility, uh, a wide range of knowledge of people and the world events outside of one's immediate personal interest. You take a person who doesn't know anything about, uh, except about one thing, and you, you'll find a person that will be boresome the moment he gets out of that field. Now, you, can, you don't have to use your imagination very much to think of somebody that you know of that uh, he lives, he, he's got his nose so closely to the grindstone in some one thing that he knows nothing about anything that's going on outside of that. And he'll, ha he'll not be interesting as a conversationalist nor in any other way unless he has a, a wide enough range of things generally to be able to talk to you about the things that interest you. Do you know the best way in the world to make yourself liked by other people? Talk to them about the things that interest them. That's it. And incidentally, if you talk to the other fellow about things that inter interest him, when you get around to talking about things that interest you, he'll be a receptive listener, much more so. And then uh, tactfulness in speech and manner. Now, you don't have to, uh, in your speech and in your manner, you don't have to reflect by your mental <coughs> attitude, by your words, Everything that goes on in your mind. If you do that, why, everybody, you'll be an open book and everybody can read you at will. And some of them, sometimes they'll read you when you wish they hadn't. Tactfulness in your speech and in your attitude toward other people. You can always be tactful. You know, like uh, drivers on the road when the other fellow skins your fenders and you know how tactful they are when they jump out and run around to see how much damage is done. Maybe 10 cents where the paint's been knocked off and they do $100 worth of damage cussing one another out. No, some of these days I'm going to have the experience of seeing two fellows collide on the highway and they're going to jump out and apologize, each one claiming it was his fault and wanting to pay the bill. And I do. I don't know what's going to happen to them, but I'm going to see that some of these days. <laughs> Tactfulness. You'd be surprised how much you can do with people if you're just tactful with them. Oftentimes, instead of telling people to do things or asking them to do things, uh, requesting them to do things or demanding them to do things, it might be very tactful and helpful if you requested them and asked them if they would mind doing things. Even though you're in authority to give them an instruction, it's still better to ask if they would mind doing certain things. I, one of the most outstanding employers I ever knew, never gave any of his employees direct instructions. That was Andrew Carnegie. He always asked his associates and his employees, even the humblest, if they would mind doing something for him. Or would it be convenient? Or would it be suitable? Never ordered them to do anything, but asked them always. No wonder he got along so well with people. No wonder he was so successful. Then the promptness of decision. Now, nobody can be, uh, be very well liked 
and have a very pleasing personality who always puts off making a decision when he has all of the facts before him and ought to make the decision right on the spot. I don't mean by that they should go off half cocked or should make, render snap judgments, but when they have all of the facts and the time has arrived for a decision, get in the habit of making those decisions. And if you make one that's wrong, you can always reverse it. And don't be too big to, uh, or, or too little <laughs> to reverse yourself when you find out that you should reverse yourself. There's a great advantage in being fair enough with yourself and with the other fellow to reverse yourself if you've made the wrong decision. And of course, I don't need to make much comment on number 13, faith in infinite intelligence. You know what your faith is there. You should rate very high. If you are following your religion, whatever it is, faithfully, you should rate very high on that one. But you'd be surprised how many people there are that give lip service to this question of faith and infant intelligence and don't do very much about uh, outside of lip service. And this lip service is not, is not so loud that you can hear it very far away. They don't, uh, they don't indulge in any very outstanding acts backing up the, their alleged belief in infinite intelligence. I don't know how the Creator feels about it, but you know, I believe that one act, uh, an ounce of acts, is worth a million tons of good intentions or belief. Just one act. Number 14, appropriateness of words. They're free from slang and wisecracks and profanity. I never saw an age when the people indulge in so many uh, uh, wisecracks, slang statements, uh, double talk and all that sort of thing. And it may seem smart to the fellow who's doing it, but it's not smart to the fellow who's listening. He may laugh at it, but he's not going to be impressed with the fellow that engages too much in these wisecracks. Smart sayings. Appropriateness of words. Our English language is not the easiest thing in the world to, to conquer or to master, but it is a beautiful language. It has a wide range of, um, of words, meanings, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to control the English language so that you can convey to the other fellow precisely what you have in your mind or what you want him to think you have in mind, what you want him to know. Then the controlled enthusiasm. You'd say, well, why control enthusiasm? Why not turn it loose and let it run riot? Well, just because you'll get in danger, into trouble if you do. Your enthusiasm ought to be handled very much like you handle your electricity. Now, it's a very wonderful thing. It washes dishes, washes your clothes, runs the toaster, maybe cooks your food on the stove, does a lot of things, but you handle it with care. And uh, you, you turn it on when you want it, and then turn it off when you don't want it. Your enthusiasm should be handled with just as much care. You turn it on when you want to uh, turn it on, and then you can just as quickly turn it off. If you're not able to turn it off as quickly as you turn it on, somebody will come along and get you all enthused over something that you ought not to be enthused over. <laughs> Did you ever hear that happening? And boy, what a sucker you will be at that time for his prey, whatever he wants to do. You can be too enthusiastic with the other fellow where you wear him out. Where I'm out pulling down his metal shades and resisting you. I have had salesmen come around so enthusiastic that I wouldn't let them in my place a second time because I didn't want to go to the trouble of defending myself against them. I have heard some speakers, I've heard some preachers like that too. I wouldn't want to follow them because I had too much trouble resisting them. <laughs> I don't get any notions. <laughs> you know the type I'm talking about. The fellow just absolutely turns his uh, enthusiasm battery loose and goes off and leaves it. And you, all you can do is run away from it or try and turn it off. And the man that does that's not going to be popular. But the man who can turn on his enthusiasm at the right time, the right amount, and then turn it off at the right time, that's the man that's going to be considered uh, to have a pleasing personality. And incidentally, if you're not able to... Uh, to exude enthusiasm when you want to, you certainly are not going to be considered a, a pleasing personality because there are times when you definitely need it in teaching or in lecturing or in speaking or in ordinary conversation or in selling or almost anything that you're doing in human relationships requires a certain amount of enthusiasm at times. And enthusiasm is one of those things you can cultivate. It's uh, just like all these other qualities. There's only one quality in here that you can't cultivate. I'll see if you can find it. It was the one that Andrew Carnegie said he could give you every one of the others except that one. Personal magnetism. Personal magnetism, that's right, exactly. You've got just so much of that, even that, that's subject to control and to transmutation too. 
But that's something that one person can't give to another. Now, um, controlled enthusiasm, and then uh, good, clean sportsmanship. Being a sportsman about everything. You're not going to win all the time in life. Nobody can do that. There are going to be times when you lose. Uh, when you lose, lose uh, gracefully and graciously. Lose and say, well, I lost, but I, uh, maybe it's the best thing that I did because I'm going to start looking immediately for that seed of an equivalent benefit, and next time, uh, when time comes to lose, I'm going to let somebody else lose. <laughs> so I'm going to wise myself up. And then uh, don't take it too seriously, no matter what it is. You know, during the Depression, I had four of my friends commit suicide. About two of them jumped off of tall buildings. One shot himself, and another one took poison <clears throat> because they lost their money. And I, the two of them, at least, I lost twice as much as they did. And I didn't jump off in the building. I didn't shoot myself. I didn't poison myself. What did I do? I said, well, it's a blessed fine thing because... Uh, Losing this amount of money, now I'll have to start and earn some more. And in earning some more, I'll learn some more. There's my mental attitude toward it. Was that I started immediately looking for that seed in the cool bit. Didn't disturb me in the least. And I said to myself, if I lose every penny that I have, my last suit I have, even my BVDs, I can always get a barrel from somebody <laughs> and start in all over again. Wherever I can get a bunch of people together to listen, I'll be able to start making money. Now, you can't, how are you going to down a person with that kind of an attitude? No matter how many times he's defeated, he'll come right up again. Just like a cork. You can put him down under water, but he can bounce up the moment you take your hand off of him. And if you don't take your hand off, he'll make you take it off. And then uh, this one down here, number 17, common courtesy. Oh, what a marvelous thing that is. Just common, ordinary garden variety of courtesy toward everybody. People, especially toward people that are obviously on a of a lower plane socially or economically or financially than yourself. What a wonderful thing it is to be courteous to the person to whom you don't have to be courteous. It's a wonderful thing. It does something to the other fellow and it does something to you. I, I, I always hate to see anybody lording it over another person. Nothing, nothing gets me uh, upset quicker than to go into a restaurant and have some newly rich or somebody come in and start ordering the waiters around and abusing them. Even sometimes they may deserve it, but I still, I, I have never learned to like that. I've always thought that anybody that would abuse another person in public, with or without a cause, had something wrong with his machinery, and that something is missing in life, and you would be sure that there is something he's missing. I remember so well when I was living at the Bellevue Stratford in Hotel in Philadelphia on that famous trip when I went there to get my publisher the first time. One of the waiters spilled some hot soup right on, right on the back of my neck. And I mean, it burned me too. Well, the head waiter ran over and a little while the manager of the hotel was out there and uh, he wanted to get a doctor. I said, well, it's not that serious after all. The waiter spilled a little soup. Uh, if he hadn't spilled it, I'd have gone down my neck. Now, uh, maybe I won't have to take it. Well, he said, we'll have, the, we'll have your suit cleaned and we'll uh, do this, we'll do that, and do that. I said, no, I'm just don't get upset. I'm, not, I'm the one to get upset, and I'm not getting upset about it. And that waiter afterward, <clears throat> after he was off duty, he came up to my room and he said, I want to tell you how much I appreciated what you said. You could have had me fired. He said, I was just as good as fired, and if you hadn't talked about the way you did, I'd have been out. And he said, I couldn't afford to be fired. Well, I don't know how much good it did the waiter, but it did me a lot of good to know that after all, I, there was a man I could have humiliated. As far as I know, I have never intentionally in my whole life humiliated anybody for anything whatsoever. Never, as far as I know. I may have done it unintentionally. And uh, I feel good to be able to say that. I feel good to have that attitude toward people. And you know, it, uh, it comes back to me because the people have that attitude toward me too. They don't want to humiliate me. Why? Because you get back from people by what you send out. You're a human magnet, and you're attracting to you the sum and the substance of what goes on in your heart and soul. Then, uh, appropriateness of personal adornment. Uh, that's important to anybody in public life. Now, I have never been too fussy about that. I've never used formal clothes, on, except on very few occasions. Uh, formal clothes are time, however, when it's appropriate, perfectly appropriate, uh, for you to adjust and, uh, and to have. But ordinarily, if you use good taste, and ordinarily the, the best dressed person is the one that's dressed so that uh, if you were told to describe what, how he, he or she was dressed later on, you couldn't do it. 
You'd say, all I know was he looked nice or she looked nice. Appropriateness of personal adornment, then good showmanship. Uh, you've got to be a showman if you're going to sell yourself in any walk of life. You've got to be a, be a good showman. Know when to dramatize uh, words, when to dramatize circumstances. You know, there are certain things, if you describe them in just ordinary language, you take the history of the most outstanding man in the world, and if you just gave the bare facts and didn't dramatize them as you went along, well, you'd fall down flat. You really would. You've got to dramatize these things that you're talking about and these people that you're doing business with. You've got to learn the art of showmanship as you go along. And it's something you can learn. And then I don't need to mention to you that you should have the habit of going the extra mile. We've uh, spent a whole evening on that and you've got a whole lesson on that. Uh, and certainly you can rate yourself on that. And then on temperance in eating, drinking, work and play and in thinking. Temperance, uh, that means not too much, not too little of anything. Do yourself just as much damage with eating as you can with drinking liquor. Just as much. Uh, the rule that I go by in all, all these things is that I don't allow anything to take charge of me. When I was smoking, um, when I got to the point where the cigars were smoking me, then I quit. <laughs> I can take a cocktail, I can take two. I, I guess I could take three. I don't remember ever having taken more than that in a social eating, but I could if I wanted to, but if I ever found them taking me, or if I ever found my being able to resist them, I'd part company with them in a hurry. I would say, I'd follow the same rule if I were smoking again now. And when I got to the point where the cigars were smoking me, I did, I quit. Quit right off. I want to be in possession of Napoleon Hill all the time. Not too much, not too little. Temperance, temperance, it's a marvelous thing. There's nothing so very bad in life, don't you know, if you don't overdo it. Then the patience, under all circumstances, patience. You have to have patience in this world we're living. It's a world of competition. You're constantly being called upon to use your patience. and to t By using patience, you learn to time these things so that uh, you uh, get action out of other people at the time when, it's more, when the time is more favorable. But if you don't have patience, you can try to force the hand of other people. You'll get a no or you get a turn down or a knockdown when you don't want it. <laughs> Patience requires, uh, you, you require patience in order that you may time your relationships with people. And you have to have a lot of patience. You have to be able to uh, control yourself at all times. Most people don't have much patience, you know. You can make, uh, you take the average person, take the majority of people, you can make them mad in two seconds. All you've got to do is say the wrong thing. Or do the wrong thing. Why, uh, I don't need to be, uh, get angry because somebody says or does the wrong thing. I could if I want to, but I, it's my choice. I can choose not to get mad. Number 23, gracefulness in posture and carriage of the body. Now, if I came in and her like this, of course I'd be very comfortable. That's much easier. But it's finer for me to stand up like this and look like I can stand straight without leaning on anything. Slump around and uh, be careless in your posture. Marchi is one who is not uh, very particular about his own personal appearance and so forth. It's a good idea to have gracefulness in posture and carriage of the body. And then 24, humility of the heart based upon a keen sense of modesty. Humility of the heart. I don't know of anything as wonderful as to have true humility of the heart. Because, you know, when I think about criticizing anybody for anything now, yeah, and sometimes there are times when I do have to criticize people. Sometimes I have to criticize the people I'm working with. Some of them, not all of them. But always inside of me, maybe they don't hear it, but inside of me, I, when I find it necessary for me to express disapproval of anything anybody does, I always say inside of me, well, God pity us all. And but for the grace of God, I'd be the man that I'm over there criticizing. And maybe I've done things that ten times as bad as the thing he, I'm criticizing him for. In other words, I try to maintain that sense of humility in my heart, regardless of what happens to me that's unpleasant. And regardless of how, the more successful I become, the more, hum, more I observe this uh, feeling of humility of the heart. Recognizing that after all, whatever success I have is due entirely to the friendly, marvelous love and affection and cooperation of other people. Because without that, I could never have spread myself over the world the way I have. I could never have benefited the people that I have. I had. could never have grown the way I have grown had it not been for the love and the affection and the marvelous, friendly cooperation of other people. And I couldn't have gotten that cooperation if I hadn't adjusted myself to other people in a state of friendliness. 
Last but not least, personal magnetism. That's, uh, that has uh, reference to the t uh, sex emotion, of course. An inborn trait and the only one of the traits of personality which cannot be cultivated, but it can be controlled and directed to beneficial usage. As a matter of fact, the uh, most outstanding leaders, salesmen, speakers, uh, uh, clergymen, uh, lawyers, lecturers, teachers, most outstanding in every field of endeavor, as a matter of fact, are people who have learned to transmute sex emotion. That is to say, convert that great creative energy over into doing the thing that you want to do most at the time being. And that word transmute is something to conjure with, something to look up in the dictionary until you make sure you understand what it means. Now, uh, you've got a lot of thinking to do about this, and uh, you're going to make discoveries about yourself. You're going to find out that when you really come down to answering these questions and giving yourself a rating, that uh, you have certain weaknesses that you didn't know you had, and that you have certain strengths and certain good qualities that you perhaps had under e under value. Let's uh, find out about ourselves to see just where we stand, what it is that makes us tick, why people like us, why people dislike us. And I could take any one of you and sit down with you, and by asking you, uh, I'll say not over twenty questions. I can I could lay my finger right on what's keeping you from being popular if you are not popular. And you can do the same thing. That's what I want you to do. I want you to learn to analyze people, starting with yourself. Find out what it is that makes people popular, what it makes them tick. And uh, when you do that, you have one of the greatest assets that you could possibly imagine. Thank you very much. Well, we're on a great lesson tonight. We're starting out with a personal initiative. And uh, this, uh, this is a great lesson because... It's the action-producing portion of this philosophy. It, it wouldn't make very much difference whether you understood all of the other principles or not uh, if you didn't do something about it, now would it? In other words, uh, the value that you're going to get out of this philosophy will not consist of anything that I will say in these lectures, not consist of anything that I put in my notes, nor anything that's in your lessons or anything that's in any of my textbooks that you'll be reading, that's uh, important, but the important thing is what you will do about all of this. The action you will take to start using this philosophy on your own personal initiative. Now, there are certain things, that, uh, certain attributes of initiative and leadership, and I want you to start in and grade yourself on them, and there are 31 of them. I'm going to make comment on the ones that I consider of greatest importance. Uh, incidentally, this is a grading of yourself on these qualities will be the first step toward making those qualities your own. I don't believe that I need to make much comment on number one, on a definite major purpose, because obviously if you don't have a, an objective in life, a major overall purpose, you have not very much personal initiative. And that's one of the most important steps to take, is to find out what it is you want to do. Maybe if, uh, if, you, if you're not sure what you want to do over a lifetime, let's find out what you're going to do this year, the remainder of this year. Let's, uh, let's uh, set our goal not too high, perhaps, but, uh, and not too far in the distance. If you're in a business or a profession or a job, uh, your definite major purpose certainly could uh, enable you to step up your income from uh, your services, whatever your services may be. And then at the end of the year, you can, uh, uh, you can review your record and uh, reestablish your definite major purpose and step it up to something bigger, maybe to a one, another one-year plan or maybe to a five-year plan. But in other words, that's the starting point of, of personal initiative, is to find out where you're going and why, why you're going there, and what you're going to do after you get there, and how much you're going to get out of it when, uh, uh, financially. You know, the majority of people in this world could be very successful if they would just make up their minds how much success they want and in what terms they want to evaluate success. There are a lot of people in this world who want a, a good position and plenty of money, but they're not quite sure just what kind of a position or what kind of money, how much money they want or when they want to get it. Let's do a little thinking on that subject and uh, grade ourselves on number one. Then on number two, an adequate motive to inspire continuous action in pursuit of the object of one's definite major purpose. Now, study yourself carefully and see if you have an adequate motive or motives. It will be very much better if you have more than one motive for wanting to attain the object of uh, your major purpose, whatever that happens to be, or your immediate purpose. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, nobody ever does anything without a motive. 
Well, now, let me restate that. Let me restate that. That's not correct. No one outside of the insane asylum or a person who is off, off balance may do a lot of things without any motive whatsoever, but normal people move only on motive. And the stronger the motive is, the more active they become and the more apt they are to act upon their own personal initiative. You know, you don't have to have an awful lot of brains in this world. You don't have to be very, so very brilliant. You don't have to have such a, a wonderful education in order to be an outstanding success if you will only take what little you have, whether it's little or much, and start using it, putting it into operation, doing something about it and with it. And of course, that calls for initiative. And number three, a master mind alliance, that is to say, friendly cooperation, cooperation at least, through which to acquire the necessary power for noteworthy achievement. Uh, take the initiative now and find out just how many friends you have that you can count, uh, call on if you were in need of something in the way of cooperation. Make a list of them. In your notes, make a list of the people that you really and truly could turn to if you needed some favor, if you needed an endorsement, if you needed an introduction, maybe if you needed to make a loan of money. And incidentally, unless you have all the money lying around that you need, the time might come when you need to make a loan. Wouldn't it be very nice to know someone that you could turn to in the case of need and get the money you need? Of course, you can always go to a bank. All you have to do is to give a, a four-for-one security, government bonds, and you can get all the money you want. But there are times when you want uh, medium sums, perhaps, or you want other favors comparable to the borrowing of money, and you, you need to have somebody, uh, the acquaintance of somebody cultivated so that when you turn to them for favors, you can get them. But above all, if you are aiming at anything above mediocrity, you need to have a mastermind alliance of one or more people beside yourself who not only will cooperate with you, but who will go out of the way to help you and assist you and who have the ability to do something that will be a benefit, benefit to you. And it's up to you to take the initiative to build those mastermind allies. You know, they don't just come along and join you because uh, you're a good fellow. You have to lay out a plan. You have to have an objective. And uh, you have to find the people suitable to make up your mastermind alliance. And then you have to give them an adequate motive for becoming a, a mastermind ally of yours. Now, incidentally, I happen to know that the, the vast majority of people do not have a mastermind alliance with other people. And don't be afraid to grade yourself zero on this one if you don't have one. But next time you come to grade, don't, don't grade zero. Grade higher than that. And uh, the only way you can grade higher if you grade zero now is to start in and find at least one mastermind ally that you can attach yourself to right now, in the beginning. Number four, self-reliance in proportion to the nature of your major purpose. Find out just exactly how much self-reliance you have. Incidentally, when you come to check yourself on self-reliance, uh, you may need some help from other people. You may need some help from your wife, or your husband, or your closest friend, or somebody who knows you real well. You may think you have self-reliance, but <clears throat> do you know how you can tell about how much self-reliance you have? Would you be interested in knowing how you can check that very accurately? All right, go back up there to number one and uh, carefully evaluate your definite major purpose and see just how big that is. Or if you have a definite major purpose, and if you don't have one, or if it's not outstanding and above anything that you've attained up to the present, then you don't have very much self-reliance, and you should grade very low on that. If you have the proper amount of self-reliance, you'll step your definite major purpose up way beyond anything you have ever achieved before, and you'll become determined to attain it. Number five, self-discipline sufficient to ensure mastery of the head and the heart and to sustain one's motives until they are realized. Uh, where and when do you need self-discipline most, do you think? When you're on the way up and when everything's rosy and going well and you're succeeding? Is that when you need it? <laughs> I thought you'd call me on that one. <laughs> That's right. You need self-discipline when things are, when the going is hard, when the outlook is not favorable. What kind of self-discipline do you need at that point? Why, you need discipline over your mind to the extent that you know where you're going, uh, you know that you have a right to go there, and you know that you're in, determined to go there regardless of how hard the going may be or how much opposition you may meet with. And you'll uh, need at least enough self-discipline uh, to sustain you through the period when the going is hard, instead of quitting or complaining, 
And number six, persistence, based on the will to win. Uh, do you know how many times the average person has to fail before he quits or decides he wants to do something else? Once. Once? Don't you think you're generous? <laughs> Once? <laughs> Did you ever hear of the fellow who fails before he starts because he knows that he, there's no use of starting because he knows he can't do a thing? Did you ever hear of him? Well, that cuts it down below one. <laughs> you see? And would you be interested in knowing that the vast majority of people fail before they start? They, they actually never make a start. They think of things that they might do, but they never do anything about it. And did you know also that a vast majority of the people, even though they do start, uh, at the first opposition they quit or allow themselves to be diverted over to something else? I wonder, it just occurs to me to ask a question. I wonder if, if you who have been here close to me and where we have taken our hair down and talking frankly, I wonder if you know what my, my outstanding asset it happens to be. Never give up. Will to win. Well, yeah, you're getting hot. <laughs> I have persistence and the, and the will to win and also the, uh, the self-discipline with which to stick to a thing the hard, all the harder when the going is the hardest. Now, that is my outstanding quality. It always has been. It always will be. And I want to tell you, without those traits, I never would have uh, completed this philosophy. I never would have been able to... Uh, have it introduced as widely as it has been, and I wouldn't be standing here talking to you tonight. And what about that trait? Is that something you're born with, or is it something that you can acquire? acquire. Well, if you couldn't acquire it, there'd be no use of talking about this lesson, would there? No, no. Certainly you can acquire it. And it's not very difficult at that. What is it that causes a person to be uh, persistent, by the way? Motive. Yes, motive. Burning desire. Do you know what a burning desire is? Yes. Yes. Burning desire, or back of a motive, is what makes people persistent, isn't it? A burning desire, back of a motive. I never think of persistence and a burning desire that I don't uh, think of my courtship. I remember that I put more persistence and more burning desire back of my courtship than anything else that I ever went into in my life. And I want to tell you, without that, I don't think you get very far in a courtship. Well, don't you think you could transmute that, uh, that emotion over to, to something else, putting it back of your uh, business or your profession or your job, and have just as much emotional feeling about attaining success in your job as you could about selling yourself to the one of your choice? Don't you think you could do that? You know what that word transmute means, by the way? Do you? What does it mean? Fine, Redirect. fine, marvelous. Redirect. Have you ever tried it on anything or anybody? Yes. Yeah. Marvelous, marvelous. If you haven't tried it, start trying it. The next time you feel moody or discouraged, try to change that over into a, an emotion of courage and faith. You see what a marvelous uh, thing happens to you. You change the whole chemistry of your whole brain and your whole body. And you'll be much more effective. And number seven is a well-developed faculty of the imagination, controlled and directed. Uh, do you think those last words there are important? Yes. Yes, an imagination not controlled and directed might be very dangerous. I once uh, made a, a survey, made an analysis of all of the men in the federal penitentiaries of the United States. I did that for the Department of Justice. And you'll be interested in knowing that the majority of the men in the penitentiary were there because they had too much imagination. <laughs> but it was not controlled and directed in a constructive uh, direction. Now, imagination is a marvelous thing, but if you don't have it under control and if you don't direct it to definite ends, constructive ends, it may be very dangerous to you. And number eight, the habit of forming definite and prompt decisions. By the way, do you do that? Do you form definite and prompt decisions when you have all of the facts in hand with which to make decisions? Yes. Well, I think some of you are just a little bit too modest. Well, uh, seriously, friends, if you do not have the habit of making decisions promptly and definitely, clear-cut decisions, when uh, all of the facts are in, you're uh, loafing on the job, you're procrastinating, and you're destroying this very vital thing called uh, personal initiative. 
One of the finest uh, places to, take, uh, to start practicing personal initiative is to learn to make decisions firmly and definitely and quickly when once you have all of the facts available. Now, I'm not talking about snap judgments. I'm not talking about uh, opinions or snap judgments based upon half-baked uh, evidence. I'm talking about facts, all of the facts on a given subject, which are not in, uh, in your hands and available. You should then do something with those facts. You should make up your mind exactly what you're going to do and not dilly-dally around, as so many people do. Because if you do that, uh, first thing you know, you will be in the habit of dilly-dallying around in connection with everything. In other words, you will not be a person who acts upon his own personal initiative. And number... <laughs> the habit of basing opinions on facts instead of relying on guesswork. How many of you do that? How many of you rely upon the facts instead of uh, guesswork? Well, pretty truthful bunch, I think. <laughs> I wonder if you do. I, I wonder if you recognize how many times you are, uh, you're acting on guesswork in comparison to the number of times that you're acting upon facts in forming your opinions. I wonder if you recognize the importance of uh, making it your business to get at facts before you form an opinion about anything. Did you know that you have no right to an opinion about anything at any time, anywhere, unless it's based upon facts or what you believe to be facts? Did you know that? And why is that true? Would you tell me why you don't have a right to do that? Because you don't want to get into trouble. You don't want to fail. That's why. <laughs> of course, you can go ahead and uh, have opinions, and we all do, a bunch of flock of them. You can even give them to somebody else without them asking for them. And we do that right along. But before you really and truly have, can safely express an opinion or have one, you must make, do a certain amount of research and base your opinion upon facts or what you believe to be facts. Now we'll come down to this enthusiasm one, number 10. The capacity to generate enthusiasm at will and control it. Do you know how to generate enthusiasm at will? But uh, what, what's back of all this? What happens before you start doing anything in connection with enthusiasm? Yes, you, uh, you have to feel it, don't you? You have to feel the emotion. of. You have to be quickened and your mind has to be alerted with some definite objective or purpose or motive. And then uh, you do something about that motive. You do it with words, with the expression of your face or by some other form of action. That word action is inseparable from uh, the, the word enthusiasm. You can't separate the two. Now, there are two kinds of enthusiasm. There's passive enthusiasm, where enthusiasm which you feel, but you give no expression of it whatsoever. And there are times when you need that kind, believe you me. Because if you don't have that kind, uh, you disclose to other people what goes on in your mind at times when you don't want that to happen. You take a great leader, a great executive, and uh, while he may have a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, he'll, he'll display that enthusiasm only to whom he, soever he pleases and under whatsoever circumstances he pleases. He will not just turn it on and go off and leave it. That's the way you and I do it. <laughs> or do we? That's the way the majority of people do. When they have enthusiasm, they just turn it on and blubber over in it, and they accomplish nothing. Controlled enthusiasm, enthusiasm turned on at the right time and then turned off at the right time is an important thing, and your initiative is the only thing that can control that. You know, if you took that one subject alone, the question of how to turn on and on and off enthusiasm, and got the art down fine, you could become a marvelous salesman of anything you might want to sell. Did you know that? Yeah. You really could. Did you ever hear of anybody selling anything that didn't have, feel enthusiasm over what he's trying to sell? Did you? Did you ever sell anything that you didn't have that feeling of enthusiasm over what you were trying to do for the other fellow? You may have thought you did, but you didn't. If you didn't have that feeling of enthusiasm on your own initiative, then you didn't make a sale. Somebody may have bought something from you because he needed it didn't have to have it, but you had very little to do with it unless you had that feeling that you imparted to him. And how do you impart the feeling of enthusiasm to another person? 
How do you do that when you're selling, for instance? Fine. Must be sold on it yourself. That's a very good way of putting it. In other words, it's, it starts inside of your own emotional makeup. You must feel that way. And uh, if you open your mouth to speak, you must speak with enthusiasm. You must put some enthusiasm into your, uh, the expression of your face. Put on a smile, a good broad one. Because nobody speaks with enthusiasm with a frown on his face. They do, the two just don't go together, do they? No, they don't. So there are a lot of things that you must learn about this business of expressing enthusiasm if you're going to make the most of it, and all of them involve your personal initiative. You've got to do it. Nobody can do it for you. I can't tell you how to be enthusiastic. I can tell you what are the component parts of enthusiasm and how to express it, but after all, the job of actually expressing it is up to you. Let's pass on down to number 12, uh, tolerance. Uh, do you know what tolerance is? What is it? Open mind on what? How many of you are open-minded on everything? Come on. <laughs> you really think you are? <laughs> I'd hate to tell you how far off you are on that one. Because <laughs> you're friends of mine and I want to keep you that way. <laughs> open-minded on all subjects? I've, I'll admit that I'm not. I'm not open-minded on all subjects. I'm open-minded on a lot of subjects, the ones I want to be open-minded on. <laughs> but we shouldn't. We shouldn't have any attitude toward anybody under any circumstances unless it's based upon something to justify that attitude or what we believe to justify it, at least. It, do you have any idea how much, you, uh, how much value do you deprive yourselves of all the way through life just because you close your mind against somebody you don't like when the, that person might be the most beneficial person in the world to you if you only had an open mind toward him? Did you know that one of the, uh, one of the costliest things in an industrial or a business organization is the closed minds of the people that work there? Did you know that? If you don't know that, I want you to find it out. It's the most costly thing in any business organization or in any industry is the closed minds of the people who work there, closed toward one another, closed toward opportunities, closed toward the people they serve, and closed toward themselves. Uh, when you speak of intolerance, you often think of um, uh, somebody who doesn't like the other fellow because of his religion or his politics. Well, that's just to, that doesn't scratch the surface of the real meaning of this subject of, of intolerance. It extends to almost every human relationship. And unless you do maintain, form the habit of maintaining an open mind on all subjects, toward all people, at all times, you'll never be a great thinker. You'll never have a great magnetic personality. And you certainly will never be very well liked unless you do have an open mind. <clears throat> Did you know that you can be very frank with people whom you don't like and who do not like you if they know that you're sincere and that you're speaking with an open mind? Did you know that? Yes. The one thing that people will not tolerate is to recognize that they're talking to somebody whose mind is already closed and what they're saying has no effect whatsoever, regardless of how, how much value there is to it or how much truth there is to it. And there are a lot of people in this world whose minds are so definitely closed on so many things that you couldn't crack the mind with a sledgehammer and you couldn't get an ounce of truth in there if you lived a hundred years. They're just closed up tight, sealed, hermetically sealed. Number 13, the habit of doing more than you're paid for always. How many do that? Let me have your hands. <laughs> What's the matter with the ones who don't? Is there anything wrong with this habit? Of <laughs> oh, that word always. <laughs> All right, let's leave it off. How many of you follow the habit of rendering more service and better service than you paid to render? Part of the time. Part of the time. Well, that's more like it. <laughs> that's more like it. 
That's something in connection with which you certainly have to move on your personal initiative. Nobody's going to tell you to do that. Nobody's going to expect you to do that. That's something that's entirely within your own prerogative. But incidentally, it's probably one of the most important and one of the most profitable sources through which you can exercise your own personal initiative. If I had to pick out the time and the place and the circumstance under which you could make use of your personal initiative most beneficially, undoubtedly, it would be in connection with your following the habit of rendering more service and better service than you're paid to render. Because you don't have to ask anybody for the privilege of doing that. And also, if you do follow that habit, not just do it once in a while, that, that's not so very effective, but follow the habit. Sooner or later, the uh, law of increasing returns begins to pile up uh, dividends for you, and when, it, when the dividends come back, they come back greatly multiplied. I want to tell you that when you start living by this principle of going the extra mile, you can expect unusual things to happen to you, and they'll all be pleasant, every one of them. And number 14, tactfulness and a keen sense of diplomacy. How many of you have tactfulness and a keen sense of diplomacy? Let me see your hands on that one. Well, now, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that is pretty good. Well, now, let's, uh, maybe that definition is a little too broad. How many of you are tactful in your conversations with people, just ordinary conversations? Tactful. Well, that's pretty good. Um, what do you think about this business of being tactful? Is it worth the time it takes to be tactful, do you think? Yes. You think it is? Why? That's right. Now you're getting at You get the cooperation of others more easily if you're tactful. You come in and tell me that I've got to do something, and I say, well, um, maybe now just a minute. Just a minute, maybe I do have to do something, but if you put it to me that way, I'm going to set up some resistance right away. But if you come in and say to me, uh, I would very greatly appreciate it if you would do something, but you knew in the first place that you had a right to demand on me, but you didn't put it that way. One of the most impressive things that I learned from Andrew Carnegie at the very beginning of my association with him was that he never commanded anybody to do anything, never. No matter who the man was that he requested to do something, uh, he never asked, he never commanded him, he always asked him if he would do a certain thing. Would you please do a certain thing, or will you do the other thing? And it's surprising the amount of loyalty that Mr. Carnegie had from his men. They'd uh, go out of their way for him any time of the day or night. Because of his tactfulness in dealing with them, and when it was necessary for him to discipline one of them, he usually invited him out to the house, gave him a nice state dinner, a real uh, five or six course dinner, really put on the dog. And then after dinner, the showdown came when they went over to the library. And he'd start asking questions. One of his uh, chief secretaries was scheduled to become a member of his mastermind group. And uh, this boy found out that he was scheduled to for promotion, and it went to his head, and he commenced to run around with a bunch of high binders in Pittsburgh, people who throw cocktail parties and such. And just in a little while, he was taking too much liquor, staying out too late. His eyes were hanging out on his cheeks when he'd come in in the morning. And Mr. Carnegie let this go on for about three months. And he got invited out one evening to dinner. And after dinner was over, they went into the library. Mr. Carnegie said, Now, <clears throat> uh, I'm sitting over there in uh, your chair, and you're sitting over here in my chair. I want to know what you would do if you were in my place. And you had a man scheduled to, for an important promotion, and all of a sudden it seemed to have gone to his head, started running around with fast company, staying out late at night, drinking too much liquor, paying too much attention to everything except his job. What in the world would you do in a case of that kind? I, I'm anxious to know. This young man said, Mr. Carnegie, I know you're going to fire me, so you might just as well start and get it over with. <laughs> Mr. Carnegie said, oh, no. Oh, no. If I'd wanted to fire you, I wouldn't have given you a nice dinner and I wouldn't have brought you out to my house. <laughs> so I could have done that down at the office. No, I'm not going to fire you. I'm just going to have you ask yourself a question and see whether or not you're not about in a position to fire yourself. Maybe you are. Maybe you're closer to it than you realize. 
that man right about faced and did become one of Mr. Carnegie's mastermind group and did become a millionaire later on. It, it absolutely saved him from himself. Mr. Carnegie's tactfulness was out of this world. He knew how to handle men. He knew how to get them to examine themselves. Uh, it doesn't do much good for me to examine you, but it might do a lot of good if you examined yourself in connection with your faults and in connection with your virtues. Self-analysis is one of the most important forms of personal initiative that you can possibly engage in. Self-analysis. I never let a day go by there. I don't examine myself to see where I have fallen down, to where I'm weak, where I can make improvements, what I could do to render more service and better service. Lord, I examine myself every day. And believe you me, this has been going on for a great number of years. And even today, I, I can always find some place where I can improve, where I can do something better or something more. It's a very healthy form of personal initiative. Well, I'll assure you, and it's very interesting, too. Because you finally get down to where you'll be honest with yourself. Do you have any idea how many people there are who are dishonest with themselves? It's the, it's the worst form of dishonesty that I know anything about at all. Creating alibis in your own mind to support your acts and your deeds and your thoughts. Instead of examining yourself and finding out why you're weak and then bridging those weaknesses or getting somebody in your master mind to alliance to bridge them for you. <laughs> now that's a personal initiative too. And it's the kind of personal initiative that most people won't engage in because it involves uh, self-analysis and self-criticism. Well, which would you rather have? Would you rather have an outsider criticize you and point out your faults or would you rather criticize yourself and find them? Yourself. Why? Well, you can be kind of uh, you can be kind of confidential about it. You don't have to publicize these weaknesses that you find out, and you can get them corrected before anybody else finds out about them. If you do do a good job, but if you wait until somebody else has to call them to your attention, then they become public property, don't they? And uh, they may embarrass you. They may uh, hurt your pride. They may even cause you to build up an inferiority complex if you wait for the other fellow to have to point out your weaknesses to you. That's personal initiative too. Finding out what your weak spots are, what it is that causes you to be disliked by other people, why it is you're not getting ahead as well as some of the other people, and why you know you've got just as much brains or even more than they have. Another marvelous place to uh, take the personal initiative is, uh, is to compare yourself with other people who are succeeding beyond your success. Make comparisons and analyses and to see what it is they have that you don't have. You'll be surprised to find out how much you can learn from the other fellow. Maybe the fellow you don't like very well either. You can learn something from him. If he's ahead of you, if he's doing better than you are, believe you me, you can always learn something from the man who's doing better than you're doing. Sometimes you can learn something from the fellow who's not doing as well as you're doing, too. It works both ways. You may find out why he's not doing as well. Number 15, the habit of listening much and talking only when necessary. I wonder how many of you listen more than you talk. Would you give me your hands? And I've never yet heard of anybody learning anything while he's talking. <laughs> Except that maybe he might learn to uh, not talk so much. <laughs> well, uh, now this seems kind of funny, but it's not funny. It's very serious. The vast majority of people do a lot more talking than they do listening. And uh, they seem dead bit on getting the other fellow told off instead of listening to see what the other fellow has to say that they might profit by. Listening much and talking when necessary. Think first and talk last. And 16, a well-developed sense of observation of details. <coughs> How many of you feel that you have a keen sense of observation of details? How many of you feel that you could walk down State Street here or any of these streets in front of uh, uh, Marshall Fields, just casually walk by, and then uh, after you got at the end of the block, give a very accurate description of everything you saw in the window? Think you could do that? I once belonged to a class in Philadelphia directed by a man who was, who was teaching us the importance of observation of small details because he said it was the little details that made up the successes and the failures of life, not the big ones at all, but the little ones. 
The ones we usually pass aside as not being important or that we do want to even observe. And as a part of our training, he took us out of the, out of the hall and took us down the, the street one block, crossed over the street, came up one block, and back into the hall. And in doing so, we passed about ten stores, one of which was a hardware store. And in that hardware store window, I would say there was easily 500 articles. And he asked each one of us to take a, a pad, a, a paper, and a pencil along. Now, mind you, giving us a crutch for our memory. And to put down the things that we saw as we passed along that we thought were important. And guess how many was the greatest number of things that, pe that, uh, that any of us put down going two blocks, one block down this way, across and up the other side, and covering at least 20 stores. Guess how many was the, uh, the greatest number of things that, the, uh, that any of us saw? <laughs> You'll be surprised. The greatest number of, of things that anybody had down was 56. And when this man came back, he didn't have any paper, and then no pencil. He listed 746 and described each one of them and told what window it was in and what part of the window it was in. I, di I didn't accept it. I, I had to go down after the class was over and double uh, backtracked him and checked it. And he was absolutely 100% accurate. In other words, he had trained himself to observe details, not just a few of them, but all of them. And believe you me, a good executive, a good leader, a good anything is a person who uh, observes all the things that are happening around him, the good things and the bad things, the positives and the negatives. He doesn't just happen to notice those things that interest him. He notices everything that may interest him or may affect his interests. Attention to details. Number 18, the capacity to stand criticism without resentment. How many of you can do that? Come on, give me your hands. Now I'm going to test you another way. How many of you invite criticism, from, that is friendly criticism, from other people? How many of you invite it? Uh, you're overlooking a bit there, my friends, those of you who didn't vote. You're overlooking a big bit. Because one of the finest things that could possibly happen is to have a regular source a friendly criticism of the thing that you're doing in life, the thing, the thing that constitutes your major purpose at least. I invite it because the things that you're doing daily that may offend other people, you think they're all right or you wouldn't be doing them. And you're going to keep on doing them if somebody doesn't call them to your attention. Is that right? Yes. So you need a source of friendly criticism. It's one of the most marvelous things. In the world. I'm not talking about these people who don't like you and criticize you just because they don't like you. That's no good. I wouldn't have any, let that have any effect on me whatsoever. And on the other hand, I wouldn't pay too much, too much attention to the person who gives me friendly criticism just because he loves me. <laughs> you know, you can do yourself just as much damage that way. I, I've heard it said out in Hollywood that uh, those stars out there, when they begin to believe their press agents, and sometimes they do, they're just about through. <laughs> That's right. Well, you need to have the privilege, ladies and gentlemen, of looking at yourselves through the eyes of other people. You need that privilege. Yeah, we all need it. Because I'll assure you that when you walk down the street, you won't look the same as the other fellow that sees you as you think you look to yourself. And when you open your mouth and speak in conversation or otherwise, you don't, uh, the, what registers in the other mind, man's mind is not always what you think is registering at all. You need criticism. You need analysis. You need people to point out to you changes that you ought to make, because we all have to make changes as we go along. If we didn't, we wouldn't grow. But did you know that the majority of people resent any kind of suggestion or criticism whatsoever that uh, differs from what they're doing? Anything at all that would change their way of doing things, they resent it. And consequently, they do themselves great damage by resenting. Friendly criticism. Someone has said that <laughs> there's no such thing as constructive criticism. I, I can't buy that. I think there is such a thing as constructive yeah. criticism. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Just remember that no matter what you're doing, who you are, how well you do it, 
you'll never get a hundred percent approval from the from the crowd. Don't expect it, and don't be disturbed too much if you don't get it. Loyalty number twenty: loyalty to all to whom loyalty is due. Loyalty comes at the top of the list in my book of rules of qualifications of people that I want to be associated with. If you don't have loyalty to the people that have a right to your loyalty, you don't have anything. No matter how brilliant you are, how, mal- how sharp or smart, how well educated, the smarter you are, the more dangerous you may be. If you don't have loyalty, if you can't be loyal to the people that, you have, or, that have a right to your loyalty. How many of you are loyal to the people that you're supposed to be? Well, that's grand. That's grand. I don't mean to make any of you tell lies, and I'm sure you wouldn't. But I just want you to check up. You see, when you start voting on something, before you do it, usually speaking, you stop to think, well, now, do I have loyalty? Do I? And if you don't have it, why, well, you think of the, of the person in connection with which you don't have that loyalty, and you decide maybe to do something about it. Now, the, I have loyalty to people that I don't even like. But I do have a sense of obligation to them if I'm related to them in business or professionally or otherwise. Or in in the family circle, there are a few people there that I don't particularly like. But I'm loyal to them because uh, I have that obligation. If they want to be loyal to me, that's all right. If they don't, that's their misfortune, not mine. I have the privilege of being loyal, and I'm going to live up to that privilege because of the values I get out of it, because I have to live with this fellow. I have to sleep with him. I have to look in the mirror every morning and shave his face. I have to give him a bath every once in a while. And you know, I have to be on good terms with him. You can't live with a fellow that closely and not be on good terms with him. To thine own self be true, and it must follow as night to day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And Shakespeare never wrote anything more beautiful and more philosophical than that. To your own self be true. Be loyal to yourself. Because you have to live with self. And if you're loyal to yourself, the chances are you'll be loyal to your friends and your business associates. And number 23, the necessary attractiveness of personality to to induce cooperation. How about this uh, business of um, an attractive personality? Is it something you're born with or uh, is it something that you must do about on your own initiative? You can acquire it. There's only one trait, only one of the 25 factors that go to make up an attractive personality that, you, uh, that you're born with, or not born with, as the case may be. Only one. Personal magnetism. Personal magnetism. And you can even do something about that. And certainly all of these other 24 factors, uh, you can do something about every one of them, because they're everyone subject to cultivation through what? Personal initiative. Personal initiative, of course. You've got to do it yourself. First of all, you've got to know uh, how you stand on each of these points. You've got to know how you stand, and you can't always uh, take your own word for it. You've got to get your wife or your husband or somebody else to tell you. Sometimes you, make an, uh, you have an enemy, and he'll tell you where you fall down. It's, did you know that enemies were good things to have once in a while? Yeah. Uh-huh. Why? <laughs> of course. Believe you me, they don't pull punches. And if you'll examine what your enemies or those who do not like you say about you, the chances are that you might learn something of value. If nothing else, you'll learn to at least to uh, see to it that you don't let them tell the truth about you. Whatever they say is not correct because you're going to be so straight in the road that whatever they say about you derogatory is not going to be true. That's an advantage, isn't it? So don't be afraid of enemies. Don't be afraid of people who don't like you. Because they may say things that uh, put you on the track uh, of discovery of something that you need to know about yourself. I had a salesman come in and see me some years ago, and he said that he had been with his company about 10 years. And he had made a wonderful record, had several promotions, and was up in the big money. And all of a sudden, six months previously, his sales began to go down. People, customers that he used to call on, that used to give him the business, would frown on him. And uh, I noticed when he came in that he had one of these big Texas 10-gallon hats on. I said, by the way, how long have you had that hat? He said, I got it about six months ago down in Texas. I said, listen, fellow, uh, are you selling in Texas? He said, no, I don't don't make Texas very often. I said, oh, listen, you wear that hat only when you go down in Texas because they don't like that hat. It doesn't look good on you. (laughs) Well, he said, would that make any difference? I said, you'd be surprised what a difference it'll make, your personal appearance. Some people just don't like the way you look and they won't do business with you. 
Yes, you can do something about your personality. You can find out the traits that you have that irritate other people, and you can, do, uh, you can correct those traits. But you uh, have to do it yourself. You have to make the discovery yourself, or you have to get somebody who's frank enough to do it for you. And then number 24, the capacity to concentrate full attention upon one subject at a time. When you start to make a point, exploit it right down to its final analysis and make a climax and then get on to your next point. Don't try to cover too many points at one time. If you do, you'll not cover any points at all. I wonder how many of you have been making that mistake in your relations with other people and in selling and in public speaking or whatever you're doing. It used to be one of my most outstanding weaknesses. I used to do just that very thing. And I had a man come to me and call that to my attention. And I think uh, no training that I ever had in public speaking was as valuable as that. Uh, and it was for free. He didn't charge me anything for it. He said, you have a wonderful command of English. You have a marvelous uh, capacity for enthusiasm. You have a tremendously big store of, of illustrations that are interesting. But he said, you have a bad head of taking off after something out there that's not related to the point you're making and then coming back later on picking up the point. In the meantime, it's gotten cold. You see? Well, grade yourself on that capacity to concentrate full attention upon one subject at a time. Whether you're speaking or whether you're thinking or whether you're writing or teaching, whatever you do, let's concentrate on one thing at a time. And then on the habit of learning from your mistakes. If you don't learn from your mistakes, why, well, you might just as well not make them. <laughs> that isn't a truism. Tell me what is. <laughs> I never, I never see a man duplicating a mistake over and over again. That I don't think of that old Chinese uh, aphorism: "If a man uh, fool me once, shame on the man. But if you fool me twice, shame on me." <laughs> there are a lot of people that should say shame on me because they just don't seem to learn from mistakes at all. And uh, number 26, a willingness to accept full responsibility for the mistakes of one's subordinates. If you have subordinates and they make mistakes, it's you who have uh, failed and not the subordinates. Remember that, will you? Either train him how to do the thing right or else uh, put him in some other job where you won't have to supervise him. Let somebody else do that. But the responsibility is yours if the person working under you is subordinate to you. Number 27, the habit of adequately recognizing the merits and abilities of others. Don't try to steal the thunder from the other fellow. If he's done a good job, give him full credit. Give him double credit. Give him more than he's entitled to, rather than less. And a little pat on the back has never been known to hurt anybody when, he, when you know he has done a good job. The most successful people like recognition, and sometimes people work harder for recognition than they will for anything else. Some people are incorruptible, you know, no matter how, you can't overflatter them because they know what their capacity is. If you go beyond that, they, they begin to be suspicious of you. Most people, however, I believe are corruptible when it comes to this business of flattery. You can, over, <laughs> you can overflatter them and they kind to believe it. And that's bad for them and for you too. There was a book written that was widely distributed all over this country, and the central theme in that book was, if you want to get along in the world, flatter people. Well, flattery is as old as the world. It's one of the most deadly and one of the oldest weapons, and one of the most dangerous. Now, I like approbation. I like those five people that, uh, that happened to know me and complimented me. I, I enjoyed it. But if they'd gone, if one of them had followed me out and said, well, Mr. Hill, I, I, I appreciate all that you've uh, done for me and all that sort of thing, but uh, by the way... Uh, uh, would you mind if I came around the house tonight? I'd like to talk to you about a business proposition. <laughs> you see, uh, right away, I'd have said, well, now he's flattered me in order that he may get some of my time and he may get some benefits from me. So too much flattery, too much commendation is not so good either. Well, anyhow, a positive mental attitude at all times, 29, but I wanted to call your attention to number 28, the habit of applying the golden rule principle in all human relationships. I'm not going to ask you to vote on that one. I'm only going to call your attention to the fact that one of the finest things you can do for yourself is to put yourself in the other fellow's position when you go to make any decision or engage in any transaction involving the other fellow. Just put yourself in the other fellow's position before you make a final decision. And if you do that, the chances are that you'll always do the fair thing by the other man. 
Number 30, the habit of assuming full responsibility for any task that you've undertaken. Not coming back with an alibi. Did you know the one thing at which the majority of people are the most apt, most adept in doing? Alibis. Alibis. My, oh, my, oh, my. <clears throat> Alibis. Creating a reason why they didn't succeed or didn't get the job done or didn't do the thing. If the majority of people who create alibis would put half as much time into doing the thing right or trying to do it right that they put into explaining why they didn't do it, you know, they'd get a lot farther in life and be much better off. And generally speaking, the man who is the most clever at creating an alibi is the most inefficient man in the whole works. They make a profession of spinning alibis. They will think them up in advance so that if they are called on the carpet or get caught over the barrel, they have an answer. There's only one thing that counts, and that's the success. Results is, are what count. Results. I once wrote an epigram covering this subject that I thought was very effective. Success requires no explanations. Failure permits no alibis. In other words, if it's a success, you don't need any explanations. And if it's a failure, you all the alibis and the explanations in the world won't do any good. It's still a failure, isn't it? Yeah. And number 31, the habit of keeping the mind occupied with that which one desires and not with that which one does not want. You know, the uh, vast uh, majority of instances in which uh, people engage in personal initiative is in connection with the things they don't want. Had you ever thought of that? Now there is one place where most people don't have to be taught to take the personal initiative. They really work at it. Work at thinking about all the things they don't want and that's precisely what they get out of life. The things that they think about. Things that they attune their minds to. Now, there's a little play, uh, the place where that word transmute can come into play. Instead of thinking about the things you don't want, the things you fear, the things you distrust, the things you dislike, think about all the things you like, all the things you want, and all the things you're going to become determined to get. I must tell you something that happened last uh, Saturday. I went down to the travel agency to get my um, ticket changed so I could come back on Monday instead of Sunday. When I walked in, the manager of the travel agency grabbed my hand when he saw who I was and introduced himself and started in to sell me Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> in a little while, uh, while he still had hold of my hand, talking to me, a man came in, a friend of his, who was connected with one of the airlines, and he heard the name Napoleon Hill, and he grabbed the other hand <laughs> and started to sell me Think and Grow Rich. And he said, you may be interested in knowing that before I went with the, air the airline, I had a sales organization with approximately 100 people, and I required every salesman to have all of your books. That was a must. Well, I felt pretty good. As I started out, there were two very nice-looking young ladies standing on the sidewalk giving out uh, election literature. And as I passed by, one of them said, Say, aren't you Napoleon Hill? I turned around and uh, bowed, and I said, Yes, I am. <laughs> Who are you? She said, Well, I was at a woman's club about two years ago when you delivered an address, and this is my cousin here. Both of our husbands are very successful now due to the fact they have read your books. I went on over to my car, and the policeman was making out a ticket. You see, all this talk... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is the payoff. I put a penny in there thinking that would, uh, 12 minutes would be all I would be in there, but all of this nice uh, conversation that I was getting, uh, I stopped to bathe my vanity in it. And when I got there, this policeman was making out the ticket. He had it about halfway made out. And I walked up to, of course, he didn't know who the car was. I walked up to him. I said, now, you wouldn't do that to Napoleon Hill, would you? He said, Who? I said, Napoleon Hill. He said, no, I wouldn't do that to Napoleon Hill, but I certainly would do it to you. <laughs> well, I, I introduced myself. I took out my credit card and handed it to him and my driver's license, and he said, well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. He took the uh, tab and tore it up, and he said, uh, we'd just forget about that. And he said, you may be interested in knowing 
that I'm on the Glendale Police Force as a result of reading your book, Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, the subject now is a positive mental attitude. I want you to, I want to call your attention to the fact that uh, nothing constructive and worthy of man's efforts ever has been or ever will be achieved except that which comes from a positive mental attitude based on definiteness of purpose and activated by a burning desire and intensified until the burning desire is elevated to the plane of applied faith. Now, here are five steps, five different conditions of the mind, all of which lead up to a positive mental attitude. Take number one, for instance, wishes. Everybody has a stock of wishes. They wish for this, they wish for that, and they wish for the other thing. We all have wishes. Well, uh, nothing very much happens when uh, you just wish for things, does it? No. No. Nothing happens. Well, uh, then you uh, go a little bit further and you become uh, curious. Uh, you put in a lot of time uh, through idle curiosity. And do you think anything ever happens worthwhile in connection with the expression of idle curiosity? No. However, you can and you do consume a lot, a lot of time oftentimes with idle curiosity, don't you? You put in a lot of time oftentimes uh, studying the, uh, what your neighbors do or do not do, what your competitors do or do not do, out of, just out of idle curiosity. Well, that's not uh, leading to a positive mental attitude. Then uh, a step above that, uh, you have hopes. Your wishes now have taken on a more concrete form. They become hopes, hopes of achievement, hopes of attainment, hope of accomplishment, hopes of accumulation of things that you want. Well, uh, just a hope by itself is not very effective, is it? Because we all have a, a, a block of hopes, but not all of us who have hopes have success. We just hope for success. It is, however, better than wishing for it, isn't it? Well, what is the difference between a hope and a wish? Some faith. Yes, that's right. Uh, a hope is uh, taking on, it's beginning to take on the nature of faith, isn't it? That's the idea. You're, you're transmuting a wish into uh, that very desirable state of mind known as faith. Then you come on, uh, you step up your mental attitude to where uh, your hopes are transmuted into something else known as a burning desire. Now, is there any difference between a burning desire and an ordinary desire? Yes. That's right. A burning desire is an intensified desire based upon hope, based upon definiteness of purpose. How does uh, one go about uh, developing a burning desire for anything? If I didn't know the answer to this, believe me, I could get me a flock of answers here, couldn't I? <laughs> That's fine. Well, a burning desire is an obsessional desire, isn't it? And it certainly, you cannot have a burning desire without a motive or motives back of it, can you? And the more motives you can have for a definite thing, the quicker you will have fan your emotions into what is known as a burning desire. But however, that's not enough. There's something else. There's another state of mind you must have before you can be sure of success. And what is that? Applied faith. Now then, you have transmuted wishes, idle curiosity, hopes, and even a burning desire. You've stepped all those up into something still higher. And that is applied faith. What is the difference between applied faith and the ordinary uh, belief in things? That's right. That word applied might, uh, might well be, uh, be uh, synonymous to action. You might, see, you might say active faith. Applied faith and active faith is exa are exactly the same, means the same thing. Faith backed by action, something that you do about it. A prayer brings positive results only when it is expressed in a positive mental attitude. And the most effective prayers are those expressed by individuals who have conditioned their minds to habitually think in terms of a positive mental attitude.
you have any idea, each one of you, let me ask, let me put this question to each one of you. Do you have any idea of the portions, amount of your time that you devote in, each day in thinking of the negative side of things in comparison with the positive side? Wouldn't it be interesting if you, tip, if you kept a tabulation for two or three days of the exact amount of time you put in thinking about the no-can-do side of life and the can-do side, or the positive side, the negative side? You might be astounded uh, if even the most successful people would be astounded to find out how many hours they put in each day in negative thinking. And the very outstanding successes in the world, the great leaders are the ones that put in very little, if any time, in thinking on the negative side. They put in all of their time thinking on the positive side. I once asked Henry Ford if there was anything in the world he wanted or wanted to do that he couldn't do. And he said, no, he didn't believe there was. I asked him if there ever had been. He said, oh, yes, back in the early days before he had learned how to use his mind. And I said, well, now, just what do you mean by that? Well, he said, now... When I want a thing, I want to do a thing, I start in finding out what I can do about it, and I start doing that, and I don't bother about what I can't do, because I just let that alone. That was a homely statement, but I want to tell you, there's a world of philosophy wrapped up in that statement. He put his mind into doing something about the part that he could do something about, and thinking about that, and not about the part that he couldn't do anything about. I venture the suggestion that if you put a problem to the majority of people, a problem, a difficult problem, they will immediately begin to tell you all of the reasons why the problem can't be solved. And if there are some things about the problem that are favorable and some that are unfavorable, the majority of people will see the things that are unfavorable first and oftentimes never see the favorable side. I don't believe there are any problems in connection with which you can't do something in connection with, in connection with which there are not some favorable sides too. I can't think of a single problem that, that could confront me that, I, that wouldn't have a favorable side to it. If nothing else, the favorable side would consist in the fact that I would say that if it's a problem I can solve, I, I will solve it, and if it's a problem I can't solve, I'll not worry about it. And that's something. But the majority of people, when they're confronted with difficult propositions or problems uh, that they can't solve, they start worrying. And then they go into what kind of a state of mind? Negative state of mind. And do you ever accomplish anything worthwhile when you're in that state of mind? No. No, you don't. You're only muddying the water when you make your mind negative. You never accomplish anything worthwhile. You have to learn to keep your mind positive all the time when you want to do things worthwhile. Does a positive mental attitude attract uh, opportunities, or does it uh, repel them? Does a negative mental attitude attract favorable opportunities for you, or repel them? It repels them, doesn't it? Definitely. And does that uh, repelling of opportunities have anything to do with your merit or right to have opportunities? Nothing whatsoever. Absolutely not. You may be just, you may have the right to uh, do all of the good things in, in life, you may be entitled to them, but if you have a negative mental attitude, you will repel the opportunities leading to the attainment of those things. So your job, Manly, is to uh, keep your mind positive so it will attract to you the things that you want, the things that you desire, the things that you are going after. Had you ever uh, stopped to think why it is that prayer generally doesn't bring anything about but except a negative result. Had you ever stopped to wonder about that? You know, I believe that's the biggest stumbling block of most people in all religions is they don't, want, they don't understand why a prayer sometimes brings the negative results or why it generally brings negative results. You couldn't expect anything else because there's a law that governs that. And the law is that your mind attracts to you the counterpart of the things of the mind of the things that the mind is feeding upon. There's no no exception to that rule. It's a natural law. There's no exceptions for anybody. So if you want to attract through prayer or otherwise the things that you desire, you have to make your mind positive. You not only have to believe, but you have to put action back of that belief and transmute it into a faith, applied faith. And you can't have applied faith in a negative state of mind. The two just don't go together.
Constructive mottos are often used by people who recognize what a powerful influence one's daily environment has on the maintenance of a positive mental attitude. The entire industrial plant of the R.G. Laterno Company with 2,000 employees was positivized by placing mottos printed in large letters in all departments and changing them weekly, such as the ones that you see here. Now, those mottos were written for a purpose. Every department in that uh, great sprawling plant of the Laterno Company, every department had those mottos replaced there regularly, sometimes daily in the cafeteria and, uh, and in the other departments weekly. And the mottos are written in the letters a half, of the, a half a foot high so that you could read them all the way across the building. And believe you me, every time they walked into their department, well, they uh, saw that, uh, that uh, motto. By the way, we had a funny experience with them. I was standing in the cafeteria one day when the motto was placed up. To, see, the cafeteria was a place where all the men lined up to get their meals at noon time, and we could catch them all there at one time or another during the day. And the motto read, uh, just remember that uh, your real boss is the one who walks around under your hat. Now, I'd think that would be as plain as mud to anybody that would read it. It would mean that you're, you're the real boss in final analysis. But I heard a man let out an Indian yell. He said, boy, that's what I've always said. I've always known that my foreman was a louse. <laughs> Now, up at the top of the page, there is a method by which one may transmute failure into success, poverty into riches, sorrow into joy, fear into faith. The transmutation must start with a positive mental attitude because success, riches, and faith do not make bedfellows with a negative mental attitude. The transmutation procedure is simple. Now, here it is. And you can very well afford to come back to this many times and... Uh, Assimilate it and make it your own. Number one, when failure overtakes you, start thinking of it as if it had been a success. Do you think that would be difficult to do? Yeah. Do you think it would? No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't at all. In other words, thinking of it, uh, what would have happened if it had been a success instead of a failure? Seeing yourself in the success side of the situation and not in the failure side. Start imagining or imaging the circumstances of the failures in your own imagination as being a success. Start also looking for the seed of an equivalent benefit which comes with every failure. And there is where you will be able to transmute the failure into success. Because every adversity, every failure, and every defeat has the seed of an equivalent benefit. And if you go to searching for that seed, you will not... Uh, Take a negative mental attitude toward the circumstance, you take a positive mental attitude because you're sure to find that seed. You may not find it the first time you look for it, but eventually you will find it if you keep on. That's step number one. Number two, when poverty threatens to catch up with you or has actually caught up, start thinking of it as riches and visualize the riches in all the things that you would wish to do with actual riches. Also start looking for the seed of an equivalent benefit of poverty. I remember when I was a little boy sitting on the bank of the river down in Wise County where I was born just after my mother was, had died before my stepmother came along. I was hungry. I didn't have enough food. I was sitting there on the bank of the river wondering if I couldn't catch some fish and maybe fry some fish and have something to eat. And as I sat there... I don't know what caused me to do this, but I shut my eyes and looked into the future, and I saw myself going away, becoming famous, wealthy, and coming back to that very spot, charging up the river on a horse, a mechanical horse that was run by steam. I could see the steam pouring out of his nostrils. I could hear his horseshoes clicking on the rocks. It was so, uh, so vivid to me. In other words, I built myself into a state of ecstasy there in that hour of poverty and need and want and hunger. Uh, years passed, and the time came when I drove my Rolls Royce into that very spot, the car that I paid $22,500 for. I, ro I drove my Rolls Royce into the, that very spot, and I went back and imaged again that childhood scene where I had been there in poverty and in want and in hunger. And I said, well... 
I don't know whether my imaging this back in the early days had anything to do with it or not. Maybe it did. Maybe I kept alive that hope and eventually translated that hope into faith and eventually that faith brought me not only a steam horse but something much more valuable and much more costly than a steam horse. Uh, looking forward and imaging the things that you want to do, transmuting uh, uh, unfavorable circumstances and adversities into something that's pleasant. By that I mean switching your mind away from thinking about the unpleasant things over to something that's pleasant. And then again, number three, when fear overtakes you, just remember that fear is only faith in reverse gear. And start thinking in terms of faith by seeing yourself translating faith into whatever circumstance or things you desire. I don't suppose anybody ever escapes experiencing the seven basic fears at one time or another. And most people experience them all the way through life. But certainly if you allow fear to take possession of you and to grip you, it'll become a habit. And it certainly will attract to you all of the things that you don't want. You have to learn to deal with fear by transmuting it or translating it or transforming it over by, uh, in your mind uh, into something the opposite of fear. In other words, faith. If you fear poverty, commence thinking of yourselves in, in terms of opulence and of money. And thinking of ways and means that you're going to earn that money and acquire it. What you're going to do with it after you get it. Why there's, you can daydream and uh, there's no end to the daydreaming you do. And it's far better to daydream about the money you're going to have than it is to fear the poverty that you know you already have. <laughs> I'll assure you, this is no virtue and no benefit in sitting down and uh, bemoaning the fact that you are poverty stricken or that you need money and you don't know how to get it. I honestly, I honestly believe that there isn't anything in this world that I need that money can buy or that anything else can buy that I can't get if I want it. I don't think in terms of what I can't get. I think in terms of what I can get. And I've been doing that for a long time, and it's a wonderful thing to, with which to condition your mind to be positive. So that when the circumstances arise where you need a positive mental action, you, you're in the habit of uh, reacting in a positive way at all times rather than in a negative way. You don't get a mental, positive mental attitude just by wishing for it. You get it by weaving a web, weaving a cord of the rope at a time, day by day, little at a time. You don't just get it overnight. Create in your imagination an army of invisible guides who will take care of all your needs and all your desires. And there they are. You've heard me speak of my invisible guides. And if you weren't in this philosophy, if you didn't understand metaphysics, you probably would say that was a very fantastic system that I worked out. But I'll assure you it's not a fantastic system. I'll assure you that it looks after all of my needs and all of my wants. I'll admit that uh, last week uh, I became a little bit careless in the they, they guide to sound physical health, let me down for a day or two, but I did something about it. I came to his rescue. I gave him a jab in the ribs and woke him up and believe you, I've got more energy now than I've had since we started this course. So it's a good thing that I had that little cold because it made me a little bit more particular to uh, express gratitude to this uh, guide of sound physical health, not neglecting. Now... <clears throat> I fully realize that these guides are the creation of my own imagination. I, I'm not kidding myself or anybody else about that. But for all practical purposes, they, are, they represent real entities and real people. And each one is performing the exact duty that I assigned to it. And is doing it all the time. The first of these guides is the guide to physical sound health. Why do you suppose I put that as number one? Fine. What in the world could the mind do going around in a body that has to be supported by crutches all the time? A good, strong, physical body is the temple of the mind, uh, and uh, it has to be sound. It has to be healthy. There has to be plenty of energy there. When you turn on the old enthusiasm button, and if there's no energy, there's no energy there, you can't uh, generate in something out of nothing. You've got to have a store of energy, and energy is physical. It's physical in nature, and it's also mental in nature. 
But I don't know of anybody who can express uh, intense enthusiasm whose uh, body is a series of aches and pains. So the first duty to yourself is to your physical body, to see that it responds to all of your needs at all the times, does the thing that it was supposed to do, and uh, you need a little bit more help than just uh, what you can give uh, during the day because when you lay your body down, then uh, nature goes to work on it, give it a tune-up and a working over, and uh, you have to have this uh, trained entity called uh, the Guide to Sound Health to do that job, to supervise it, and to see that it's done properly. And then this number two, the Guide to Financial Prosperity. Why do you suppose I put that second in importance only? Do you know of anybody that can be of any great service to others without money? How long can you get along without money? No, you've got to have money. You've got to have a money consciousness. And this entity that you're building up here through this guide gives you a, a money consciousness. My guide is so controlled, however, that he doesn't make money my God. I don't permit that. I don't permit myself to become greedy, to want an over amount for money, or to pay too much for the money that I get. I pay enough, but not too much. I know people who pay too much, who die too young, because they put too much effort into accumulating money that they didn't need and couldn't use. The only purpose it could serve would be to uh, cause their uh, descendants to fight over it after they were passed on. Now, I, that's not going to happen to me. I want enough, but not too much. And this guide, it's his business to see that I stop when I get enough and that I don't want too much. Do you know this, uh, this money-getting business becomes a kind of a vicious circle with a lot of people. It does. It becomes a vicious circle. You get in it and uh, you say, well, I'll make my first million and I'll quit. I remember the time when, when Bing Crosby announced to his brother, who's his manager, when they made the first $50,000, that was enough. And they're going to quit. Well... <laughs> Got down to where they make over a million dollars every year, now they're still working harder than they ever did before, struggling in a rat race. I don't, I'm not speaking in a derogatory manner, you understand, of Bing. My Bing's a friend of mine and I greatly admire him, but I'm speaking of all people in that category who pay too much for trying to get things that they don't need. Now, this is a philosophy dealing with economic success. But uh, success wouldn't consist in your destroying your life and dying too young, uh, too young because you tried to get too much of anything. <laughs> Stop when you get enough. Make better use of the things you have right now instead of trying to get a lot of more things that you're not going to make any use of at all. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is. That statement that comes out of the Bible, I, I won't translate it to verbatim, but the meaning of it is not too much, not too little of anything. Not too much, not too little, just enough of everything. Want to learn what is enough, not too much. That's one of the blessings of this philosophy. It gives you a balanced life. You learn what is enough and what's uh, too much. Then the uh, next one is the most important, the guide to peace of mind. What good would it be to you if you had everything, if you owned uh, everything in the world and could collect a royalty from every person living if you didn't have peace of mind. What good would it be? Now, the reason I'm emphasizing these points along here, my friends, is that I've had the privilege of knowing intimately the most outstanding and the most successful and the richest men that this country has ever produced. I mean sleeping in their houses, eating with them, knowing their families and their wives and their children, and seeing what happened to their children after they died and passed on. I've seen all of that. And I know the importance of learning to live a balanced life so that you can have peace of mind as you go along, so that you can make your occupation or your daily labor, whatever it is, a game of, that you're getting joy out of. Not something to be abhorred and dreaded, but a, a game, if you please, that you play as ardently as a man would play a game of golf or some other game that he loves. I have always said that one of the sins of civilization consists in the fact that so few people are engaged in a labor of love thing that they like to do. Most people are doing things because they have to eat and sleep and have, have a, some clothes to wear. But when a man or a woman gets in a position where he or she can do the thing that is being done for the sake of love because they want to do it, I want to tell you they're really fortunate. And this philosophy leads to that very condition. 
But you'll never attain that position until you learn to maintain a positive mental attitude at least a major portion of your time. Out of all of those men that collaborated with me in the building of this philosophy, and they represented every outstanding success in every field, you might say, of that era. Out of all of those men, there was only one that I could say that even uh, vaguely approached having peace of mind along with his other successes. John Burroughs undoubtedly was the one that came nearest it. I would say the one that came next nearest to it was Mr. Edison, and I would place Mr. Carnegie as number three. And I'll tell you why he takes position number three. In the latter part of his uh, years, he uh, practically lost his mind trying to find ways and means of disgorging himself of his fortune and giving it away to where it would do no harm. It almost drove him crazy. His obsession, his major obsession in the latter part of his days was to get this philosophy well organized while he was living and into the hands of the people so it would provide them with the know-how by which they could acquire material things, including money, uh, without violating the rights of other people. That's what he wanted more than other, any, uh, anything else in the world. Right. Dr. Gill, did he live deep? No, he did not. Mr. Carnegie died in 1919 before I had even translated this into a writing, before I'd written the first books on it. But he had checked with me and double-checked on 15 of the 17 principles. There are two people that I always regretted didn't live to see me in the day of my triumph after having seen me in the days of my discouragement and opposition. Those who were my stepmother and my sponsor, Andrew Carnegie. It would have been a great joy to me and a, quite enough compensation for a lifetime of effort if I had, could have <clears throat> displayed to those two wonderful people the results of their handiwork in manipulating me and directing me at the time when I needed direction. No, I'm not so sure that they're not standing looking over my shoulder now. You know, uh, there are times when I'm sure somebody is standing looking over my shoulder because I say and do things that uh, beyond my reasonable intelligence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was not in my notes, and the lady brought it out for her question, but I have thought about it a great many times, and I have noticed in more so in recent years than ever that the things that I do which might be called brilliant and outstanding always are done by this man who is standing here looking over my shoulder, and always in the times of an emergency when I must make decisions, important decisions, I can almost feel that man telling me what decision to make. I can almost turn around and imagine he's standing there in person. There is an influence there. There's no two ways about it. I could not have, and this is a good time as any for me to tell you this, I could never have done what has been done in connection with this philosophy if I had had nothing but the collaboration of those five or six hundred men that helped me. That wouldn't have been enough. I've had more than that, believe you me. And the reason I haven't said anything about it before is I just don't want to get in the position of having people feel that... Uh, I have been favored or that I have anything that anybody else can't have. My, my honest opinion is that I don't have anything that you can't have. I think whatever source of inspiration I'm drawing upon, you can have that same source. It's just as available to you as it is to me. I believe that with all of my heart. And then the next one of these guides here, the, they're twins, the guides of hope and faith. Now, how far would you get in life if you didn't have that uh, eternal burning flame of hope and faith working in your soul? It wouldn't be anything worth working, worth living for, would there? So you have to have a system, a system for keeping your mind positive because there are things to destroy hope and faith, aren't there? Yeah. People, circumstances, things that you can't control even that pop up in your life. And you've got to have a system to antidote those things and to offset them. Something that you can manipulate and draw upon. And I know of no better system than these uh, eight guides that I have adopted here because they work for me. I've... I've taught them to a great many other people for whom they work just as well as for me. And then the next two are also twins, the guides of love and romance. I don't believe uh, that anything worthwhile could be accomplished unless a man or a woman romanticize uh, whatever you're doing. In other words, if you don't put some romance into whatever you're doing, you don't get any fun out of it. And certainly if there's no love in your heart, then you're not, uh, you're, you're not just quite a human being. 
the main difference between uh, the lower animals and the, hum and the human being is that the human being is capable of expressing the emotion of love. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. It's a great uh, builder of, of geniuses and of leaders. And it's a great uh, builder and maintainer of, of sound health. To have had a great capacity to love has been to have the privilege of rubbing elbows with genius. There's no exception to that. It's absolutely true. And so the two guides, love and romance, in my life, their job is to uh, uh, keep me uh, friendly with what I'm doing in life and to keep me young in body and mind. And they do just that, believe you me. Well, not only keep me young in body and mind, but they keep me uh, enthusiastic, they keep me sold on what I'm doing, and they take the drudgery out of it. In other words, I don't have any such thing as hard work because I don't work at anything. I play at everything I do. And everything I do is a labor of love. I recognize, of course, that before you get in a position where you can economically forget about earning a living, there's something that you have to think about that maybe takes a little of the pleasure out of work. But uh, if you watch yourself, you can develop a system that will make everything that you do, even washing dishes or digging ditches or anything else, you can make it a labor of love for the time being. When I go home, I help Annie Lou wash the dishes. I'm not because she couldn't do it, or, but uh, because I just want to feel that I'm not too good to help wash the dishes. And I get great joy out of doing it. <laughs> I'm not above working in the garden because if I didn't do it, Annie Lou would do it when I'm gone and deprive me of the pleasure. Look at the nice tan that I brought back with me and all that good health. Oh, it's a great thing to learn to be, to learn to live the simple life, to learn to be a human being instead of a stiff shirt or something else that you don't want to be, nobody wants to be. Love and romance, uh, learn to get that into your life and learn to have a system whereby that uh, habit of love and romance will e express itself in everything you do. Then this last one, the guide to overall wisdom. His job is to, he's the controller, or the controller of the other seven. His business is to keep them active, eternally engaged in your service and also to adjust you to every circumstance of your life, pleasant or unpleasant, so that you benefit by that circumstance. I can truthfully tell you that nothing comes to my mill in life that isn't grist. I make grist out of everything that comes to my mill. And the more unpleasant things that come, the more grist I get out of them because I doubly grind them to make sure they won't be anything else but grist. It's a wonderful thing to recognize when you come to recognize that no experience in life is ever lost, whether it's good or bad. No experience is ever lost at all if you will make the right adaptation of yourself to it. You can always profit by every experience in life if you have a system for doing it. Of course, if you just let your emotions run wild and you go down under the you know, dull thud under these unpleasant experiences, you'll attract more unpleasant experiences than you will pleasant ones. But you know, there's a peculiar thing about unpleasant circumstances. They're cowardly. And when you get to where you would say, come on over here, little fellow, I've got a set of harness right here. I'm going to put you to work. Uh, somehow or other, they find business around the corner and they... they they don't come your way so often when they know that you're going to put them to work. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? If you fear unpleasant circumstances, they'll crowd down on you in flocks. They'll come in at the back door and the front door. They'll come in when you're not expecting, when you're unprepared to deal with them. I don't particularly invite unpleasant experiences, but if they are foolish enough to come my way, they'll find themselves, find themselves ground up in my mill of life. I'll make grist out of them as sure as anything, uh, but I will not go down under them. Eternal vigilance is the price that one must pay to maintain a positive mental attitude because of these and other natural opposites of positive thinking. And here they are. First of all, your negative self constantly maneuvering for power over you. Did you know that there are entities working in your makeup all the time constantly maneuvering to gain power over you on the negative side of life? And you have to be on, eternally on alert to see that those entities don't take you over. And then your accumulated fears and your doubts and your self-imposed limitations, you have to deal with them constantly, lest they get the upper hand and lest they become the dominating influence in your mind. And then the negative influence is near you, including people who are negative, the people that you work with closest, the people that you live with, maybe some of your own relatives that are negative. And if you don't watch, You'll be just like they are. 
because you will respond in kind. It may be necessary for you to live in the same house with somebody who's negative, but it's not necessary for you to be negative just because you're in the house with somebody who is. I'll admit it'll be a little bit difficult for you to immunize yourself against that kind of an influence, but you can do it. I have done it. Mahatma Gandhi did it. Look what he did with immunizing himself against things he didn't want. And then uh, number three, the negative influence is near you, including people who are negative. And number four, perhaps uh, some in, inborn negative traits you brought over with you from birth. Now, these can be transmuted into positive traits too as soon as you ferret them out and find out what they are. I'm convinced that there are a lot of people who are born with natural traits of, uh, of a negative nature. In other words, they, you take a person who's born in, the, in an environment of poverty. For all of his relatives are poverty-stricken, all of the neighbors are poverty-stricken, he saw nothing but poverty, felt nothing but poverty, heard nothing but poverty talk. And that was the condition I was born in. And I know you can be born with that trait. And it was one of the most difficult things that I had to whip, was this inborn fear of poverty. And then the worries over the lack of money and the lack of progress in your business and profession or calling life. You can put in most of your time with worrying over the things, or you can transmute that state of mind over into working out ways and means of overcoming those worries. Think about the positive side instead of the negative side. Worrying over the negative side is not going to do anything except to get you in deeper and deeper and deeper. That's all it's going to do. And then the unrequited love and unbalanced emotional frustrations in your relations with the opposite sex. You don't have to let these unrequited love affairs destroy your balance of mind as so many people do. It's up to you to do something about it, to maintain a positive mental attitude and to recognize that your first duty is to yourself. Get control of yourself and do not allow anybody, emotionally or otherwise, to upset your equilibrium. Uh, the Creator didn't intend that should be done, and you shouldn't let it be done. Then unsound health, either uh, real or imaginary. You can worry an awful lot about that, about the things that uh, you think might happen to you but never do, physically. You know, if it weren't for that, we call it in the Materia Medica, we call that hypochondria. That's a two dollar and a half word with the doctors. Five dollars, yes, that used to be two dollars now, it's five dollars now, that's how, and sometimes a lot more than five dollars. Well, you can put in a novel lot of time becoming negative over that if you don't have a positive mental attitude towards your health, if you don't develop and build up a, a health consciousness. Think in terms of health, and your mental attitude would have a tremendous uh, amount to do with what happens to your physical body. There's no doubt about that. You can try that out on any time you please, when you think you're not feeling well, but let some good piece of news come along, and how quickly you snap out of it. <laughs> Haven't you had that experience? Yeah. You weren't feeling so badly at all, but, uh, but what this good news uh, did away with the, the feeling that you had. And then uh, intolerance, the lack of an open mind on all subjects. Uh, how much uh, trouble that gives some people in maintaining a, a negative mental attitude. Then greed for more material possessions than you need. I've already made extensive comment on that. I'm talking now about the things that you, the prices that you have to pay, the things you have to conquer in order to have a positive <laughs> mental attitude. Ignorance of the real extent of the power of your mind and its unlimited potentials for the attainment of anything you desire. Then lack of a definite major purpose and the lack of a definite philosophy by which to live and guide your life. You know, the vast majority of people have no philosophy to live by. Did you know that? No philosophy. They live by hook or crook, by chance, by circumstance, and they're just like a dry leaf on the bosom of the wind. They go whichever the way the wind blows, and there's nothing they can do by because they have no philosophy of life. No set of rules to go by. <laughs> Trusting to luck and to misfortune. And generally, misfortune is the one that rules. You have to have a philosophy that you can live by. Now, there are many philosophies, fine philosophies that you can die by. I'm much more interested in one that you can live by, and that's what we're studying here in this. It's a philosophy that you can live by in such a way that the neighbors around you look upon you as something desirable. They feel happy to have you there. You feel happy to be there. You not only enjoy prosperity and contentment and peace of mind, but you reflect that in everybody that comes into contact with you. And that's the way that people should live. That's the kind of a mental attitude people should have to live by. 
And then, last but not least, the habit of allowing others to do your thinking for you. If you're going to do that, you'll never have a positive mental attitude because uh, you won't have your own mind. Everyone desires to be rich, but not everyone knows what constitutes enduring riches. And here are the 12 great riches. I want you to familiarize yourself with them. And before anybody can become rich, they would have to have a fairly well-balanced uh, proportion of all of these 12 great riches. And I want you to notice where I place money with relative to its importance in regard to the others. Number 12. There are 11 other things even more important than money if you're going to have a well-rounded out, well-balanced life. Positive mental attitude, sound physical health, harmony in human relations, freedom from fear, the hope of future achievement, the capacity for applied faith, willingness to share one's blessings, to be engaged in the labor of love, an open mind on all subjects toward all people, complete self-discipline, the wisdom with which to understand people, and then money to top it all off. And I thank you. You were given a copy of our first uh, edition of Success Unlimited as you came in the door. And you'll see one of my contributions over on the middle, two inside middle pages, called A Challenge to Life. Uh, this uh, challenge to life is something that I want to call to your attention, because that is my reaction to uh, one of the worst defeats that I've ever had in my entire career. I bring it to your attention because it gives you an idea of how I go about transmuting an unpleasant circumstance into something useful. Now, when this circumstance happened, I had uh, real reason to go out and fight. And I don't mean fight mentally or orally, I mean fight physically. If I had to settle the, uh, the business from behind pine trees with six shooters, it would have been justified under the circumstances. But instead of that, I elected to do something that would damage no one and that would benefit myself. I elected to uh, express myself through this essay which says that, uh, a challenge to life, which says, Life, uh, you can't sub subdue me because I refuse to take your discipline too seriously. When you try to hurt me, I laugh, and the laughter knows no pain. I appreciate your joys wherever I find them. Your sorrows neither discourage nor frighten me, for there is laughter in my soul. Uh, temporary defeat does not uh, make me sad. I simply set music to the words of defeat and turn it into a song. Uh, your tears are not for me. I like laughter much better. And because I like it, I use it as a substitute for grief and sorrow and pain and disappointment. <coughs> Life, uh, you are a fickle trickster. Don't deny it. You slipped uh, this emotion of love into my heart so that you might uh, use it as a thorn with which to prick my soul. But I learned to dodge your trap with laughter. You try to lure me with a desire for gold. But I have fooled you by following the trail which leads to knowledge instead. You induce me to build beautiful friendships, uh, then <clears throat> convert my friends into enemies so you may harden my heart. But I sidestep your fickleness by laughing off your attempt and selecting new friends in my own way. Uh, you cause men to cheat me at trade so I will become distrustful. But I win again because I possess one precious asset which no man can steal. It is the power to think my own thoughts and to be myself. You threaten me with death, but to me death is nothing worse than a long, peaceful sleep, and sleep is the sweetest of human experiences, excepting laughter. Uh, you build a fire of hope in my heart, then sprinkle water on the flames, but I go you one better by rekindling the fire, and I laugh at you once more. Life, you are licked as far as I'm concerned. Because you have nothing with which to lure me away from laughter, and you are powerless to scare me into submission. To a life of laughter, then, I raise my cup of cheer. <laughs> uh, you may think it's easy to have that kind of an emotional reaction to an unpleasant experience where you've been damaged and hurt and injured by those who should have been loyal to you. 
This business of striking back at people who have injured you or tried to injure you is just a lack of self-discipline. You haven't really become acquainted with your own powers or your own ways and means of benefiting by those powers if you stoop and to the low level of trying to strike back at some person who has slandered you, vilified you, or cheated you in one way or another, or even tried to do any of those things. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. Because you'll only lower yourself in the estimation of yourself and of your Creator. There's a better way, a better weapon that I'm trying to put into your hands with which you can defend yourself against all who would injure you. And if you'll take my word for it and use the self-discipline based upon this lesson that we have tonight and never allow anybody to drag you down to their level, you set the level on which you wish to deal with the people and if they want to come up to your level, all right, or if they don't, let them stay down on theirs. There's no sin in that. Set your own high level and stand your ground come what may. I have a better way of defending myself. I have a mind. I know what to do with that mind. And I never am without defense. Now, I haven't got that out of my system. <laughs> you go down to my lesson. But I did want you to get this, uh, uh, this idea. And when, I, when our editor chose this challenge to life out of some one of my books to publish in the first edition, <clears throat> I said, that's fine. And I want every one of the students to have a copy of the magazine because I want to tell them the story back of that essay. And you may be interested in knowing that that essay, that essay was largely responsible for the late Mahatma Gandhi becoming interested in my philosophy and having it published throughout India. That essay has already influenced millions of people and will in time be indirectly or directly of influence beneficially to millions of people who have not yet born. So the power, it's not the brilliancy of the essay, it's the thought back of it. Don't you know that you react to these unpleasant things in life in such a way that life can't conquer you? that nobody can conquer you. And you've got laughter in your soul. I want to tell you, you're sitting very close to the plane on which the Creator acts Himself. When you've got laughter in your soul, it's a wonderful thing to have. A wonderful thing. Laughter. A laughter in the soul, laughter on the face. And I want to tell you, you'll never be without friends. You'll never be without opportunity. And you'll never be without a means of defending yourself against uh, people who do not know anything about laughter. I pause for silence while you may remember what I have said about laughter. Now, what a suggestion, that is, suggestion to self through which, uh, through dominate, uh, through which dominating thoughts and deeds are conveyed to the subconscious mind is the medium by which self-discipline becomes a habit. Now, the starting point in the development of self-discipline is definiteness of purpose. You'll notice that every one of these lessons, uh, come uh, what may, approach them from whatever angle you choose, you can't get away from that term, definiteness of purpose. It just stands out like a sore thumb, and you can't get away from it, uh, because it is the starting point of all achievement, of everything that you do, whether it's good or bad. You may be sure that it starts with definiteness of purpose. Now, the reason for repetition of an idea Repetition of it is what, do you think? Why should you uh, uh, go over, uh, why should you write out your definite major purpose, for instance, and uh, memorize it and go over it as a ritual day in and day out? Why, do you, why should you do that? <laughs> to get it into the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind gets into the habit of believing that which it hears often. And you can tell it a lie over and over again, and, and you'll finally get to where you don't know whether it's a lie or not, and the subconscious doesn't either. I know of people who have done just that thing. Now, obsessional desire is the dynamo that gives life and action to definiteness of purpose. Obsessional desire. An obsessional desire is a desire that... Uh, how, how do you make a desire obsessional in the first place? Let's get into that. That's right, by living with it in your mind, calling it into your mind and seeing the, uh, the physical manifestation of it out there somewhere in the, in the circumstances of your life. In other words, if you have an ob obsessional desire for enough money to buy a, a new Cadillac, let us say, and you're now driving a Ford or something less than a Ford, you, don't, uh, you want that nice new Cadillac, you don't have enough income to pay for it, you don't have enough money, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do, you go over to the Cadillac agency and get one of those nice new catalogs with all the models in it. And you turn them over and you pick out the model you want. 
And every time you get in that Ford and start down the street, just before you start off, you kick off the starter and then you shut your eyes for a few moments and you see yourself sitting on top of a nice new Cadillac. And as she purrs down the street, as you give her the gas, you imagine right now that you already have, uh, you know you own this Cadillac, but you don't exactly have possession of it. But for the time being, you're there at the wheel of your Cadillac. Sounds silly, doesn't it? It may sound silly, but it is not silly. I can assure you it's not silly. I talked myself into my first Rolls Royce that very way. Did I ever tell you about the, how I got my first Rolls Royce? Do you remember that? Am I putting myself out on a limb one evening in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel saying that I was going to have it that before the week was over and I didn't have enough money in the bank to get it? My student sitting right in that audience who had the, exactly the same car that I described, even down to the wire, uh, the orange colored wire wheels. And he called me at my hotel next morning and said, come on down and I have your car, Mr. Hill. And I went down there and he had it. He had the legal transfer made out. Had, and the keys he had ready to hand to me. All he wanted to show me was a, a little trick or two that you had to know about a Rolls Royce in order to get the best results out of it. He took me down Riverside Drive. We drove a little bit and he got out and shook hands with him and said, well, Mr. Hill, uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have had the privilege of letting you have this nice car. Wasn't that a wonderful thing for a man to do? Well, he hadn't said, nothing had been said about price. He said, well, the price, you fix the price. I'll tell you what I paid for it. But he said, you need it worse than I do. I don't actually need it at all. But you do need it. And I want you to have it. Be careful what you set your heart upon through obsessional desire. For, for the subconscious mind goes to work on translating that desire into its material equivalent. Self-discipline cannot be attained overnight. It must be developed step by step by the formation of definite habits of thought and physical action. You must go through the motion of doing something about it. In other words, when Al Allen comes on the stage here, do you notice the chemical change that takes place in your mind while you're doing that? Of course you do, and I notice it. I feel it out there on the stage, 50 feet removed from you. I can feel the vibrations of it. But suppose that uh, you sat in your, just sat still in your seats and uh, you repeated those words in a monotone like I'm talking now and didn't uh, put some zump in your voice and wouldn't do you a bit of good in the world, would it? No, you will learn to become uh, enthusiastic by acting enthusiastically. That's definite. Now, the reason I admonish you to be careful what you set your heart upon is this, if you follow the instructions laid down in this lesson, if you set your heart on anything and stand by that decision, you're going to get it. And be sure before you start a, uh, any obsessional desire about anything that the thing that you're desiring uh, is something that you will be willing to live with after you get it, him or her. <laughs> I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I know. I see, I, I see a lot of cackling around in this audience of people who are married, <laughs> who understand exactly what I'm talking about. What a marvelous thing it is to uh, demonstrate in your own mind uh, something that you desire above everything else, something that's hard to get, maybe, and then come to know after you've demonstrated that you want to live with it the rest of your life. Well, that's a marvelous thing. But be careful what you demonstrate before you start demonstrating. You may be interested in knowing that out of the 500 or more men that collaborated with me in building this philosophy, every one of them was immensely wealthy. I didn't pay any attention to any other kind. I was only after the ones that had made a big demonstration financially. I had no time to fool with the little boys. That wouldn't apply today, but it applied then. And you may be interested in knowing that every single solitary one of them had abundance of wealth, but they did not have peace of mind. They neglected in demonstrating their wealth to demonstrate along with it a, the circumstances of life through which they would not worship that wealth, through which they, it would not be a burden to them, through which they would have peace of mind in their relationships with their fellow men. They didn't learn that lesson. If those men could have had the, uh, the remarks that I made when I stepped on this stage for the first five minutes, if they could have had that lesson, Back in the early days before they came immensely wealthy, 
They would have learned how to balance themselves with this wealth so that it would not have affected them adversely. To me, the most pitiful sight in the world is to see an extremely rich man who uh, doesn't have anything else but riches, but monetary riches. And there are a lot of them in this world. Uh, the next most pitiful thing is the boy or girl who has come into possession of uh, great riches without having earned them. Uh, your power of thought is the only thing over which you have complete unchallenged control. Control by the power of will. In given human beings control over but one thing, the Creator must have chosen the most important of all things. Uh, this is a stupendous fact that merits your most profound consideration. If you give it this sort of consideration, you will discover for yourself the rich promises available to those who become master of their mind power through self-discipline. Self-discipline leads to sound physical health, and it leads to peace of mind through development of harmony within one's own mind. I don't believe that I could stand before an audience of my students, many of whom know my background, and all of whom will know my background before they're through working with me. I, co I couldn't stand up with a straight face and tell you that I have everything in this world that I need or can possibly use or can possibly wish for. I have it in abundance if I hadn't learned self-discipline because that's how I got it. There was a time when I had very much more money in the bank than I have in the various banks that I'm doing business with today. Very much more. But I, didn't, I wasn't as rich then as I am today. I am very rich today because I have a balanced mind. I have no grudges. I have no worries. I have no fears. I have learned through self-discipline to balance my life, with, balance my books with life. I may not be uh, entirely at peace with the income tax men, <laughs> but there is a big boy up somewhere stands looking over my shoulder that I am at peace with all the time. And I wouldn't have been at peace with him if I hadn't have learned the art of self-discipline, of reacting to these unpleasantries of life in a positive way instead of a negative way. I don't know what I, I would do if somebody came up and hauled off and slapped my face real hard without any provocation. I don't know what I would do. I was still pretty human, I think. As apt as not, I would double up my fist, and if I was close enough to him, I probably would hit him right here in the solar plexus, and he would go down with a dull thud. No doubt I would do that. But if I had a few seconds to think about it, instead of doing that, I would pity him instead of hating him. Pitying him for being such a fool as to do a thing like that. Uh, a lot of things that I used to do the wrong way, I do the right way now. And because I've learned to do them the right way through self-discipline, I'm in position to be at peace with other people, to be at peace with the world, and, or particularly at peace with myself and with my Creator. That's a wonderful thing to have, no matter what other kind of riches you have. If you're not at peace with yourself and with your fellow men and with those you work with, if you're not at peace with them, then you're not rich. You never will be rich until you learn through discipline to be at peace with all people, all races, all creeds. I have sitting here in this audience Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, people of different colors, different races. Why, to me, you're all the same color, you're all the same religion. I don't know the difference and don't want to know the difference, because in my mind there is no difference. <laughs> I've risen above this idea of letting petty things, such as racial differences, anger me or cause me to feel at the least out of step with my fellow man. I just won't let those things happen. And there was a time when they did happen. And you know one of the curses of this world in which we're living, and particularly this uh, melting pot here in America, is that we haven't learned how to live with one another. We are in the process of learning. And when we are all indoctrinated with this philosophy, we'll have a better world here in the United States. And I hope it'll spread over into some of the other countries too. Self-discipline enables one to keep the mind fixed on that which is wanted and off that which is not wanted. If it didn't do anything else but that, if that lesson, this lesson tonight didn't do anything else for you, except start you on a habit or a plan whereby you occupy your mind from here on out mostly with the things you desire and keep your mind off the things you don't desire. If you did nothing else but that. All the time and all the money that you spend in this course would be uh, paid back a thousand times over because you would experience a new birth, a new opportunity, a new life. 
If you just learn through self-discipline not to let your mind feed upon the things you don't want, upon the miseries, upon the disappointments, upon the people who injure you. Now, uh, what I'm telling you uh, to do is, uh, it's much easier for me to tell you than it is for you to do it. I know that. I, I'm not unappreciative of it, of what a difficult thing it is to start in keeping your mind occupied with the money that you're going to have when you don't have any now. <laughs> Now, I know that. How do I know it? Well, now, I'll tell you. You give a guess. I know all about it. That's right. That's right. I know what it is to be hungry. I know it is what it is to be without a home. I know what it is to be without friends. I know what it is to be ignorant and illiterate. I know all about that. And I know how difficult it is when you're illiterate and ignorant and poverty-stricken to think in terms of becoming an outstanding philosopher and spreading his influence throughout the world. I know all about that, but I did it. I'm speaking now in the past tense. I did it. And if I can conquer the things that I've conquered, I know that you can do a, an equally good job. But you'll have to take possession. You'll have to be the person in charge. Take possession of your own mind and keep it so busy, occupied with the things that you want, the things you want to do, the people that you like, that you have no time left to think about the things you don't want or the people you don't like. And speaking about people you don't like, had you ever thought of examining very carefully the people, and with, as near as you can without bias, the people you think you don't like, and to find, not to look for their faults, to justify your opinion of them. Don't do that. That's very easy. That's the natural thing. That's what the weakling would do. But a strong person will keep himself in subjection through self-discipline and he'll start in looking in the life of the person he doesn't like for some of the things that he does like. And if you look uh, fairly and squarely, you'll find some of those things in every human being. There is nobody so bad in this world but what he has some good in him. If you look for it, you'll find it. If you don't look for it, you'll not find it. I think one of the evils of this age in which we're living, maybe it's the evil of all ages, is that when we come into contact with other people, if they give us the slightest reason on earth for doing it, we not only look for all of their shortcomings, but we multiply those shortcomings and step them up into something bigger than they are. And that's a great discredit and disservice to the person who does it. Because you under-evaluate. You can under-evaluate your enemies to where they'll, they'll just destroy you. And you can uh, underestimate your opposition too, and you'll have opposition, you'll, you'll always have it. Uh, but you can convert a lot of that opposition from enemies into friends if you adjust yourself and start to work on yourself first. Don't start to work on the other fellow to convert him over to your ways of thinking. Start working on yourself to become charitable, to become understanding, to become forgiving. And if a person does you an injury, an out-and-out -out injury, without... Uh, provocation, you have one of the grandest opportunities in the world uh, to do what? You have a prerogative that he doesn't possess because he's, uh, he's lost the initiative. If a person injures you with or without provocation, he's lost the initiative and you have it. And what is that initiative? You have the prerogative right to forgive him and pity him, don't you? That's what you have. I want you to emphasize the three mental walls of protection against outside forces. Now, you heard me speak about those three mental walls on one occasion, but maybe I spoke only casually, and maybe the, I didn't make a definite uh, Im lasting impression upon you of the necessity of building up a, a way of immunizing yourself against uh, uh, outside influences that would disturb your uh, mental capacity or anger you or make you unhappy or make you afraid or take advantage of you in any way. I have this system, and it works like a charm. Now, when you get out to where you have as many people knowing you all over the world as I do, and as many beloved friends clamoring for appointments and so forth as I have, you'll have to have a system of choosing how many of them you'll see and how many of them you won't. That, that just goes without saying. You'll have to have that. You don't, maybe you won't, don't in the beginning. I didn't in the beginning, but I do now. And I tell you, that I'd be uh, my, my, my friends, my beloved friends, the ones that I love all over the world, uh, they'd take up all of my time if I didn't have a system, you know, of keeping them from doing it. And I try to keep uh, most of them confined to dealing with me through my books. Then I can reach millions of them. But when they want to deal with me in person, then I have to have a system for telling how many can see me in a given length of time. And this system is this um, 
a series of three imaginary walls. And they're not so imaginary either. They're pretty real. That first one is a rather wide wall. It uh, extends way out from me, and it's uh, not too high, but it's high enough to stop anybody that wants to get over the wall and get to me with anything, unless I, uh, he gives me a very good reason for wanting to see him. Now, one of my students wouldn't, uh, they would never need to, well, uh, they have a, each one of them has a stepladder. They can go right over that wall <laughs> and shove the tall. They don't even have to ask me. But uh, outsiders, uh, who are not privileged as students, would have to go over that wall, and they'd have to... Uh, and make contact in some sort of a formal way. They couldn't just ring or come in and ring my doorbell or my telephone because I don't have any name. My name's not listed in any telephone book. They'd have to go through some formality. Now, why did I have? Why do I have that wall? Why do? Why don't I just leave it down and let everybody come to see me? Let everybody write to me and answer all the letters that I receive from all over the world. Why don't I do that? Do you suppose? <laughs> you may be interested in knowing that on one occasion I received five mail sacks full of letters. I couldn't even look at, the, uh, look at the outside of the letters, let alone open them. I didn't have secretaries enough to open the mail, and I'll say that thousands of them were never even opened. They came from all over this country. It's not quite so bad today, but the very moment I get a little publicity about something, letters come to me from all over the country. There's a write-up about me in uh, this uh, last issue of Printer's Inc., and I'm getting uh, letters from people who knew me 35 and 38 years ago, right here in Chicago, who didn't know that I was here. So we have to have a system. Now, when they get over that first wall, they immediately come into contact with another wall that's not so big and not so commodious, and, but it's much higher, many times as high. And they can't go over that with any stepladder. Uh, I'll tell you, that you students can do that, without, <laughs> even if you had a stepladder. But there is a way of your getting over it. And I'm going to tip you off what it is. If you have something I want, you can get over it very easily. <laughs> Or if you have something in common with me, which is the mean thing. I don't mean to be, uh, make that statement selfishly. I want to clarify it. I mean by that, <clears throat> you can get over that uh, second wall and get to me very easily if I am convinced that uh, the time I devote to you is going to be of mutual benefit to you and me both. But if it's just something that's going to benefit you and not me, the chances are that you won't make it. There are exceptions, but very, very few. And I'd use my judgment as to where the exceptions came. And there's nothing selfish about that. It's of necessity. I'll assure you it's of necessity. Then when you get over that second wall, you come in contact with one that's very much more narrow, and it's as high as eternity. No living person ever gets over that wall. Not even my wife, as much as I love her and as close as we are together. She doesn't even get over She doesn't try because she knows that I have a sanctuary of my soul wherein nobody but my Creator and myself commune. Nobody. Nobody at all. And there is where I do my best work. When I go to write a book, I retire into my sanctuary, lay out that book, commune with my Maker, get instructions. When I come to an intersection in life and I don't understand which way to go, I go into my sanctuary. I ask for guidance and I always get it. Always. Always. Don't you see what a wonderful thing it is to have this system of immunity? Don't you see how unselfish it is? Your first duty is to yourself. Shakespeare's marvelous poetic lines, To thine own self be true, and it must follow as night to day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Uh, I was thrilled to the marrow of my bones when I first read that. I have read it hundreds of times. I've repeated it thousands of times. Because how true it is that your first duty is to yourself. Be true to yourself. Protect your mind. Protect your inner consciousness. You self-discipline to take possession of your own mind and to direct it to the things you want and to keep it off the things you don't want. That's your prerogative. The, Im the Creator gave you that as the most important and precious gift of the Creator to mankind. And uh, you could do nothing less than show your appreciation by respecting that gift and using it. Make up a list of five traits of personality in connection with which you need self-discipline for improvement. I don't care how perfect you are. Uh, there's not a person in this class who couldn't sit down and if you really be honest with yourself and if you don't know the answers, get your wife to tell you. She'll tell you some of these things that you should get in this list. Or your husband, but maybe he'll do a good job too. Uh, maybe uh, some, in some cases you won't have to ask the husband, he'll tell you without it. <laughs> or the wife, vice versa. 
But to find out five things in your personality that you need to change and write them down. Now, uh, just, uh, just for the sake of experiment, right now, uh, right off in your mind, just mentally, the first one, number one. Surely everybody in this room can think of one trait of personality that you'd like to change. You're not going to do anything about your defects until you take inventory of them and find out what they are. And get them on paper where you can see them. And then start in doing something about them. And after you uh, discover these five traits in connection with which you uh, need to use self-discipline for improvement, you start in immediately to develop the opposite of those traits. If you're uh, in the habit of not sharing your opportunities or your blessings with other people, start in sharing them. No matter how much it hurts, start in where you are. If you are um, greedy or anything of that sort, start in sharing. If you've been in the habit of um, <clears throat> passing on a little gossip to somebody, stop that for all time to come. Just stop it and start passing on, uh, not gossip, but what? Right. Complimentary things. You'd be surprised. Why, you see a man blossom out, he'll be a different person. If you start telling him about some of the things that you know are good about him. I don't rub it on too thick. If you do, he'll wonder what you're after. <laughs> uh, uh, be reasonable about it. When anybody walks up to me and shakes my hand and says, Napoleon, you know, I, I have always wanted to meet you. I appreciate so much the books that you read. And I just wanted to tell you that uh, I have found myself, I've been, I've been a success in my professional business, and I owe it all to Think and Grow Rich or to the Law of Success. I know that that man is telling the truth because uh, I can tell by the way, the, the tone of his voice, the look in his eye, and the way he takes hold of my hand. And I appreciate it. Now, if he stood there and rubbed it on, out of proportion to what I deserve, I would know right away that he's getting ready for a touch <laughs> of some sort. So you do have to be, uh, you, you do have to use uh, discretion. Now then next, uh, make up a list of all the traits of personality of those nearest to you which you believe need to be improved by self-discipline. Now you'll have a uh, known trouble at all making up that list. You can find that one very easily. <laughs> I want you to notice the difference, the difference as to the ease with which you'll find that, uh, carry out that transaction and uh, the one where you're looking into your own life for traits of character that need to be changed. Uh, Self-examination uh, is a very difficult thing. Did you know that? Very difficult. Because we, well, why? Why is it difficult? Because we are biased in our favor. We think that whatever we do, no matter how it turns out, if we did it, then it must be right. And if it doesn't turn out right, it was always the other fellow's fault, not ours. <laughs> always. Some of these days, I'm going to have somebody walk in and tell me that, and I, uh, there are plenty of students who can do that, walk in and tell me that they had been at odds with somebody for a long time only to find out when they got into this philosophy that the trouble was not with the other fellow, it was with themselves. And they started through self-discipline to improve themselves and lo and behold, when they got their own house clear, the other fellow's house was also clean. And that's the way it'll work out. It's astounding as to how many motes you can see in the other fellow's eye when you're not looking for those in your own eye. I think that everybody, before he condemns anybody, should go in before a looking glass and say, now look here, fellow. Uh, before you start condemning anybody, before you start uh, passing out gossip about anybody, I want, uh, you, you look yourself in the eye and uh, find out if you have clean hands. Remember that passage in the Bible? He was without sin among you. Let him cast the first stone. All right. Cast the first stone first before you commence condemning other people. And when you make a practice of that, you'll get to the point at which you can forgive people for almost anything. Next, uh, there, what is the most important form of self-discipline which should be exercised by all who aspire to outstanding success? Well, now, what's the most important form of self-discipline? They're just one. It's outstanding. It control of thought. Now, of course, the control of your thoughts, the control of your mind. As a matter of fact, there's nothing else of importance in the world, is there, except the control of your mind. If you control your own mind, you'll control everything that you come into contact with. You really will. You'll never be the master of circumstances. You'll never be the master of the space that you occupy in the world until you first learn to be the master of your own mind. You will never will. Now, Mr. Gandhi, you've heard me speak of him many times in uh, biding his time to gain freedom of India, used uh, these five principles. Definiteness of purpose. He knew what he wanted. 
applied faith. He began to do something about it by talking to his uh, fellow men, indoctrinating them with the same desire. He didn't do anything vicious. He didn't uh, commit any acts of uh, mayhem or murder. Then third, by going the extra mile. And fourth, by forming a mastermind, the like of which this world probably has never seen before, with at least 200 millions of his fellow men all con contributing to that mastermind alliance, the main object being to free themselves from India without violence. And fifth, self-discipline on a scale without parallel in modern times. Now, there are the elements that made Mahatma Gandhi the master of the great British Empire. No doubt about it. Self-discipline. Where in the world would you find a man that would stand all of the things that Gandhi stood, all of the uh, insults, all of the uh, incarcerations that he went through while standing his ground and yet not striking back in kind? He struck back on his own ground with his own weapons. And that's a very safe thing to do. Select your own If you have to go to battle with somebody, select your own battleground, select your own weapons, and then if you don't win, uh, it's, up to, it's your own fault. <laughs> I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that because you're going to have battle to do in one way or another throughout life. You're going to have to plan campaigns to put yourself across, to remove opposition out of your way. You've got to be smarter than your opposition or your enemies. And the way to do it is not to strike back on battlegrounds of their choice with weapons of their choice, but to select your own battleground and your own weapons. Does that mean anything to you, what I'm just saying? I don't know how much it means to you now, but the time will come when it will mean something to you. When, you. when you've got a problem to solve, somebody's opposing you, you've got to go around somebody. Then you will think of this lecture that I delivered here tonight, wherein I said, choose your own battleground and choose your own weapons. Condition yourself first for the battle. By making up your mind that you're not under any circumstances going to try to destroy anybody or to do anybody any injury other than that of defending your own rights. And when you take that attitude, I want to tell you that you've just as good as one before you ever start. And I don't care who your adversary is, how much, how, st how strong he is, or how smart he is. If you use those tactics, you're bound to win. To create a system whereby you take full possession of your own mind and keep it occupied with all the things, circumstances, and desires of your choice and strictly off of the things you do not want. Now, how do you go about keeping your mind off of things you don't want? Will you tell me that? I want to see if you have a clear idea. Why, of course, that's, a, that's an elementary question. And I didn't mean to insult your intelligence by asking it. I only wanted to emphasize it by having you tell me. And I know that I don't have anything. I was not blessed with anything that you don't have, and maybe not half as much as some of you have. My background was certainly much more difficult than that of most of you. And if I made the grade, I know you can make it. But you'll have to take possession, you'll have to be in charge of your institution and your enterprise. And you are an institution, an enterprise, each one of you. You'll have to be in charge. You've got to call the shots and see that they're carried out. And you have to have self-discipline with which to do it. That's how you go about keeping your mind off the things you don't want, by occupying your mind and seeing in your imagination the things that you do want. Even, th even though you don't have physical possession of them, you can always have mental possession, don't you know? And unless you have mental possession of a thing first, you'll never have a physical possession of it. You may be sure of that, unless somebody wishes it upon you or it falls on you out of the top of a house when you're walking by accidentally. Anything that you get or acquire by desire must be created and gotten in your mental attitude first. And you must be very sure about it there. You must see yourself in possession of it, and that takes self-discipline. Now your reward for doing this is mastery of your own destiny through guidance of infinite intelligence. Isn't that a marvelous thing? What you, a reward for doing this. For doing what? Taking possession of your own mind. It gives you direct contact with infinite intelligence. No doubt in the world about it. When I tell you that there's a person standing looking over my shoulder... And guiding me, I'm particularly telling you the truth when I meet with obstacles. I know, I, all I have to do is to remember that he's right there. And if I come to an intersection of life, I don't know which way to turn, this way or that way, or to go ahead or to go back. 
All I have to do is to remember that that uh, invisible force is there looking over my shoulder and he'll always point the right direction if I pay attention to him and have faith in him. How would I know that that's true, do you think? How could I say that, make a statement like that and know that it's true? Only one way, and that's by having practiced it. That's the only way I would know. And I certainly will never be guilty of telling you anything will happen unless I have made it happen, and unless I tell you how you can make it happen. Now, the penalty for not doing it, for not doing what? Not taking, not taking possession of your own mind, which is the penalty that the majority of people pay all the way through the life, is this. You will become the victim of the stray winds of circumstance which will remain forever beyond your control. What, uh, what are the stray winds of circumstance? What am I talking about there, do you think? You'll become the victim of every influence that you come into contact with, enemies and everything else alike. All these things that you don't want will sway you like a leaf on the bosom of a wind unless you take possession of your own mind. That's the, uh, that's the penalty that you must pay. Is it a strange thing to, to contemplate? Is it a profound thing to recognize the truth that you have been given a means by which you can declare and determine your earthly destiny and that along with that comes a penalty, and a, a, a tremendous penalty that you must pay if you don't embrace that asset and use it. And along with it also comes this tremendous asset or reward that you do receive automatically if you accept that asset and use it. What a profound thing it is. If I didn't have any other evidence of a first cause or a creator, if I didn't have any other evidence than what I know about that principle, then I would know there had to be a first cause. Because that's too profound for any human being to think out. Giving you a great asset and then penalizing you for not accepting it, rewarding you if you do accept it. That's the sum and the substance of what happens when you use the self-discipline with which to take possession of your own mind and to direct it to the things you want. Never mind what you want. That's nobody's business except yours. Did you hear what I said then? Yeah. You sure you heard it? Yeah. That's nobody's business, what you want, but yours. I don't want you to forget that. Don't let anybody come along and sell you the idea that, uh, as to what you should want. Who's going to tell me what I want or what I should want? You. Yes, you bet your life. It hasn't always been that way, but it is that way today. There isn't anybody going to tell me what I want. I'll do that. And if I allowed anybody else to tell me, I'd think it was an insult to my Creator because He intended that I should have the last word about this guy here. And believe you me, I take it. <laughs> I take it all the time. I don't hurt anybody else, and nobody else. I would do nothing in this world under any circumstances to injure anybody or anything. Whatever you do to or for another person, you do to or for yourself. It's an eternal law. Nobody can avoid or evade that law. That's why I wouldn't be a prosecuting attorney. That's why I was so proud that I didn't follow my inclination and become a lawyer. I had a long visit with my brother Vivian. He's a lawyer. And he practices, he specializes in divorce suits, especially divorce suits of very wealthy people. <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you the penalty he's paying for knowing too much about the bad side of domestic relations. He got so much of that that he came to the conclusion all women were bad and he never married. He's never had the pleasure of a wife like I have because he thinks that all women are bad because he's judging them by the ones he knows best which is a common trait of all of us. We judge people by the ones we know best, don't we? And it's not always fair either to do that. Certainly not in his case. I'm calling to your attention some of the vital things in life that you need to deal with. You need to understand yourself and understand people and understand how to adjust yourself in, uh, with people that are difficult to get along with. You need to know that because there are a lot of people in this world that are difficult to get along with and there are going to be a lot as long as you and I live and long after that. So we can't uh, do away with those people that are difficult to get along with, but we can do something about it by doing something with ourselves. Does that make sense to you all or not? Yeah. I think it does. We're talking about self-discipline. We want to know what it means. First of all, it means complete control over both the body and the mind. Complete control. Oh, that doesn't mean changing your uh, your your mind or your body, it means controlling it. 
breaks the great emotion of sex, gets more people into trouble than all the other emotions combined. And yet it's the most creative, the most profound, and the most divine of all of the emotions. It's not the emotion that's the, the, that, that gets people into trouble. It's their lack of controlling it and directing it, transmuting it, which they would be readily able to do if they had self-discipline. So it is with other faculties of the body and the mind. It's not that you have to change completely. It's just that you have to be the master. You have to be in control. You have to recognize uh, the things that you must do in order to have sound health and peace of mind. It also means the development of daily habits by which the mind is kept busy in connection with the things and the circumstances that one desires and off the circumstances one does not desire. It means that you will not accept or submit to the influence of any circumstance or thing you do not desire. Nothing at all. Don't submit to it. You may have to tolerate it. You may have to recognize it's there, but you don't have to submit. That is, you don't have to let it conquer you. You don't have to admit that it's stronger than you are. But on the other hand, you assert that you're stronger than it because you're not going to submit to it. And you can give your imagination a wide range of operation there as to what these things are that you're going to have to deal with, but you're not going to submit to them. I'm not going to mention, mention them. It might get too personal. <laughs> It means that you will build a three-wall protection around yourself so no one will ever know all about you or what goes on in your mind. Isn't that an interesting thing? Would you want anybody in this world, anybody, to know all about you? No. no. Who would? If you're in your right mind, you wouldn't. Would you want anybody to know all that you think about him? <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of people who just make the mistake of letting anybody that wants to know know everything that goes on in their mind. All you have to do is start them talking. You know, these people who start their mouths to working and then go off and leave them. <laughs> you know the type I'm talking about. They, uh, just get them started and believe me, you find out all about them, good and bad. J. Edgar Hoover, with whom I did some professional work on a great many occasions and still do at times, told me once that the fellow that, who he's investigating is the best help to him of all, of all because he gets more information from the guy that he's tracing than from all other sources combined. I said, why? He says, well, because he talks too damn much. <laughs> yeah, that was his exact reply. Um, tell me what a man fears and I will tell you how to master him. The very minute you find out what anybody fears, you'll know exactly how to control him if you're foolish enough to want to control anybody on that basis. I don't want to control anybody on fear. Not at all. If I control anybody, I want it on the basis of what? Love. Of course. Of course. On no other basis. I wouldn't have any control over anybody on any other basis than that he wants to give me control of it. The average person talks too much for his own good. We're now on the subject of enthusiasm, and I don't know a better time than to talk about enthusiasm than right now, because you seem to have been demonstrating quite a bit of it. <clears throat> first of all, the very first step in creating enthusiasm is based upon a burning desire. In other words, that's the starting of enthusiasm, and you have no trouble, and uh, as a matter of fact, when you learn how to work yourself up into a state of a burning desire, you won't need the rest of the instructions on enthusiasm because you've already got the last word in enthusiasm. When you want something real badly, you make up your mind to get it. Uh, you have that burning desire. Uh, it steps up to your thinking processes. It, uh, it uh, whets your imagination so that your imagination goes to work and works out ways and means of so you're getting the thing you desire. That enthusiasm... Uh, uh, gives you a brighter mind. It makes you more alert to opportunities. You see opportunities that you never saw before when your mind is stepped up to that state of enthusiasm to a burning desire for something definite. And next, uh, there is active enthusiasm and passive enthusiasm. The active enthusiasm is uh, more effective. Now, what do I mean by active and passive? I'll give you an illustration of passive enthusiasm. Henry Ford for instance, was the most lacking in the active enthusiasm of any man I have ever seen. I never heard him laugh but once in his life. When he, shakes, when he shook hands with you, it was like taking hold of a piece of cold ham. You did all the shaking. He did nothing but stick his hand out and then take it back when you let loose of it. And in his conversation, there was no magnetism in his voice whatsoever. And uh, there was no evidence of any shape, form, or fashion of his demonstrating 
active enthusiasm. Now, what kind of enthusiasm did he have? Because he must have had some to have such an outstanding major purpose and to have achieved it so successfully. It was inward. His enthusiasm was placed, uh, transmuted into his imagination and into his power of faith and into his personal initiative. He went ahead on his own initiative. He believed that he could do whatever he wanted to do. He kept himself alert and keen with applied faith through his enthusiasm, his passive enthusiasm, thinking inside of his own mind what it was he was going to do and all the joy he'd get out of doing it. I once asked him, this was after he, long after he had arrived and had his uh, problems whipped, I asked him if, uh, uh, if he ever wanted anything or wanted to do anything he couldn't do. He said, no, not no, and then he qualified himself, not in recent years. He said in early days, uh, until he learned how to uh, get or to do whatever he wanted to do, he uh, couldn't uh, answer in the affirmative. And I said, well, in, the, um, in other words, Mr. Ford, is there anything that you need or want or that you can't get? He said, that's right, that's correct. Well, I said, how do you go about, uh, how do you know that's true? And how do you go about uh, making sure that whatever you want to do, you know you're going to do it before you stop? He said, well, for a long time, I've uh, formed the habit of putting my mind on the can-do part of every problem. If I have a problem, there's always something I can do about it. Many things I can't do, but something I can do, and I start where I can do something. And he said, as I use up the can-do part of it, the, the no-can-do simply just vanishes. If I get to the river where I expected to have to have a bridge, I didn't need the bridge because the river was dry. <laughs> now, isn't that a marvelous thing for a man to make a statement like that? And he, kept, he started in on, the, on his problem or his objective where he could do something. And he said if he, um, if he wanted to turn out a new model, if he wanted to turn out a, increase his production... He immediately put his mind to work on the plan through which he could do that. And he never paid any attention to the obstacles because he knew that if his plan was sufficiently strong and definite and backed with the right kind of a faith that the opposition that he might meet with would melt away when he came to it. And he said an astounding thing was that if you took that attitude of putting your mind behind the can-do part of every problem, the no-can-do part takes to its heels and runs. And I'm quoting his words. I could endorse everything that he has said because that's been my experience. My experience has been that if, if you want to do something, if you'll work yourself up into a state of white enthusiasm, uh, go, go to work where you stand if it's nothing more than drawing a picture in your mind of the thing you want to do. And keep drawing that picture and making it more vivid all the time. That uh, in, in so far as you make use of the tools that are available to you now to move with, will other and better tools be put in your hands? That's one of the strange things of life, but that's the way it works. Uh, public speakers, teachers, can express enthusiasm by control of the voice. Now, there isn't any doubt about that. One of my students um, was riding down to class with me this evening and paid me a very high compliment. She wanted to know if I had had any voice training or voice culture or anything like that. I said, no, nothing, not a thing. I said, I had a course in public speaking a long time ago, but I violate everything the teacher ever taught me about it. In other words, I have my own system. And uh, she said, well, you have the most marvelous voice. And I often wondered if it hadn't been, if you hadn't had it carefully trained to impart the enthusiasm or the meaning that you want to impart with it. And I said, no, uh, the answer to that, the answer to this voice that I have it's, uh, is this, that no matter who hears it, or how inexperienced that person may be, or how much of a cynic that person may be, the person knows one thing, that when I say something, I believe what I'm saying. I'm sincere about it. And that's the grandest voice control that I know anything about. It's to express enthusiasm in, in belief, in terms of belief, as the thing that you're saying. You know that the thing that you're saying at the time is the thing that you ought to say, and that will do some good for the other fellow, and perhaps for you too. I have seen public speakers that march pranks all over the stage and run their fingers through their hair and stick their hands down in their pockets and go through all kinds of personal gestures. Uh, I don't, I, all that does to me is uh, it distracts my attention when a speaker does that. I have trained myself to stand in one position. I never march around over the stage and very seldom I sometimes uh, spread out my hands, but not very often. But the effect that I want to get is, first of all, with the sincerity of what I'm talking about and then putting my own enthusiasm back, it in, back of it in the tone of my voice. And if you learn to do that, 
you'll have a marvelous asset. And then the, one must feel enthusiasm before being able to express it. I don't see how in the name of heavens anybody could express enthusiasm when his heart was breaking or his, he was in uh, uh, distress or was in trouble of some sort that he couldn't throw off. I did sit in a, in a show once in New York where the star of the show came on and gave a marvelous performance and she discovered about three minutes before she came on for her part that her father had just dropped dead and uh, you would never know, never know at all. She gave the performance as perfectly as I, I could imagine it could be given. Not the slightest indication in the world that anything had happened. She, she'd trained herself to, uh, uh, to be an actress once and always, no matter what the circumstances. And if she hadn't trained herself to do that, she wouldn't have been an actress. An actor who can't uh, uh, fall into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the skeleton shape of his character that he's trying to portray and feel uh, like that character ought to feel will not be an actor. He may express the words, <coughs> the lines that are written for him, but he'll never have the right impression on an audience unless he lives the thing he's trying to put across. And they're really great actors in all walks of life. And they're not all on the stage. There are some of them in private life. The great actors in life are all people who can put themselves into the role that you're trying to portray. They feel it. They believe in it. They have confidence in it. And they have no trouble in conveying to the other fellow a spirit of enthusiasm. This uh, enthusiasm is a mighty tonic for all of the uh, negative influences that get into your mind. If you want to burn up a negative influence, just turn on old enthusiasm. I'm telling you, the two can't stay in the same room at the same time. Just can't do it. You start being enthusiasm over, uh, enthusiastic over anything, and I defy you to let uh, these doubting thoughts or these thoughts of fear come into your mind while you are keyed up in the state of enthusiasm. One should practice the development of enthusiasm in daily conversations and learn to turn it on or off at will. But you start in now immediately to uh, step up the tone of your voice when you're conversing with other people, to uh, put a smile back on your words, uh, inject into it a pleasant tone, a pleasant feeling. Sometimes you can do that by toning your voice down, not talking so loud. Other times you can do it by stepping it up so that they can't fail to hear you and, and recognize what you're doing. In other words, uh, learn to inject enthusiasm into your ordinary daily conversations and you'll have somebody to practice on in every person you come into contact with. Now, this, uh, this assignment that I'm giving you about practicing on people that you come into, con into contact with daily is a marvelous thing if you just stop and, and watch what happens to you when you start doing that. Naturally, you start changing your tone of voice. You'll go out deliberately intending to make the other fellow smile while you're talking to him or her and make that person like you. It'd be no good to put enthusiasm into telling another fellow what you think about him if you don't think something pleasant. Because the more enthusiastic you are, the less he'll like you. When you start telling um, another person what you think of him for his own good, well, <laughs> believe you me, you better be smiling. Nobody wants anybody to reprimand him or to overhaul him or to tell him something for his own good because he knows very well that there's a selfish motive in it somewhere along the line, or he thinks so at least. Speech in monotones is always monotonous and boresome. I don't care who it is that's speaking. If, you don't, if you're not able to uh, get variety and color and rise and fall in the inflection in your voice, you're going to be monotonous no matter what you're saying or who, to whom you're saying it. Just suppose that I came out here and talked in the tone that I am now and never changed my tone of voice, and even though I said exactly the same thing that I've been saying and didn't color my voice, so I, do you think that uh, I would get such a rousing cheer when I come on? And, huh? No, of course not. Of course not. I can come out here and keep you from going to sleep. How? By arousing you with a question that you weren't prepared for and then letting you answer it. But mostly by getting some enthusiasm into my tone of voice. Raising my voice, letting it back down again, keeping you jumping and guessing as to what I'm going to say next. That's a good way to hold an audience so you won't be like, keep the audience guessing as to what you're going to say next. If you talk in monotones and put no enthusiasm into what you're saying, the, uh, the listener will be a way ahead of you. He knows what you're going to say long before you say it. And whatever it is, he doesn't want to hear it in the first place. <laughs> Enthusiasm, it's a marvelous thing. And the, the, the beautiful part about enthusiasm is that you can turn it on and off yourself. You don't need to ask anybody about it. 
Uh, facial expression should also express enthusiasm through the smile properly directed. I, I hate to see a person t talking to me at close range uh, with a, a serious expression on his face that never changes that seriousness in the leaves. Even though the topic of conversation is one of, uh, of a serious nature, I like to see the person uh, soften his face with a smile. If you watch Mr. Stone when he's speaking, he stops quite often through his speeches and smiles, and he's got a, he's got a winning smile. It's a marvelous smile. The way he softens up his whole face. He just absolutely disarms anybody that he's talking to, even though he's saying something the other person doesn't want to hear. He can, uh, he, he can disarm the other person by this uh, change of expression on his face. He's a master at that. I'm not a master at it, but I can do it when I want to, believe you me. Uh, because that's a part of self-discipline too, is to be able to look at the other person, let him know by the tone of your voice what you're saying and the way you're saying it and the way you look. That uh, what you say you mean and that you mean it for his benefit. Now that's one of the things that you can do with enthusiasm. Facial expression. And start now to observe people who express enthusiasm in their conversational relations. Also people who do not. And uh, get a great lesson in attractiveness of personality. Just start studying people. If you see a person that you particularly like, watch that person. Find out what it is about him that, or her that makes you like him or her. And uh, chances are a thousand to one that you find out that whatever that person says to you or engages whatever conversation he engages in, it will be on an enthusiastic basis. And you'll never be bored no matter how much he talks or what he says because he makes it so attractive that you'll never get tired of it. From definite habits, uh, form definite habits by which you will learn to express enthusiasm in your ordinary conversations. Practice before a mirror. Talk to yourself if you can't find anybody that's willing to listen to it and start out with. You'll be surprised how interesting it is when you start talking to yourself and say the things you want to hear. Don't, don't say the things you don't want to hear when you're looking at yourself in the glass. You know, I stood before a, mi a mirror for years and years and years and I told myself that the day would come, I said, look here Napoleon Hill, you admire Arthur Brisbane's style of writing, that clear clarity, that succinctness, that definiteness, that uh, simplicity of language. You, you admire that. But Napoleon, you're going to not only catch up with Arthur, but you're going to run rings around him. And ladies and gentlemen, I did just that. <laughs> By talking to this fellow and convincing him it could be done. It's not foolish to talk to yourself in the mirror. It's not foolish to talk. That is, if nobody is standing on the eye. Be sure to close the bathroom door. Don't leave the door open. <laughs> don't leave the door open. And don't talk too loudly if there are people around too close because they'll uh, probably call the, uh, the psycho <laughs> psychiatric ward and want to know if they can't come down and tend to have a relative down there that's gone berserk. <laughs> use discrimination and all these things, but really and truly, you've got a, an overhauling job to do on yourself. We all have, at one time or another at least. You've got to do an overhauling job. <clears throat> I want to attain to a greater degree of proficiency all the time. I, my, my education is never completed. It's wide open all the time. You know, as long as you're green, you continue to grow, but when you get to where you're ripe with knowledge, then the next step is to become rotten. <laughs> I don't want to be ripe. I'm not, I'll never be ripe with knowledge. Never learn the last word about anything. I'm always learning, learning from people. I get much more from you than you do from me because I have several hundred to learn from and you only have one. <laughs> you ever thought of that? But I wouldn't get anything from you if I didn't have an open mind if I weren't trying to learn from you all the time. When you express enthusiasm in your daily conversations, observe with profit how others pick up your enthusiasm and reflect it back to you as their own. You can change the attitude of anybody that you want to by simply working yourself up into a state of enthusiasm. It's a contagious thing, and they pick it right up and reflect it back to you as their own. All salesmen, all master salesmen understand that art. If they don't understand it, they are not master salesmen. They're not even ordinary salesmen if they don't know how to key up the buyer with their enthusiasm. And no matter what you're selling, it works just the same in selling yourself as it does in selling services or commodities or merchandise. You take a good salesman, go into any store and pick out a salesman that knows his business. And I want to tell you right now that you recognize that that salesman is not only showing you merchandise, but along with it, he's giving you a, some information and a tone of voice that uh, impresses you. 
Most salesmen, you know, in stores are not salesmen at all. They don't have the first, uh, 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 first idea about salesmanship. They, uh, they're, uh, what will we count, call them? They're order takers. Order, order takers, not salesmen at all. They don't sell it. I've often heard them say, well, I sold so much today. I heard a newspaper man that, uh, talking to one of the man that delivers the news to him. I was telling how many papers he'd sold that day. Well, he hadn't sold any papers at all. He'd been there, he had them out, and people came along and bought them and laid their money down. He didn't have anything to do with selling them, except putting there, putting the merchandise where the people could pick it up and buy. But he thought he was a salesman, thought he was a pretty good one. But you see a lot of people who wrap up merchandise and pass it out to you and take your money, who think they've made a sale, they haven't made anything of the kind. You've done the buy. But a good salesman, you can't say that about him. You go in to buy a shirt, and before you get out of there, he'll sell you some underwear and some socks and some tie and a pair of suspenders. No, he wouldn't sell me any suspenders because I don't wear them. But he'd sell me a nice new belt. One did that just a day or two ago. I didn't need a belt, but he, did. he, he showed me a nice one, and uh, it just fitted my personality, and I bought it mostly on the personality of the man I was talking about. <laughs> yes, believe you me, I'm not immune to salesmanship either. Well, um... When you meet with any sort of unpleasant circumstance, learn to transmute it into a pleasant feeling by repeating your major purpose with great enthusiasm. In other words, when any kind of an unpleasant circumstance comes across your path, instead of brooding over that or allowing it to take up your time in regret or in frustration or in fear, just start in and switch over to thinking about this marvelous thing that you're going to accomplish down here one, two, or three, or four, or five years from now, or six months, or whatever it is. Start thinking about the thing that you can put enthusiasm back of and use your enthusiasm for the things you want and not for the things that you've just lost through defeat. You know, there are a lot of people who allow the death in the family, the death of a loved one, to run them distracted. I've known people lose their minds over that. When my father passed away in 1939, of course, I knew he was going to pass away. We knew what his condition was, and we knew it was only a question of time, and I conditioned my mind so that it could not possibly upset me and make the slightest impress on me emotionally. I got a call from my brother one evening down at my estate in Florida, and I had some rather distinguished company there uh, talking about publishing business, and my the tele the maid came in and said that my brother wanted to speak to me on the telephone. I went out of the room and talked to him for three or four minutes. He told me that our father had passed away and that the funeral would be that coming Friday. And we chatted uh, a little while about other things, and then I thanked him for calling me and went back to my company. Nobody, nobody knew that anything had happened. Not even many members of my family knew until the next day what had happened. There was no, no expression of, of sorrow nor anything of that kind. What was the use? I, I couldn't save him. He was dead. Why I would grieve myself to death over something I can't do anything about? You say, that's hard-hearted? No, it's not hard-hearted at all. I knew it was going to happen. I adjusted myself to it so that it could not destroy my confidence nor my, make me afraid. In matters of that kind, now, as serious as that, you have to learn to, uh, to give yourself immunity against uh, being upset emotionally. You know, when you're upset emotionally, you're not quite sane. You don't digest your food. You're not happy. You're not successful. Things go against you when you're in that frame of mind. And I don't want things to go against me. I don't want to be unhealthy. I want to be successful. I want to be healthy. I want things to come my way. And the only way that I can ensure that is to not let anything upset my emotions. I don't think anybody can love any deeper or more often than I have. But if I had unrequited love circumstances, and I've had that circumstance once in life, I could let that upset me very badly, but I didn't. <laughs> Why? Eh, because I have self-control. Because I won't let anything destroy my equilibrium. Nothing at all. I didn't want my father to die, but as long as he was dead, there wasn't anything I could do about it. There was no use of me dying along too, just because he had. And I've seen people do just that. Just die, go ahead and die because somebody else had died. That's an extreme illustration I'm giving you, but it's certainly one that's needed by everybody. We need to learn to adjust ourselves to the unpleasantness of life without going down under them. And the way to do that is to convert, to divert your attention away from the unpleasant over to something that is pleasant and then put all of the enthusiasm you've got back of that other something. Your life is, you're entitled to have complete control of it. <clears throat> and remember, from this day forward, 
that your duty to yourself requires that you do something each day to improve your technique for the expression of enthusiasm, no matter what it is. Maybe the, I have touched upon some of the things that you can do, but I haven't touched upon all of them. Maybe you, in, in your circumstances and considering your relations with other people, you know something that you can do to step up your enthusiasm so as to uh, make you more beneficial to some other person. And I want to tell you something, and this is a very appropriate thing for the closing of this lecture. If you have a mate, and you can work up a relationship with that mate, where the mate compliments you in every place where you're apt to be weak, then you've got a fortune beyond uh, compare, a fortune that you can't estimate, an asset that's beyond comparison with anything else in this world. Because that mastermind relationship between a man and his wife can surmount and go around and master all difficulties that they may come into contact with. They do it by multiplying, joining their mental attitudes and multiplying their enthusiasm, turning it on each other to places where they are in need of it. And I thank you very much. I've never known of a successful person in the upper brackets of success in any calling that hadn't acquired the great potential powers of concentration upon one thing at a time. You've heard... Uh, people speak of others intending it to be derogatory by calling them people with one-track minds. Have you ever heard that term? Yeah. Well, anytime anybody call, says, I have a one-track mind, I want to thank him for it. <clears throat> because there are a lot of people that have multi-track minds and they try to run on all of them at the same time and don't make a good job on any. I have observed that the outstanding successes are people who have uh, developed high... Uh, capacity to keep their mind fixed upon one thing at a time. When you have learned to concentrate on one thing at a time, you have learned to key yourself up to where you can see yourself already in possession of the thing that you're concentrating on. Motives, uh, the nine basic motives is the star, are the starting point of all concentration. In other words, you don't concentrate unless you have a motive for doing it. If you want to make a lot of money, for instance, let's say you want to buy an estate, a farm. And uh, you concentrated on money in the upper brackets, you would be surprised at how that concentration would uh, change your whole habits, attract to you opportunities for making money that you never thought of before. I know that's the way it worked out because some years ago I wanted a thousand acre estate. Of course, I didn't know at that time just how much a thousand acres was, but I, I was concentrating on a thousand acres. And it cost approximately $250,000 to get the land that I was looking for. And that was a lot more money than I had at that time. But almost from the very day that I fixed in my mind the size of the state that I wanted, opportunities began to open up and develop for me to get that money and in larger blocks and hunts than I'd ever gotten it before. The royalties on my books commenced to increase. Demand for my lectures commenced to increase. Demand for my business counsel commenced to increase. So I had just sold myself on the idea that I had to have the money, I was going to get it, I was going to render service for it. When I got the estate, I didn't get a thousand acres, I got 600 acres. And the man uh, from whom I bought it, when I told him that I wanted a thousand acres, he said, I have 600, by the way, do you know how much 600 acres are? I said, well, I have a rough idea. I said, would you mind walking around this estate with me? <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we started out bright one morning and with a couple of golf sticks. I, we took the golf stick along to knock the rattlesnakes in the head with. And we started around the outer edge of that and we walked until noon time and uh, we went more than halfway around it up and down over the Catskill Mountains. Noon time, uh, he says, we're just about halfway around. I said, well, instead of going all the way around, let's just turn and go back. <laughs> I've seen enough. 600 acres is plenty. <laughs> well, I bought the place. And then the Depression came on, 1929, 30, 31. And believe you me, it was tough going. But I had uh, accumulated enough money to buy the place. I wouldn't have had it if I hadn't have concentrated on that idea. Then next, a definiteness of purpose or of an obsessional proportion is the moving spirit back of the motive. Now, it's no, there's no use of having a motive unless you put obsessional desire or obsessional purpose uh, back of it. 
Now, what's the difference between an ordinary purpose or desire and an obsessional desire? What's the difference? That's right. That's very good. That word intensity is a very good one. It's a very fitting word. In other words, uh, to wish for a thing or to hope for a thing doesn't cause anything to happen. But when you put a burning desire or an obsessional desire back of a thing, why, it moves you into action and it attracts you to others and uh, attracts things to you that you need in order to fulfill that desire. And also, the, uh, how do you go about uh, developing an obsessional desire about anything? By thinking about a lot of things, changing from one thing to another? No, no. You... Uh, you select one thing, you eat it, you sleep it, you drink it, you breathe it, you talk about it as long as you can find anybody to listen. If you can't find anybody, you talk to yourself. That's right, repetition. Keep on telling your subconscious mind exactly what you want. Make it clear, make it plain, make it definite, and above everything else, let your subconscious mind know that you expect results. And no fooling. An organized endeavor or personal initiative is the self-starter that starts the action on uh, concentration. And then applied faith is the sustaining force that keeps uh, action going. In other words, uh, without that applied faith, when the going gets to be hard, and it will, no matter what you're doing, uh, you'd either slow down or maybe quit. So you can see that you need applied faith to keep uh, your action keyed up to a high degree even when the going is hard and when the results are not uh, coming in as you would like them to come. Uh, by the way, did any of you ever hear of anybody starting out to do anything and achieving an outstanding permanent success right from the start without any opposition? Did you ever hear of anybody like that? No. no. Well, don't look now. <laughs> But I want to tip you out, tip you off to the fact that nobody ever did that, and probably nobody ever will. <laughs> the going is hard always with everyone, no matter what you're doing. And you've got a tremendous amount of information back of every one of these lessons that you can concentrate on. But you'll have to concentrate on every one of these lessons when you come to it. Put everything else aside and concentrate on that lesson. And uh, add to these notes everything that you can get that's uh, related to this subject. You'll have to come back to it many times. And when I say you'll have to concentrate on each lesson, that means that you'll have to come back to each lesson many, many times. You have to keep thinking about each one. But while you're concentrating on a given lesson, don't let your mind be running over all the other lessons. Stick right straight to that one lesson while you're at it. Then the master mind is the source of allied power necessary to ensure success. Can you imagine anybody concentrating on the attainment of... a uh, something of an outstanding nature without uh, making use of the mastermind and the brains and the influence and the education of other people? Did you ever hear of anybody achieving an outstanding success without the cooperation of other people? No. I never have, and I have been around quite a bit in this success field, about as much as the average, maybe more than the average, and I have never found anybody yet in the upper brackets of achievement in any line that didn't owe his success very largely to the friendly, harmonious uh, a cooperation of other people, to the use of other people's brains and sometimes other people's money. You know, they do that once in a while, too. So you need the mastermind uh, alliance in your concentration if you're aiming for anything above mediocrity. Of course, you can do your own concentrating on failure. That way, well, you won't need any help on that. <laughs> won't need any mastermind on that, but also you'll have a lot of uh, volunteer help on it. <laughs> And a lot of good company along. Well, I say a lot of company, let's put it that way. If you just aim to fail. But if you're going to succeed, you've got to follow these regulations as I'm laying them down for you. You, just, you can't escape them, you can't neglect any one of them. And then self-discipline is the watchman that keeps action moving in the right direction, even when the going is difficult. And incidentally, there's where you need self-discipline the most, is when uh, you have meet with opposition, or when the uh, conditions and circumstances that you've got to cut through are uh, um, difficult, there's where you'll need your self-discipline to keep your faith uh, going and keep yourself uh, determined that you're not going to quit just because the going is hard. So you couldn't possibly get along in concentrating without self-discipline. Oh, you could if everything went your way. It'd be no trouble at all. You could concentrate on anything if everything was going your way and you didn't need to meet these difficult circumstances. 
Then the creative vision or imagination is the architect that fashions practical plans for your action back of your concentrating. Before you can concentrate intelligently, you've got to have plans. You've got to have an architect, and that architect is your imagination and the imaginations of your mastermind allies, if you have them. What happens uh, when you start out to do something without a definite or a practical plan? Did you ever hear of anybody who st had a very fine objective or a very fine uh, a purpose or a very fine idea, but uh, it failed because he didn't have the right kind of a plan for putting it over. Did you ever hear of anybody like that? Yes. Have you ever heard of any other kind except that? <laughs> is, is that a common pattern, as a matter of fact, for people who have ideas, but their plans for carrying them out are not good, not sound? And then uh, going the extra mile is the principle that ensures harmonious operation, cooperation from others going the extra mile. You need that in, co in the business of uh, concentrating. If you're going to get other people to help you, you've got to do something to put them under obligation. So you've got to give them a motive. Even your mastermind allies that are in your own organization, they won't serve as mastermind allies without a motive. And what are some of the motives, incidentally, that would get people to join you in a, in an under, in a given undertaking? What are some of the motives? What's the most outstanding motive? The desire for financial gain, of course. In all business and professional undertakings, I would say the uh, desire for, for financial gain is the outstanding motive. And if you're going into a business that's, uh, where the main object is to make money, and if you don't allow your mastermind allies or your key men and women or the people who are helping you most, if you don't allow them to get sufficient returns, uh, you're not going to have them very long. They'll be uh, going into business for themselves. They'll be going over to your competitors and whatnot. I was very astounded once to hear Mr. Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, tell me that he paid uh, Charlie Schwab $75,000 a year salary and some, on some years a bonus in addition to his salary of a million dollars. Did that several years. And to me that was a lot of money then, it's still a lot of money now. Well, I was curious uh, about Mr. Carnegie, and I want to know why a man of his great intelligence would pay one man like that a bonus of more than ten times as much as his salary. And I said, Mr. Carnegie, did you have to do that? Well, he said, no, certainly I didn't. I could let go and let him go out and go into competition with me. <laughs> sure, I didn't have to do it. There's quite a bit of meaning back of that statement. In other words, he got a good man there that was very valuable to him, and he wanted to keep him. And he knew that the way to keep him was to let him know that he'd make more money with Mr. Carnegie than he would without him. Then the applied golden rule gives uh, one moral guidance to the action on, in connection with which one is concentrating. Then accurate thinking saves one from daydreaming and the creation, in the creation of plans. And did you know that the, um, most of the so-called thinking is nothing in the world but daydreaming or hoping or wishing? That's what it is. There are a lot of people in this world who spend the vast majority of their time daydreaming and hoping and wishing, thinking about things, but never doing, never doing what? Anything else. Never taking any actual, physical or mental, concrete uh, action in carrying out their plans. I had an experience a long time ago when I was lecturing over in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, on this philosophy. <coughs> After the lecture was over, an elderly man tottered up or waddled up to the stage. He was decrepit and not very strong. And he fished around in his pocket and came out with a great bundle of papers that had dog ears on them. And finally he fished around amongst those papers and he came up with one on yellow paper. He said, uh, Nothing new, Mr. Hill, in what you just said. said, I had those ideas 20 years ago. He said, there they are on paper. I had those ideas. Sure he did. <laughs> Millions of other people had them, too. But no, nobody did anything about them. Nothing new in the philosophy. Not a thing new in it, except the law of cosmic habit force. That's the only new thing about it. And that, strictly speaking, is not new. That's Emerson's, uh, that's a proper interpretation of Emerson's essay on uh, compensation but stated in terms that people can understand the first time they read it. Yes, there he was. He uh, carried those ideas around his pocket, and he could have been the Napoleon Hill instead of me if he'd have only gotten busy back before I started. Some of these days, some smart fellow will come along, and uh, he'll take up uh, right where I stop, and he'll 
create a philosophy based on uh, what I've done uh, that'll be far superior perhaps to this. Maybe that person sits right in this room now. Then uh, learning from defeat ensures one against quitting when the going is hard. Isn't it a marvelous thing to know that in this philosophy you, know, you have learned beyond any question of a doubt that uh, failure and defeat and adversity needn't stop you, that there's a benefit in every such experience? Yes. What is that benefit? Tell me. Can you see any benefit in a man going through a depression and losing all of his money right down to the last penny, having to start all over again? <laughs> well, if you can't, you uh, take a good look now because you're looking at a man who did just that. And it's one of the greatest blessings that ever came along because I was getting just to, to be a kind of a smarty pants. I, I was making too much money and making it too easily and I had to get taken back a notch. I came out fighting, and uh, I have done more good work since that time than I ever did before, and if, without that experience, I probably would be up there on my estate in the Catskill Mountains instead of down here teaching. Sometimes adversity is a blessing in disguise, and oftentimes not so much disguised as that, if you take the right attitude toward it. Uh, you can't be whipped, you can't be defeated until you have accepted defeat in your own mind. Just remember that. And remember that the, no matter what the nature of your adversity is, there is always that seed of an equivalent benefit if you will concentrate on the circumstance and look for the good that came out of it instead of the bad. Don't spend any time brooding over the things that are lost or gone or the mistakes that you have made. Oh, except put in some time analyzing them and uh, learning profiting by them so that you won't make the same mistake twice. And thus it will be seen that controlled attention involves the blending and the application of many of the other principles of the philosophy. Persistence should be the watchword behind all of these principles. Controlled attention is the twin brother of definiteness of purpose. Just think what you could do with those two principles. Definiteness of purpose, knowing exactly what you want, and concentrate everything you've got on the carrying out of that purpose. Do you know what would happen to your mind, to your brain, and to your whole uh, personality, and to yourself, if you would concentrate on one definite thing? And by concentrating on it, I mean to put all of uh, the time that you can possibly spare when you're not sleeping and not working to earn later, all of the time that you can possibly spare seeing yourself in position of the thing that represents your definiteness of purpose. Seeing yourself in position of it, seeing yourself building plans for attaining it, working out the first step that you can take, and then the second, and then the third, and so on, concentrating on it day in and day out. In a little while, you'll get to the point at which Every way you turn, you'll find there's something in the way of an opportunity that'll lead you a little bit closer to the thing that uh, represents your definiteness of purpose. When you know what you want, it's astounding how many things you will find uh, that are re related to exactly what you want. I was living in Florida some years ago, and <clears throat> I had a very important letter coming to the Tampa, Florida post office. I knew the letter came because I'd talked on the long distance to the city, National City Bank in New York, and I knew that letter was in the mail and was out down at the post office. I had to have it before 12 o'clock. I called the postmaster, who was a friend of mine, and he said the, the mail for your, I lived out in the country, 10 miles off. He said, that mail is somewhere between here and, uh, and Temple Terrace. It's out on the route number one, and uh, I don't know of any way for you to get that letter before 12 o'clock except to run the postman down. And he said, I'll tell you which station is where to start because he's already passed station number nine, I think it was. He says, you pick him up there and uh, I'll give you the instructions how to follow his route. Well, 
Route number one came over the same highway at long distance that I used in traveling from Tampa out to Tampa Terrace at my home. I traveled it every day. I didn't know there were any mailboxes on it, but when I began to, began to be important for me to observe mailboxes, I won't tell you, I never saw so many mailboxes in all my life. <laughs> Believe me, they were, looked to me like every hundred feet almost, there was a mailbox. And they were all numbered. And I was looking for the number that the postmaster had given me as the one that he'd pro where the, he would probably be at that very hour. Well, I finally caught up with him, and he had it was on a Monday. And he had an enormous load of mail. Why well, he said, man, I can't do anything. I can't do anything about that. I don't know where your letter is. And says, I won't know until I get rid of all. I said, listen, fellow, I have got to have that letter. It's in there. I have got to have it. I said, the postmaster told me to run you down and not to take no for an answer, to tell you to get out and sort that mail and let me have that letter. Now, I, that's what he told me. And if you don't think so, come right over here to this farmhouse and you can call him. Well, he said, uh, it's, uh, not, it's unlawful. I can't do that. Well, I said, unlawful or not, I've got to have that letter. Now, that's all there is to it. Now, listen, fellow, be a, be a good sport. There's no use of you and me arguing. You've got a job to do, and I've got a job to do. Mine's important, too, and yours is important. And it's not going to hurt you very much to move that mail. You can do it in a little while. Oh, hell, he said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to work, and this, the third letter that he picked out was mine. Oh. Third one, he didn't... Just one of those things, you know, when you know what you want, uh, somehow or other, and you're determined to get it, it's not near as difficult to get it as you thought it was. I have often thought of that experience, how uh, indicative that is of, of the experiences of people who uh, know what they want and are successful in getting it. They don't let anything stop them at all. In opposition, why, they just don't pay any attention to opposition. I've often watched Mr. Stone, my distinguished business associate, Mr. Stone, and his uh, talk to his salesman. Well, I tell you, I get a thrill every time I hear him speak. Because that man doesn't end. I don't believe he knows what the word no means. I think he's long since for, believes it means a yes. <laughs> well, that's right. And the results he gets show that he means it, uh, believes it means yes. He can be the most definite about the things he wants of anybody I've ever known, and the most definite in the failure in refusal to accept a, a turndown. <laughs> in other words, when objects get in his way, he just goes right over them, or around them, or he blows them out of the way. But he never lets them stop him. Now that's concentration. That's a definiteness of purpose put into action. Take Henry Ford, for instance. And everybody knows what his de obsessional definite purpose was. Everybody knows it. Most people have been riding a part of his major purpose around every day of their lives, my, driving it. It was a low-priced, dependable automobile, wasn't it? He didn't allow anybody to talk him. There were promoters that go... I, I have heard promoters pro approach Mr. Ford with the opportunities that seemed to me most glittering. And his, uh, his re reply always was that he was engaged in the thing that consumed all of his time and all of his effort. He was not interested in anything outside of his definite major purpose, which was to make and distribute all over the world low-priced, dependable automobiles. And, of course, uh, that uh, sticking to that uh, job made him fabulously rich. There were hundreds of people that I saw come into the field and uh, spend more money infinitely more money than Mr. Ford had to start out with, and they went back into the graveyard of failure, and I couldn't uh, find a dozen people in the world today who would know what their names were. Men who were better educated than Mr. Ford, better uh, personalities, had everything that he had and a lot more, except one thing. They didn't stick to the last. They didn't stick to the one definiteness of purpose the way that he did when the going was hard. Mr. Edison in the field of invention, there was a marvelous illustration of what concentration could do. And if you want the truth, I'll tell you that if Mr. Edison was a genius in any sense, it was because when the going was hard, then was when he turned on the most steam and didn't quit. Think of a man standing by and keeping on through 10,000 different failures as he did when he's working on the incandescent electric lamp. 10,000. Can you imagine yourself going through 10,000 failures in the same field without uh, wondering if you shouldn't have your head examined? I was so astounded when I heard about that. I saw his, his log books. There were two stacks of them, that high. 
Each book about 250 pages in, and on every page there was a different plan that he had tried and it had failed. And I said, Mr. Edison, suppose that you hadn't have found the answer. What would you be doing right now? He said, I would be in my laboratory working instead of out here fooling away my time with you. <laughs> and I will say in his behalf, he grinned when he said it, but believe you me, he meant just exactly what he was saying. You know, infinite intelligence will throw itself on your side when it finds out that you're not going to quit until it does. If you do not give up when the going is hard, infinite intelligence will throw itself on your side. Remember, that's when the going is hard. It, you see there, you have your faith tested, you have your uh, initiative tested, you have your uh, uh, enthusiasm tested, you have your endurance tested, and when nature finds out that you can stand the test and that you're not going to take no for an answer, she says, all right, you pass. Come on in. You're over. You're in. I think that nature or infinite intelligence or God or whatever you choose to call it, I think that uh, first cause likes to convey information to people in simple terms and things they can understand. And surely this philosophy comes within that category. It wouldn't send the high school boy or girl to the dictionary or to the encyclopedia. You can read it or you can hear about it, you can understand it, and your own intelligence tells you the moment you uh, come across one of these principles that it's bound to be sound. You just know that it is. You don't need any proof. You can see that it is. And it wouldn't have been in existence today if I hadn't concentrated through 20-odd years of adversity and defeat. So you see, it does pay to concentrate, and it does, uh, my own experience corroborates what I said, that if you stand by when the going is hard and fail to quit, infinite intelligence will throw itself on your side. Now, I don't think that would be true in a case uh, like that of Hitler's. No doubt he had uh, a definiteness of purpose, no doubt he had an obsessional desire, but what was wrong with his uh, definiteness of purpose? <laughs> That is right. It ran counter to the plans of infinite intelligence, to the laws of nature, to the laws of right and wrong. And you may be sure that whatever you're doing will come to naught or come to failure and you'll come to grief if it works on hardship or an injustice upon a single individual. What you must do, what you do, if you hope to have infinite intelligence throw itself on your side, is to be right. And you can only be right when everything that you do benefits everybody whom it affects, including yourself. Well, then take uh, Christ's uh, whole life was de devoted uh, to concentration upon developing a system of uh, living for the brotherhood of man. Uh, he didn't fare too well while he lived. But on the other hand, uh, he must have been doing the right thing because what he was doing, even though after he passed on, he only had 12 people to start out with. And that's uh, why I believe that what he was doing, what he was preaching, must have been right because if it hadn't been right, it would have been destroyed and gone along before this. Because there is something in nature, in infinite intelligence, which uh, brings forth with every evil the virus of its own destruction. And that, uh, there's no exception to that. Every evil, everything that's not in conjunction with the overall plan of nature, of the natural laws of the universe, brings with the circumstance itself the virus of its own destruction. Take uh, William Wrigley, for instance. Mr. Wrigley, by the way, William Wrigley Jr., was the first man that ever paid me money for teaching him this philosophy. I, my first hundred dollars that I ever made was, came from William Wrigley the stenographer's friend. <laughs> well, just think what that man did on a five-cent package of chewing gum. I never ride down Michigan Boulevard. I never see that building down there lighted, on the river lighted at night, that white building, because I don't think of what concentration can do even in connection with such a thing as a package of five-cent package of chewing gum. The signers of the Declaration of Independence and George Washington's and Abraham Lincoln's and Thomas Jefferson's concentration was to give personal liberties to all of the American people and eventually to the people of the world. It may well be that the freedom from mankind, the, this is the cradle 
for the birth of the, of the freedom of mankind itself, because I know of no other nation on the face of this earth that is concentrating upon the freedom of the individual, as we are doing here in the United States. And I know of no other philosophy, no other people engaged in any other study whose objective is to free so many people as those who are studying this philosophy. Well, we're on a marvelous lesson tonight, the subject of accurate thinking. You know, the thing that everybody talks about and hardly anybody ever does. <laughs> accurate thinking. Uh, what a marvelous thing it is to be able to analyze facts, think accurately, make decisions based upon uh, accurate thinking rather than upon emotional feelings. The majority of the opinions of uh, decisions that you make, and I and everybody else for that matter, are based upon uh, things that we desire or things that we feel, not upon the facts necessarily at all. And when it comes to a showdown between your emotional feelings, the things you feel like doing, and the things that your head tells you you ought to do, uh, which one do you think wins the most? Yeah. What's the matter with the head? That it doesn't get a better chance, do you suppose? Why isn't it consulted more? <coughs> very good, very good. The sparks are flying. I can see that. Someone has said that most people do not think, they just think that they think. And I think that just about covers it. Now, there are certain simple uh, rules and regulations that you can apply and this lesson covers every one of them, that will uh, help you avoid the mistakes, the common mistakes of inaccurate thinking, that is, of snap judgments and of being pushed around by your emotions. You know, the truth of the matter is that your emotions are, are not uh, reliable at all. Take the emotion of love, for instance. It's the greatest and uh, grandest of all of the emotions, and yet the most dangerous for, by the same token. And uh, perhaps more... Uh, trouble, more difficulty in human relationship grows out of a, a misunderstanding of the emotion of love and for all other sources combined. Well, let's begin at the beginning on the accurate thinking and see just what it is. First of all, there are two kinds of uh, thinking based upon two or uh, three uh, on three major fundamentals as follows. Inductive reasoning based on assumption of unknown facts or hypotheses. And there's deductive reasoning based on known facts or what is believed to be known facts. Then there's logic, that is, guidance by past experience similar to those under consideration. Now, those are the three types of thinking that we do. And uh, which one do you say that we put into operation most? Inductive reasoning or deductive reasoning or logic? Do you think, it, do you think we... <laughs> I don't <laughs> Now, inductive reasoning is based on assumption of unknown facts or hypotheses. You just assume, you don't know the facts, but you assume that they exist and uh, you create them and uh, base your judgment on what you have created. Now, when you do that, uh, you must keep your fingers crossed and be ready to change your, uh, your decision readily because your uh, reasoning may not uh, prove to be accurate because you're, uh, you're basing it upon assumed facts. But deductive reasoning is based on known facts or what is believed to be known facts. Now, that's where you have all of the facts before you, and you can deduce from those facts certain things that you ought to do to your, for your benefit or to carry out your desires. And that is the, uh, that's supposed to be the type of reasoning or thinking that the majority of people engage in, only they don't do a very good job of it. Now, there are two major steps in accurate thinking, and they are, first of all, separate facts from fiction or hearsay evidence. That's the first step. Before you do any thinking at all, you must find out whether you're dealing with facts or fiction, real evidence or hearsay evidence. And if you're dealing with fiction or hearsay evidence, it behooves you to be exceptionally careful, to keep an open mind and not to reach a final decision until you have examined those facts very carefully. And second, separate facts, separate facts into two classes. Important and unimportant. Now, what is an important fact? You will be surprised when I tell you that the vast majority of facts that we deal with, I'm talking about facts now, not hearsay evidence, not hypotheses, 
the vast number of facts that the majority of us deal with day in and day out are relatively unimportant. Why? Well, let's see what an important fact is, and then you'll know why. An important fact may be assumed to be any fact that can be used to advantage in the attainment of one's major purpose or any subordinate desire leading toward the attainment of one's major purpose. Now, that's what an important fact is. And I, uh, I wouldn't guess, I wouldn't miss, uh, miss it very much, I suspect, if I said that the vast majority of people spend more time on irrelevant facts that have nothing whatsoever to do with their advancement than they do on facts that would be of benefit to them. Curiosity people, people that meddle in other people's affairs, gossipers and all that sort of thing, putting in a lot of time thinking and talking about other people's affairs, Dealing with the petty uh, small talk and petty facts. In other words, dealing with unimportant facts. If you doubt that uh, what I've just said is true, take inventory of uh, the facts that you deal with for one, for one whole day and just sum up at the end of the day and see how many import, really important facts you've been dealing with. It'd be uh, better to do this on a Sunday, on an off day, when you're away from your occupation or any business. <laughs> because that's where, um, where an idle mind usually goes to work on unimportant facts. Now, um, opinions are usually without value because they are based on bias, prejudice, intolerance, guesswork, or hearsay evidence. It's surprising to uh, take inventory and find out how many people have how many opinions on how many things that have no basis whatsoever, except the way they feel or what somebody said to them or what newspaper they read or what influence they've come under. Most of our opinions come as a result of influences that uh, we don't have any control over. Uh, free advice uh, volunteered by friends and acquaintances is usually not worthy of consideration. Why? Not based upon facts and too much small talk mixed up in it. That last part of the sentence there is uh, not meant to be funny. Free advice volunteered by friends and acquaintances is usually not worthy of consideration. What kind of advice is the most desirable advice when you need advice? How do you go about getting it? And what kind of advice would you uh, recommend? Someone who is a specialist, who's known to be an, a specialist in connection with the problem at hand, and go and pay him for his services. Don't go after any for, for free advice. And speaking of free advice, I just want to tell you what happened to a student of mine, a friend of mine first, and then a student out in California. For three years, he used to come over to my house every weekend and spend three or four hours, for which I ordinarily would get $50 an hour, but I didn't get anything from him because he was a friend and acquaintance. <laughs> yeah. He'd come over there to get three or four hours of free counsel, and, uh, well, I gave it to him. I gave it to him every time he came, but he didn't hear a single word that I said. Oh. Not a word. That went on for three years. <laughs> and finally he came over. Finally he came over one afternoon, and I said, now look here, Elmer. I have been giving you free counsel for three years, and you haven't heard a darn thing. Only darn's not the word I use. No, 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 you haven't heard a darn thing that I've been saying. Now, you'll never get any value out of this uh, counsel that I'm giving until you start paying for it. Now, why don't you just go ahead? We're starting a master course right away. Why don't you go ahead and join that course like everybody else, and then you commence getting some value. He took out his checkbook and gave me a check for the master course and entered the course and went through it. And I want to tell you that his business affairs began to thrive from that moment on. I had ne I have never seen a man grow and develop so fast. After he paid a substantial sum for some counsel, he commenced listening to it and putting it into action. <laughs> and that's human nature I'm talking about. I'm telling you it is for a fact. Uh, free advice. You know, it's just about worth what it costs. Everything in this world is worth just about what it costs. <laughs> Love and friendship. What are what are love and friendship worth? A lot. Do they have any price? No. Well, now you try and get love and friendship without uh, paying the price, and see how far you go. Those are two things that you can only get by giving them. You can only get the real McCoy by giving the real McCoy. That's the only way you can get them. And if you try to mooch, get to. Friendship and love without giving in return, uh, you, your source of supply will soon play out. 
accurate thinkers permit no one to do their thinking for them. Now, uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> How many people are there that permit to circumstances and influences and radio and television and newspapers and other people and relatives to do the thinking for them? How many do you think, what percentage would you say of the people permit that? 97, 99, and somebody said 100. <laughs> well, it's not quite that bad. <laughs> not quite. But I want to tell you the percentage is way up there. No fooling. Allowing other people to do their thinking for them. <laughs> if I have one asset that I feel proudest of, and I do, I have one that I feel really proud of, and uh, I bet you'd never guess what it is. Think for yourself. Think for yourself. <laughs> well, now, what is it? I have an asset. I have an asset that I'm very proud of. It has nothing to do with money and our bank accounts and our bonds and our stocks or anything of that kind. It's something more precious than that. I have learned to hear all evidence, get all of the facts I can from all of the sources and then put them together in my own way and have the last word in making my own thinking. That doesn't mean that I'm a know-it-all or that I am a doubting Thomas, or that I don't seek counsel. I certainly do seek counsel. But when I have gotten that counsel, I determine how much of it I will accept and how much of it I will reject. Certainly, when I make a decision, nobody could ever say that it isn't a decision of Napoleon Hill, albeit it might be a decision based upon a mistake. It might be an error. It's still mine. I did it, and nobody influenced me. That doesn't mean that I'm hard-hearted, that I have no, uh, my friends have no influence on me. They do. Certainly they do. But I determine how much influence they have on me and how, what the reaction I will have to their influence. Certainly I would never permit a friend to have such influence on me as to cause me to damage some other person just because that friend wanted it done. And that's been tried many times. I would never permit that. Doing your own thinking, well, I want to tell you that uh, I think the angels in heaven cry out when they discover a man that, that, or a woman that does his or her own thinking and doesn't allow the relatives and friends and enemies and other people to discourage the business of accurate thinking. Uh, the reason I'm emphasizing this, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is because the majority of people never do take possession of their own minds, the most valuable asset that anybody has, the only thing that the Creator gave you that you have complete control over, and the one thing that you generally don't ever discover and use, but you allow other people to kick it around like a football. I'm not talking to you. You understand that, of course. <laughs> I'm talking about they. <laughs> that is, they who are not here in this class. I don't know why it is that, uh, that uh, in our educational system or somewhere in our system of teaching or writing, I don't know why it is that before now people haven't been informed that they have the greatest asset in the world, an asset sufficient unto all of their needs, and that asset consists in their, in their privilege of using their own mind and thinking their own thoughts and directing those own thoughts to whatever objective they choose, and yet they don't do it. Why? Why? Tell me why. Too lazy. Too lazy, said someone. That's the idea. They don't know they have it. There has not been the proper system of education. And I want to tell you that wherever this philosophy touches, wherever it begins to touch, you see people blossom out as they never blossomed out before. It makes a difference because they begin to find out that they have a mind, that they can use that mind, and that they can make it do whatever they want it to do. I don't say that they all uh, run in immediately and take possession of their own mind, but they rather kind of sneak in or slip in a little at a time. But eventually the, the affairs of their lives begins to change, and the reason they change is that they discover this great mind power and start using it. It's not safe to form opinions based upon newspaper reports. I see by the papers is a prefatory remark usually brands the speaker as a Snap judgment thinker. I see by the papers, or I hear tell, or they say. How often have you heard those terms? They say so and so. When I hear anybody start off with that, mentally I pull down my earmuffs and don't hear a doggone thing that they say because I know it's not worth hearing. When anybody starts to give me information and identifies the source by saying, I see by the papers, or they say, or I hear tell, I don't, I don't pay any attention to what's said whatsoever. Not, a, not the slightest attention. 
Not that what they are saying might not be accurate, but then I know that the source is uh, faulty, and therefore the chances are that the statement is faulty also. The scandal mongers and uh, gossipers are not reliable sources from which to procure facts on any subject whatsoever. Now, why is that true? Well, no, they're not reliable, and also they're biased. Did you know that when you hear anybody speak in a derogatory way of anybody else, whether you know the person or either one of the persons or not, the very fact that one person speaks in a derogatory way of another person puts you on guard and gives you the responsibility of studying and analyzing very closely everything that's said. Because you know you're listening to a biased person. You know that. I, I think the human brain is a wonderful thing. You know, the creator... I, I just marvel at how smart he was in creating a human being. Giving a human being all of the equipment and all of the machinery and all of the mechanism with which to detect lies from false, falsehood from truth. There is ever something present in the falsehood that does notify the listener of it. It, uh, it. It's there. You can tell it. You can feel it. And the same thing by the same token of when uh, someone is speaking the truth. The most finished actor in the world couldn't deceive you if you would use your innate intelligence in reference to statements that are made. Scandal mongers. Now, by the same token, uh, when you hear uh, someone overpraised by a doting or loving friend, <laughs> what about that? Well, now, that is, that, that's a compliment, and it's less dangerous to uh, depend upon that. But certainly, if you want the accurate facts, then you will study, uh, the, you will study the remarks of, uh, of a complementary nature just as closely as you study the others. For instance, if I send somebody to you for, an employ for a job, and I send along a letter, a very, very laudatory letter, or get you on the telephone and give you a sales pitch about how what a marvelous person this person is, if you're an accurate thinker, you're going to know that I'm rubbing it on pretty thick and you better be very careful how much of it you accept, that you better do a little outside investigating. Is that right? <laughs> now, please understand, I'm not trying to make doubting Thomases out of you. I'm not trying to make cynics out of you. But I am trying to bring to your attention the necessity of using this God-given brain that you have with which to think accurately and with which to search for the facts, albeit though when you find the facts, they may not be what you're looking for, but there they are. There are a lot of people you know who fool themselves, and there's no worse, per no worse fooling in this world than the fooling that one does for himself. That old uh, Chinese uh, proverb which says, a man fool me once, shame on the man. You fool me twice, shame on me. People just never seem to think that, uh, to do a little accurate thinking, a little investigating, you know. And you can't imagine, the, um, you'd think that bankers, for instance, would be so shrewd that a, uh, that a confidence man couldn't come in and take them. And I heard, a, I heard one of the most outstanding confidence men in the world, Barney Birch. I don't know what's ever happened to him, but he used to operate here in Chicago. I got acquainted with him once and, and interviewed him on several occasions. And I asked him what, kind, what, uh, what type of men were the easiest victims. Well, he said bankers, because they think they're so damn smart. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> I'm quoting him. I'm quoting him. Just what he said. Well, anyhow, you'll not pay too much attention to scandal mongers and gossipers. Uh, wishes often are fathers to facts, and most people have a bad habit of assuming facts to harmonize with their desires. Did you know that? <laughs> Therefore, uh, you have to look in the looking glass when you're searching for this uh, business of uh, locating the person who can do accurate thinking. You've got to be, uh, put yourself under suspicion a little bit too, haven't you? 
Because if you wish a thing to be true, oftentimes you will assume that it is true and you will act as if it were. If you love a person, you will overlook his faults. You'll never see his faults if you love him a great deal. But really and truly, we do need to watch ourselves in connection with those whom we admire most until they have proved themselves entirely. Because I have uh, admired a great many people who turned out to be very dangerous. Very dangerous indeed. As a matter of fact, I think most of my troubles back in my early days came from trusting people too much, letting them use my name. And sometimes they wouldn't use it wisely. That's happened five or six times in my life. Because I trusted the people. Why did I trust them? Well, because I knew them, and they were nice people, and they said and did the things that I liked. <laughs> Be careful of the fellow that says and does the things you like, because you're over going to overlook his faults. Don't be too hard on the man who steps on your corns and causes you to re-examine yourself. Don't be too hard on him because he may be the most important friend you ever had in your life. The person who maybe irritates you, but causes you to examine yourself carefully. Uh, we all like to meet and associate with people who agree with us. That's human nature. But oftentimes, the people, uh, some people that you uh, associate with who agree with you and who are very nice and lovely, uh, uh, come to the point where they t can take advantage of you, and they do. Now, um, information is abundant, and most of it is free, but facts have an elusive habit, and generally there is a price attached to them. Certainly the price is painstaking labor in examining them for accuracy. That's the least of the price that you have to pay for facts. And this question, how do you know, is the favorite question of the thinker. When a, when a thinker has a statement, here's a statement uh, uh, that he doesn't, uh, that he can't accept, immediately he says to the, uh, to the speaker, how do you know, what is your source of information? This business of asking people to identify their source of knowledge, and uh, when, uh, oftentimes if you have the slightest doubt, if you do that, you put the person right out on a limb. He won't be able to do it. Or, if you ask him how he knows, he'll tell you, well, I believe so. Well, now what how right of you to believe anything unless you, it's based upon something, unless you can give some background for it? I believe there's a God. A lot of people do. But I'll bet you there are a lot of people who say that they believe in a God who couldn't give you the slightest evidence of them if you backed them into a corner. I can give you evidence... When I say that I believe in a God and you say, how do you know? I can give you all of the evidence. I don't, know, I don't have so much evidence in connection with anything else in this world as I do in connection with the existence of a creator. Because the orderliness of this universe couldn't go on and on eons and eons of times ad infinitum without a first cause and without a plan back of it. You know that's absolutely true. And yet there are a lot of people who undertake to prove the presence of God in a devious ways that, uh, from, in my book of rules, wouldn't be evidence at all. Anything that exists, including God, is capable of proof. And where there is no such proof available, it is safe to assume that nothing exists. Now, when no facts are available for the basis of an opinion or a judgment or a plan... Turn to, the, to logic for guidance. No one has ever seen God, but logic says that he exists of necessity. He has to exist, or we wouldn't be here. We couldn't be here without a first cause, a higher intelligence than ourselves. We couldn't be here. And that thing called logic, it's a wonderful thing. You know, there are times when you have a hunch, you have a feeling that certain things are true or certain things are not true, and you better be careful to pay high respect to that hunch or those feelings. Because that's a... That's uh, probably infant intelligence trying to break through the outer shell and uh, let you use a little logic. If one of you got up and said, now my definite major aim is to uh, make a million dollars this coming year. Well, what, do you th what would I say if you did that? What would be the question, first question I would ask you, do you think? How do you think? Yeah, how? How are you going to do it? I want to hear your plan. And then after I hear your plan, um, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to accept it or reject it? What am I going to do about it? 
I am going to weigh you, first of all, your ability to uh, get a million dollars and to find out what you're going to give for it, and then I'm go my logic will tell me whether or not your plan for doing it is probable uh, and uh, workable and practical. Now, that doesn't take an awful lot of intelligent thinking, but it's a very important thing to do. And I'd go over it, I'd analyze your plan, I'd analyze you, I'd analyze your capabilities, I'd analyze your past experience, your past achievements, I'd analyze the people that you're going to help, uh, get to help you make that million dollars. And when we got through analyzing, I would be able to tell you that, well, probably you can do it. Well, or I'd be able to point out to you that probably it'll take longer than the year that you said. Maybe it'll take two years, maybe it'll take three. And then again, probably I might tell you that you wouldn't be able to do it at all. If my reasoning taught me that that was, what, uh, that was the answer, well, I'd give it to you just that way. I've had some of my students, some of them sitting right here in this room, come out and put propositions before me, which I had to turn down and tell them just absolutely forget about it because they're wasting their time. Now, that's the way an accurate thinker proceeds. He doesn't allow his emotions to run away with him. If I allowed my emotions to do my thinking for me, I would, uh, anything that one of my students undertook to do, I'd tell him he could do it. Now, that leads up to this famous motto or epigram that you've seen quoted a lot of times. You've heard it in my lessons. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe, your mind can achieve. I don't want anybody to misread that statement this way by saying, reading into it, whatever your mind can conceive and believe your mind will achieve. I said it can achieve. Do you get the line of difference there between the two? It can, uh, but uh, I don't know that it will. That's, that's up to you. Only you know that. The extent to which you use your own mind, the extent to which you intensify your faith, the soundness of your judgments and your plans, all will be factors entering into how well you carry out that aphorism or that epigram. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe, your mind can achieve. Some acid tests now to be made and separated in facts from information. Let's see how we go about it. First of all, scrutinize with unusual care everything you read in newspapers or hear over the radio and form the habit of never accepting any statement as a fact merely because you read it or heard it expressed by someone. Statements uh, bearing some proportion of fact often are intentionally or carelessly colored to give them an erroneous meaning. A half-truth, in other words, is, as uh, someone has said, is more dangerous than an out-and-out lie. It's more dangerous because that half-truth part is liable to deceive somebody who knows that it's a... Uh, who understands half of it and thinks the whole of it is true. Scrutinize carefully everything you read in books, regardless of who wrote them and never accept the works of any writer without asking the following questions and satisfying yourself as to the answers. And that would reply, apply to lectures or statements or speeches or conversations or anything else. These rules that I'm going to give you. First of all, is the writer a recognized authority on the subject covered? The writer or the speaker or the teacher or the one that's making the statement. Is he a recognized authority on the subject on which he's speaking or writing? That's the first question that you ask. Next, did the writer or the speaker have an ulterior or a self-interest motive other than that of imparting accurate information? You know, the motive that prompts a man to write a book or to make a speech or to make a statement in public or in private conversation, the motive back of it is very important. And if you can get at a man's motive when he's talking, you can tell pretty well how truthful he is and what he's saying. Has the writer a profit interest or other interest in the subject on which he writes or speaks. You know, that when you find out what a man's motive is, when whatever he's doing, if you can locate his motive in doing it, it'll be impossible for him to fool you in the least because you'll be able to smell him out. And is the writer a person of sound judgment and uh, not a fanatic on the subject on which he writes? I have seen a lot of people who are overzealous about, uh, to the point of fanaticism. If you wanted to judge me, for instance, you wouldn't judge me on account of the kind of a tie I wear, the kind of a suit I wear, or how I cut my hair, or how I used to cut my hair. 
and or how well I speak or how poorly I speak, you wouldn't judge me by any of those things. You'd judge me by how much influence I'm having for good or evil on people. That's the way you would judge me. That's the way you would judge anybody else. You might not like a man's brand of religion or politics. But if he's, uh, if, he's re- if he's doing a good job in his field and helping a lot of people and doing no damage, never mind about his brand. Don't condemn him if he's doing more good than he is harm, preponderantly more good than harm. Before accepting as facts statements by others, ascertain the motive which prompted the statements. Ascertain also the writer's reputation for truth and veracity. And scrutinize with unusual care all statements made by people who have strong motives or objectives they desire to attain through their statements. And be equally careful about accepting as facts the statements of overzealous people who have the habit of allowing their imaginations to run wild. <coughs> Learn to be cautious to, and to use your own judgment no matter who is trying to influence you. Use your own judgment in final analysis. And uh, what do you do if you can't trust your own judgment? Is there an answer in this philosophy for that? There certainly is. There certainly most definitely is an answer. And you know there are a lot of times when an individual can't trust his own judgment because he doesn't know enough about the circumstances that he's faced with. He's got to turn to somebody with broader experience or a different education or a keener uh, mind for analysis. He has got to do that. For instance, uh, uh, can you imagine a business succeeding who was made all made up of master salesmen? Can you imagine that? Did you ever know such a business? Yeah. I have. You'd think, why, well, that's wonderful. Master salesmen, why, they'll go out and bring in all the business in the world. Why, well, sure they do, and then spend all the money in the world, too, in doing it. You need a wet blanket man in every organization, and you need a hatchet man. <laughs> A man will cut through the red tape and everything else that gets in his way and let the chips fall wherever they may. I wouldn't want to be a hatchet man. I wouldn't want to be a wet blanket man. But certainly I'd want one in my, those two in my organization if my operation was very extensive. In seeking facts from others, do not disclose to them what facts you expect to find. Now why is that, why, why is that statement made? If I say to you, uh, by the way, you uh, used to employ uh, John Brown, and uh, he's applied to me for a position. I think he's a wonderful man. What do you think? (laughs) Well, if he has any faults, I'll certainly not get them with that kind of a question, will I? If I really wanted to find out about John Brown, who used to work for you, how would I go about getting the information? Well, I wouldn't go about getting it from you at all in the first place. I'd uh, have the, the commercial credit company get an unbiased report on it from you. And you'd probably give out the facts to the credit rating company that you wouldn't give out to me or to anybody else. Surprising how much information you can get if you know the right to uh, commercial agency through which to get it. But oftentimes when you go direct for information about a man, unless it's very friendly and favorable, the chances are you won't get the real facts. You'll get a varnished or a watered down set of facts, don't you know? No, if you're going to, if you ask a man a question and you give him the slightest idea as to what you expect the answer to be, the, most people are lazy anyway. They don't want to go to too much trouble in explaining. But, well, they'll just uh, give you the answer they know you want and you're tickled to death and you go on with it and then fall down on it later on. Science is the uh, art of organizing and classifying facts. That's what science means. And when you wish to make sure you are dealing with facts, seek scientific sources for their testing where possible. The men of science have neither the reason nor the inclination to modify or to change facts nor to misrepresent. Isn't that an astounding thing? They just don't have the reason. Well, if they did, if they had that inclination, they would not be scientists, would they? They'd be pseudoscientists or fakes. And there are a lot of pseudoscientists and fakes in this world, believe you me, who assume to know things that they don't know. Your emotions are not always reliable. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the time they're not reliable. And before being influenced too far by your feelings, give your head a chance to pass judgment on the business at hand. The head is more dependable than the heart, but uh, what makes a good combination? 
Balancing them, and that's the idea, just balancing them, so that both of them have an equal say, so to speak. And you'll come pretty near coming up with the right answer if you do that. The person who forgets this generally regrets his neglect. Now, these are some of the major enemies of sound thinking. The emotion of love, for instance, stands right up at the head of the list. You think, why, how in the world could the emotion of love interfere with anybody's thinking? Yeah, yeah. If you said that, I'd know right away you hadn't had very many love experiences. If you've ever had an experience with love at all, you know very well how dangerous it is. It's like playing around TNT with a match in your hand. When it starts, when it starts exploding, it doesn't give any notice. Then hatred and anger and jealousy and fear and revenge and greed and vanity and egotism and the desire for something for nothing and procrastination. All of these are enemies of thinking. You have to be on the lookout for them constantly and to be sure that you're free of them. Provided that the thinking at hand is of importance to you and maybe your whole future destiny depends upon your thinking accurately. And isn't it a fact that it does? Doesn't your future destiny depend very largely on your accuracy or your lack of it in your thinking? Of course, if that were not true, then what would be the use of the Creator having given you complete control over your own mind? What, what, what good would it be? The answer is that that mind is sufficient unto all of your needs, absolutely, at least on this uh, lifespan. I don't know on the, uh, on the preceding plane where you came from or on the succeeding plane where you're going to. I don't know about those planes because I don't remember where I came from and I don't yet know where I'm going. <laughs> I wish I did. But I know a great deal about where I am now. And I found out a great deal about how to influence my destiny here now so that I get a lot of pleasure out of it, so I get joy, so I give joy, so I make myself useful, and I justify my having passed this way. Why do I, can I say that? Because I have discovered how to manipulate my own mind and keep it under control, make it do the things I wanted to do. Throw off the circumstances I don't want and accept the ones that I do want. And if I don't find the circumstances I want, what do I do? Create them, of course. Create them. That's what definiteness of purpose and imagination are for. Now, um, your mind uh, should be an eternal question mark. Question everything and everyone until you satisfy yourself that you are dealing with facts. Do this quietly in the silence of your own mind and avoid being known as a doubting Thomas. Don't come out and uh, question people orally. That's not going to get you anywhere, and, uh, but uh, question them silently. And furthermore, if you're too outspoken and too oral about your questioning of people, it puts them on notice and they cover up and you don't get the information you want. Quietly go about seeking for information and doing some accurate thinking. You probably will come up with it. Be a good listener, but also be an accurate thinker as you listen. Which is most uh, profitable, to be a good speaker or a good, thi a good listener? Good Why? I don't know of any virtue or any quality that, would be, uh, that will help an individual to get along in this world better than to be an effective, enthusiastic speaker. I just don't know of any other quality that's, that will excel at one. And yet, I would follow that statement immediately by saying that it's far more profitable to anybody to be a good listener, an analytical listener, than it is to be a good speaker. Let your mind be an eternal question mark. Now, I don't mean by that that you should uh, be become a cynic, nor a doubting Thomas, but I mean that, I mean that no matter who you're dealing with, deal with them on the basis of thinking accurately of every relationship that you have. You'll get a lot of satisfaction out of that. You'll also be more successful. And if you're tactful as you go along and diplomatic, you'll uh, have a lot more uh, substantial friends than you have by the old method of uh, snap judgment. Mostly your friends, if you're an accurate thinker, mostly your friends will be friends worth having. Believe you me, they will. Your thinking habits are the results of social heredity and physical heredity. Watch both of these sources carefully, but particularly social heredity. Now, physical heredity, through physical heredity, you get everything that you are physically. The stature of your body, the shape of the texture of your skin, color of your eyes and hair, and you're the sum total of all of your ancestors, back farther than you can ever remember or think. 
and uh, you inherited a little of their good qualities and a little of their bad. And there's nothing you can do about that. That's static. It's fixed at birth. But by far the most important part of what you are is a result of your social heredity, that is your environmental influences, the things that you have allowed to go into your mind and that you've accepted as a part of your character. That's the important thing. Down at the bottom, your conscience was given to you as a guide when all other sources of knowledge and facts have been exhausted. Be careful to use it as a guide and not as a conspirator. Did you, do you know a lot of people who use their consciences as a conspirator instead of a guide? In other words, they, they so sell their conscience on the idea that what they're doing is right, that the, uh, the conscience falls in line eventually and becomes a conspirator. Now then, if you sincerely wish to think accurate, there's a price that you must pay for this ability, a price which is uh, not measurable in money. And first, you must learn to examine carefully all of your emotional feelings by submitting them to your sense of reason. That's step number one in accurate thinking. In other words, the things that you like to do best are the things that you should examine most and first to make sure that the, if they lead you to the attainment of some object that you want that object after you get it. The point I'm making is that the thing that you set your heart upon, be careful about the thing that you set your heart upon because uh, when you get it, sometimes you find out it's not what you wanted at all. Now, uh, I could multiply that by a thousand illustrations of men who paid too much for what they got, who wanted something too badly, who tried to get too much of it, did get too much of it, but didn't get peace of mind and balancing of their lives along with it. I, I think the saddest thing that ever came out of my uh, research in building this philosophy was the things that I learned about the men the wealthy men that collaborated in the building of this philosophy. The fact that they didn't get success along with their money. was to me a sad thing indeed. They didn't get success because they became too obsessed with the importance of money and power and the, money, the power that money would give them. And you must curb the habit of expressing opinions which are not based upon facts or what you believe to be fact. Did you know that you didn't have a right to an opinion about anything, not anything at all, unless you uh, base it upon facts or what you believe to be facts. I'll bet you wouldn't admit that that's true. I'll bet you won't admit that that's true, that you have no right whatsoever to have an opinion about anything at any time unless it's based upon what you believe to be facts or actual provable facts. Now why do I say you don't have a right to it? Because it is dangerous for you to have, you, you can do it, I mean you have a right, of course, but I mean to say you have the responsibility of assuming what happens to you if you express an opinion that's not based upon facts or what you believe to be facts. You can fool yourself that way, and a lot of people go all the way through life fooling themselves by uh, opinions that have no basis for existence. You must master the habit of being influenced by people in any manner whatsoever merely because you like them or they are related to you or they may have done you a favor. Now, I know that when you've gone the extra mile, you're going to put a lot of people under obligations to you and I want you to do that. That's perfectly proper. That's legitimate to put people under obligations to you by helping people. Now, that says that nobody can find any fault with that. But be careful, be careful in being influenced by people just because they have done you a favor. I'm talking now to the people for whom you've gone the extra mile, and you may be in that position sometimes too, where somebody's put you under obligations to an extent that you don't want to be put under obligations. Uh, you must form the habit of examining the motives of people who seek some benefit from or through your influence. You must control both your emotion of love and your emotion of hate in, asking, in making decisions for any purpose because either of these can unbalance your thinking habits. No man ought to make an important decision while he's angry. You just, you just shouldn't do it. And correcting children, for instance, a bad mistake to discipline children when you're, when you're angry. Of course, you're nine times out of ten, you'll do and say the wrong thing, do more harm than good. And that applies to a lot of grown-ups, too. If you're really angry, don't make decisions, don't make statements to people while you're mad. Because they can come back on you and do you an awful lot of injury. 
uh, self-control and self-discipline. You see, we have a lesson on self-discipline. You remember? It plays right along with this lesson, doesn't it? Because a lot of times, when if you're going to be an accurate thinker, you've got to have a lot of self-discipline. You've got to refrain from saying and doing a lot of things you'd like to say and do. Bide your time. There's always a time for you to do everything. Time your, uh, what you say and do properly. And uh, you, uh, accurate thinkers do that too. They don't just fly off the handle and say they start their mouths to going and go, on, or go off and leave them like some people do. They carefully study the effect on the listener of every word they utter even before they utter it. Don't make any decisions or plans until you have carefully weighed what the effect may be on you and on other people. I can think of a lot of things I could do that would benefit me that wouldn't benefit you. Might even injure you. I can think of a lot of things. But I wouldn't engage in them because eventually I'd have to pay the price. Because whatever you do to or for another person, you do to or for yourself. It comes back to you. Greatly multiply. That's another thing that comes under the heading of accurate thinking. You learn very... Uh, after you've uh, become thoroughly indoctrinated with this philosophy, you learn not to do anything that you don't want to come back and affect you. Not to think anything, not to say anything, not to do anything that you don't want to come back and that you have to give countenance to later on in life. You must recognize that before accepting as facts the statements of other people, it may be beneficial if you ask them how they came by the so-called facts. And when they express opinions, ask how you know your opinion is sound. Uh, I don't want an opinion. I want some facts. Then I'll, I'll form my own opinion. You give me the facts and I'll put them together in my own way, says the accurate thinker. You must learn to examine with extraordinary care all statements of a derogatory nature made by one person against others because the very nature of such statements brands them as being not without bias. And that's putting it very politely. You must uh, overcome the habit of trying to justify a decision you have made which turns out to have been unsound. Accurate thinkers just don't do that. They reverse themselves just as quickly as they make uh, decisions if they find they're wrong. Alibis and accurate thinking never are friendly bed bedfellows. Excuses and alibis and accurate thinking are not friendly bedfellows. I have never seen the person yet that wasn't very adept at creating alibis for his faults and the things that he didn't do that he should have done, the things that should, they didn't do that he shouldn't have done. In other words, uh, most people have a great stock of them and you don't have to give them very much time before they can fling them together and uh, spray, throw them at you. Good excuses, good alibis, that they don't mount to a thing unless there's something back of them that's sound that you can depend upon. If you are an accurate thinker, you will never use the term they say or I heard. Or accurate thinkers in repeating things they have heard first identify the source and attempt to establish its dependability. You know, uh, folks, it's not an easy matter to be an accurate thinker. I, I, have you reached that conclusion already? That's quite a little bit you have to pay in order to have it, but it's worth it, isn't it? It's worth trying. If you're not an accurate thinker, you're, the people are going to take advantage of you. You're not going to get much out of life like you'd like to. You're not going to be satisfied. You'll never be a well-balanced person without accurate thinking. And in order to think accurately, you've got to have a set of rules to go by. And you'll find in this lesson, if you'll go over this lesson and study it carefully, add some notes to it of your own, start now to do some thinking, start to putting into practice tomorrow morning or before that time some of these uh, principles of separating facts from information, then separating the facts themselves into two classes, important and unimportant. You just make those four steps alone. This lesson will very much more than have justified yourself, and this lesson alone could well be worth a thousand times as much as, as you have put into the entire course if it teaches you just to do those simple things, to start separating facts from information. Be sure that you're dealing with facts, and then take the facts after you're dealing with them and break them down and throw off the unimportant facts that you've been wasting so much time with here to fall. If there is uh, one thing in the, the world that people do not like, it's to undergo adversity and unpleasant circumstances and defeat. And yet, uh, if I have uh, evaluated circumstances properly, and if I have taken inventory of 
the laws of nature properly, it was intended that we all should undergo adversities, defeat, failure, opposition. I still say that uh, people do not like defeat, they do not like adversity, and yet I'm compelled to tell you that had it not been for the adversities that I went through during the early part of my life, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you tonight. I wouldn't have completed this philosophy. I wouldn't be reaching millions of people all over the world because it was out of the opposition that I met with that I grew the strength and the wisdom and the ability to complete this philosophy and to take it to the people in the shape that it's now in. Yet if I were to go back over the past and had my choice, I have no doubt that I'd make it easier for myself, just the same as you would from here on out. We're all inclined to do that, to find the uh, line of least resistance. Did you know that taking the line of least resistance is what makes all rivers and some men crooked? <laughs> That's right. Yet it's a very common habit for us to do that. We don't want to pay the price of uh, intense effort, no matter what we're doing. We like to have things come the easy way. And the mind is just like any other part, of, like a, any part of the physical body. It uh, atrophies and withers away and becomes weak through disuse. When you uh, are met with, uh, when you meet with problems, circumstances and incidents that force you to do thinking, why probably that is the finest thing that could happen to you. Because without a motive, you're not going to do very much thinking anyway. There are 40 major reasons or causes of failure. More than twice as many causes of failure as there are principles of success. There are 17 principles of success, some combination of which is responsible for all successful achievements, and more than 40 major causes of failure. And uh, that is not all of them. These are just the major causes. Now, uh, self-examination is one of the most uh, profitable things that you can indulge in, and sometimes uh, you don't want to do it, but it's a very necessary thing for us to know ourselves as we are especially our weaknesses. In uh, putting out a philosophy of success, it is necessary to tell you the things that you should do in order to succeed and also the things you should not do. Grade yourself as I go along as I make comment on each one of them. Grade yourself from zero to 100, meaning if you're 100% free of any one of them, grade yourself 100%. If you're only 50% free, grade yourself 50%. And if you uh, aren't free at all, <laughs> grade yourself zero. And when you get through, add the total up and divide it by 40, and you'll get your general average then on the control of the things that cause men and women to fail. First of all, on the habit of drifting with circumstances without definite aims or plans. Now, if you don't uh, follow that habit of drifting, if you make decisions quickly, if you lay out plans and follow those plans, if you know exactly where you're going and are on the way, you can grade yourself 100% on that one. But uh, be careful before you put down the grading, because it's the rarest thing in the world that anybody would be able to grade himself 100% on that one. You really have to be organized, and you really have to be prepared if you're going to do that. Number two, unfavorable physical heredity, uh, hereditary foundation at birth. Well, I don't need to make any comment on that. As a matter of fact, that uh, can be or could be a cause of failure. Also, it could be a cause of success. Some of the most successful people I have ever known were handicapped by bad afflictions at birth. And number three, meddlesome curiosity in connection with other people's business and affairs. Meddlesome curiosity. Now, curiosity is a wonderful thing. If we weren't curious, we'd never learn anything. We'd never investigate. But notice the wording of that, meddlesome curiosity with other people's affairs, something that doesn't really concern you. Of course, none of you would be uh, guilty of that, so you'd grade yourself 100% on that. Or will you? Now, remember, as you uh, grade yourself, go back in your past experiences and determine to what extent you have control of these weaknesses. Number four, lack of a definite major purpose as a lifetime goal. You've been, uh, we've been talking about that one for a long time about having it, now we're putting down the lack of it. If you, if you lack it, here's a mighty good place to rate yourself zero. Five, inadequate schooling. Well, uh, you know one of the most astounding things that I have learned from life is to discover the, uh, that there is very little relationship between schooling and success. 
Oh, I hesitated there for purpose, not because I didn't have something else to say and couldn't remember my lines, but I wanted you to think about that one. Some of the most successful people I have ha ever known have been people with the least amount of formal education, formal schooling. A lot of people go through life failures and they alibi themselves out of it, kid themselves into believing that they're failures because they don't have a college education. If you come out of college with the feeling that you should be paid for what you know instead of what you do, then that uh, college education hasn't done you much good until you meet that old man destiny that's standing just around the corner where you're going to pass with a stuffed club. And it's not stuffed with cotton. You'll find out sooner or later that you're not going to be paid for what you know. You're going to be paid for what you uh, do with what you know or what you can get other people to do. Number six, lack of self-discipline, generally uh, manifesting itself by excesses in eating, drinking, and indifference toward opportunities for self-advancement and improvement. Lack of self-discipline. I hope you can grade yourselves very high on that one. Number seven, lack of ambition to aim above mediocrity. There's a humdinger. Just how much ambition do you have? Anyway, where are you going in life? What do you want out of life? What are you going to settle for? I told you the story some time ago of a young soldier that came in just after World War Number One wanted to settle for a sandwich and a place to sleep that night. I wouldn't let him do it. I talked him into uh, settling for a higher rate than that, with the result that he became a multimillionaire within the, within the following four years. I hope I'll have as much success with you in stepping your ambition up to where you're not willing to settle uh, with life for a penny. Aim high. It's not going to cost you anything to aim high. You may not get as far as you aim, but you'll certainly get farther than you would if you don't aim at all. Get your sights raised up. Be ambitious. Be determined that you're going to become in the future what you have failed to become in the past. And number eight, ill health, often due to wrong thinking and improper diet. There's a lot of alibis on the count of ill health, too, I can assure you. A lot of an imag imaginary ailments. Well, they call it hypochondria in the Materia Medica. I don't know to what extent you've been coddling yourselves or babying yourselves on with this, that, and the other imaginary ailment, but if you have been doing that, why, well, grade yourself down pretty low on that one. Number uh, nine, unfavorable environmental influences during childhood. Now, once in a great while, you'll find that the influences of, uh, upon a person during childhood are of such a negative nature that they go all the way through life with those negative influences. I'm quite convinced that if I had been uh, permitted to continue in my childhood as I started out before my stepmother came into the picture, that I really and truly would have become a second Jesse James, only I would have been able to shoot faster and straighter than he did. Well, Number 10, lack of persistence in following through with one's duties. Lack of There's a honey. Lack of persistence in following through with one's duty. Uh, what is it that causes people to uh, fail to follow through when they start something? What, what's the main reason why people do not follow through and do the thing right and to see it's done right? Lack of motive. That's the idea. They don't want to do it badly enough. Believe you me, I'll follow through on anything that I want to follow through on, but if I don't want to follow through, I can find a lot of alibis to keep from doing it. Is it uh, profitable for you to get into the habit of following through when you undertake something, or is it profitable for you to uh, be, uh, permit yourself to be sidetracked? Well, all right, let's put the question another way. How do you rate on that one? <laughs> That's the important thing. How do you rate on that one? Do you follow through, or are you easily sidetracked? Are you easily dissuaded from doing a thing when somebody criticizes you? <coughs> Believe you me, uh, uh, if I had uh, been afraid of criticism, I never would have gotten anywhere in life. I, I got to the point eventually at which I really accorded criticism because it only put the fight in me. And uh, I found out that when that fight was in me, I did a much better job and I carried through better. There are a lot of people in this world who fail because... Uh, they lack that uh, driving force, don't you know, that causes them to, to carry through, and especially when the going is hard. No matter what you're doing, you're going to run into uh, that period when the going is hard. 
If it's a new business, you'll uh, probably need finances that you don't have in the beginning. Or if it's a profession, you'll need clients that you don't have in the beginning. Or if it's a new job, uh, you'll need the recognition with your employer that you don't have. You have to earn that recognition. The going is always hard with people in the beginning, and that's why you need this follow-through. Number 11, the habit of uh, a negative mental attitude. The habit of keeping your mind negative all the time. Now, uh, which are you? Preponderantly negative most of the time, or are you preponderantly positive? When you see a donut, what do you see first? Do you see the hole first, or the donut? Well, <laughs> that's fine. You know, when you go to eat a donut, you don't eat the hole, do you? You just eat the donut. But there are a lot of people who, uh, when they come across a problem, they, uh, they uh, are like the fellow who sees the hole in the donut and growls about it because it took so much of the nice cake out, but do not see the, the donut itself. Negative mental attitude. Uh, what is the result of a person who uh, has the habit of uh, allowing his mind to become negative and remain negative? What, what, what happens to that kind of a person? You can't put him in jail for it. You can't sue him for it. A negative mind repels, doesn't it? It repels people. A positive mind attracts. Attracts what? People who harmonize with your mental attitude. Your character. I don't saying of birds of a feather flock together. Well, negative birds flock to the negative mind and neg positive birds flock to the positive mind. Uh, who has control over your mind? Uh, who, who determines whether it's positive or negative? You. Now then, there's where I want you to grade yourself. Oh, on the extent to which you exercise that prerogative. And that's the most precious thing that you have on the face of this earth or ever will have. It's the only thing that you have that you have complete, unchallenged, and unchallengeable, unchallengeable control over. Is the right to make your mind positive and keep it that way, or make it negative, allow the circumstances of life to make it negative. And you have to work at it if you're going to keep your mind positive, because of, of, for what reason? That's right. So much negative influences around you. So many people, so many circumstances that are negative that if you're going to become a part of those instead of creating your own circumstances in your mind, then most of the time you'll be negative. Do you have a very, quick, very uh, clear concept of what, uh, what the difference is between a negative mind and a positive mind? Can you picture the, what happens in the chemistry of the brain when your mind is positive and when it's negative? Have you ever demonstrated or experienced in your own life the differences between uh, your achievements when you are afraid and the achievements when you're not afraid? You have. Like in selling or like in doing anything else, in teaching or in lecturing or in writing or anything else. When I first wrote uh, Think and Grow Rich, I wrote it while I was working for President Roosevelt during that uh, bad depression during his first term. And I wrote it in that same negative mental attitude that everybody else was in. In other words, it was forced upon me unconsciously. <coughs> Several years later, when I got that book out and read it, I recognized it was not a saleable book because of the tempo of it being negative. And you could pick that up. A reader will pick up exactly the mental attitude that a writer is in when he writes a book, no matter what kind of language or terminology he uses. So, I sat down to my typewriter. I didn't change a word in that book. I sat down to my typewriter when I was in a new frame of mind, on, up on the beam, as we say, 100% positive, and I typed that book in that frame of mind, and that's the thing that made that book click. You can't afford to do anything when you're negative. Anything that you expect to benefit you. Anything that you expect to influence other people. If you want to get people to cooperate with you, or to, if you want to sell people something, or if you want to make a good impression upon people, don't come near them until you're in a positive frame of mind. Now, the reason I have emphasized that so much, I want to give you a chance to grade yourself accurately on that one. And in doing that, you will, uh, you will grade yourself on the average state of mind that you maintain, not just on the state of mind at any given time for a short time. I'll tell you a good rule to go by which will enable you to determine very, to a large extent whether or not you are more positive than you are negative. Would you like to have that rule? Yes. Observe how you feel when you wake up in the morning and start to get out, <laughs> out of bed. 
And if you're not in a good frame of mind then, I'll tell you right now, it's because of a lot of thought habits that have preceded that uh, hour, the day before perhaps, that have been negative. You can make yourself very ill by allowing your mind to become negative, and it'll reflect itself the next morning in particular. You see, when you come out of sleep, you're just uh, fresh from coming out of from under the influence of your subconscious mind. Your, sub, your conscious mind has been off duty. And it goes back on duty and it finds a mess there that you've got to clean up. <laughs> that the subconscious mind has been stirring up all night long. But if you wake up full of joy and uh, you want to get out and uh, get out what you're going to do today, well, the chances are that you've been pretty positive the day before and maybe several days before. <coughs> Number 12, lack of control over the emotions, <laughs> both the negative and the positive. Had you ever thought that it's just as necessary to control your positive emotions as it is your negative ones? Why is that? Why, when, why in the world would I want to control the emotion of love, for instance? It's in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> Lady, it not only can get you in hot water, it can scald you. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a very good one, and that was a very spontaneous reply you gave, too. You must have had some experience. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, now let's take another emotion. Desire for financial gain, for money, for instance. Uh, do you need to control that? Why? You're not afraid of getting too much, are you? Yes, getting it the wrong way. Now you said it. Well, there, there could be such a thing as you're uh, uh, working that emotion up to where you want to get too much. I met a lot of people who had too much, too much money for their own good, especially people who got it without earning it, like people who inherited it, for instance. <clears throat> Did you ever? Would you be interested in knowing how, why uh, why they call me Napoleon? Uh, yeah. Would you be interested in knowing? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you because it makes a good point here. My father named me, my, I being the, old, the eldest son, or the first child, my father named me after my great uncle, Napoleon Hill of Memphis, Tennessee, who was a multimillionaire cotton broker, hoping that when Uncle Napoleon died that I would get some of the money. Well, <laughs> he died, and I didn't get any of the money. And when I found out that I was not going to get any of it, I felt very badly. But uh, later on, as... I swapped some of my youth for wisdom and observed what happened to the ones who did get it. I was thankful, eternally grateful that I didn't get a dime of it because I learned a better way of getting it for myself without having it given to me. Well, number 13, the desire for something for nothing. Are you ever troubled with that? The desire for something for nothing, or the desire for something for less than its value, the desire for something without uh, being willing to give adequate uh, compensation for it. Are you ever troubled with that uh, tendency? Well, now, who of us hasn't been at one time or another, I'd like to ask. But after all, you can have a lot of faults, but uh, what you want to do is to find out what they are and start getting rid of them. That's why we're making this analysis. We're giving you a chance to come face to face and to... Uh, be trial judge, be defendant, be prosecutor all at one time, and then you make the decision finally. And if you make it accurately, it'd be far better for you to find, the, uh, find your faults than it would be for me to find them for you. Because if you find them, you're not going to spin any alibis, you're going to try to get rid of them. And number 14, lack of the habit of reaching decisions promptly and firmly. Now, do you reach decisions promptly and firmly? Or do you reach decisions uh, uh, very slowly and after you reach them, uh, do you allow the first person that comes along to uh, reverse you? <coughs> or do you allow circumstances to reverse your decision without a sound reason? To what extent do you stand by your decisions after you make them? Just under what circumstances would you reverse the decision that you had made, incidentally? That's right, and uh, you should hold an open mind on that subject at all times. You should never make a decision uh, and say, that's, uh, that's it, and I'm going to stand by it forever, because there might be something developed later on that would prompt you to, uh, to 
reverse that decision. And you know, there are some people who are known as stubborn, who, when once they've made a decision, right or wrong, they'd die by it. <laughs> I, I've seen people like that, a lot of them, who would just rather die than to reverse themselves or have somebody reverse them on a decision. Of course, you're not like that. <laughs> that is, if you're really indoctrinated with this philosophy, you, you may be, have been like that once, but you're not like that now, or you're not going to be like that after tonight. Number 15, one or more of the seven basic fears. <clears throat> I'm not going to dwell on them because there are the seven basic fears, and you can grade yourself on that one at, at your leisure. You know, this is a wonderful world we're living in, a wonderful life. I, I, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm doing just what I am. And if uh, unpleasant circumstances cross my path, I'm very glad for that too, because uh, I'll find out whether I'm stronger than the circumstances or not. And as long as I can conquer them and go over them, I'm not going to worry about circumstances, about things that oppose me, people that don't like me, people that talk, say mean things about me. I don't worry about that. What I would worry about would be if people said mean things about me and I'd examine myself and found out they were telling the truth. <laughs> but as long as they're not telling the truth, uh, well, I can stand back and laugh at them, uh, how foolish they are and how much damage they're doing themselves. Now here is a honey, number 16, the wrong selection of a mate in marriage. Now don't, <laughs> don't uh, be too uh, quick to grade yourself on that one. <laughs> if you've made, your, uh, made a 100% mistake on that, look around before you grade yourself and see if you can't do something about correcting that mistake. Maybe resell yourself. I've known of that being done too, haven't you? Now, oh, you know, there's some people who believe that all marriages are made in heaven. Well, it would be a wonderful thing if they were, but I've seen some that were not made in heaven. I don't know where else they might have been made, but they certainly weren't made in heaven. Also, I've seen some business marriages, some business relationships that were not made in heaven. And I've helped to correct a lot of those, believe you me. Business associates that were not working together in a spirit of harmony. And there's no business on the face of this earth that can succeed unless the people at the top level, at least, are working in harmony. And there is no household, there's no household or home that can be a joy, a place that you want to go to but worse than you want to come away from it unless there is harmony at the top. And that harmony starts with, lo with loyalty. Loyalty and dependability. And then would come ability after that. That's the way I would evaluate people. If I wanted to select a man or a woman for a high position, the first thing I would look for is to see whether that person was loyal to the people to whom he owed loyalty. If he didn't have loyalty, I wouldn't want him or her on any terms whatsoever. The next thing I would look for would be dependability. Whether or not you can depend upon him to be at the right place at the right time and to do the right thing. And then after that would come ability. I've seen a lot of people who had great ability, but they had, were not dependable and they were not loyal and therefore very dangerous. Number 17, overcaution in business and professional relationships. Have you seen people so, so cautious that they wouldn't trust, trust their own mother-in-law? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I knew a man who was so cautious once that he had a, had a special wallet made and a little lock put on it and he hid the key in a different place every night so that his wife couldn't go through his trousers and take money out of his wallet. <laughs> Wasn't he a honey? I bet his wife loved him. Overcaution in business and professional relationships, then lack of all forms of caution in all human relationships. Have you seen people like that that just didn't have any caution? People who start their mouths to going and go off and leave them, never mind what they're going to say or what the effect's going to have on other people. You've seen people like that, haven't you? No caution whatsoever, no discrimination, no diplomacy, no uh, consideration of what they're going to do to other people through their words. I've seen people with tongues that were sharper than a double-edged uh, Gillette blade that never had been used. And they start them to cutting and go out, just walk away and leave them. No caution whatsoever. I've seen people who would sign anything that a salesman put in front of them without even reading it. They wouldn't need to read the big type, let alone the little type. Have you seen people like that? Of course, you're not like that. But you know you can be overcautious and you can be undercautious. What is the happy medium? 
The happy medium is found in, lesson, uh, in the lesson on accurate thinking, where you examine carefully the things that you're going to do before you do them, not afterwards. Where you evaluate your words before you express them, not afterwards. Now, you know it's going to be a little bit difficult for you to grade yourselves accurately on this one. I know it is. To be perfectly candid with you, it would be a little bit difficult for me to grade myself accurately on those two, on 17 and 18. Because there have been a lot of times in my life when I wasn't uh, cautious at all. I think most of my troubles in my early days came through my trusting too many people. I let somebody come along and flatter me into using the name Napoleon Hill, and he'd go out and flim-flam a lot of people in the name of Napoleon Hill. That's happened several times in my life before I tightened up and became cautious. And that can happen to a lot of people, you know. But on the other hand, I wouldn't want to become so cautious that I didn't trust anybody for anything. You'd get no joy out of living if you did that. And number 19, wrong choice of associates in one's occupation or calling. How many times have you heard of people getting into trouble because they were associated with the wrong kind of people? Yeah, <laughs> fine. Fine, I see quite a number of hands going up. Let's see how many there are, anyway. Well, that's, uh, you're pretty lucky, most of you. Wrong kind of associates. You know, I've never seen a youngster in my life that, went, that became bad or went wrong that couldn't be traced back to the influence of some other person. Not once I ever known a youngster to go wrong or to get into bad habits unless that person had been influenced by somebody else. Number 20, wrong selection of a vocation or a total neglect to make a choice of a vocation. Now, about 98 people out of every 100 would grade zero on that one. Of course, you students of this philosophy who have had a chance to become indoctrinated with lesson number one on definite purpose would grade much higher than that. But do you know that on that one, you either grade zero or 100%. There's no halfway point. You either have a definite major purpose or you don't have it. You can't grade 50 or 60 or any other amount on that one. Nor on definiteness of purpose. You, a major purpose. You either have one or you don't have it. Number 21, lack of concentration of effort. That is divided interest. You, do, you split your interest. Divide them over a lot of, your interest over a lot of different things. You know, one person is not strong enough, and life is too short to ensure your success unless you learn the art of concentrating everything you've got on one thing at a time and following through on that one thing and doing a good job. And now here is one that's uh, going to be difficult for you to grade yourself on, perhaps. Now, number 22, lack of a budget control over income and expenditures. Having a systematic way of taking care of your income and your expenditures. Do you know how the average person uh, manages that uh, question of a budget? Yeah. Well, I, he, he, over his expenditures, he, uh, that is somewhat controlled by the amount of credit that he can get from other people. That's about the only thing. When the credit shuts down on him, then he more or less slacks off. But until that happens, well, he uh, runs wild with spending. A good business firm would uh, go bankrupt in a little while if it didn't have a system of control over its income and ex its expenditures. That's what a controller in an organization is for. They call him a wet blanket usually. Every, every successful business of any size has to have a wet blanket. A man who controls uh, the assets of the company, keeps them from getting away in the wrong, at the wrong time in the wrong way. And number 24, that's right, you're following, 23 is right. The failure to budget and use time to best advantage. Now, that is the most precious thing that you have. You have 24 hours of every day. Eight hours of that you must devote to sleep if you're going to have health, or, or, or an average of that much, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but on the average, eight hours are taken right out. Then another eight hours to make a living. And then you have... Another eight hours of free time. In other words, in America here, as free citizens, you can do anything in the world that you want to with that, that other eight hours. You can sin. You can spend. 
You can establish good habits. You can establish bad habits. You can re-educate yourself and your mind during those eight hours. But actually, what are you doing with those eight hours? Now, there's going to be the determining factor as to how you grade yourself on this particular question. How you're budgeting of your, the use of your time to best advantage. Do you have a system of actually uh, put it, making all of your time count? Of course, you have the first 16 hours that are pr practically taken, taken care of automatically, but the other eight hours is not taken care of automatically. That's something that you can do pretty much as you want to with. It's flexible. Number 24. Lack of controlled enthusiasm. Now there's a honey too. Enthusiasm is among the most uh, valuable of the, of, of the emotions, beyond any question of doubt, provided that you can turn it on and off just like you would water at a spigot or an electric light. Now if you can turn your enthusiasm on when you want to and then turn it off whenever you want to, then you can grade yourself 100% on that. But lack of the ability to do that would raise you somewhere down the, the other way, down toward that little zero. Now, um, how do you go about controlling your enthusiasm? H had you ever thought about your willpower, what, what it was placed there for? You have a power of will, and what's the, what's the purpose of that power of will? It's for the discipline. That power of will is for discipline over your mind. So you can make your mind whatever you want it to be. You can form habits, whatever kind of habits you want. I have never been able to find out or to determine in my own mind which is the worst. No enthusiasm at all, a cold fish, or red-hot enthusiasm out of control. They're both bad. Now, if somebody made me mad right now, I could turn off my enthusiasm just like that and turn on something else. <laughs> that would be much more appropriate maybe, provided I didn't use the wrong language. But there has been a time when I could turn on the anger much more quickly than I could turn on enthusiasm, and I couldn't turn it off near as easily. That's something you'll have to overcome, too. The ability to turn on any of your emotions or to turn them off. Number 25, intolerance, that is a closed mind based on ignorance or prejudice in connection with religious, racial, political, and economic ideas. Now, there you are. How do you rate on that one? It'd be a marvelous thing if you could rate 100% on that and say that you have an open mind on all subjects toward all people at all times. But if you could say that, you'd probably not be human, you'd be a saint. However, there are times, I suppose, when if you made up your mind to be open-minded on all these things, you could for a little while. I know I can for a little while. <laughs> However, suppose you can't grade 100% on that one. Suppose that you can't be open-minded toward all people at all times, on all subjects. What is the next best thing to do? Oh, of course, we tolerate some of the time. Now, that's a good one. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> and if you... If you try that out, uh, the more you uh, try it out, the more you'll, uh, that sometime will take on more and more time. And eventually you'll get to where tolerance will be a habit with you instead of intolerance. You know there are people in this world, and I regret to say that they're in the vast majority, who when they meet others, immediately begin to look for the things that they don't like in the other people. And they always find things they don't like. Then there is another type of person, and I notice that this other type of person is always much more successful, much more happy, much more welcome when he comes around, who, when he meets a person, whether it's an acquaintance or a stranger, immediately begins not only to look for the things that he likes in that person, but to compliment them, say something about them, or to do something about them, or to indicate that he recognizes good qualities instead of bad ones. I get a great thrill when somebody walks up to me and says, Napoleon, aren't you Napoleon Hill? I say, yes, I'm Gilly. Well, I want to tell you, Mr. Hill, how much good I got out of your book. Well, I, I just thrive on that. I love it. Doesn't be a lot of good. Unless, of course, they rub it on too thick. <laughs> and you can do that too, you know. But I've never seen the person yet that didn't, uh, wouldn't respond in kind uh, if you complimented that person. Even a 
pussycat, as bad natured as they are. If you stroke him on the back, uh, will curl up his tail and begin to purr. Cats are not very friendly, but you can make them friendly if you do the things the cat likes. 26, failure to cooperate with others in the spirit of harmony. Well, there are circumstances in life, I suppose, where your failure to cooperate would be justified. Or are there? I can say there are a lot of circumstances where you'd fail to cooperate. I come into contact with people very often who want me to do things that I can't possibly do for them. They want my influence. They want me to write letters of recommendation. They want me to make telephone calls for them. Well, I can't do it. I can't cooperate unless I'm sold on what I'm cooperating with and with whom I'm cooperating. And uh, you'd be like that too. Number 27, possession of power or wealth not based on merit or earned. Well, I'll, I hope you won't have any trouble grading yourself on that one. And number 28, lack of the spirit of loyalty to those to whom it is due. Now, if you have loyalty in your heart to those to whom loyalty is due, you can grade 100% in that, perhaps. But unless you practice that all the time, you wouldn't grade 100%. You'd grade something lower than that. And incidentally, where you grade yourself anywhere on any of these lower than 50%, put a cross mark there and go back for study of that particular point. If you grade less than 50%, you should have uh, all of these uh, causes of failure at least 50% under control. And it falls below that, you've reached the danger point. Number 29, the habit of forming opinions not based upon known facts. Now, to the extent to which you do that, give yourself a good grading on that one. And if you grade below 50% on that, begin to work on yourself right away and stop having opinions unless you uh, base them on facts or what you believe to be facts. When I hear anybody expressing an opinion on something that I have reason to believe he knows nothing about, I always think of that story that tell on... <clears throat> two men who were discussing Einstein's theory of relativity. And they got into a hot argument about it, and one of them said, oh, hell, what does Einstein know about politics anyway in the first place? <laughs> oh, he understood relativity, didn't he? Well, there are people like that, you know, who have opinions about everything in the world. They can run the country better than Eisenhower's running it. They can tell J. Edgar Hoover a few things about his job, and uh, they could always work their friends over and improve them. But uh, if you examine them very carefully, they're not doing too well themselves, generally. Number 30, egotism and vanity not under control. Egotism is a wonderful thing, and vanity is a wonderful thing. If you didn't have a little vanity, why, well, you wouldn't wash your neck or your face or have your hair curled or marcelled or whatever it is the women do to their hair. You have to have a little vanity, a little pride. But you can't have too much, can't you? I think lipstick's a wonderful thing if it doesn't get on my shirt. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can have too much lipstick. The rouge on the face is a wonderful thing, but you know nature is a pretty good old hand at painting faces, right? just right. And when I see a 60 or 70-year-old woman painting her face up to look like a 16-year-old, I only know she's just fooling herself and nobody else because she's certainly not fooling me. Egotism and vanity. The ego, the human ego, is a marvelous thing. There are a lot of people who need to build up of their ego. They have allowed the circumstances of life to whip them down until they've got no fight left in them. No initiative. No imagination. No faith. Your ego, your human ego, that's a wonderful thing if you have it under control and don't allow it to become objectionable to other people. I have never seen a successful person yet that didn't have great confidence in his ability to do anything he started out to do. And one of the purposes of this philosophy that you're studying is to enable you to build your ego up to where it will do for you anything you want it to do, no matter what it is. Now, there are some people whose ego needs to be trimmed down a little bit, but I'd say there are very many more that need a build up than there are who need a squishing. Very many more. Number 31, lack of vision and imagination. I have never been able to determine exactly whether this great capacity for vision and imagination is an inherited quality or an acquired quality. I think perhaps in my case it was inherited because I have, 
I have had a lot of imagination right back to the earliest days that I can remember. And that was one of the things that got me in difficulty in the early days. I had too much imagination and I didn't direct it in the right direction. Number 32, unwillingness to go the extra mile. Now there is a honey, because if you have the habit of going the extra mile and have learned to get joy out of it, out of the business of doing it, the chances are that you're going to put a lot of people under obligations to you, willing obligations. They, not, they don't mind being under obligations to you on that basis. And if you have enough people obligated to you, they, there's no reason why you couldn't make legitimate use of those people their influence, their education, their ability, and whatnot to help you succeed in life and whatever you're doing. Do you know how to get anybody to do whatever it is you want him to do? That's right. Do something for him first. Now, that is as good a definition as I could have used, but I've thought of it for a year. Do something for him first. Now, that is right. And... Look how easy it is to do something nice for another person. You don't even have to ask him, do you? No, you don't. Now, how do you grade on that? How many times uh, when, you want, uh, when you want to have a great long list of people who are standing ready as an army to help you when you need help, how many, what are you doing to cultivate that army in advance of the time of need? You can't just go out and go the extra mile... Uh, this minute and the next minute you uh, turn right around and ask the person to whom you rented that service to render you twice as much service. You can't work it that way. It won't work that way. You've got to build up a, this something called goodwill in advance. And then when they, it's got the, the, the timing has got to be right. Now there are a lot of people who will go the extra mile only for the sake of expediency. They do it just to put you under obligations and they don't time it sufficiently to now allow you to forget about it, so to speak turn right around after having done you a favor and ask you for two or three favors. Haven't you had that experience? Haven't you seen other people make that mistake? Of course, you haven't made it, but the other fellow. Or have you? I don't believe there is a principle of this philosophy that would, uh, if I had to select one principle with which you can do the most, with the most people, I'd say it's with this principle of going the extra mile. Because that's the one thing that anybody can control that wants to do it, you don't have to ask anybody for the privilege of, of, of going out of your way to be nice and to be of help to people. You don't have to ask anybody for the privilege. And the very moment you start doing it, you profit by the law of con contrast. Because most people are not doing that. Well, uh, let's see. Now, number, what's the next one? That's right, 33. Desire for revenge for real or imaginary grievances. Which is the worst, to have a desire revenge for a real grievance, an injury somebody's done for you, or an imaginary grievance? Well, I wonder now. Think that one over. Why, uh, why shouldn't you have... What happens to you when you have a, an expression of revenge, or desire for revenge for any reason whatsoever? What happens to you? Does it hurt the fellow? Oh, that's it. That's the point. It hurts yourself. How does it hurt yourself? It makes you negative. That's the idea exactly. Poisons your mind. It even poisons your blood if you maintain it long enough. Any kind of a, of a mental attitude will get into your blood and, and interfere with your sound health. Number 34, the habit of producing alibis instead of satisfactory results. To what extent do you uh, immediately begin to look for an alibi when you make a mistake or when you do something that doesn't turn out right? Or when you neglect to do the thing that you should have done. What, to what extent do you come across and say, well, it's my fault, I'm, I lay it on the line, face the music, or do you begin to conjure up a, a set of alibis to justify what you've done or neglected to do? Now, that's the point on which you're grading yourself. What is the preponderance of your habits on that subject? And I'll say that if you are an average person, then the chances are that uh, in the majority of cases, you look for an alibi to justify what you do or what you refrain from doing or neglect doing, if you're an average person. 
If you're not an average person, I don't, I'm sure you'll not be if you become properly indoctrinated to this philosophy, you will not look for alibis because you know that's only weakening. That's a crutch that you're leaning on. You'll face the music. You'll acknowledge your mistakes. You'll acknowledge your weaknesses. You'll acknowledge your errors because self-confession is a marvelous thing. It does something to the soul. When you really know what your faults are and confess them honestly, you don't have to spread them to the whole world. But confess them where a confession is, is necessary. I had a student of mine come into my office about a few days ago and make a confession that's going to be a more use to her than anything that's happened since uh, she was a very small girl. Now this student was suffering because she had not yet learned how to distinguish the difference between her needs for things and her rights to have them. Had you ever thought about that? She needed things very badly and she was willing to get them the wrong way. But there are a lot of people who make that mistake. You cannot tell the difference between the things they need and the things that they have a right to get. Number 35, lack of dependability. Uh, that uh, perhaps will be a little bit hard for you to grade yourselves on. But generally speaking, you know whether you're dependable or not. You know whether your word's dependable. You know whether uh, your performance in your occupation or your job is dependable. You know whether uh, your relationship to your family, your wife, or your husband, or your children, you know whether you're de a, a dependable family man or woman, you know that. You know whether you're dependable or not in connection with your credit relations with people where you buy things on credit. You know that. Is it a wonderful thing to have dependability among uh, your friends? You know, just know exactly where they are, where they're always going to be regardless of what happens. Is it a wonderful thing to have dependability among your loved ones? Well, you know they're not going to let you down on any score, at any time, for any reason. How many, how many of you have a half a dozen people like that in your life? Absolutely dependable under all circumstances. My, my, oh, what a lucky group of people this is. I'd say that if you have three people like that in an entire lifetime, you're indeed fortunate. People that are dependable under all circumstances. I'm not so sure, but what I can count the ones that I have that are like that on the fingers of my two hands, as many people as I know all over the world. Dependability, what a marvelous thing it is. Uh, number 36, unwillingness to assume responsibilities commensurate with one's desire for compensation. In other words, your desire for the good things of life, good income and all that, nice home, nice car, nice wardrobe of clothes but unwilling to assume the responsibilities to entitle you to those things. Now, how do you agree on that? In other words, are you willing to assume the necessary responsibilities to entitle you to all the things in life that you want to get out of life? That's the point that you're grading yourself on. And number seven, the failure to obey the conscience when it seems advantageous not to do so. Are there, little, are there times when you uh, tell your conscience just to step aside for a few moments while you don't look right now because a little bit of transaction of business here you want to attend to that's a little bit off color. Do you ever do that? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to ask you to vote on it. I wouldn't do that. Well, you know, I, I think you could do that a few times to get away with it, but I think if you got in the habit of it, you're, you, you would convert your conscience into a conspirator that would endorse all of the mean things you might ever want to do. And that would be bad. That conscience was given to you by an all-wise creator so that you would always know what is right and what is wrong without having to ask anybody. And if you're on to good terms with your own conscience, if you really respond to that conscience under every circumstance and let it be your God, then you are a very fortunate person and uh, you have uh, been using that conscience properly. But if there are times when uh, you waver, you undecided and you make, make your conscience step aside, then uh, you need to grade yourself low and begin to work on yourself on that score. I think it's a, a marvelous thing that the Creator should have given each individual a judge advocate, so to speak, to sit over all of his acts and all of his deeds and all of his thoughts and tell him when he's right and when he's wrong. Number 38, the habit of unnecessary worrying over things one cannot control. Now, how are you going to agree on that? Unnecessary worrying over things you can't control. If you can't control the thing that you're worrying over, what can you do about it? 
Make the most of it. Why, you can adjust yourself to that thing that you can't control in a positive mental attitude so as to not let it get you down. Or you can transmute that uh, worry over into something uh, on another subject where you can control it. And then uh, number 39, um, neglect to recognize the difference between failure and temporary defeat. Have you ever thought about that? When is failure a failure, anyhow? <laughs> That's right. When you accept it as such, no matter what the conditions are, if you accept it as failure, that's it. Is failure ever a failure until you accept it as such? No. No, of course not. It's temporary defeat, perhaps, but certainly not failure. You know, if, uh, if you took no for an answer, if you were selling, and you took no for an answer every time you heard it, you'd never make a living selling. Because it's easier for people to say no than it is to say yes, and they don't mean it at all. They just mean that they haven't yet been broken down by a good salesman. <laughs> Temporary defeat and failure. Who determines whether a circumstance in your life is a temporary defeat or failure? Who determines that? No. That's right. You're the one who determines that. And 40, lack of flexibility in adjusting to the varying, cir varying circumstances of life. Lack of a flexibility of your mind. Do you know it's uh, necessary at times for you to go along with uh, unsavory bedfellows, people that you don't like. You go along with them until it's time as they drop out of your life. Of course, you could have it out with them right where you stand. But uh, if you do that, you probably would uh, oftentimes get the worst out. You can wear them out, walk them to death by going along with them for a time. If you make an incident out of everything that you do, dislike in people, if you make an incident out of it, well, you'll always be in difficulty. If you let these things that uh, are food for incidents pass by, time is a wonderful cure, a wonderful agent. You know it's the greatest doctor on the face of the earth of everything. Time. Old mother time. Or is it father time? Well, anyhow, maybe it's both. <laughs> there are a lot of things in this world that can be cured only with time. Now, there are people who fret themselves to death and wear themselves out making incidents out of uh, very silly, small, unimportant things every day of their lives. And there's not a day ever goes by in the life of any of you that you couldn't make an incident out of something and have an unpleasant uh, scene with somebody if you would allow yourself to do it. But, of course, being a student of this philosophy, you're going to grade yourself about, let's say, about 80% on that one, flexibility. That is, the ability to adjust yourself to these circumstances that you don't like without going down under them and without making an incident out of them. And you may have a very peculiar cause of failure that I haven't mentioned here at all. It'd be uh, most interesting to see what it is if you do have one, because I have given you a pretty good catalog here of the things that cause people to fail. And uh, one of the interesting things about this uh, list of 40 things that cause people to fail, wh what is the most interesting thing about that list? We have control. They represent things that you can do something about. Now, isn't that true? What would be the use of my having you make this analysis if you couldn't do anything about it? You can eliminate every one of those causes, of every one of them. And you can almost do it instantaneously. There are a few of them. It'll take a little time for you to develop up uh, more positive habits. But for the most part, every one of these causes of failure, you can wipe out of your character this very night by determining to do so, by determining to develop a more agreeable set of circumstances. No matter what your adversity may have been, go back, after you've had this lesson, go back for the last 10 years and take every unpleasant circumstance that you've ever had and begin to search now and see where that seed of an equivalent benefit was, even though you didn't find it and didn't use it. It's very difficult to find the seed of, a, of an equivalent benefit in an unpleasant circumstance while the wound is still open and hurting. There again, timing is important, but if you'll give it a little time... <coughs> Make up your mind that you're not going to go down under the circumstances. You give it a little time and then go back and evaluate it carefully and you will find that you will have learned something from it of benefit. There are two kinds of cooperation. One based upon force or coercion. And the other is a voluntary, based upon voluntary action found of based on motive. The vast uh, majority of all circumstances of cooperation, I think, are based upon some form of force or coercion. 
<clears throat> employees oftentimes cooperate with their employer, but uh, there's a certain amount of coercion in it, a certain amount of fear that if they don't cooperate, they'll not have their jobs. There are other circumstances where the uh, employees cooperate with the employer because the employer has made it so beneficial for them to work at that place that they do it willingly. Any kind of cooperation that's forced or forced on people or based upon any type of cooperation um, of coercion is not desirable because people only cooperate on that basis as long as they have to and when they get to the point where they don't have to do it any longer they kick over the traces. Relatively speaking there is a small percentage of uh, employers throughout the United States who understand the advantage of having their employees cooperate with them on a willing basis of friendliness based upon benefits that they extend to those employees. Cooperation differs from the mastermind principle in that it's based upon coordination of effort without necessarily involving the principle of definiteness of purpose or the principle of harmony. <clears throat> the men working in the military service, an army of men for instance, working under their superior officers represents a, a tremendous amount of power based upon cooperation but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's harmony nor that they like what they're doing. There's a certain amount of coercion and force there. They're doing what they uh, have to do. Sometimes they like to do it, but sometimes they don't like to do it. Cooperation based on the mastermind principle is the medium by which great personal power may be attained, and no one has ever acquired such power without the aid of these principles, a fact which places them in the category of indispensables. <clears throat> now, cooperation is indispensable in four major relationships, and here they are, in the home, in one's job or profession, in social relationships, and in support of our form of government and free enterprise. Certainly those are musts. And if every citizen cooperated in those uh, four respects, this would be a better country than we still have, uh, than we have yet. Now here are examples of cooperation not based on the mastermind principle. Soldiers working under army regulations, employees working under rules of employment, government officials working under laws of the nation, professional men such as lawyers, doctors, dentists working under rules of ethics of their profession, citizens of a nation related under a dictator. Observe the manner in which a cooperative effort assumes greater powers when the principle of cooperation is combined with the mastermind principle involving harmony based on a definite motive. Now here are some examples of that. Uh, government officials, when working in harmony with and supported by a majority of the people, as in the case of uh, Roosevelt's first term in office, when the emergency of an economic depression supplied motives for harmony, and the motive was a desire for economic recovery affecting all the people. I have never seen a finer illustration of power attained through a combination of the principles of cooperation and the mastermind and I witnessed there in the Roosevelt administration during his first term in office. We had a motive. We all had a motive in getting back at the president. That motive was, uh, was survival. We were in danger. There was an emergency and we had to close ranks and get behind him whether we agreed with his uh, political principles or not and we did that. Did it on a grand scale for a time, but the, as soon as the emergency passed, or it was softened by that uh, combination of the mastermind principle and cooperation began to disintegrate. And before Roosevelt uh, finally got out of office, there was an upheaval and uh, uh, lack of harmony and a lot of other things that uh, caused a lot of people <clears throat> worry and annoyance and not to mention loss. Employers and their employees with a motive such as that which inspired harmony in the Arthur Nash Clothing Company of Cincinnati when the company faced bankruptcy. While I was publishing the Golden Rule magazine, I got a hurry-up call from Mr. Nash of the Nash Clothing Company in Cincinnati to come over to Cincinnati and see him. And when I got over there, I found he was in trouble. He was, in, he was really bankrupt. For no reason that he could explain, a business that had been going for years profitably, all of a sudden became unprofitable and the business dropped off to where they didn't have enough to really pay their payroll. When I went over the situation with Mr. Nash, I said there is only one thing that can save your business and that is if you work out a, a plan whereby the employees will take a new lease on life, 
put their heart and soul into the business, go along with you, you can, you can save the business. And we worked out a plan whereby they would uh, receive at the end of the year, in addition to their regular salaries, a bonus consisting of a percentage of the profits. There's quite a bit of details that I'll not go into, but that was the sum and the substance of it. Mr. Nash called all of his employees together. He got up and told them what he had in mind. He said, I think I should tell you, first of all, the company's bankrupt. We don't have enough money to pay this coming week's uh, payroll. And he said, uh, for a long time, this business has been going downhill, and I noticed that all of the employees were losing interest. Uh, that enthusiasm that used to prevail here is no longer here. The spirit of the thing is gone. Unless we can recapture that spirit, that willingness of enthusiasm for everyone to jump in and do something, why, uh, we're all in the same boat, namely bankrupt. And he said, I have a plan, and uh, I think it'll work. It's based upon the golden rule. I have a plan whereby... Uh, if you'll all come down Monday morning and start in on a new basis, the basis uh, in the same mental attitude that you were in 10 years ago when we were thriving, go to work. I'll pay your wages as soon as we can make the wages, including the back wages that I'll not be able to pay you this coming week. And uh, if we make a go of it, at the end of the year, we'll divide the profits on a basis that will give you the same standing as a stockholder in the company. I'm going to leave the room and then you talk it over frankly and decide what you want to do and then when you want to see me, you let send for me. He and I went to lunch. We were gone about an hour and uh, a messenger came over and called him away from the lunch and went back and they announced that uh, what had happened. They all got together and they decided that not only was going to accept this proposition, but uh, they came down the next day with their savings. Some of them had money in old socks, some of them in tin cans, some of them in savings accounts. They laid $16,000 in cash on his desk. They said, there it is, Mr. Nash. If that's the way you feel about us, this is the way we feel about you. We earned this money down here. It isn't much, but if it'll do any good, use it. And when you can pay it back, why, pay it back. And if, it, if you can't pay it back, why, that's all right, too. You see, they had caught the spirit, don't you know, of real cooperation. The company began to thrive, and before Mr. Nash died, some ten years later, it became the most prosperous uh, mail-order clothing business in the whole United States, and as far as I know, it still is that today, despite the fact that he's gone. Same business, at the same location, making the same kind of clothes, with the same people doing the work, failing one day and starting to succeed on a grand scale the next day. And what, was it that, what, what happened there? There was a change of what? Change of mental attitude. What caused them to change their mental attitude? Was it fear that they'd lose their jobs? No, it wasn't that, was it? They had a motive. Mr. Nash had inspired them with his insincerity and purpose in making them that kind of an offer. They were touched by it. They knew it was sincere. And they made up their minds they were going to be just as uh, good a sportsman as he was. They were not going to let him outdo them. And when you get any group of people together on that basis, I don't care what their problems are, they'll meet those problems successfully. They always do. And then uh, the Rotary Clubs and their members throughout the world. There's a marvelous illustration of uh, the mastermind principle and the harmony in the ranks. I remember when that Rotary Club was organized. I belonged to the first club ever organized here in Chicago. I was a member of the original group that Paul Harris organized. And in those days, we... Uh, uh, the purpose of the club was to honor Paul Harris and to help build up his legal practice without violating his ethics. <laughs> that was the original purpose of it. But we finally grew bigger than that purpose, and the purpose became the idea of uh, developing fellowship among the members. A good feeling. Well, the Rotary spread all over the world and has become uh, really an outstanding influence for good wherever it is touched. You don't do anything in this world without a motive. There must be a motive to inspire everything that you do or everything you refrain from doing. The only person that does, does things without a motive is an insane person. He doesn't have to have a motive. Well, at first, the opportunity to get increased compensation and promotion is one of the most outstanding motives for gaining friendly cooperation. And wherever that has been put into use in any business that I know anything about, there has always been a very beneficial and a very profitable return. 
recognition for personal initiative, pleasing personality, and outstanding work. Now, that's a, a strong motive to inspire cooperation, giving person recognition. When he does a good job, he say so, or do something about it. I know an employer who has the uh, birthdays of all of the wives of his employees, his male employees, and all of the children, and every, every birthday they all get presents from him, with a card signed by him in person. Well, uh, his organization represents just one great big family. In other words, they have a, he, he has built himself up in the hearts of the people in the home where the man works. And you can just imagine what that does to the man himself. And then the third, taking a personal interest in one's private problems. You know, that's a powerful motive, too, for gaining friendly cooperation. Taking an interest in the problems of people that you're associated with or that you're working with. Helping them to solve problems. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, uh, after all, this, uh, my problems are mine, but the other folks' problems are his. I don't, I'm not interested in them. And you have, you have the right to do that if you want to. But it won't be profitable to you. It won't be beneficial. If you want to have a lot of friends, if you want to have a lot of cooperation, you'll make it your business to look around and wherever you can be of help to people, you'll start in being of help to them. And next, a system of friendly competition between departments and uh, in departments between individuals. A system of friendly cooperation. Now, in a sales organization, for instance, if you can have a, a different group competing with other diff uh, groups in the same organization on a friendly basis, They'll all strive to do their very best to, in order to win because of good sportsmanship. And uh, able sales managers very often set up that kind of a motive to inspire their salespeople to do better jobs. Then the hope of future benefits in the form of some yet unattained goal which can best uh, be attained by mutual cooperation. In other words, something that you want to accomplish with a group of people where it can only be accomplished by your all pulling together in the same direction at the same time in the spirit of harmony. Well, now, you could mention other motives. Uh, maybe in your particular case, uh, you need the cooperation of somebody. Maybe you would know what uh, kind of a motive that you could plant in the mind of that person to get that cooperation. But certainly you can't get it by force or coercion and hope to benefit by it, because if you get it by that method, sooner or later the cooperation will play out, and it'll turn into resentment. Andrew Carnegie's method of inspiring cooperation was based on four principles. First, he established a monetary motive through promotions and bonuses. That was one of his most potent and influential motive in getting men to cooperate. In other words, uh, all the men who worked for Andrew Carnegie knew that they had the potential possibility of becoming an exceedingly well-paid executive. They'd seen man after man do that very thing, starting at the ranks and climb right on up to the top. And second, his question system. He never reprimanded any employee offensively, but allowed the employee who deserved it to remand himself or herself through carefully directed questions. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? If he wanted to reprimand a person or discipline him, he'd call him in and start asking him questions, which could only be answered one way, the way Mr. Carnegie wanted them answered. Well, I think that is very smart. And if he wanted a fault brought out, he'd let the man bring it out himself because he'd put questions to him that would force him to bring out the fault or tell a lie. And, then, of course, the man didn't want to do that, especially when he knew that Mr. Carnegie knew what the lie was. <laughs> that was one of the things that indicated what a smart man Mr. Carnegie was. He knew how to get the best results out of people without ne unnecessarily hurting them or offending them. And uh, next, he always had one or more men in training for his job. And several of them made it. Isn't that a wonderful thing for an employer to have a number of men standing around training for his job? You don't think they'd be disloyal, do you? You don't think they'd lie down on the job? You don't think they'd uh, refuse or neglect to go the extra mile, do you? Well, why, no. Well, they'd be very silly if they did. Well, Mr. S Mr. Carnegie knew how to hang out to plums, so to speak, for people to reach for. And uh, while he kept the plumb just a little bit ahead of the reach of the man, he caused him to grow stronger and to build a longer arm for reaching by having that plumb out there for him to reach for. That was much better than throwing the fear into a man's heart, or losing his job or something of that sort, as so many employers had done. 
And he never made decisions for his employees, but encouraged them to make their own decisions and to be responsible for the results thereof. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He would not make decisions for his executives and for his uh, under-executives and for those who are in training for executive jobs. I was in the office of Mr. Curtis, Cyrus H. Curtis, of owner of the Saturday Evening Post, who was also one of the collaborators in the building of this philosophy, when his son-in-law, Edward Bach, came in and apologized to me for interrupting our meeting, and he said, there's something that I must speak to Mr. Curtis about that has to have an answer immediately, and he had a telegram in his hand. And uh, he hurriedly explained to his father-in-law that a problem in connection with buying the supply of paper that they were going to need for the whole next year involving a, a tremendous amount of money. Paper for the Ladies Home Journal, and maybe the Saturday Evening Post, and maybe the Country Gentleman, all. He told his father-in-law what the problem was, and, uh, and he uh, also told him that there were three things they could do about it. And he mentioned them. And he said, now what I want you to tell me is which one shall I do? Would you be interested in knowing what Mr. Curtis said to him? He went, uh, went ahead and very briefly analyzed each of those three problems, each of those three things, analyzed them for their good points and their bad ones. And then when he was through, now he said, it's your responsibility, that's my analysis, it's your responsibility to determine which one of the plans you're going to adopt. And Buck said, well, thank you, and walked out. And when he left, Mr. Curtis said, if he makes the wrong decision, it'll cost us nigh on to a million dollars. I said, well, why didn't you give him the right decision? He said, if I had, I'd have ruined a good executive. That's why I didn't. Mr. Bach did become a good executive. He made the, the Ladies Home Journal the outstanding magazine of its time. But he didn't do it by having his father-in-law make decisions. He made them himself. Well, and that's what made Mr. Carnegie such a successful man. He taught people to make decisions, but also to be responsible for the decisions when they made them. That's an important little item, too. Our American system of free enterprise gets friendly cooperation when it is not interfered with by outside influences, by the profit motive. In the United States, if we took away the profit motive, it would uh, take the very, uh, the very warp and the woof of our whole system of free enterprise away. And there are certain pressure groups that are trying to do that very thing all the time, to take away the profit motive. You have to have a motive for everything you do. And we, have, we believe in the United States, in our system of free enterprise, the finest uh, combination of, pro of uh, motives that uh, exist anywhere in the world. I don't... Uh, know what you think about this philosophy as far as you've gone, but I just want to tell you this in closing, that if you get 50% of the benefits that are available to you out of this philosophy, if you get 50% of the benefits, not 100, but just 50% of the benefits, you can so thoroughly change your lives that uh, the next, uh, the coming year that's ahead of you can be the most outstanding year of your life, and from here on out, the rest of your life, you can... Uh, Enjoy a controlled destiny, one that you'll hew out for yourself, where you'll find happiness, pleasure, contentment, security, and where you will enjoy the friendship and the goodwill of people around you because you will create circumstances leading to that end. Uh, the imagination, said someone, is the workshop where in this fashion the purpose of the brain and the ideals of the soul. I don't know of a better definition than that that there are two forms of imagination. Uh, the first one is synthetic imagination, which consists of a combination of recognized old ideas, concepts, plans, or facts arranged in a new combination. Uh, basically, new things are few and far between. As a matter of fact, when you speak of somebody having created a new idea or anything new, the chances are a thousand to one that uh, it's not anything actually new. It's a reassembling of, of something that's old and something that's gone before. Uh, number two, the creative imagination, operating through the sixth sense in the subconscious mind, has its base in the subconscious section of the brain and serves as the medium by which basically new facts or ideas are revealed. Now, any idea 
plan or purpose that is brought into the conscious mind and repeated and supported by emotional feeling is automatically picked up by the subconscious section of the brain and carried out to its logical conclusion by whatever natural means that are practical and convenient. Any idea, plan, or purpose that is brought into the conscious mind and repeatedly and supported by emotional feeling. Now, there is something I want to call your attention to. Ideas in your mind that are not emotionalized or over which you're not enthusiastic or in connection with which you don't have faith seldom produce any action. You've got to get emotion into your, into your thoughts. Or you've got to get enthusiasm or you have to have faith before you get action. Now here are some examples of synthetic imagination applied. First of all, Edison's invention of the incandescent electric lamp. You may be interested in knowing that uh, there is nothing new about Edison's electric lamp. Both of the uh, factors which, when combined, made up the incandescent electric lamp were old and well known to the world long before Edison's time. It remained for Thomas A. Edison to go through 10,000 different failures and to find the way of marrying these two old ideas, bringing them together in a new combination. As you may know, some of you or all of you, one of these ideas consisted in the fact that you could take and apply electrical energy to a wire and at the point of friction the wire would become hot and it would make a light. A lot of people found that out before Edison's time. Edison's problem was in finding some means of controlling that wire so that when it was heated to a white heat where it would make a light it wouldn't burn up. <clears throat> he tried all of these experiments, to be exact over 10,000 of them, and uh, none of them worked. And then one day, as was his custom, he laid down for one of those cat naps to turn the problem over to his subconscious mind. And uh, while he was asleep, the subconscious mind came up with the answer. I've always marveled at uh, and wondered why it was that he had to go through 10,000 failures before he could get his subconscious mind to, uh, to act and give him the answer. So uh, he woke up after one of those cat naps, and as he came out of his sleep, he saw the other half of his idea. He had half of it already. He saw the solution to the other half of his problem. It consisted in the uh, charcoal principle. You know, uh, to produce charcoal, you put a pile of wood on the ground and set it to fire, and then cover it over with dirt, allowing just enough oxygen to percolate through to keep that wood smoldering, but not enough to permit it to blaze. And it burns away a certain part of that wood, leaving the rest which is called charcoal. You know, of course, that where there is no oxygen, there can be no combustion. Taking that concept with which Edison had long been familiar, he went back into the laboratory. He took this wire that he had been heating with electricity, put it in a bottle, pumped the air out and sealed the bottle, cutting off all oxygen. No oxygen could come in contact with oil. Turned on the electrical power and it burned for eight and a half hours. And that's the principle to this very moment on, under which the electric lamp operates. That's why when you drop one of those bulbs, it pops like a gun. The air has all been drawn out of it. The reason being, they cannot permit any oxygen to be inside of that bulb because if it, if it were there, it would quickly burn the filament up. Two old simple ideas brought together through synthetic imagination. And if you'll examine the uh, operations of your imagination or the imagination of successful people, I think you'll find that uh, in a large proportion of the cases, the, uh, what has been used has been synthetic imagination and not creative imagination. These ideas, you know, of uh, giving rearrangement to old ideas and old concepts can be very profitable. Uh, you may be, uh, of course, you may have discovered that there isn't, there's only one new principle in this philosophy that you studied, just one new one that you may not have been familiar with before, and I have only made one contribution to it. Everything else is as old as mankind. But what did I do? I used my synthetic imagination and I reassembled. I, I sorted out the salient things that go into the making of success and organized them in a way that they had never been organized before in the history of the world. Organize them in a simple form where you or anyone else can take a hold of them and put them into practical use. Now, I often wonder why somebody else smarter than I didn't think of that a long time ago before I started into it. 
You know, when we get a hold of a good idea, we always are inclined to go back and say, well, why in the world didn't I think of that? Or if you get it, you think, why didn't I get it a long time ago when I needed the money? Henry Ford's combination of the horse-drawn buggy and the steam-propelled thrashing machine. There's nothing in the world but uh, use of synthetic imagination. He was inspired to create the, the uh, automobile when he first saw his first thrashing machine outfit being uh, pulled along by a steam-propelled uh, engine. They had this thrashing outfit with the machinery attached to the locomotion of the steam engine going down the highway, and uh, Mr. Ford... Uh, observed it, and then and there he got the idea of taking that same principle and putting it onto a buggy instead of the horse, and making the horseless buggy, which eventually turned out to be known as the automobile. Now, examples of creative imagination. First of all, all basically new ideas originate through single or mastermind application of creative vision generally through the mastermind application of creative vision. Now, you'll observe that when two or, people, two or more people get together and begin to think along the same line in the spirit of harmony, and they begin to work up enthusiasm, and all the people in the group begin to get ideas, and out of that group will come an idea pertaining to the thing that they're discussing in the main. If they, have a, if they go into that discussion for the solution of a major problem, somebody will find the answer, depending on whose uh, subconscious tunes in to the infinite storehouse and picks the answer out first. And oftentimes, the answer will not come from the, uh, uh, the, more, uh, the smartest or the most brilliant or the most e best educated man in the group. Oftentimes, it'll come from the least educated and the least brilliant person in the group. Here are some uh, examples of uh, creative imagination. Take radium, for instance. That was uh, discovered by Madame Curie. Now, that all Madame Curie knew was that, uh, in, theoretically, there should be some radium somewhere in the universe. She hoped it would be on this little ball of mud that we call the Earth. She had a definite purpose. She had a definite idea. She worked it out mathematically and <coughs> determined that there was radium somewhere available. Nobody had ever seen any. Nobody had ever produced any. Nobody had ever refined any. Imagine uh, Madame Curie starting out to find radium in comparison with the proverbial story about the person looking for a needle in a haystack. Believe you me, I'll take the haystack and the needle every time in comparison with her task. Do you have any idea what it was that gave her her first cues, how she went about uh, searching for it? You, you don't think for a moment she went out with a spade and a, and a mattock digging for it in the ground looking for it, do you? Oh, no, oh, no, she didn't do that. She wasn't that foolish. She conditioned her mind to tune in on infinite intelligence, and infinite intelligence directed her to the source. The exact process that you use in attracting riches or in attracting anything else you want. You first condition your mind with a definite picture of the thing you want. You build it up and support it with the faith in your belief that you're going to get the thing you want. And you keep on get wanting it, even when the going is hard. Well, you take the radar and the radio, for example. Both of them products of creative imagination. And the Wright Brothers flying machine. Now, nobody had ever created and successfully flown a heavier-than-air machine until the Wright Brothers produced theirs. Now, Wright Brothers had no encouragement from the public, and when they announced uh, that they were going to fly the machine, they had flown it successfully and were going to demonstrate it again down at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, when they announced that to the press, the newspaper men were so skeptical they wouldn't even go down there. Not one single solitary newspaper man went down there on the biggest scoop in the last hundred years. There they were, smart Alex, you know, wise guys. They knew the answers. How many people do you see like that all the way through when somebody comes up with a new idea? Smart aleck, wise guys, people who don't believe that it can be done because it's never been done before. There is no limitation to the uh, application of creative vision. The person who can condition his mind to tune in on infinite intelligence can come up with the answer to anything that has an answer. Anything, no matter what it is. And Marconi's invention of wireless communication. And Edison's talking machine. You know, Edison never uh, created but one, as far as I know, but one idea that came out of creative vision, and that was the talking machine. Uh, before his time, nobody had ever re recorded or reproduced sound of any kind. Nobody had ever done that, nor anything even resembling it. 
And there had been no talk about it, no stories written about it, as far as I know. And Edison conceived that idea, and uh, almost instantaneously, he took a piece of paper or an envelope out of his pocket and with a pencil drew a crude sketch of what became later the first Edison uh, um, recording machine, talking machine, they called him then. One that had a cylinder on it, you know. And when they tried it out, when they tried the model out, the, the thing worked the very first time, quite in contrast. You see, the law of compensation paid him off for those 10,000 failures when he stood by <laughs> while he was working out the incandescent electric lamp. Don't you see what a generous and a fair and just thing the law of compensation is? Where you seem to be cheated in one place, you will find that it'll be made up in some other place in proportion to your deserts, whatever they may be. That works with penalizing, too, when you escape the... Uh, the cop at one corner, of course, you run a red light, maybe you escape him again, but the next time he'll catch you <coughs> on two or three counts. <laughs> you'll find He finally catches up with you. Well, here out here in nature somewhere, there's a tremendous cop and a tremendous, tremendous recording machine, recording all of our good qualities and all of our bad ones, all of our mistakes and all of our successes. And sooner or later, they all catch up with us. Now... <clears throat> A creative vision in evaluating the great American way of life. We still enjoy the privilege of freedom and the richest and the freest country ever known to mankind, but we need to use vision if we are to continue to enjoy these great blessings. Now, if you look backward and see what traits of character have made our country great, here they are. First of all, the leaders who have been responsible for what we have, have in the American way of life made definite application of the 17 principles of the science of success with emphasis on the following six. Now, they didn't at that time, they didn't call uh, these principles by these names. They probably weren't conscious that they were applying these principles. And one of the strangest things about all of the successful people that I work with, not one single solitary one of them could sit down and categorically give me step by step the modus operandi by which, which he had succeeded. They had stumbled upon, stumbled upon, mind you, by sheer accident, these uh, principles uh, are listed here First of all, definiteness of purpose. Second, going the extra mile, rendering more service than they're paid for. I want you to go back and measure the, seven, the, the 56 men that signed the Declaration of Independence. I want you to go back and measure what they did by these six principles and see how definitely you can trace the application of them to their act. Definiteness of purpose, going the extra mile, the mastermind principle, creative vision, Applied faith and personal initiative. The makers of the American way of life did not expect something for nothing. They did not regulate their working hours with a time clock. They assumed full responsibilities of leadership, even when the going was hard. Looking backward over the past 50 years of creative vision, we find, for instance, Thomas A. Edison, through his creative vision and personal initiative, ushered in the great electrical age and gave us a source of power the world had not previously known. Think of that. That one man ushered in a new age, the great electrical age, without which all of this industrial improvement that we've had, all the radar, all the television, all of the radio, would not be possible. What a marvelous thing that one person did to influence the trend of civilization all over the world. And what Mr. Uh, marvelous thing Mr. Ford did when he brought in the automobile, brought to uh, Backwoods and Main Street together, he shortened distances. He improved the values of lands by causing marvelous roads to be built through them. He gave employment directly and indirectly to millions of people who would not otherwise have had employment and to millions of people who now today have businesses supplying uh, the automobile trade. Then Wilbur and Orville Wright, they changed the size of the earth, so to speak. Shortened distances all over the world, just those two men operating for the good of mankind. Then Andrew Carnegie, through his creative vision and personal initiative, ushered in the great steel age, which revolutionized our entire industrial system and made possible the birth of myriad industries which could not exist without steel. And not satisfied with the accumulation of a vast fortune of his own and the raising of scores of his associate workers into sizable fortunes they could not have accumulated without Carnegie's aid, he finished up his life by inspiring the organization of the world's first practical philosophy of personal achievement, which makes the know-how of success available to the humblest person. What a marvelous thing one man could do operating through one other man. 
So you see now, when you begin to analyze what's happened here, what a marvelous thing can be happen can take place when an individual gets together with another individual and forms a mastermind alliance and begins to do something useful. There's nothing impossible to two people working together in the spirit of harmony under the mastermind principle. Without that alliance, if I'd had a hundred lives to live, I could never have created this philosophy. But the inspiration, the faith, and the confidence, and the go-ahead spirit that I got by having a access to a great man like Mr. Carnegie enabled me to rise up to his level, something I never could have done without, his, uh, without this mastermind principle and without creative vision. Because there have been times, times when logically, if I had listened to what would seem logic and reason, I would have quit this uh, philosophy and have gone to work with, and got myself a job, as one of my former relatives said uh, she thought I should have done. Job as a nice bookkeeper somewhere. I'd have brought in $75 a week and been very secure. <laughs> been wonderful. Wonderful. Be at home every night, well, most every night, and everything would have been lovely. <laughs> well, believe you and me, I had to fight that argument for quite a while. I did fight it successfully. I saw bigger things in life. I began to use not only my synthetic imagination, but my creative imagination, and particularly the latter. And it uh, enabled me to pull aside the curtain of discouragement and of despair and to look into the future and to see there what I now know is taking place all over the world as a result of my having passed this way. All of that through creative vision. What a marvelous thing it is to be able to tap that thing called creative vision and through it to tune in on the powers of the universe. I'm not uh, making a poetic speech. I'm citing science because everything that I'm saying is practical and is being done, and it can be done by you. Here is a brief bird's eye view of what men and women with creative vision and personal initiative have given us. First of all, the automobile, which has practically changed our entire way of living. Uh, those of you who have uh, been born in the last uh, 25 or 30 or even 40 years, you can have no concept at all of what the vibrations of the, this nation were under the horse and buggy age in comparison with today. Well, in those days, you could walk down the road or you could ride down the road in safety. <laughs> Nowadays, you can't even cross the street where there's a policeman watching in safety unless you are a very alert of limb and eye. The whole method of transportation, the whole method of doing business has changed as a result of that one thing called the automobile. And then the airplanes, which travel faster than sound and have shrunk this world to where the peoples of all countries know one another better. What a marvelous thing it is. Perhaps the Creator intended it that way. That instead of all these wars and things that we've been having in the past, that by bringing, uh, reducing the world in size, bringing the peoples of all nations together within a travel distance of 24 hours or so, that they would become better acquainted and finally become neighbors and then become brothers under the skin as well as on the skin. If the brotherhood of man ever takes place, it'll be because of these various marvelous things that the imagination of man has uncovered and revealed that brings us together and makes it more convenient for us to assemble and to understand each other all over the world. You can't uh, carry on a war with a person that you're doing business with each day, the neighbor that you're living by each day. That is, you can't do it and have any peace of mind. You try to manage to get along with the people that you have to come into contact with. And when you come to know people, you'll be surprised at how many good qualities the people you previously didn't like have. If you come to know them as they are. And then the radio and television, which uh, give us the news of the world almost as fast as it happens. And it provides the finest of entertainment without cost to the log cabins of the mountain country and the city mansions alike. Quite an advance over the days of Lincoln as he learned to write on the back of a wooden shovel in a one-room log cabin. Isn't it a marvelous thing to know that down in the mountains of Tennessee and Virginia, where I was born, famous only at that time for mountain feuds, corn liquor, and rattlesnakes, now you can turn a little knob and you can tune in the finest operas, the finest music, finest uh, everything, know what the world is doing almost as fast as it's doing it. You know, if we'd had those conveniences when I was growing up, I doubt that if I would have had my first definite major purpose, that of becoming a second Jesse James, I probably would have wanted to become a radio operator or something of that sort. 
How it's changed those mountain people down there, down all throughout the country and throughout the world. Just the result of these uh, things that the mind of man has brought forth to introduce people to one another. You know, it's a wonderful thing to, to have a system whereby you can have this old physical frame in fine condition to, to do anything you want to do any time you want to do it. If I hadn't had a system for keeping myself healthy and full of energy, I couldn't have uh, done the amount of work that I've done in the years past. I couldn't do the amount of work I'm doing now. As a matter of fact, at my age, uh, uh, with the health that I have, the condition of my physical body, I can run rings around people half my age uh, who, who, don't, who don't have the system that I have. And I, I have to keep myself in that condition for several reasons for it. First, call, first place, I enjoy living better if I, my body is uh, responds. When I make demands on for enthusiasm, I want the uh, physical basis to be there for that enthusiasm. I don't want to get up a morning ailing. I don't want to look in the glass and see uh, my tongue all coated. I don't want my breath to smell bad. <laughs> that's, not, that's not so good, is it? Well, there's ways and means of avoiding all of that. And uh, I hope that you'll get some suggestions out of this lesson that will help you keep your physical body in fine condition. First of all, let us take mental attitude. That comes at the head of the list, as you notice. Because... <clears throat> Without a health consciousness, in other words, without thinking and acting and being in terms of health, the chances are that you're not going to be healthy. I, I never think of ailments. As a matter of fact, I, I can't afford ailments. I just can't afford them. They take up too much of my time. They disturb my mental attitude too much. And you say, what? You can't afford ailments? How are, how are you going to help having ailments? I have them. Well, you may have them now, but when you get through this lesson, you're not going to have them, not as often as you did before. There is a way of controlling ailments. Mental attitude. First of all, there must be no griping in family or occupational uh, relationships. It hurts the digestion. Now, you will notice that every one of these things in connection with the conditioning of a mental attitude is something that you can control if you want to do it. No griping in family or occupational relationships. You say, well, I, I have certain circumstances in my family that makes it necessary for me to gripe, complain. Yes. All right, change the circumstances. So you won't have any circumstances for griping and complaining. Now, the reason I mention family relationships and occupational relationships is there's where you spend most of your life. And if you're going to allow that, that, those relationships to uh, be based upon uh, friction and misunderstandings and arguments, why you're not going to have good health and you're not going to be happy and you're not going to have peace of mind. There must be no hatred. No matter how much a person deserves to be hated, you can't afford to do the hating. You just can't afford it because it's uh, bad for your health. It produces stomach ulcers and worse things than that. It produces negative mental attitudes that repels people instead of attracting them to you, and you can't afford that. It attracts <coughs> reprisals in kind, and it hurts digestion. If you hate people, they'll hate you. They may not say so, but they will. And there must be no gossip or slander. That's a pretty hard one to comply with, because there's so much wonderful material to gossip about in the world, it seems a pity. <laughs> Very great pity to cut you off from all of that pleasure, but let's transmute that uh, desire into something that's more profitable to you. No uh, gossip or slander because they attract reprisals and they also hurt the digestion. And there must be no fear because it indicates friction in human relationships and also hurts the, the digestion. And also, if there's any fear in your makeup, it uh, indicates very definitely that there's something in your, in your life that needs to be changed or altered. I can truthfully say that there isn't anything on the face of this earth nor in the universe that I survey around me that I fear. Nothing at all. I used to fear about everything that the average person fears, but I had a system for overcoming those fears. If I had a fear now, do you know what I would do about it? I'd have it out with myself. I would eliminate the cause of that fear. No matter what it took or how long it took, I would eliminate the cause of fear. I will not tolerate fear in my makeup. I just won't tolerate it. Because you can't have good health, you can't be prosperous, you can't be happy, you can't have peace of mind if you're going to fear anything at all, even death. Most of all death. Personally, I'm looking forward to death with a great 
anticipation. It's going to be one of the most uh, unusual interludes of my whole life. As a matter of fact, it'll be the last thing I'll experience. <laughs> I, I, of course, I'm putting it off a long time. I've got a job to do and all that. But when the time comes, believe you me, I'm going to be ready. It's going to be the last thing I'll do and the most wonderful thing of all because I'm not afraid of it. And there must be no envy. Because it indicates lack of self-reliance and it also hurts uh, digestion. Now, here, here are just some of the things. There are six things that I give you in the way of do's that will enable you to, uh, to maintain the mental attitude that is conducive of a health consciousness. And believe you me, the mind, the way you use your mind has more to do with your health than all other things combined. You can talk about germs getting into the blood all you want to, but believe me, nature has set up a marvelous system of doctoring inside of you. And germ or no germ, if, you, if that system is working properly, that resistance that's in your physical body will take care of all those germs. Nature has a way of keeping, through body resistance, keeping down the supply so those germs cannot multiply. And the very minute you become worried or uh, annoyed or fear and break down that body resistance, uh, these germs begin to multiply by the billions and trillions and quadrillions. The first thing you know, you really are sick. And then your eating habits. Uh, prepare the mind to aid you in eating with peace of mind. And there must be no worries or arguments or unpleasantness at mealtime. Do you know that the uh, average family uh, selects meal time for the hour of discipline of the husband and the children, or the wife and the children, as the case may be? That's the one time you can get them all together, <laughs> and when they're not inclined to run away while you're giving them a tongue lashing. They will stand and, uh, or sit rather, and eat it out <laughs> while you're <laughs> saying your piece. But believe you me, if you could see what happens to the digestion, what happens to the bloodstream, to a person who eats while he's undergoing punishment, you would know that's the wrong time to do it. Because the thoughts that you have while you're eating go into the food you eat and become a part of the, of the, of the energy that goes into the bloodstream. And there must be no overeating. It overworks the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, and the sewer system. Now, most people eat twice as much as they really could get along with. Twice as much, if you please. And look at the amount of money you'd save nowadays with grocery bills what they are. Astounding how much, uh, how many pe people overeat. I mean, people who are doing sedentary occupations. Of course, a man who's digging ditches, he has to have a certain amount of meat and potatoes or something equal or two, uh, necessarily. But a man, a man or woman doing office work or in, in a store, or in a, ho in a house, for instance, doesn't have to have the same amount of food, heavy, substantial food that you would have on the outside working, doing manual labor. And then uh, you must eat a balanced ration with fruits and vegetables and plenty of water or the equivalent of water and some sort of juices. I, I have a system out in California of making one meal a day, at least one meal a day on nothing in the world but uh, live food. That is to say vegetables, berries, nuts, melons, and things of that sort, all alive. Nothing that's been canned or processed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And I can tell you, the, I have all the difference in the world in my energy while I'm at home uh, following my uh, established diet, which I can't do here in Chicago. They'd think I was nuts if I went into a restaurant and ordered the kind of a meal I have in Chicago. As a matter of fact, I doubt if I could get that kind of a meal. And don't eat rapidly. It prevents proper mastication. Now, I violate this one, but don't you do it. I can get away with it because I have a good, strong, vital body, but don't you try it. <laughs> there are a lot of people, you know, who eat too rapidly, and uh, not only that, but uh, it shows that you've got too much on your mind. You're not relaxing, you're not enjoying yourself. A meal should be a, a form of worship, you know. You should have your thoughts on all of the beautiful things that you want to do, your major purpose, or the things that please you most while you're eating. Or if you're eating with someone else, if you're engaged in conversation, it should be a pleasant conversation, not a fault-finding fishing job. Pleasantness. Man sitting across the table from a beautiful woman, I don't see why he shouldn't talk about her beautiful eyes and her hairdo and her lipstick and all the things that women like to have you talk about sometimes if you're the right man. <laughs> Even if you're t sitting across the table from your wife, I don't know any reason in the world why it wouldn't help you and her too. Don't eat candy bars, peanut or 
peanuts or snacks between meals, or drink too many soft drinks. If you want to take a drink, get a hard one. It'll do you some good. <laughs> Something like water, for instance. <laughs> Tripped you up on that one, didn't I? You know, I know people, I know office girls, for instance, that uh, make a whole lunch off of candy bars and knickknacks that they get out of the newsstand and a bottle or two of Coca-Cola. Well, uh, a young person, the stomach can stand that for a while, but it's not being treated properly, and sooner or later, nature makes you pay up for that kind of mistreatment of your stomach. It'd be far better if an office worker would go out and get a head of lettuce and put salad dressing on it and eat that, or some fruit, or some grapes, or some anything that you get at the fruit stand. It'd be far better than eating these candy bars. Liquor in, essay, in excess is taboo at all times, except after six o'clock. <laughs> That is meant to be funny. <laughs> now, I don't exactly mean what is said here, uh, I, except if you, uh, if you leave out that word excess, yes, I would say it was taboo at all times. But uh, liquor in a reasonable amount, I can take a cocktail, I can take two cocktails. But that'd be about my limit at one time. Oh, I could take three, but if I did, I'd come as to say some of the things maybe that I shouldn't say and do some of the things I ought not to do and it wouldn't do me any good. I like to be in control of my mind all the time. What's the sense of uh, pickling your stomach and your brain so that uh, you're not yourself? People find out too much about you. You don't want them to know. And in addition to that, you look silly, don't you? Don't you, don't you think that a person is, whose tongue has been loosened up with liquor, don't you think he makes a, a spectacle of himself that doesn't do him very much credit, no matter who he is? If I go into a home, as I often do, where they take a cocktail, I don't say, oh, no, 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 thank you. I, I don't touch this stuff. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't say that. I take the cocktail, and if I'm not in, in the mood to drink, if nobody's looking, I set it down somewhere. I carried around, I carried around a cocktail one whole evening before I got a chance to sit down. As soon as I got a chance, I dumped it into the sink, and they thought I drank it. But I didn't, because I was to make a speech that night. And believe you me, I'd have been a silly thing to got all pepped up with liquor before making a speech. <laughs> Now, uh, with uh, liquor or smoke it, with everything else, if it's in, if it's moderate, and if you take it instead of it's taking you, <laughs> I'd say it wouldn't be too bad, but uh, the better plan is to get over using it at all. <laughs> and, uh, and then on relaxation, you need play to ensure sound health. Therefore, balance all work with an equivalent amount of play. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean an equivalent number of hours, because it doesn't work out just that way. Believe you, I, I, can work, uh, I can work one hour, and in five minutes of playing, I can offset that. When I'm writing, I'm an inspirational writer, as you may have guessed. I write when I'm keyed up. I'm up on another plane entirely. And it's intensely hard on the physical constitution, and 40 minutes is all I can stand of it. And then I go into my piano and sit down and play for five or ten minutes, and then I've uh, completely balanced off that uh, intense uh, activity that I've been engaged in. And then uh, sleep eight hours out of every 24 if you find time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Might have a fine habit to get into, to get uh, some good sleep. And when I say sleep, I mean get in there and lie down and don't turn and twist and groan and snore and all that sort of thing. <laughs> lie down and sleep peacefully and uh, get in such good... Uh, uh, report with your uh, <clears throat> with yourself, your own conscience, and your neighbors that uh, you don't have anything to worry about. When you hit that old pillow, you can go right smack to sleep. And then uh, train yourself not to worry over things you can't remedy. Now, it's bad enough to worry over the things you can remedy. <laughs> and I wouldn't worry over them any longer than it took me to remedy them. Uh, one of my students uh, some time ago asked if I didn't uh, worry an awful lot over people who came to me with their problems. I said, other people's problems? Why, bless your life, I don't worry over my own problems. Why should I worry over somebody else's problems? And it's not because I'm indifferent. I'm certainly far from indifferent. I'm very sensitive to the problems of my friends and my students. 
but not sensitive enough to let them become my problems. They're still your problems, and I'll do all I can to help you dissolve them, but not enough to absorb them and take them over myself. That's not my way of doing it. And don't you get into that habit either. There are a lot of people, you know, who not only uh, make room in their makeups for all of their own problems, but they take on the problems of all their in-laws and their relatives and their friends and the neighborhood and sometimes the problems of the whole nation. The worry was made for somebody else, not for me. And don't look for trouble. It will find you in its own way too soon anyway. Don't go looking for it. Now, because the, the circumstances of life have a queer way of revealing to you the thing you're searching for. If you're looking for faults in other people, or if you're looking for trouble, or if you're looking for things to worry about, you'll always find them. And you don't have to go very far. You don't have to go out of your own house to find a lot of things to worry about if you're looking for things to worry about. A person without hope is lost. Sound health inspires hope, and hope inspires sound health. Now, what do I mean by hope? I mean the hope of some yet unattained objective in life, something that you're working toward, something that you're trying to do and you know you're going to do it. And you're not going to be worried because you're not doing it fast enough. You know, there are a lot of people in this world who start out to be rich. They want to make a lot of money, and they're impatient, become nervous, work themselves into a fury because they don't get the money fast enough. Sometimes this desire to get money quickly influences people to get it the wrong way, and that's not good. Uh, develop hope by daily prayer, not for more blessings, but for those you already have, such as freedom as an American citizen. What a marvelous thing it would be to express prayer every day in one form or other, in your own words, or don't need to use any words at all, just in your own thoughts. Express a prayer of appreciation for the freedom that you enjoy as an American citizen. Freedom to be ourselves, freedom to live our own lives, freedom to have our own objectives, freedom to make our own friends, Freedom to vote as we please, to worship as we please, and to do pretty much anything else we please. Even abuse ourselves by wrong living if we want to do it that way. Then the privilege of acting on our own initiative. And a job that is secure from war hazards at the present time. We think that there's not any danger of war at this time. There may be some time later on, but right now there isn't. And then an opportunity to secure economic freedom according to your talents and freedom to worship in your own way, sound physical and mental health, and the time that lies ahead of you. Think of the marvelous thing that consists in the time that still lies ahead of you. Well, you know, the richest part of my life and of my achievements is still ahead of me. I'm still just a youngster. in the business. I've uh, been going to kindergarten. I'm up all into the graded school now in my profession. But I'm going to do some really good work before I pass on. I'm not I am making better use now of my time than I used to. Time is a precious thing. I evaluate it in terms of minutes now. And throw away your aspirin and your headache tablets. First thing you do. Headache is nature's way of warning you that something needs correction. Headache, the headache is one of the most marvelous things in the world. It's a wonderful thing. We couldn't get along without headaches. Why, well, we die too young. Because headache is nothing in the world but nature telling you that there's some trouble somewhere and you better get busy and do something about it. Now, did you know that physical pain is one of the miraculous and marvelous things of all of na nature's creations? Physical pain, it's a language that every living creature on the face of this earth and every person of every nationality understands. It's the only universal language. Language of physical pain. Every living creature begins to do something when physical pain begins to clamp down on it. Because it is a form of warning. And take no purgatives of any sort at any time. That's a bad habit. And remember, sound health does not come from bottles, but it may come from fresh air, wholesome food, wholesome thinking, and living habits, all of which is under your control. Fat people may be good-natured, but they generally die too young, and I don't like to see people dying too young. Fasting. Here is one of my pets. Now, if you want to know one of the ma main secrets why I have such marvelous health, why I have no ailments, why I have lots of energy, it's because <coughs> twice a year I go on a 10-day fast. 10 days without any food of any nature whatsoever. I condition my physical body through two days of preparation by fruits, fruit juices, nothing but live vital elements going into the body. Then I go on my fast of water, nothing but just plain water, all the water I can drink, but I put enough uh, 
flavoring or lemon juice or something in it, just a few drops to uh, take the flatness out of water because, believe you me, when you're fasting, water will taste mighty flat. And then when I come off of my fast for the first two days afterwards, I take a very light diet, very little of it. The first day, only one small bowl of soup with no grease in it and one slice of whole wheat bread. Now, don't you start fasting just because I said so. And don't you start fasting at all until you learn under the directions of a doctor or somebody skilled in fasting how to do it and why to do it. I recommended a fast to one of my students once who was about 75 pounds overweight. And she said, you mean fast for 10 days? Well, I'd starve to death the first day. I would starve to death the first day if you took food away from me. And I believe she meant it, and she probably would. The person got lost in the woods and scared to death. I suspect they could starve to death in two or three days. Believe you me, there is tremendous therapeutic value, tremendous spiritual value, tremendous economic value in learning the art of fasting. And on work. Well, work must be a blessing because God provided that every living creature must engage in it in one way or another or perish. Isn't that a marvelous thing to think about? Talk about the birds of the air and the beasts of the jungle, neither wind is spinning nor sowing nor reaping, but nevertheless they... They have to work before they can eat, just the same. Work should be performed in the spirit of worship, as a ceremony. What a wonderful thing it would be if you would uh, look at your work as the rendering of useful service. Think uh, not in terms of what you're getting out of it, but in terms of the people that you're helping as a result of what you're doing in life. Did you know that when you're engaged in a labor of love, when you're doing something for somebody just because you love that person, or he's a friend of yours, you're not doing it for money, do you know you, you never feel tired when you're doing that kind of work? And it does something for you. You get your compensation as you go along. I want to tell you that this business of going the extra mile is the most wonderful thing in this philosophy. For what it will do to you is you go along. It makes you feel better. Better towards yourself, better towards your neighbor, and uh, gives you a better standing in the world of health. And work should be based on the hope of achievement of some definite major purpose in life. Thus it becomes voluntary, a pleasure to be sought, and not a burden to be endured. Work with a spirit of gratitude for the blessings it provides, both in sound physical health and economic security, and the benefits it may provide one's dependence, thus in embellishing it with love. And then faith. Learn to communicate with infinite intelligence from within, and adapt yourself to the laws of nature as they are in evidence all around you. And that's one of the greatest systems of therapeutics that I know anything about is an abiding and an enduring source of faith. It does wonderful things to your physical body. And believe you me, if there does happen to creep in ailments, legitimate ailments, I know of no better medicine to take than faith. And then habits. All habits are made permanent and work automatically through the operation of the law of cosmic habit force, which forces every living thing to take on and to become a part of the environmental influences in which it exists. You may fix the pattern of your thought habits and your physical habits, but cosmic habit force takes these over and carries them out. Understand this law and you will know why the hypochondriac enjoys poor health. If you ever have financial security in this world, you've got to do two things, at least. You've got to budget your time, the use of your time, and you've got to budget your money, your expenditures and your receipts, so that you have a definite plan to go by. Now, to begin with, you have 24 hours of time. Let's take up time first. You have 24 hours divided into three eight-hour periods, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for work, well, you have no control over the eight hours for sleep. You have to give that over to nature. She demands that. And you don't have uh, always uh, too much control over the eight hours that you put into work. Even though you're working for yourself, you still don't have too much control. You have to be there. But there are eight hours that bless your lives. That, uh, that's yours. You can waste it if you want to. You can play. You can work. And you can enjoy yourself. You can relax. Or you can develop by taking courses of instruction. You can read. You can do anything you want to with it. And therein lies the greatest opportunity of the whole 24 hours. It used to be, back in the days when I was doing my research, I worked 16 hours a day, but it was a labor of love that I was engaged in. I reserved eight hours a day for sleep, and the other 16 I worked. Part of the time I was working in order to make a living, training salesmen and so forth, but mostly in research, getting ready to give this philosophy to the world. 
And had it not been for the fact that I had at least eight hours of free time on my own, I never could have done the necessary research. Now, in those eight hours of spare time, you can practice developing uh, all of those habits that you choose through the law of cosmic habits for us. Now, you don't have to follow my plans, but you'll get some mighty good ideas in the lesson on applied faith, in the one on cosmic habit force, and in the one on uh, the mastermind. Work out a plan of your own, and if it's your plan, it'll be better than if I give it to you verbatim and you just follow it. Now, the suggestions for budgeting of time, uh, uh, budgeting of income and expenses. First thing on your uh, list, your monthly or weekly amount of income should put out, be put down should have a regular book worked out, a budgeting book. Now, if you have a family or if you don't have a family, a life insurance is a must. It's absolutely a must. You just cannot afford to be without it. If you, have, if you brought children into this world who are responsible for, to whom you are responsible for an education, it's up to you to insure yourself so that if you pass out of the picture and you don't earn any longer, they have got enough money to educate themselves with. That's just a must. And if you've married a wife that's dependent entirely upon you, it's up to you to uh, carry enough insurance to give her a, a down payment on a second husband if you should pass out of the picture. <laughs> uh, but life insurance is a wonderful thing because uh, it gives you such wonderful protection in case uh, you are taken away from your source of production. And a family man or a man that's in business where his uh, services are a large portion of the assets. There are men like that, you know, in jobs or in the business where the, a key man or key men, if taken away, would be a tremendous loss to the business. And the men like that should always carry themselves, uh, be insured for a large sum of money. Large enough to give, uh, uh, to fill up the chasm and be left by them if they should be taken out. So life insurance comes up at the top of the list. Then next, uh, a definite percentage for food, clothing, and housing. Now, don't just go out and blow the works. You know, you can go down to the grocery store and you can spend five times as much as you actually need if you don't watch, if you don't have a system to go by. I do the shopping at our house, believe it or not. I, Annie Lou doesn't do that. I do it. That way I get what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I learned, I learned a great deal about shopping by following the housewives that I knew, found out were good shoppers and asking them questions. And believe you me, they put me on to a lot of things that I didn't know about buying food, about handling food after they buy it. And uh, so when I go over to one of those big supermarkets out in California, I always uh, pick out the most likely housewife, and I follow along behind her and start asking her questions. You'd be surprised how cooperative they are. They just love to tell you about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. <laughs> food and clothing. But... Uh, <clears throat> Now, we don't have a, I must say that on this one, I, we don't have a budget to go by. I buy whatever I, uh, whatever my fancy strikes me. But uh, I just happen to be in a position where a budget on food and clothing is not necessary. But there was a time when it was necessary, and I imagine in the lives of most people, it is necessary to have a, a budget. And then uh, a definite amount to be set aside for investment, even if it's only a small amount, if it's only a dollar a week. Even 50 cents a week. It's not the amount that you set aside. It's the habit of being resourceful and frugal. It's a wonderful thing to be frugal, not to waste things. And I've always admired anybody that uh, doesn't waste things. I even like, uh, like my grandfather. He used to go around picking up old nails and strings and pieces of metal, and you'd be surprised at what a collection of things he had. <laughs> Now, I, my frugality never ran to that extent. <laughs> it ran more to Rolls Royces and 600 acre estates. <laughs> but believe you me, I got around at long last at learning that no matter how much of this philosophy you have, if you don't uh, have a system for saving a part of what goes through your hands, it makes no difference how much goes through, does it? And if you don't have that system, it will go through all of it. <laughs> Whatever amount remains after you have taken care of those three items, should go into a current checking or spending account for emergencies, recreation, education, etc. You can draw on that. To, you don't have to follow your budget on that. In other words, that's a, a petty cash account, you might say. And uh, if you're a real frugal, you let it get up to pretty good size. You won't keep it down too slow all the time. 
And it's a nice thing, you know. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that uh, you have a good, uh, good nest egg lying in the bank or in your savings account? No matter what happens, uh, you go out and go down there and get the money. You may not need it, and the chances are it'll put you in that frame of mind where you won't have to go down and get it. If you've got it. But if you don't have it there, believe you me, you'll have a thousand needs. <laughs> and you'll be afraid in connection with all of them, won't you? Yeah. That's right. I, I think perhaps the thing that gives me the most courage to speak my piece and to be myself and to m demand that my people keep off of my toes is the fact that I, I no longer have to worry where my money's coming from. I just don't have to worry about that. I have no money worries. In fact, I don't have any worries at all. People try to worry me sometimes, but they, it's like the Confucius say, when rat tries to pull cat's whiskers, rat generally winds up in honorable cat's belly. <laughs> fine. 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 Well, I'll give you a little time on that one. Now, um, this system of trapping a little bit of a percentage that goes through your hands, it's not the amount that, uh, that I'm so interested in as the fact that you're establishing a frugal savings habit. And if your uh, wages or income is so low that you can't cut your expenses anymore, and you can only absolutely take out of the top, off of the top, one percent, one cent out of every dollar. Take that one cent off and put it away in some place where it's hard for you to get at it. I'm a great believer in having money invested in the investment trusts where they represent a great variety of uh, well-known stocks so that if one goes bad, why it doesn't affect your investment at all. There are a lot of those investment trusts. Some of them are good and some of them not so good perhaps. But if you go to invest in an investment trust, you want to go to your banker or somebody that is acquainted. Don't try to do that on your own judgment. You, individuals, as a rule, are just not qualified for doing that. But get, your, get some of your money to working for you, and you'll be surprised at what a nice game it is when you know that you're setting aside a certain amount every month or every week, and that that amount is beginning to work for you. This business of trapping the money, by that I mean uh, getting it in a place where you uh, can't reach down in your pocket and get it. When I go to the bank, to, I go to the bank every so often to get money, to well, pocket money. And I always take a $20 bill, I, what, no matter what, other, what amount I get, I take a $20 bill and wrap it up and put it in a little special pocket in my wallet, just in case I happen to run out of money. I'll always have $20. <laughs> and believe you, the other day I needed it, too. <laughs> it came in very handy. Otherwise, I'd have had to cash a check. Uh, with somebody who didn't know me too well, and I wouldn't have liked to ask to have that done. Saving money, you know, is a very difficult thing for most people because they don't have any system to go by. First of all, on the choice of a profession or occupation, how much time are you giving to that? How much thought and time have you given to the question of getting yourself adjusted in an occupation or a business or a profession that it can be a labor of love? How much time are you devoting to doing that? Now, you can grade yourself on all of these. The grading could run all the way from zero up to 100. Of course, you're not giving 100% of your time on this first item. But uh, if you haven't already found the profession or the occupation that can constitute a labor of love, then you uh, should put in a lot of time searching until you do find that. Then the habits of thought. How much do you put in on the can-do sort of thinking, and on the, how much do you put in on the no-can-do? In other words, how much time do you put in on what you desire and on what you don't desire? Have you ever stopped to take inventory to see just about how much goes in on the, time, on the things that you don't desire in life? Fear, and ill health, frustration, disappointment, discouragement. I'll bet you'd be surprised if you had a stopwatch that you could, uh, you could record the time that you put in every day on worrying about things that, uh, that uh, might happen to you but never do. You'd be surprised at how much of your time goes. A little here and a little there and a little the other place. And the first thing you know, the predominating part of your portion of your time is going to thinking about things you don't want. Unless you have a system, a budgeting system, whereby you keep your mind definitely fixed on the things you do want. I have three hours a day set aside for meditation. Silent prayer and meditation. Three hours. It doesn't make any difference what to hour. Usually when I go home from these lectures, no matter what hour I get home, 
I'll put in three hours of meditation, giving, expressing gratitude for the marvelous opportunity that I've had to be of ministry to other people. And if I don't get it in at night, I get it in sometime during the day. Just expressing gratitude. Do you know the finest prayer on the face of this world is not to pray for something? Pray for what you already have. Oh, divine providence, I ask not for more riches, but more wisdom with which to make better use of the riches I already have. What a wonderful thing that is. Oh, you have so many riches, all of you. You have health. You live in a wonderful country. You have wonderful neighbors. You belong to a wonderful class. You're studying a wonderful philosophy. <laughs> Think of all the things you have to be thankful for. Just think of the things that I have to be thankful for. It's no wonder I'm rich, is it? Why, there'd be something wrong with me if I weren't rich. If I couldn't stand here and tell you that I have everything in this world that I want, there'd be something wrong with me in this philosophy, wouldn't there? I'd have no right to teach it to you whatsoever if I couldn't say that myself about it. I can be the master of my fate, the captain of my soul, because I live by philosophy, because it's designed to help other people, because never under any circumstances do I do anything intentionally to hinder or harm or endanger another person. Never do. <laughs> and then your uh, business and personal relationships to other. How much time do you put into, to, uh, into uh, public relations, you might say, or goodwill building in your relationships with other people in business or in your job? You spend some little time cultivating people? If you don't, you're not going to have friends. You really won't. Out of sight, out of mind. I don't care how good the friend is. If you don't keep contact, he'll forget about you. <laughs> You've got to keep contact. Some of these days, I'm going to get up a series of postcards that'll just take two cents to mail each one. And we'll have a beautiful uh, motto of friendship on each one so that my students can have those cards and then can mail out uh, one a week to each of their friends just to keep in contact. <clears throat> it wouldn't be a bad idea for a business house or a professional man. There'd be nothing in the world to hinder a professional man from building up a wonderful client deal by doing that very thing. And he certainly would never violate the ethics of his profession by doing it. There'd be no commercial atmosphere in it at all. He's only sent out one a month. He'll send out 12 cards a year with the right kind of message on the back of it, signed by himself. Believe you me, it would, it would be the best thing in the world to build up his practice. Then the habits of health, physical and mental. How much time are you putting into uh, seeing to it that you are building health habits that uh, keep, to give you health consciousness? Because a health consciousness doesn't just grow for without some effort. And your religion, how, how much of time are you putting into living your religion? I don't mind, I'm not talking about believing in it. And I'm talk, not talking about going to church and putting a quarter in the basket now and then. Anybody can do that. How much are you living it in your bedroom and in your drawing room and in your kitchen and in your place of business and in your office? There's where I want to know how much you're living your religion. And when you, when you grade yourself on that, that's the place to grade yourself. Not in the church. Because the chances are you go to church once a week, maybe more, if you're Belong to some religions, you have to go more. But uh, it's not how many times you go either that counts. It's not how much you contribute to the church in the way of money that counts. It's what you do to live that religion. That's the thing that counts in the everyday way of living. Why, well, you know, any of the religions would be wonderful if you'd, if you'd only live by them instead of just believe in them. They'd all be wonderful. I don't know of a religion on the face of this earth. It wouldn't be wonderful if people would live by it. Now, it may seem trite, my asking you to grade yourselves on how much time you're spending in on living your religion, but believe you me, unless uh, you're very different from most people that I know, uh, you need to reflect on this subject. And then the use made of your spare time. There is why you really need to go to town and examine yourself. Really give yourself an accounting on that one. Just how much of that eight hours of spare time are you devoting to some sort of advancement of your interests, improvement of your mind, Benefiting by association. Just how much are you doing? And then uh, the budgeting, your spending of money. Have you got a system for doing that? If you haven't got a system, work out one. You can make that system flexible. It may be some weeks when you have to, have to cheat a little bit. 
but you can always pay it back the next week when you don't have to cheat. Then on accurate thinking, based on the lesson on this episode, how much time are you putting into actually learning how to think accurately, following the, the rules that I laid down in that lesson? How much are you doing to put that lesson into uh, actual practice? Thinking accurately, doing your own thinking for once. Then the use made of the power of thought, whether controlled or uncontrolled. Are you controlling your thoughts or are your thoughts uncontrolled? Are you letting the circumstances of life control you or are you trying to create some circumstances that you can control? Now, you can't control all of them. Nobody can do that. But you certainly can create some circumstances that you can control. And how about this privilege of voting? Yes or no? Do you say, oh, well, I guess I'll not go to the polls today. The crooks are going to run the country anyway, the politicians, and I, my little vote's not going to count. Or do you say that, or do you say, I have a responsibility, and I'm going to go to the polls and vote because it's my duty to do that? Put a little time in on that, do you? There are a lot of people that don't, you know, and that's why there's so many uh, crooked politicians and uh, others in public office that shouldn't be there. there too many of the decent people that don't vote. Then family relationships, are they, har are they harmonious? Do you have a mastermind relationship or are you just letting that one slide by? How much time are you giving to, to, build, to improving your family relationship? You have to do something about it, you know. Somebody has to give in. If the wife won't give in, start why, why don't you give in, gentlemen? And vice versa. <laughs> the husband doesn't give in, start a little masterminding. Why don't you give in? Why don't you make it interesting for him? You made it interesting for him before you married him. I'm sure you did or he wouldn't have married you. Why don't you try it all over again and re, uh, renegotiate your marriage relationship so that you have a wonderful relationship there? My, believe you and me, it'll pay off. It'll pay off in peace of mind. It'll pay off in dollars and cents. It'll pay off in friendships. It'll pay off in every way that you want to judge it. Then uh, you and your job or your business or your profession, are you going the extra mile and do you like your work? If you don't uh, like your work, uh, find out why. If you're going the extra mile, how much are you going the extra mile? In what ways are you doing it? And are you doing it in the right sort of mental attitude? And believe you me, I don't care who you are or what you're doing. If you make it your business to go the extra mile in connection with every person where you can possibly do it, the time will come and you will have so many wonderful friends that whatever it is you want to carry out through them, they'll be there at your beck and call. I don't care where you go, you might search this world over and you'll never find a mar marvelous relationship than I have with you wonderful people here in this class, and you proved it here tonight. And I worked at it in order to get it. I wanted to earn it. I wanted to deserve it. If I didn't deserve it, you wouldn't have given it to me, would you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. People, people just don't applaud like that with their hands and their heads. They applaud with their hearts. And that's the kind of applause that I appreciate. I so often say to Annie Lou, Annie Lou takes life a little bit more seriously than I do. She works some now and then at things that she doesn't particularly like. I don't do that. I won't do anything I don't like to do. But uh, we, we are in a wonderful situation. We have wonderful health. When you see her, you know that. I won't need to tell you. She's a wonderful person, just the woman I should have had doing a wonderful job playing opposite me in this great uh, theater of life. And uh, we have everything in the world we can use or need, and if we, don't have, if we want more of anything, we all have to just pick our fingers and here it comes running from a million different sources. Don't think for a moment we could have had that on any other basis than that we first deserved it, we earned it, and we couldn't have had it without it. And nobody can have anything in this world worth having without first earning it. If any of you happen to be uh, students of Emerson, if you've read the law of compensation, you'll uh, get the sum and the substance of this lesson very much more quickly, and you'll also get more out of it. After I had read Emerson's essays for 10 years, especially uh, the one on compensation, and finally had interpreted it, what he was talking about, I said uh, that someday I would rewrite that uh, particular essay so that men and women could understand it the first time they read it. And the lesson that you get tonight is that rewrite. We call it the law of cosmic habit force because it is the uh, controlling force of all of the natural laws of the universe. You know, we have many natural laws, 
And obviously, they all work automatically. Obviously, they're not suspended for one moment for anybody. And uh, those laws are laid down so that uh, the individual who makes it his business to understand them and adapt himself to them can go very far in life. And those who do not understand them and adapt themselves to them uh, go down in defeat. Uh, you've often wondered about this subject of habit, how we happen to have habits, how we get them, how we get rid of the ones we don't want. And I hope that you'll get a fleeting glimpse tonight of the answer to these questions. You, of course, know I have repeated time and time again the importance of recognizing that man has control over but one thing and one thing only, and that's the uh, privilege of uh, forming his own habits Tearing down those habits and replacing them with others, refining them, changing them, doing anything in the world that he wants to do with them. He has that complete prerogative, and he's the only creature on the face of this earth that has that privilege. Every other thing that comes into life has its pattern, its life pattern, and its destiny fixed for it, and it cannot go one iota beyond that pattern. We call it instinct. A man is not bound by instinct. He's bound only by the imagination and the willpower of his own mind. He can project that willpower and that mind to whatever objective he pleases. He can form whatever habits he may need in order to take him toward his objectives. And this lesson that you're on tonight deals with that subject. The purpose of the science of success, of course, which you've been studying, incidentally, in the previous lessons, are based uh, and, and designed to enable one to establish habits that lead to financial security, health, and peace of mind necessary for happiness. In this lesson, we examine briefly the, the established law of nature which makes all habits permanent to everything else except mankind. Now, there's no such a thing as a permanent habit for man because he can establish his own habits. He can change them at will. You know, that's a marvelous thing when you stop to consider that the Creator gave you complete control over your mind and gave you a means of making use of that control. And this law of, of cosmic habit force is the means by which you set the pattern of your own mind and direct it to whatever objectives you choose. Now, the, uh, some of the habits uh, which are fixed by cosmic habit force and which are not uh, subject to suspension or to circumvention are, the, first of all, the stars and the planets as they are established in their fixed courses. How, isn't it a wonderful thing to contemplate all of those millions, billions, quadrillions, and trillions of planets and stars out there in the heavens, all going along according to the system, never colliding, so precise in the system that the astronomers can uh, determine hundreds of years in advance the precise relationship of uh, given stars and planets? Isn't it a marvelous thing to recognize that all of that is a uh, carried on according to a system. You know, um, uh, if the Creator had to hang out those stars and watch everything every night, he'd be a very busy fellow. Now, he's not going to do that, I don't think. He's got a better system. He's got a system that works automatically. If you learn what those laws are, you can adapt yourself to them and profit by them. If you don't learn what they are, you'll uh, probably, through ignorance or neglect, you will suffer by them. I notice that the majority of people not recognizing that there is a law of cosmic habit force, go all the way through life using this marvelous law. What for? To bring prosperity and health and success and peace of mind? No. To bring poverty and ill health and frustration and fear and all of those things that people do not want by keeping their mind on those things. And cosmic habit force picks up those habits of thought and makes them permanent. That is, until I come along and break them up with this science of success philosophy. And that's just why you're here. <laughs> Mr. Stone and I had a very charming lady in our office last week wanting to sell us some space or something in a book that she was getting out based upon the birth dates of people. She wanted to know what my birth date was. And Mr. Stone didn't let her get very far with her story because he told her that he would have nothing to do whatsoever with any system or book that presupposed that uh, birth date had anything to do with what happened to one in life. <laughs> and when he got through, she, uh, he said, now I can't speak for Napoleon Hill, but uh, that's my decision. And I said, well, you've just made my speech now, Mr. Stone. I don't care what uh, 
star you were born under. I don't care what under favorable, unfavorable circumstances you may have met with in life. I don't care what happened to you in the past. I do know that I can take you, and if you follow my instructions, you can get from where you are now to where you want to go, and you'll get there easily. I know that. And I know that you can set up habits that will make your success so easy, you'll wonder why in the world you worked so hard in the past and got so, didn't get so far. You know, most people work harder at failing in life than, than I work at succeeding, a whole lot harder. It's much easier to succeed when you learn the rules and a lot more pleasure in it than it is to fail. And you certainly are not going to succeed unless you understand this law of cosmic habit hopes and start building habits that lead to where you want to go. All actions and reactions of matter are based upon the fixed habits of cosmic habit force. Have you ever stopped to think of it? That the very smallest particles of matter all exist as a result of habits that are fixed upon. And the perpetuation of every living thing through the sex principle. Each seed reproduces its own kind, but each individual reproduction is modified by the vibrations, that is, the environmental influences of the environment in which it exists. Thought habits of individuals are automatically fixed and made permanent by cosmic habit force. Now, there is one for you to think about. Thought habits of individuals are automatically fixed. Whether you will it or not, the thoughts that you give uh, expression to are going to be fixed into habits. You don't need to worry about it. If you uh, keep your mind on the things that you want to become a habit, cosmic habit force will take over from there on out. The individual creates the pattern of his thoughts by repetition of thought on a given subject, but the law of cosmic habit force takes these patterns and makes them permanent unless they are broken up by the will of the individual. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if we couldn't break habits? And when I see the number of people smoking cigarettes nowadays, I'm beginning to think maybe they can't break that habit. When I see all the publicity that the magazines and newspapers are given about the death, high death rate of lung cancer due to cigarettes, I'm wondering whether or not people can break the cigarette habit. Well, don't get mad about it. I don't smoke either. <laughs> Something to think about, though, isn't it? You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, friends. If you want to go ahead and get lung cancer, smoking cigarettes, that's your business. I haven't a thing in the world to say about it. Well, I want to give you a little test that might be helpful. If you can't start out tomorrow morning and prove that you, your willpower is stronger than a little pinch of tobacco in a little piece of silk paper, then you want to begin working on your willpower right away and re-educating it. When I quit smoking, I laid my pipes down. I told Annie Lou to take them and throw them away. I wouldn't be needing them. She said, put them away until you call for them. I said, put them, throw them away. I'll not be needing them. Habits? Well, if you can't get control of the habit of smoking, it's going to be very difficult for you to get control of some of these other habits of fear and of poverty and of other things that you're allowing your mind to dwell upon, too. When I have some enemies to deal with, I always take the biggest guy first. When I lick him, then the rest of them usually take their tails between their legs and run. And if you've got some habits you want to break, don't start with the little easy ones. Anybody can do that. Start with the big ones, the ones that you want to do something about. Take that pack of cigarettes that you have in your handbag there, ladies, or in your pocket, gentlemen half smoked up now, and when you go home, put it upon the dresser. Say, look here, fellow. You may not know it, but I'm more powerful than you are, and I'm going to prove it by not, uh, by not going into that package again. I'm going to sit, sit there for 40 days, after which I won't need cigarettes anymore. Now, I don't think that I am uh, uh, talking against uh, the cigarette business. You know, I, after all, I don't have any stock in the cigarette guns. I am just giving you some ideas through which you must start testing your capacity to build the kind of habits that you want by starting with the tough ones. I'll give you another habit. If you'll uh, go on a week's fast, a whole week without any food, tell your stomach that you're the boss. It may think it's the boss, but you're the boss. Now, don't do this on your own. Do it under the directions of a, of a doctor because fasting is not anything for not child's play. Get control over your stomach, and you'll be surprised at how many other things you have control over when you have control over your stomach. 
You know, how in the world can we expect to be successes in this world if we are going to allow all these myriad habits that come along through the circumstances of our daily life to take hold of us and rule our lives? We can't expect to be successes. We have to form our own habits long enough until cosmic habit force takes them up automatically. Now, let's uh, take up the question of how the individual may apply the law of cosmic habit force. First, in connection with physical health. The individual may contribute to the healthful maintenance of his physical body by establishing habit patterns in connection with the following subjects, and there are four of them. And it's not very difficult to do this. If you want to prove the soundness and the potency and the effectiveness of this law of cosmic habit force, here is a mighty fine place on page two to start in. Because I don't know of anything in this world that men and women want any more than to have a good, strong, physical body that responds to every need in life. I couldn't do the kind of work that I do. I couldn't write the inspirational books. I couldn't uh, deliver inspirational lectures if I didn't know that when I put my foot on the gas, so to speak, that there's going to be power there. And no matter how steep the hill or how long, I know that I've got plenty of power to go the full distance because I keep my body in that kind of condition. First of all, in connection with your thinking. That's the place to start in connection with applying cosmic habit force for the purpose of developing sound health. Now, a positive mind leads to the development of what is known as a health consciousness. You know what a health consciousness is? What is it? Just what do I, what do I mean when I talk about a health consciousness or a prosperity consciousness or any other kind of a consciousness? An awareness, a continuous awareness of a condition, don't you know? In other words, a predominating tendency of your mind to think about health and not about disease or ailments. Now, most people, they have, um, they have a wonderful time telling about their operations. I had a very good friend of mine visit me not more than six months ago, and he had just come out of the hospital. And I want to tell you that he, his vivid description of his operation was such that I could feel this the surgeon's scalpel turning in my back. Yeah, I finally turned around and rubbed my back. It began to hurt back there where he was describing. It really did before I got myself under control. But I didn't ask him to come back to see me again when he left. And uh, most people don't like to hear you talk about your ailments. They're not interested in your ailments. Uh, you ought not to be either, except to get rid of them. And the best way to get rid of them is to form... A health consciousness. Think in terms of health. Talk in terms of health. Look in the glass a dozen times a day and say, you healthy man or you healthy woman. Talk to yourself. You'll be surprised at what will happen. Now, the, the positive mind leads to the development of what is known as a health consciousness and cosmic habit force carries out the thought pattern to its logical conclusion. But it will just as readily carry out the picture of an ill health consciousness created by the thought habits of the hypochondriac, even to the extent of producing the physical and the mental symptoms of any disease on which the individual may fix his thought habits through fear. Isn't that a marvelous thing to know that if you think about a certain ailment or disease long enough, the nature will actually simulate it in your physical makeup. We had down in Wise County, Virginia, an old elderly lady down in the mountain section when I was a small boy. used to come over to my grandmother's every Saturday afternoon and sit on the front porch and entertain us all afternoon with the operations of herself, her husband, what her husband died with, what her mother died with, what two of her children died with. And then she always wound up, after about three or four hours of this, by saying... I know that I'm going to die of cancer. Take, put her hands on her left breast like this. I've seen her do that a dozen times. I didn't know what cancer was at the time. I found out later. Years later, some ten years later maybe, my father sent me a copy of the county paper and I saw a, uh, an announcement of Aunt Sarah Ann Steele's death of cancer of the left breast. She finally talked herself into it. Now, that's not an exaggerated case at all. It just happens to be one of the cases that I know about. You can talk yourself into a headache. You can talk yourself into a bilious condition. 
You can talk yourself into anything and think yourself into it if you allow your mind to dwell upon the negative sides of your physical body. So thinking is important. Now, in eating, the mental attitude and, and the thought patterns established while one is eating and during the following two or three hours while the food is being broken down into liquid form for introduction into the bloodstream may determine whether the food enters the body in a suitable form for the maintenance of sound health. And did you know that the mental attitude that you're in when you're eating becomes a part of the energy that goes into the, your bloodstream? Did you know that? Well, if you don't know that, you better be learning about it because it does. You can't afford to eat when you're disturbed. You just can't afford to do it. You can't afford to eat when you're too tired physically. Sit down, rest, relax. As a matter of fact, uh, food should be a form of uh, a religious uh, exercise. It should be a ceremony, a religious ceremony. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is to go out to the kitchen and squeeze, that is when I'm home, squeeze a nice, great, big, long glass of orange juice. I worship every drink, every ounce of that orange juice as it goes down. I don't just turn up a glass and go, 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 let it all go down once. I let it go down a little at a time and worship every mouthful of it. Now, if you think I'm just kidding, if you think I'm just filling in time because I don't have anything else to say to perish the idea because I'm telling you something that's very important about your eating. And if you get into the habit of blessing your food, not only when you sit down to the table, but blessed as it goes into your body, if you get into the habit of doing that, I want to tell you right now, it'll go a long way toward keeping you healthy. And then third, in connection with your work. Now here too, mental attitude becomes a vital ally of the silent repairman that is working on every cell of the body while one is engaged in physical action. Therefore, work should become a religious ceremony also, with which only positive thoughts are mixed. I think one of the tragedies of civilization consists in the fact that there are so few people in the world at any one time who are engaged in a labor of love. That is doing the thing they want to do because they want to do it, not because they just have to eat and sleep and wash some clothes. I'm hoping and praying that before I shall have crossed over on the other side, that I will have made valuable contributions to mankind to the end that individuals may find a labor of love in which to make a living and earn their way. What a grand world this would be to live in if it weren't for some of the people who live here. <laughs> and what, uh, what's wrong with some of the people? Well, I, not anything wrong with them, it's just their habits that are wrong. They think wrong. That's what's the matter with them. Let them think in terms of good health and of opulence and of plenty and of fellowship and of brotherhood instead of stirring up race riots and all of that sort of thing, setting man against man and brother against brother, nation against nation, thinking in terms of war instead of cooperation. Why, there's plenty in this world for everybody, including the squirrels and animals and birds. Plenty for everybody. If only some people wouldn't try to get too much and try to keep other people from getting enough through wrong thinking. I honestly don't want any advantage, any benefit of any nature whatsoever that I can't, that can't be shared with all of my people everywhere. I don't want anything that I can't share with people. I want no advantage over other people, save only the opportunity of sharing with them my knowledge and my ability to help them to help themselves. Work. What a marvelous thing it is. Uh, observe that, uh, <clears throat> for instance, the main famous Mayo brothers have discovered that four vitally important factors must be observed to maintain sound physical health. An equal balancing through thought habits of work and play and love and worship. Now, is that an interesting thing? That's authentic, can come from the great Mayo Institute where they have had thousands of people pass through their clinics. They have found out that where those four things are out of kelter, out of balance, almost invariably it results in some form of physical ailment. Observe that here enters a sound explanation of one of the major reasons for adopting and following the habit of going the extra mile. This habit not only benefits one economically, but it enables one to work with a mental attitude that leads to sound physical health. Isn't that a wonderful thing? 
When you're doing something out of a spirit of love, out of a spirit of desire to be of help to other people, not out of a selfish desire, it tends to give you better health and to build up better health habits. And for comparison, consider the person who has the habit of griping and performs all work grudgingly and in a negative frame of mind. Nobody wants to even work with him. And nobody wants to employ him if he can find somebody else who doesn't gripe. The fellow who gripes while he's working not only a damages himself, but he damages everybody around him. Mr. Andrew Carnegie told me that one single negative mind in an organization of 10,000 could more or less discolor the mind of everyone in there inside of two or three days without even opening his mouth or saying anything, just by releasing thoughts. You go into a home where there's fighting between members of the family, and the moment you cross the threshold, even when you get in the, I can tell when I get in the front yard whether I want to go in or not. Well, it's safe to go in or not. And certainly after I get in there, I can tell. We have an experience in our home uh, that makes me prouder than anything I can tell you about. Almost invariably, when a person walks into our home for the first time, they look around and uh, make some complimentary expression such as this. For instance, an outstanding publisher came to see me not long ago, And when he walked into our living room, he said, oh, what a beautiful home. And then he looked around again, and after all, it was was just an ordinary home. There's not anything outstanding. But he said, well, the word beautiful is not just the word I want. He said, it's the way I feel when I get in here. He said, the vibrations are good. I said, now you're getting hot. You're getting up my alley. (laughs) This home is charged and recharged constantly with positive vibrations. No inharmonies inside of this house are permitted. Even our dogs have picked that up, our little Pomeranians. They respond to the vibrations of that home. And they can tell a person that's not in harmony with that home in the moment they come in, and they don't like that kind of a person. Little Sparky will go up and sniff a person, and if he's, in, if he's pleased with that harmonious atmosphere, she'll go over and kiss his hand. And if she's not pleased, finds that he's not in harmony, she'll bark at him and back away. I didn't teach her that either. It's her own idea. So homes, places of business, streets, cities, all have their own vibrations made up of the dominating thoughts of those who work and go that way. You go down Fifth Avenue in New York City, I don't care whether you, how much, how little money you've got in your pocket, and if you walk along there with with those big prosperous stores along about Tiffany's, you'll catch the feel of that crowd and you'll feel like you're prosperous too, although you may not have very much money. You'll go just four blocks over in the other direction, over to 8th Avenue or 9th Avenue in Hell's Kitchen, and I defy you to walk one block there without feeling like you were as poor as a church mouse, even though you may have all the money in the world. Economic and financial benefits. Let's see what we're going to get out of this in connection with cosmic habit force. First of all, a definite major purpose. And through a combination of the principles of the philosophy of American achievement, one may condition his mind and body to hand over to cosmic habit force the exact picture of the financial status he wishes to maintain, and these will automatically be picked up and carried out to their logical conclusion by an inexorable law of nature which knows no such reality as failure. Now, I have observed by studying people who are successful, and I've had probably more opportunity to study successful people at close range than any other man living today, I have observed that they think constantly in terms of uh, things they can do, never in terms of things they can't do. I once asked Henry Ford if uh, there was anything he wanted to do that he couldn't do. He said, why, no, I don't think about the things I can't do. I think about the things I can do. Now, the majority of people, however, are not like that. They think about the things they can't do and worry about them. And uh, consequently, they can't do them. They think about the money they don't have and worry about it, and consequently, they don't have it and never get it. You know, money is a peculiar thing, isn't it? <laughs> Somehow or another, it just doesn't follow the fellow around that doesn't believe he's got a right to get it. I wonder why that is. 
money is a kind of an inanimate thing. I, I don't believe it's the fault of the money. I don't think uh, the fault's there. I think it's in the mind of the person who uh, doubts that he can get it. I notice that to when the students of mine start believing that they can do things, it starts to change their entire financial condition. I notice that when they, uh, they don't believe they can do things, uh, why they, they, they don't do them. So the whole purpose of this philosophy is to induce my students to build up habits of belief in themselves and in their ability to direct their minds to whatever they want in life and to keep their minds off the things they don't want. If you, haven't, uh, if you don't know too much about Mahatma Gandhi, it'd be a good idea if you to get a book and read up the, on the life of Mahatma Gandhi. There's a man who didn't have anything to fight the British with except his own mind. He didn't have any soldiers, he didn't have any money, he didn't have any military equipment, he didn't even own a pair of britches. And yet he put to rout the great British Empire with his mind power just resisting them. He didn't want them, he didn't accept them, and finally the British picked up, they got the big idea and got out. Surprising how many individuals will do that when you set your mind against them. You don't have to say anything, you don't have to do anything, you just have to say it in your own mind, I don't want that person in my life, and eventually he'll get out, sometimes very quickly. I'm telling you, this mind power stuff, it's powerful, it's potent, it's marvelous, it's profound if you want to become acquainted with it and start using it. Now, this philosophy is the medium by which one's thought habits may be controlled until they are taken over by cosmic habit force. And it is well to here call attention to the fact that no one has ever been known to become financially independent without having first established a prosperity consciousness. Just as no one <coughs> may remain physically well without having first established a health consciousness. I remember so well my greatest difficulty when I started out with Andrew Carnegie. My greatest difficulty was forgetting that I was born in poverty and illiteracy and ignorance. It took me a long time to forget, forget the little mountain hut in the mountains of Wise County, Virginia, where I was born. Long time before I could forget about that and get it out of my system. And always when I'd start out to uh, interview an outstanding man, I'd think, oh well, uh, I'm so insignificant. When I come to, into his presence, I guess I'll be ashamed and afraid because I remembered where I came from. I remembered my poverty. It was a long time before I could shake that poverty off. But finally I did it. And when I began to think in terms of opulence, I began to say then, well, why wouldn't Mr. Edison see me? Why wouldn't Mr. Wanamaker see me? Because I'm just as big in my field as he is in his. I not only felt that, ladies and gentlemen, but I saw the day when I made it come true. It's an achievement. When you can reach out and influence the lives of millions of people all over the world beneficially, I say that's an achievement. And I say it never would have been done if I hadn't changed the habits, thoughts of Napoleon Hill. That was my biggest job, believe me. My biggest job was not getting in to see the men of affairs and to get their collaboration. That was easy. My biggest job was to change the habits of thinking of Napoleon Hill. And had I not changed those habits, the books that I have written that inspire millions of people never would have had the effect that they had. Because when an author writes a book or makes a speech, the exact mental attitude that he's in when he's speaking or writing is conveyed to his audience. And he, no man lives who is smart enough to keep that audience from picking up the thoughts. You read a book that anybody writes and you have impressions about that writer as you read that book. And you couldn't possibly read one of my books without knowing down deep in your heart that I'm dealing with fundamental principles as fundamental as infinite intelligence itself. You know that. You don't need anybody to prove it to you. And before I could write books of that kind, I had to completely build over my thought processes, my habits of thinking, and learn to keep my mind on the things that were positive and keep it on there automatically. Fixations of fear and faith. Did you know that each one of you came over to this plane with a marvelous doctoring system of your own? Did you know that? A chemist, don't you know, that breaks up your food and distributes it, takes out of it the things that nature needs? And did you know that if you think right, eat right, exercise right, and live right, you know that, you, that, that this doctor inside of you does everything else automatically? They call it body resistance. 
I don't care what you call it. It's a system that nature gave you for balancing everything that you need to keep your body in fine condition all the time. But you have to do your part. Now, faith, <clears throat> a fixation is a wonderful thing if it doesn't happen to be a negative fixation. But you want to look out for these fixations of fear and self-limitations, the things that you can't do, the fear of criticism or the fear of anything else. But if you want to make use of fixation and benefit by the law of cosmic habit force in doing so, go to work on the fixation of faith. Fixation of applied faith. Now there's a fixation you can tie to. And there's a fixation, if you tie to it properly, when you reach out there and call for the things you need, you'll find them always in place. If they're not where you thought they were, they'll be close at hand. By all means, cultivate that kind of a fixation. Don't let it get away from you by neglect. How do you go about uh, making a fixation of anything? Any thought habit, how do you go about it? Repetition, that's right, and applying it in everything you do and think and say. Repetition. Some of you are old enough to have remembered the Kuwait formula, day by day in every way I'm getting better and better. Millions of people all over this country were saying that. And it didn't come out to a tinker's dam, not swearing, D-A-M, a little small coin, <laughs> unless the person saying it believed it. It wasn't what he said that counted, it was what he thought while he was saying it. And there were a lot of people that said it over and over again and then finally turned thumbs down on it because they said, oh, well, it didn't work for me because I didn't believe in it in the first place. <laughs> you can understand why it didn't work. It makes no difference what formula you use or whether you use any oral formula or not as long as your thought patterns are positive and you can repeat them over and over again. I want you to... Follow the habits of thinking in positive terms until cosmic habit force takes up your my mental attitude and makes it predominantly positive and not predominantly negative. The circumstances of life are such that the majority of people have, have, their, they have their minds are predominantly negative all the time. Now what you want to do is to change all of that and make the mind predominantly positive all the time. So no matter what you want, you can turn on the power and uh, get some response from infinite intelligence. Infinite intelligence is not going to do anything for you while you're in a state of, of anger, no matter how much right you have to be angry. Infinite intelligence is not going to do anything for you, but she's going to let you do something for, to yourself if you keep yourself in a, a state of a negative mind. You can't afford to go into action. You can't afford to go into expression. You can't afford to have human relationships while you're in, the, in a negative mental attitude. And the best way to keep from having a being in the negative mental attitude is to start to build up these positive habits and to let cosmic habit force take them over and make them predominant in your mind. Here are the negatives that you should avoid making into fixations. Poverty, imaginary illness, laziness, just plain ever any garden variety of laziness, laziness. You know what a lazy man is? He's a man who hasn't found a labor of love. That's right. No, no lazy people except those who haven't found something they like to do. Of course, some of them are pretty hard to please. <laughs> They go all the way through life and have an alibi. They don't like this, don't like that. As a matter of fact, they don't like anything, period. They are lazy. And envy and greed and anger and hatred and jealousy and dishonesty and drifting without aim or purpose, irritability of mental attitude in general, vanity, arrogance, cynicism, sadism, and the will to injure others. Now, those are things that become fixation in the lives of most people, and you can't afford to have that kind of a fixation. You just can't afford it. It's too expensive. Even as a student of uh, the science of success, I'd still say it's too expensive for you. You can't have that kind of a habit nor fixation. But down here are the positives that you can't afford to have and you can't afford not to have them. The definiteness of a major purpose in life heads the list. Make it a fixation by all means. Eat it, sleep it, drink it. And indulge in some act every day of your life leading in the direction of your overall major purpose in life. And faith, personal initiative, enthusiasm, 
willingness to go the extra mile, imagination, the traits of a pleasing personality, accurate thinking, and all the other traits recommended in this philosophy of individual achievement. Now, those are the things that you can afford to make into fixations so that they dominate your mind. You live by them. You think by them. And you act by them. You relate yourself to people by them. And uh, you'll be surprised at how quickly you can give yourselves changed lives. You'll be surprised at how quickly the people who have tried to injure you will, of their own accord, fall away and become ineffective and impotent. You'll be surprised at how potent you will become, how you'll attract to you new opportunities. You'll be surprised at how quickly you'll solve your problems when they arise. And you wonder why you didn't do it before. Instead of worrying over your problem, why you just didn't get busy and dissolve it or solve it. On every one of those, you'll notice everyone is under your control, subject to your control as a result of repetition of thought. That's all you have to do. Just keep repeating it over and over and over again and put some action about behind the thought. Words without deeds, you know, are dead. Engage in some sort of action. Now, one should develop fixations by all means, but one should take care to see that they are fixations on the subject of that which one wants, not that which one does not want. Isn't it a strange thing that the majority of people go all the way through life with the, uh, getting everything they don't want and very few things that they do want? Isn't that funny? You know, a lot of people who don't get the mate in marriage that they really want. They have to get him or her and find out about it. <laughs> know a lot of people like that. I know a lot of people who don't get out of their jobs what they want. I know a lot of people who do not get out of their profession what they want. They'd like to have more patience and better patience with better dispositions. Incidentally, that's, uh, there's an idea. You know how a professional man, like a dentist or a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer, how, how he goes about attract, attracting a lot of patients that uh, are agreeable to get along with? Wonderful patients, pay their bills promptly and all that sort of thing. Do you know how he does it? Yeah, be that way himself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you set him out, though. <laughs> That's the idea. In other words, the, the, the effect starts with the professional man himself. His own mental attitude toward his clients or his patients is what determines what they do toward him. No getting away from that. That's absolutely true. That happens to a merchant, happens to a man or woman in a job or any other person in any other connection. In other words, if you want to reform people, don't start with the people, start with you. <laughs> and get your mental attitude right, and you'll find that the others will fall in line. They, they can't do anything about it. As a matter of fact, if your, if your mind is, is positive, the negative-minded person can't influence you in the least. Nothing he can do about it. A positive-minded person is always the master of the negative-minded person. That is, if he exercises his rights. We are what we are today, ladies and gentlemen, because of two forms of heredity. Now, one of them we control outright, and one of them we do not control at all. Through physical heredity, we bring into this world a little sum total of all of our ancestors. Now, if we happen to be born with a nice brain power, nice, well-developed, rounded-out bodies, fine. But if we happen to be born with a hunchback or some affliction, there's nothing much we can do about that. In other words, we have to take what physical heredity hands us as it is. I know a man afflicted with the loss of his legs through polio who uh, ran a peanut stand within two blocks of the White House and right in the White House, a man afflicted with the same thing was running the biggest nation in the world. And he made a, an asset out of his affliction instead of a liability. Social heredity, however, is another thing. Social heredity consists of all of the influences that enter into your life after you were born, and maybe dating back to the prenatal stage even before you were born. The things you hear, the things you see, the things you are taught, the things you read about, the legends that you were, were influenced by, and all that sort of thing, constitute social heredity and by far and away, the most important part of what happens to us all the way through life is due to our relationship to social heredity, or what we get out of our environment and how much we control it. No, it's a social heredity thing. 
You know, it's a good idea for all of us, all adults, to go back and re-examine ourselves about these vital things that we uh, think we believe in. Find out just what right we have to believe them. Where do we get our beliefs? What is there to support any belief? So help me, I, I, I don't think I have any beliefs that, that are not supported by good sound evidence, or at least what I believe to be evidence. But I didn't arrive at that open-minded state of tolerance overnight. I'll tell you that now. There was a time when I was just about as intolerant as the next one. But I found out that that was a bad thing for me, and certainly not good for my students to be, uh, have a closed mind about anything. Thank you very much. <laughs>